treasure guarded by jinns. This story happened in 1998 in a village in the Black Sea region. It's Tur spelling Turkey, T-U-R-K-I-Y-E. So I keep screwing it up. But I'm sure that's how they spell it. My name is Sir Khan. I'm born and raised in Istanbul, the child of an ordinary family. My father was a civil servant, and you know the difficulties of living in Istanbul. My father worked hard to put his two children through school, but he had to moonlight on the weekends because he couldn't you know, keep up financially. So my father often didn't have enough time for us. I used to resent him for that. Now that I'm 35 years old, married with two children, I can better understand how unfair I was to my father. I loved the summer months. It gave us financial relief. My father would usually meet my needs like bicycles and computers at the end of the summer, because we had hazelnut orchards back home. Every year we would go to our village in early August, harvest, sell our hazelnuts, then return to Istanbul in early September. August 1998. It was a little bit different from other years. And after those nightmarish days, we never set foot in our hometown again. That year, I asked my father for an Atari as a report card present. When he said he would buy it after the hazelnut harvest, the world was mine. God, I couldn't wait to work in that hazelnut orchard in our village. I don't think I would have worked so enthusiastically if I didn't have a vested interest, you could say. One evening at 8 o'clock, our bus was leaving from the bus station. As we were packing our suitcases, I remembered that I'd forgotten my Walkman. I had made my father buy me it last year, so I rushed to my room, grabbed the record button of the stereo from the drawer, and a few cassettes that I used to record from the radio, and left. The 12-hour journey from Istanbul to our village would have been unbearable otherwise. Uncle Osman, my father's friend, came to our door in this car to take us to the bus station. We didn't wait too long. We loaded the suitcases in the truck and got in the car. It was 20 minutes from our house to the bus station. We arrived at the bus station after a short while. We boarded our bus and set off. As we crossed the Bosphorus Bridge, I thought to myself that I would miss this city, because whenever I went to the village, I missed Istanbul after about a week. Let me tell you a little bit about a village. I don't think I need to tell you about greenery of the Black Sea. There's many big trees and forests in our region, but settlements and their surroundings are usually surrounded by hazelnut gardens. The village center is a place with approximately 130 to 150 households built on a flat area. It was resembling a town rather than a village. Many houses and they're used by villagers for their shopping needs. As you move away from the center, high hills welcome you. My grandparents' house, the house we're going to stay in, was in the middle of one of these hills. The distance between the center and the house was about 25 minutes on foot. On the way, there was a very old, decaying school and a wooden bridge over the village stream that we had to cross. Every time I crossed that bridge, a shiver ran through my body. I didn't know why. There's only two households between the village square and the bridge. One of them was far from the bridge. The other was about 50 meters back from the bridge. In this house, there was an old woman named Fad... Fadme. They lived alone. She was a strange woman who didn't talk to anyone and hid when she saw people. I'll talk about this woman later. After the bridge, the climb up to the hill began. Sometimes I wondered how I would feel if I had to cross the road at night, which I was afraid to cross even during the day when I was alone. According to my grandfather, Greeks used to live in our village. The Greeks who fled during the War of Independence buried their gold and valuables in various places in hopes that they would come back after the war was over. He also said there were a few people from the village who found gold. After the last incident, no one searched for treasure. One day last year, some foreign people came to the village, introducing themselves as government officials and saying that they were going to make an exploration. 
My grandfather was suspicious of their contradictory speech, thought that they had to come look for gold. I heard that he had told them about the incident to make them give up. Then the men must have gotten scared because they left the village. This is how it happened. The year was 1979. Three young men, including Mehmet, the son of Aunt Fatime, were always looking for treasure. One day, while wandering by the stream, Mehmet came across some marks carved in a large rock near the wooden bridge. He got excited thinking that these marks were Greek letters. Although he had passed this place many times before, he had never noticed them. In the evening of that day, he meets the friends at the village cafe, as he does every evening. Tells them about this rock. His friends immediately grab a pickaxe and a shovel and say, Let's go! And they set off. When they come to the creek, just as they're about to start digging, Mehmet's eyes catches the wooden bridge. On this bridge, a few beings with unknown faces and hands were looking at them. In a panic, Mehmet warns his friends and sits behind a rock, trembling and looking at his friends. When his friends look at the bridge, they can't see anything. They put the incident aside and excitedly start digging in various places around the rock. After about an hour of digging, the pickaxe hits a wooden chest. When they lift this chest, they see that there is a jug underneath. Cries of joy echo through the forest. When the friends open the chest and see dried snake skin, some dried herbs and a blood-like liquid in the glass bottle, they realize what kind of trouble they've reached. While all of this was happening, Mehmet was already lifting the jug and knocked it to the ground. As the jug's contents are revealed, ear-splitting screams emanate from the woods behind the rock. Terrified, the friends look in the direction of the sound and see a dozen of glowing eyes in the woods. One of the young men collapses. Mehmet and his other friend flee the scene, leaving the gold and their friend on the ground. Since Mehmet's house was close to the scene, he went home soon after. Curious about the young people who didn't go home at the night, their families start looking for them at the first light of the morning. Soon they are found, and lamentations echo in the village square. One kilometer away from the scene, the young man who had run away with Mehmet, while telling the villagers he saw on the road about the incident, said that they found me and ran away again, only to be found dead in a hazelnut garden near his house. The other young was lying lifeless, or he had collapsed. Mehmet's fate was unknown. His mother said that Mehmet never came home that day. No one had seen or heard about the gold the youth had found. After these events, the villagers called the Creek Sin Creek and the Bridge Sin Creek Bridge. The truth of the matter is this. There was a Greek family here who practiced magic. Before leaving this region, they buried the gold coin somewhere around the rock on the edge of Sin Darsai, cast a spell to protect them from the Jinns. What was found in the chest after the young people dug it up were the materials used in the spell. Anyway, we had finally reached our village after a long journey. The minibuses departed from the bus station. They were coming to the village square. By the time we reached the square, my grandfather had already arrived on his motorcycle. We settled on the motorcycle without wasting time. We set off toward her house on the hill. Soon we were at Aunt Fatime's house. She must have heard the sound of the motorcycle because we saw her enter the house as we passed by. Aunt Fatime was a strange person. I didn't even remember hearing her voice before. A little further on, we were greeted by a wooden bridge that smelled of history. Interesting. Ever since I heard the story of this area, every time I crossed it, I got chills. I looked at my grandfather and father, and they were moving their lips. They were obviously shivering and saying prayers as they crossed the bridge. After the crossing the bridge, we started climbing up the steep slope. Soon, the houses of relatives began to appear before us. There were about 15 houses on the hill where our house was located, 
most of them were in the house of our relatives. When we reached our house, I went straight to bed. I was very tired. When I woke up, the sun was about to set, and I felt rested. Seeing me waking up, my mother called out from the kitchen. Sir Khan, my son, will set a table under the gazebo. My uncles will come too. Carry these plates. I was happy to hear that my uncles were coming. I had two cousins, Akin and Amre. They could be considered my peers. We loved each other very much, but because of the long distances between us, we could only see each other one month a year. They lived here. After a nice dinner in the garden and the house, my cousins and I started chatting. We agreed that tomorrow we would meet in the village square, eat ice cream, walk around a bit. At such gatherings we would often buy some junk food and sit in the garden of the old school and eat it. Another reason we chose that secluded place was that when we got together, we would sometimes smoke cigarettes in secret. There weren't many people coming and going, so the risk of getting caught was low. There were a few times when we heard strange noises coming from inside the school. When we would go and look, we would see nothing but a ruin with a single classroom. A very old blackboard on the wall and rotten desks. Actually, it looked very scary, but we were used to it. It came so often. After dinner, tea was brewed. While the elders were chatting in the corner, we three cousins were chatting nearby. Then the conversation of the elders caught my attention, and I listened. My father asked my uncle, There's still no news about Uncle Muhuddin, is there? My uncle said, No, the last time he went, he went after gold in Sin Creek. That was the last time he went. He never found him alive or dead. Uncle Muhuddin didn't believe the story of Jin Creek. According to him, after finding the treasure that night... Mehmet had killed his friends and escaped with the treasure. Whenever the subject came up, he would say, Stop these tales of jinns. Mehmet ran away with the gold and he took the lives of two young men. Maybe he was right. One day when the subject came up in the village coffee house, Uncle Muhitten got angry. I have no fear if there is a treasure in Sin Creek. There must be other treasures. He said, he goes to the creek with a pickaxe and a shovel. The last people to see him are the workers in the hazelnut garden. The Jeanne de Marie is notified. Jeanne d'Ar Marie. Perhaps. That's hard to say. Despite searching for days, no results were found. It was quite late. My uncles got ready, got into their tourist car, and left. The next day at noon, as we had agreed, set off for the schoolyard to meet the cousins. After about ten minutes of walking, I arrived at Sin Creek. It looked very beautiful from afar in daylight. A stream with clear water flowing in the middle of the forest. Beautiful bird sounds all around. After looking at it from a distance, I walked toward the bridge. As I got closer, the chills came back. There was a bad energy here. This was obvious. I quickly crossed the bridge and continued on my way. A little ahead, Aunt Fatime was waving her hands as if she was talking to someone. There was no one in front of her. She soon realized I was coming and quickly entered the house and slammed the door. She must have gone mad with grief after her son disappeared, I thought. When I arrived at the schoolyard, my cousins hadn't arrived yet. While I was waiting, I lit a cigarette. I had stolen it from my father's pack. I was halfway through when I started by the sound of talking and threw a cigarette away and my dog in a cone started making loud noises and interrupting me. It was my father's voice. I could hear it very clearly. As I ran away, the rustling sound of dry leaves under my feet gave me away. Who's there? They were coming fast. I went to the secluded area behind the school so they wouldn't see me. The back wall of the school was covered with ivy. I found a gap between the vines and leaned my back against the wall of the school. My father would be very angry if he found out I was smoking. Out of fear, I just sat in a hiding place for a while. Then I dozed off and fell asleep. In my dream, I was in the schoolyard. The 
School was like new. Flowers had been planted in the garden. There was a colorful landscape. Beautiful bird songs echoed around. A whispery voice was telling me to go inside the school. Children's voices were coming from inside. I approached the window and looked inside myself, and there was a teacher. He was holding a wooden ruler and explaining something on the blackboard. The window I was looking at was directly opposite the blackboard. About 30 children were listening to the lecture with their backs to me. Suddenly I realized that it was getting dark. When I turned around, I was terrified. The beautiful garden I had just seen was gone, replaced by the ruined garden of the school. The sunny weather had been replaced by a gloomy and overcast one. A cloud of fog was slowly coming toward me from about 20 meters away. When I turned my head back in the direction of the school, my heart almost stopped from fear of the sight that I saw. The teacher had been replaced by an ugly creature. Its eyes were white. It was very tall. Its mouth was like a human mouth opened until it tore open. It pointed at me with its index finger and said a word in a language I didn't understand. At that moment, the creatures sitting on the desks of the classroom turned their head toward me without turning their bodies. Thirty pairs of white and bright eyes stared at me. Screaming, I turned around and started running into the fog. I had only taken a few steps when hundreds of crows began to caw in their ugly voices from the trees around me. They began to fly and attacked me. The eyes of the crows were red. I was running, trying to protect my head with my hands while I tripped and fell on my face. When I stood up to get up, I saw the creature looking down at me and lunged at me with a horrible scream. I woke up, jumping up, sweat beating on my face. My cousins had either not come, or they had come and left because they couldn't see me. When I saw that it was almost dark, boiling water poured over my head, thinking about how to cross Sin Creek in the dark. First, I thought of going to the village square, but that road in the dark was as scary as Sin Creek. The sun was about to set, so I had to make a quick decision. Gathering my courage, I decided to go home and set off. I was still under the influence of the dream I had seen. My legs were shaking. I walked along the road reciting Surah's Falakinas. As I passed Aunt Fatime's house, I looked at her windows. There was no movement. Not even the light was on. After a while, the Sin Creek Bridge came into view. Whispered voices were coming from my right and left. With each whisper, I turned my head in the direction of the sound. I turned my back to the bridge with the sound coming up from behind me. No one was there. When I turned back to the bridge, the beings lined up on the bridge and they were looking at me with their white and bright eyes. I wanted to cry out of fear, but I couldn't. I started running backwards with all my strength. The nearest house was Aunt Fatime's house. I arrived at her door, gasping for breath. I was pounding on the door, but no one answered. Whispering voices kept coming. There was a barn in the yard of the house. I ran there to hide. The barn door was locked. It was a barn with two compartments. I could hear animal noises coming from the compartment on the left. I went around behind it. There was a window in the room on the right. They had boarded it up. put all my strength into it, hoping to open it. A piece of wood came loose, and there was a growling sound from inside. While I bent down and looked, I froze. There was someone chained by the neck and feet. He was looking at me, laughing in a voice you'd be surprised to hear coming from a human being. There was no white in his eyes. His eyes were completely black. His hair, beard, and nails were very long. It looked like a wild animal. What was this creature? A crunching sound came from behind me. I looked up and my eyes glazed over. I had been hit on the head with a hard object. When I opened my eyes, I was in the hospital. I learned the rest of the story from my father. And I'll tell you this part as he told it from his mouth. Sir Khan said that he had heard that we had come to the ruined school that day. But he had never been there. My brother Amit and I had paperwork in the district. We met early in the morning and went there. On the way back, we stopped by relatives near our house and chatted for a while. Time passed quickly and it was getting close to dark. 
when we returned home, my wife greeted us in a hurry. When I asked what's the matter, she said, Sircon hasn't been around for hours. It must have happened to him. He was supposed to meet a Kim and Amir, but the boys came to ask for Sircon. They're inside now. Could he have gone to Jin Creek? Stop, ma'am. Calm down. We'll see now. I told Amit to start the car. There was a well-known Hoja who lived on the other side of our hill. That side of the hill was connected to another village. We didn't travel back and forth that way very much. My brother Amit started climbing the hill at full speed. After about 15 minutes, we were at the Hodge's house. We quickly explained the situation. The Hodja took some materials from the shelves and drawers and said, let's go. When we came to Sin Creek, the branches of all the trees around the creek were shaking like crazy. There wasn't much wind. You wait here, said the Hodja, drawing the Basmela. He walked toward the center of the bridge. He took something out of his pocket. I don't really know what it was. It was like sand. He poured it into his palm. He said something in Arabic and blew on it. Then he wrapped the rope he took out around the railings of the bridge and started to tie knots while reciting a prayer. He tied a knot after each prayer. Finally, he went down to the stream, made a fire, threw something into it, put out the fire with water he took from the stream. He did everything very quickly. Suddenly, the tree branches stopped swaying and everything calmed down. Now we can search, said the Hadja. First, we quickly went down to the creek bank, scattered and looked around. On the one hand, we were shouting Sir Khan, and on the other hand, we were scanning the forested area with a flashlight. After a while, I saw a path along the creek bank. This path went all the way to the garden of Aunt Fatima's house. Mehmet's mother... Mehmet was my best friend as a child. We had walked this path together a few times. We had been separated since I was to work abroad at a young age. Then I heard about the unfortunate incident that happened to him. I started walking up the path when I came to Aunt Fatime's garden. I was devastated by the scene that I saw. Aunt Fatime was trying to drag someone off the ground. These were Sir Khan's clothes. I ran and grabbed the old woman and threw her backwards. She hit her head where she fell and remained motionless. Sir Khan's face was covered in blood. The unscrupulous woman must have hit him with a hard object like a shovel. When I checked his pulse, I realized he was alive and I was thankful. My brother Amit was nearby. He came running when he heard the shouting. I asked Amit for the car keys. Stay close to this woman, I said, and rushed Sir Khan to the hospital. I'll try to tell the last part of the story exactly as my uncle told it to me, as far as I remember. My brother took my nephew and stepped on the gas. He stared at the cloud of dust he left behind him on the dirt road. The teacher had heard the sound, like me, and came. Did you find the boy? How is he? He asked. He's alive, I only know this much. I was asking myself why Aunt Fatime wanted to harm this child. I said to the Haja, Haja, you stay with this woman, I'll take a look around. According to the marks on the ground, the old woman had dragged Sir Khan from the barn side. It was clear from the way the grass was laying. I followed the tracks. She was going behind the barn. There was blood on the ground and a shovel next to him. Why did you want, or what did you want from the child and the woman, I said to myself. There were strange noises coming from the inside. There was a gap at the bottom of the boarded up window, just enough to see inside. I bent down and looked to my amazement, and there was a person inside whose face looked familiar. His hair and beard were tangled, and he lived in filth. He was making strange noises and trying to attack, but his chains prevented him. When I looked more carefully, I recognized who it was. Poor Mehmet. He had obviously suffered a lot. I called to Haja to come and take a look. As soon as he saw him, he said, this poor man is haunted by evil people. Let's break the boards on the window so I can get inside. With the shovel on the floor, I made enough space for him to enter. Haja entered by reciting verses. As the Haja recited verses, Mehmet was almost going crazy. 
Meanwhile, Aunt Fatima came to my mind. When I looked to check on her, I saw that she wasn't there. I went up the road and looked, but there was no sign of her. When I came to the Hadja with Mehmet, the Hadja put his hand on her Mehmet and said, O oh, demon created by Allah, get out of his body. Mehmet was weak and collapsed on the floor. Hadja went inside and asked for help to carry Mehmet. He told me that the possession was very stubborn and that he should take Mehmet to his house and put him up for a few days. He added that it might take a few more sessions, but with Allah's permission, he would save him. This is what my father and uncle told me. When I opened my eyes, I was in the hospital. My mother, father, uncle, cousins, they were all here. They suspected a brain hemorrhage and put me to sleep for three days. During this time, with the help of Hadja, Mehmet started to get better. He tried to tell my father what he had experienced when it happened, as much as he could remember. I say he tried because he had a stutter after what he had been through, but the night they found the treasure, Mehmet came home scared. He senses something strange in his mother, but he doesn't pay attention because his mind is on the beings outside. As he looks out of the window, his mother hits him on the head with a hard object. He opens his eyes, chained in an empty room in the barn. His mother and the beings he saw on the bridge that night were on his head. And from that day on, He's always in pain. My family's history with the supernatural. To begin, I don't think I believe in the paranormal. It's a family trait that we scoff at anything, pretty much despite having our share of odd stories and small encounters. Our opinion on religion and the supernatural has always been one of stoic agnosticism. Regardless, there are family stories that get told again and again, usually to guests in the late of the night, and with a bubbly haze of booze in the air. I'm also aware that recently a lot of these subs have been getting a lot of exaggerated, and some fictional stories too. I don't want to peer as a no-sleeper who escaped their cage. So I'll try to write these simply and without much opinion, just give you the details as I experience them, or as I've been told. My family moved to Ireland around the year 2000. We moved into an incredibly old and almost dilapidated house on the west coast. It's around here where this history with potentially supernatural occurrences began. I do have many other stories from my extended family too, although I think I can validate turning these into separate posts. I'll just use this one to focus on our time in Ireland. I'll begin with our family's ghost story, the one that began it all. 1. I don't really know time frames, but it must have been within our first year of living in the house. My mother's not a believer in the paranormal, but at the same time, she's not a stranger to it. Our house had a large front garden with a small path that ran straight down the middle of the road front door. Our kitchen overlooks this. It's a big room with large, uncurtained windows. Quite spooky at night. Attached to the kitchen is a playroom that faces out the back of the house, and likewise has massive, uncurtained windows. Every now and then, my mother would glimpse a lady in white through the kitchen window. They'd be walking down a path toward the door. The first few times, she went to greet the lady, but found no one there. And these sightings continued, and she would either see the lady walking down the path or catch a glimpse of something white passing directly by the window. She ignored these and never brought it up with my father. One day, however, they were both in the kitchen again, my mother saw the flash of something white glide by the window. Used to it by this point, she said nothing and continued with whatever she was doing. But then my father said, unprompted, Wish that bloody woman would go away. It was then she realized that she wasn't seeing things. For the first time, they both acknowledged the presence of this woman. Things escalated from there. 
My father began seeing this woman, except now he would see her passing by the back windows in the playroom sometimes. That room overlooked some fields that lead to the sea. I think by this point he was getting really freaked out. One night in particular, he said he watched the lights flicker on and off in the room and watched the woman go back and forth in front of the window for ages. While that seemed like the bubbling point, the real turning point involved three-year-old me. One day I was playing on my own in the living room. This has another large window, forcing out into a little walled-off section around the back of the house. It was always overgrown and wild, as it was impossible to get a lawnmower at that point. My mother heard me screaming bloody murder before she could even get to me. I was flying out of the room in utter hysterics and unable to speak coherently. I kept screaming about a massive white bird that had been stood peering at me through the back window while I played. At this point, they decided to do something. Got someone. I don't think it was a priest, but maybe a local who was religious to visit the house. And ultimately bless it, and after that, the haunting stopped. Now, we had a strange situation with this house. Due to some family issues, we ended up moving out of that house after a couple of years. My parents separated, and me and my siblings spent a few years moving around to different houses and areas of the west coast of Ireland. Eventually, we moved back into this house. I spent the remainder of my teenage years living there with my mother. To keep things brief, though, I'm just going to list everything weird I think that happened between the story above to the basically how the situations weirdly continued with my younger sister. They live in that big old house alone with my mother now. Here it is. My father has kind of another wild story from when we first lived in that house. Not sure when it happened exactly. Nearby to that house, along a path leading to a nearby beach, is a house notorious for being strange. This is about a 90 second walk away. A lot of the more superstitious locals genuinely think it's evil. It was built by a man for his family and something bad happened, but I can't remember what. So for as long as I've known, it's been uninhabited. One night, my father was walking her dog. It was heading to the beach. It had just gotten dark, so the land was black, but the sky still had a touch of deep blue to it. As he passed this house, he looked over to it and was shocked to see that in the field directly behind was a large mass, like a big shadow swirling around in this field. He could just see it silhouetted against the sky. He said it almost looked like a flock of birds, but was more like a concentrated shadow. It just flowed round in a circle around the edges of this field. And the other problem he had was that it was just completely silent. He watched it for a while in shock, however the dog didn't react, and eventually he bailed. 3. My parents also have a story that I remember them clearly telling some guests that we had over one night but I've since asked my mom about it, and she can't recall it. In our house, their bedroom was directly above the kitchen. One night, they heard a great mass of moving things and animal-like noises. I remember their description so well, because as a kid, it freaked me out. They described it as a sound as if a tiger was going through the dishwasher, as in taking plates and moving them about. Four. After moving out, me and my sisters moved into another house with my mother and new partner. It was again quite old, but weirdly Spanish in its design. I remember it having iron sheets with bowls inlaid in the wall and black iron spiral staircase leading to the second floor. Me and my sisters have all agreed that house was haunted, but we only openly talked about this opinion many years later. It was when we all admitted this that I suddenly got the realization that what I was used to seeing was this kid in that house might very well not have been my imagination. I remember very distinctly how almost every night I would be terrified. I was about six years old at this point. I was terrified of a silhouette that stood in the corner of my room where the door was. The door opened inwards, so it stood in the exact spot that would be hidden if the door was opened. 
I slept with the door shut, and when my eyes would adjust to the dark, I'd always be able to see this shadow. It led me to having to come up with coping mechanisms to deal with the monsters in the room, as I called them. I convinced myself I was safe from it as long as I always pretended to be asleep, but I would secretly stare at it for ages. Five. In this same Spanishy house, one night we all headed out somewhere, leaving our dog behind. I don't remember what we did, but we arrived home late, found that for some reason every single window in the house was swung wide open. Every single one. I remember sitting on my bed while everybody searched the house, my older sister coming to my room and checking under the bed. The explanation was that the dog had somehow learned to open the windows and had done it while we were out. Now skip forward to when me, my mother, and my two younger sisters moved back into the coastal Irish house, a few years later. I'll list off all the weird things, although more minor, that happened here. 6. One morning I came and sat in bed with my mother. My younger sisters were downstairs. At some point she got up and went downstairs to join them. I was reading a large book, and although I could see the doorway clearly, it was just large enough that it obscured my view of the floor there. After some time, I jumped when I suddenly heard a singular note being played on a toy keyboard that we got at some point. I looked, and there it was. It sat perfectly straight in the middle of the doorway, where I hadn't seen it before. The key wasn't moving, but a single note was repeatedly coming through the speakers. I got up, turned it off, and went down to my sister. I grilled her about where exactly she had left the keyboard. She swore over and over again that it had been left downstairs with them. This could have just been a prank, although I'm not really trying to point anyone here standing in the doorway and place it. 7. I slept in the room that had a hatch to the attic. My bed was a bunk bed but with a desk instead of a bottom bunk. This means I slept about three feet below the ceiling and the hatch was over my feet. On multiple occasions I woke to find the hatch lifted and slid open. This hatch was just a thick slab of wood that loosely sat in a frame to cover the hole. It had to be lifted about three inches up before you could slide it to the side. Still, could it just been air currents? It's a big and breezy house. 8. Some minor things. As a kid about five years old, my sister once accidentally cut her wrist while washing a glass. My whole family rushed over to her, her neighbor and just retired nurse, as I think what her job was, and I for some reason stayed at home. It was nighttime. They were only gone for about 15 minutes, but while gone I heard somebody knocking on the front door using the heavy iron door knocker attached to it. I was scared, so I pushed the crate against the door and looked through the eye hole. No one was there. I didn't open the door. I specifically once felt myself get poked in the back one day while in my room. Could have been a muscle spasm, I guess. We used to have a wicker chair that would creak as it was being sat on in the night. That's when I would be the last one up. I figured it was something to do with the wicker setting. We frequently had a fire instead of radiators, and... I once saw a translucent foot that almost looked cartoony, but the foot of a marshmallow man walked around the corner toward me, however it vanished after a second, and I just shrugged it off. A bigger story, number nine. One night when my older sister was visiting, we stayed up late watching Marbled Hornets. Thoroughly creeped out, went to bed late. The electrics in the house were always pretty bad, so my mother grilled us kids in the habit of switching everything off before bed in case a bad electric is causing a fire. As we went to bed, I locked up and switched everything off. About 20 minutes into trying to fall asleep, I suddenly heard my dog barking. I crept out onto the landing and saw the dog sat at the opposite side of the stairs, opposite to where you'd actually walk down them, staring down below. I quickly noticed that the kitchen door was wide open, despite locking it, and the kitchen light was now on. Not only that, but the front door was now swung wide open, too. 
having just spent an hour watching marbled hornets, I was freaked out. I took my dog down with me and relocked everything, switched everything off again. I went to bed imagining the slender man loping around in the hallway behind me. 10. One night my mother and her boyfriend said they'd heard two people talking in the kitchen while they tried to sleep. I don't know why neither of them ever got up to check it out. I didn't really ask. A couple of days later we found out that the wire we used to tie the front gate shut to stop my baby sister from getting out into the road. It had been cut. I'm sure nothing paranormal. Some people probably just came into our house. It's still weird the wire was cut, as the gate was only a few feet tall and easy to hop over. Completely unnecessary to cut the wire. 11. This is probably the most unbelievable one. And I generally don't tell people this unless I believe they're very open-minded for that reason. There's no point telling it to people I don't think will believe it. It was not a dream. I'm not superstitious. I just can't explain it. One night, 15 or 16 years old, I couldn't sleep. My bedroom at this point was a large room in the back of the house and had large windows. I couldn't sleep, though, and I felt like I could hear something. But there was no discernible noise. I just had the feeling that there was something kind of sound or vibration, but it was so faint I convinced myself it was my imagination. Still, it didn't go. And the feeling was so persistent that I got up and went to the window. I pressed my ear to it. The windows were old and rusted shut. They didn't open. I realized that there was definitely some kind of vibration. Now, curious, I went downstairs and quietly opened the front door. What greeted me in the night was completely different. It was a loud thumping noise that filled up the entire night. I mean loud, I don't understand how it wasn't more audible for my room. It was deep and bassy and rhythmically thumping. Basically, just like if you were at a festival, it sounded like the bass drum from a dance track and about that loud too. But I'm stood in the middle of rural Ireland. All that surrounds me is fields, old abandoned stone houses, and 60-year-old farmers. It's also like 3 a.m., Excited and curious, I wrecked back, just kind of rushed back inside, and being a lame teenager, I dressed myself head to toe in black, put on a face mask. I was just caught up in the moment. I snuck outside. I head into the front garden. I hop the wall into the road, following this massive thumping sound that just reverberates in your chest. It sounded like a heartbeat. I don't have to go far. On the opposite side of the road, it's a long abandoned house. Now, you see these a lot in the Irish countryside. These old abandoned stone houses that kind of fallen through and have been left to rot in the weather for a hundred years. This is one of those houses. Thatched roof and all. It's a small old farmhouse. It's got a walled off field attached to the back. Inside that field is a stone or cement hut. I don't know what it's used for, but it's literally like a four by four meter single room. I get to the wall of this field, and I can just tell that the sound's coming from there. Literally straight across the road from my house. I don't go any further, I just crouch down in the darkness and watch this hut, listening to this rumbling, booming heartbeat noise. I can't see any lights or anything. I eventually go home, and I remember shaking so much from the adrenaline I could hardly stand. I don't remember the rest of the night. I guess it just eventually stopped, and I eventually went to bed and fell asleep. Now that's the majority of the events. Or the events I experienced while living there. Mostly as a teen. I moved out at 17, still completely unconvinced of the paranormal, and that there was really anything still in that house. No one ever really seemed to have experienced anything, so I never talked about any of the above with my family. Eventually, my second youngest sister moved out of that house for uni, and all that was left was my youngest sister having only started secondary school and my mother. Over the last couple of years, and as my younger sis, who I'll refer to as YS from now on, became a teen, every now and then while calling my mother for a catch-up, my mom would tell me about how YS has been being a wimp and freaking herself out. 
started a while ago and was a bit of a running joke. YS was doing typical teenage things. She'd invite her friends over, they'd watch some horror film, get scared, and then swear they heard noises or saw something. Saw lights moving through the house. Just typical shit. We'd laugh about it, and every now and then my mom would have a new story. Got to the point where it was kind of happening frequently. My mom would go out for a drink with friends, Wyas would call her after a couple of hours freaking out because she'd heard or seen something. The main one I remember is that she'd been home alone in the bedroom on her phone, when suddenly a woman screamed her lungs out right outside her bedroom door. Obviously, she flipped and called my mom in tears. My mom dismissed it, said she'd probably heard the neighbors shouting at each other, yada, yada, yada. This happened a few times, and we always laughed at YS for being a chicken and freaking herself out. We have a friend who's a white witch, and to calm YS down, my mom invited her around to smoke the house, whatever it's called. She thought this would be a bit of a placebo for YS, and for a while everything did calm down. This lady also thinks that YS is quite perceptible to these things. So she's had some weird results in doing some kind of chant for YS. Then I visited my mother a couple of years back. We went to the pub, and after some drinks, she admitted something that made me swear not to tell YS. One morning, my mom awoke, and just before she needed to get up for work, she lay in bed for a few minutes just savoring the free time, and then heard Wyeth walk down the stairs. It's an old house, so those stairs creak like all hell. As well as that, there's a baby gate at the bottom of the stairs to stop her dogs from getting upstairs during the night. Surprised, she eventually gets up and goes downstairs. Baby gate is still locked, and she looks around. YS's nowhere goes back upstairs. YS is still passed out in her bed, so no one got up and could have walked down those stairs. But yeah, this could have just been some kind of sleep delusion. My mother's the most stubborn of us, when it comes to acknowledging the paranormal at least. But with this, she's very serious. Now, last story. Skip forward a year, it's been a while, and I've been keeping bad contact with them, so I'm not really up to date. These little scares have been happening, but I've heard about nothing major. Finally meet up with them again last November for a family or early sort of Christmas thing. On the first night I'm talking to YS, and I can't remember if I bring it up or she does, but we start talking about her experiences. Then she tells me this. And as she tells me this, she's in no way excited or elated or anything. For a 15-year-old, there was no theatric, just blankly regaled the story. Sort of as if to say, Now are you going to tell me it's not true too? She just seems tired and casual about it and admits that she's sick of all of us just never believing her. So she says this, My mother's out with some friends. YS has two of her own teenager friends over having a sleepover. Think these two friends are common culprits for jumping on the spooky bandwagon and kind of commonly freak themselves out. However, this time they're all stood in the kitchen. It's a pretty dark house. There's only a lamp on when they're talking. They stood in the corner of the table spread out a bit. It's a tall table so the chairs are quite heavy wooden ones. And when you sit on them, they're tall enough that your feet don't touch the ground. While they're chatting, they hear a scraping noise. And for a second, Wyas can't figure out what it is. She thinks it's the fridge making a weird noise. Then from in between them, one of those heavy-ass chairs slowly fucking slides away from the table. I try to ask her really specific questions here. Seems like it moved about a meter and a half over a few seconds. It's not really fast, but it does slide out in a diagonal path away from the table in between the girls. The chair then lifts onto one of the legs of YS. Genuinely said it span around three times on that back leg, then fell over flat, leading down to the back hallway near the side of the table. They freaked the hell out. 
YS manages to take a really shaky picture, but she's kind of late to take it, so it's just in the chair lying flat in the hallway, and that's it. Now, we know that seems like a typical lie told by a freaked out teen, but she's really not like that. And the way she haggardly told me the story just got me. I told her I believed her. We talked for a long time about my experiences and other experiences that she's had. And that's kind of where the story's left off. Step into the twilight zone with Paranormal M, where reality meets the inexplicable. Subscribe and turn on notifications to join us on this journey through the realms of the paranormal. We guarantee it'll be a ride you won't soon forget. True ghost stories from the Caribbean, or Caribbean, however you want to say it. Personal Experience Part 1 So first I'll say I grew up in Jamaica. And almost anybody that's from there will have stories. Especially since Jamaica was once a country filled with slaves that were often mistreated, passed away in gruesome ways. I'll start with the mild experiences and move to the more extreme. Around five years ago, I stayed at my house with my uncle. The house was built on top of an old slave plantation. It is said that there were still graves under the house as they just built a new community over it. One day in the early morning, I was on my computer. For some context, I had a desk right next to the veranda where the dog would stay sometimes. Anyways, as I logged into my computer, I noticed my dog growling at me. I was really spooked because the dog never did that before. I yelled at him to stop, but still growling. I soon realized that I was not what they were growling at. I saw a shadowy figure in the corner of my eyes. As I turned around, I saw what looked like a floating shadow with no legs, and a feeling of dread came over me, like piercing fear just taking over my entire body. I never felt something like that before. I tried to keep my cool, I turned around, closed my eyes, and prayed, as the dog was still growling and barking. I said Psalm 23, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want is known for being a very powerful psalm, and I asked God to protect me under the blood of Jesus, though I do not remember the exact words. As I opened my eyes, looked back, the shadow stared, then flew from left to right, never coming inside, mind you. It was through the window that it looked. Weeks passed, and only ever one other paranormal experience happened. I know I wasn't crazy, because there were five other people with me at the time, Basically, there is a knocking. Think of a dog wagging its tail against a washing machine, which is exactly what we thought it was. None of us had the balls to check. It went on for a couple of minutes until it suddenly stopped. We all started looking at each other. There'd be knocking on our front door. Boom, boom, boom. We all ran to our uncle's room, telling the house is haunted. To which he began to laugh at us. True Ghost Stories from the Caribbean, or Caribbean, Personal Experience Part 2. Anyways, for context, let's go back two years. I had an aunt who was very loving, and I enjoyed visiting her every chance I could get. She would make the best food, however she specialized in fish, which is ironic because she was a cat person. Before she passed away, she had like 12 cats one of which chased me when I was younger, but that's a story for another time. Anyway, she had two children, a boy and a girl. They had different fathers, though. For privacy reasons, I won't kind of give them nicknames. So, Jake and Amoy. Jake was the older one, and Amoy was the youngest at the time, but she was still in the stroller. Sadly, my aunt had issues with Amoy's dad, who didn't want to pay child support even threatened her multiple times, but she refused to back down. What was she going to do after all? She was a single mom who only made money as a hairdresser, maintaining two kids in a third world country is not easy, especially when you're alone. But the father didn't care. There was a break-in at my aunt's next door neighbor. They were shot and killed. 
My aunt, feeling scared, went to stay with my uncle. About five days after we heard there was another break-in. This time it was her house. She wasn't there at the time, however they did ransack the place. Fast forward about one week after my aunt and my uncle got into an argument. To be honest, to this day I'm saddened the way that it happened. But my uncle, in a fit of anger, said that she should leave, to which she did the same day as a matter of fact, and that's the last day I would ever see her again. Because not even two weeks had passed and I heard my mom crying her eyes out on the phone. The story goes like this. She had a call to do a lady's hair. But it was all a trap. The lady never came. Instead, there was just a lone car driving slowly down the street and a man walking alongside it following her. She walked for a bit before turning to talk to the old man. I believe she wanted to ask the time in order to break the tension, but he opened fire, shooting her over eight times in front of her daughter and son. Then jumping in the getaway car and fleeing. The daughter was still a baby at the time, she doesn't remember. Sadly, the son still resents his sister even to this day because he believes it was her fault, since her dad is the supposed person who ordered the hit. Fast forward now to a year after the events of my previous post. Amoy was now around six years old. Again, not exact for privacy reasons since that somewhat well-known incident in Jamaica. We had moved to my other aunt's house because there was a falling out between my mom and my uncle. Fair to say my uncle does not get along well with people. Anyways, while at my other aunt's house, strange things started happening. Amoy caught a crazy fever out of nowhere, and they began seeing and talking to things that were not there. I remember one night I saw her squealing in pain as if it seemed like she was being pinched by something I couldn't see. I was dumbfounded, and with each incident, the fever got worse and worse. And for those of you who don't know, it's believed that whenever spirits interact with people, particularly children, it makes them sick. Like, really, really sick. And if it doesn't stop, it can lead to death. I thought maybe my late aunt was trying to play with her daughter, but the thing is, is my aunt loves her children dearly, but never hurt them. So to this day, I'm not exactly sure what that was. But it went on for days, and there was nothing I could do. I would pray, and it would stop, and then start back again, each night, over and over. Her brother didn't comfort her, aside from the fact that he still resented her. Pretty much the whole family that was at my aunt's house avoided the situation, but I told my uncle what was happening, and he immediately came, took her away to his place. Afterward, he didn't tell me much, but the only thing I know is that the incident stopped happening as far as I know. Anyway, I moved to the U.S. maybe two, maybe one year after. Haunted House. True Caribbean Stories. Personal Experience, Part 3. So this was about ten years ago. Where I lived at a huge house, which we got for pretty cheap. I believe it was around 30,000 uh, JMD, or less than 300 USD in rent. We thought that we had hit a gold mine. It had enough rooms for a whole family, and we even had roof access, which was rare in Jamaica. Anyways, on to the spooky stuff. It started with my baby brother. When we moved in, he would immediately get sick. It's a common theme with ghosts interacting with children, by the way. We didn't think anything of it at first, because shit happens. So days passed. Then one night while I was asleep... I was awoken by screaming, both my aunt and my mom yelling various Bible scriptures and verses. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus, among other things. Not gonna lie, I was scared out of my pants. I just laid there in bed quivering in the sheets until I eventually fell asleep. The next day I heard my mom telling my grandma what had happened. She also started calling other members of the family to tell them what happened herself. She said that there was a large shadow it was humanoid in appearance. Picture your shadow standing upright. It was seemingly trying to pick my little brother up out of a crib. My aunt, a devout Christian, saw it first, then called my mom. If you all remember my previous stories, Jamaica is known for paranormal experiences. 
the main reason being all the slavery and wars that were fought here. So most people should have at least some sort of experience, especially the elders who grew up in the most country area. They suggested that we use frankincense. Usually people burn it before they move in, as it's said to be able to clear negative energy and evil. Anyways, fast forward two days. I bought some goldfish in a bag on my way home from school. I decided that upstairs would be a good place to keep them. I made a makeshift tank for them. But as I walked into the upstairs room, I saw someone sitting in a chair in the corner of my eye. I turned and looked, and it was a male. Fair skin color. He seemed like he was tortured, or like a busted face, mouth wide open, bleeding all over the floor. Both through his mouth and body. I was sitting laid back in the chair, staring at me. I slowly turned away in disbelief, and when I turned back around, there was no one there. The chair didn't even exist. I went and told my younger brother, and we had four brothers. He said he also had a freaky experience. He said that on some nights when he would try to go to sleep, he feels like someone was squeezing his head together, like legit squeezing to the point that he would cry. He would not be able to move if it got so bad that he would try not to sleep at night. Needless to say, I was freaked out beyond words, because as of now, as far as I was concerned, we needed to get out of this house. It's one thing just seeing freaky shit, but when that freaky shit starts interacting with you, that's a no-no. So I asked my parents if we could move because they had their own experiences. But we had just moved in, so we had to stay there a while longer because we needed to find somewhere else to live. Money doesn't grow on trees, especially in Jamaica. We ended up staying for a couple of months before leaving. But to conclude, if something is too good to be true, it probably is. It was a good looking house, but we later found out that the previous residents had issues with it too. Apparently, somebody had been killed in that house. How I Almost Died True Caribbean Stories Personal Experience Part 4 This was me as a baby. I don't actually remember it, but this is my mom's description of what happened. So when I was around two years old, I got really sick after spending time at my mom's friend's house. However, whenever my mom would carry me to a hospital, the doctors wouldn't be able to find anything wrong, and the fever would be gone. So anyway, this went on for almost a week. I never got any better. My mom was worried that I would pass away because I started to lose weight. She checked on me in the hospital and just took me to another one, but the same thing would happen. She tried various hospitals, spending thousands of dollars with no results. After which, she called my grandpa with tears in her eyes telling him what was happening. He said that well, she should take me up to see him in Jamaica. Herbal medicine is very much in the culture, so that was what he wanted to try. But he would be in for shock. My mom brought me to spend time with him. He bathed and took care of me, after which I was put to bed. Things started getting crazy. My mom heard Grandpa screaming, Get out! Get out of here! He was chasing something through the house in broad daylight. He chased the ghost out of the house who was a young boy. He was playing with me as a baby. That's why I said in previous posts that when other entities interact with people physically, in particular children, can make them sick, even if they don't mean for them to get sick. Jamaican elders are known for dealing with such things, especially the Indian ones, which my grandpa was. He performed some sort of ritual to which I never got sick again after. So to conclude, if you see your child getting sick with no reason given by the doctors, try taking them to a church or someone high in spirituality. Of course, make sure you do conventional doctors first. And for those of you who don't know, entities can appear in the day as well as night. The Jinn Who Taught Me Sorcery That summer my father fell ill, and I, as the eldest son, went out to pasture the sheep. 
That night the moon was very bright, and the stars weren't visible. It was very hot, and I was lying in the grass. Suddenly I heard a noise, and I got up and looked around. When I opened my eyes in the darkness, there was silence all around me. There were no bird song, no breeze of the wind. I could only hear a slight rustling in the grass. I felt a shiver run up through me. I realized that something was moving in the grass. For a moment I saw a shadow moving toward me in the darkness, but then it disappeared. My heart was beating wildly. I looked around, but I couldn't see anything. Only the rustling of the shadow was ringing in my ears. I immediately stood up and ran toward the herd. I remembered the stories of jinns and thought that jinns were following me. I knew I was scaring myself for nothing, but there was nothing I could do. I lived with this fear throughout the night, looking at the herd and listening to the surroundings. I fell asleep while the animals were grazing. When I woke up, the sun was coming up. The fear inside me was still there. I gathered the herd and went home. But when I got home, I realized something was wrong. The door had been left open. A foggy silhouette stood in front of the door. I couldn't see his face. I felt cold inside, but I walked toward the house anyway. He approached me and said in a thin voice, Shepard, I watched you and admired your courage. There's something I must tell you. It's our territory and you must not stay there too long, otherwise no one can protect you. I couldn't respond to his words. My heart was beating like crazy. The jinn smiled at me and continued. I like brave people like you. Maybe I'll give you a chance. I can teach you something. But you must be loyal to me and do what I say. Hearing these words, my fear increased. But my curiosity was aroused. What was this jinn going to teach me? The jinn touched my shoulder and said, Think for a night before you decide. Don't disobey me, otherwise you'll regret it. Then he disappeared in mist, and from that day on I dreamt of him every night. He said he was teaching me sorcery, but he was also watching me. For several days I thought about the Jin's offer. Every night in my dreams he taught me spells and promised to give me power, but I began to feel uncomfortable with his presence. One night in my dream he cast a very powerful spell on me. While I was casting the spell, a dark fog surrounded me and scary creatures appeared. The jinn frightened me and took control of me. It was hurting me a lot and I had to get rid of it. I don't know how to resist the power of the jinn. I researched how to protect myself and found some methods against jinns. I was ready now and I wanted to confront it, but I realized I was wrong. I never saw him again except in dreams. Maybe the first day I saw him was also a dream, but I can't remember exactly. Maybe it was all imagination. My father's illness had gotten worse and the doctors couldn't understand what was happening. I thought it might have something to do with the spell the jinn had cast on me, but I couldn't be sure. One night I went out to graze the sheep again. The jinn appeared. This time he looked scarier. His face was like black smoke and he was sneaking toward me and he said, Don't you want to serve me? I looked at him with my eyes trembling with fear and I said no inside. But the jinn's power overpowered me. I began to do his bidding. I fearfully submitted to his spell. My days were filled with what he taught me in his dreams. One night in my dream the jinn took me on his back took me around. The whole place was covered in a dark fog and horrible creatures roamed around. The jinn told me their names. I can't remember them now. In fear and terror, I continued to do the jinn's bidding. I didn't know how to save myself. My days and nights were filled with nightmares. The stress had worn me out and I could no longer tolerate people. I was talking to my friends and they told me about jinn's. They said they had seen me grazing sheep in the evening and that something had happened to me. I got angry and asked them to change the subject. Sir Hot laughed at me and said, Are you scared? A man's not afraid. Let me come with you one night and graze sheep. I replied, What could happen? Let him come along. We had agreed earlier to meet in front of the fountain, and when I returned home, my mother prepared some food for me. I gathered the sheep 
set off after a while, and I saw Sir Hot near the fountain. We went into the fields to graze the sheep, and after a while it got quiet. Sir Hot suddenly stopped and said that this was a dangerous place, that we should be careful. We kept walking in fear, and I felt that something was going on around us. Our sheep started to get cranky, and some of them tried to run away. Suddenly I saw a being following us in the darkness. A being with glowing eyes was chasing us. Sir Hot picked up and ran away to gather the sheep while I tried to go back. But the being with the glowing eyes started to follow me in the dark. I told you we shouldn't have stayed here, Sir Hot shouted. Finally, the being with the glowing eyes grabbed me and said, You will be my servant and obey my commands. Unable to control myself in the fear and terror, I realized that I was now under its control. I felt like I was being pulled into a dark world and I couldn't find a way out of it. When I came to, it was just getting light and there was no sign of the sheep. I was shocked to see the sheep lying lifeless on the village road. Sir Hot was lying among them, and his face was mutilated. There was the smell of carcasses around. I couldn't stand it, and I had to vomit because I started to feel nauseous. When I was done, I ran to inform the villagers. The villagers were stunned by the horrible incident. Everybody was wondering how the sheep had died, and how Sir Hot had become like this. Some people claimed that there was a supernatural force behind this terrible event. After a few days, strange things started happening in the village. A woman's voice was heard screaming in the middle of the night. Some villagers said that Sir Hot's ghost was haunting the village. The rest claimed that the source of the voice was Sir Hot's mother. Indeed, the poor woman had collapsed after the funeral. Every time I passed by their house, she would look at me with disgust. It was obvious that she blamed me for her son's death. If I had let her mock me, there would have been no need for me to prove myself to her. My father and mother were also very upset when the sheep perished. The only source of income for our household had suddenly disappeared. My father's health deteriorated a little bit more with this news. Although my mother didn't show it to me, I could see that she blamed me in her heart. If I had been a little more careful, Sir Hot would have lived and the sheep wouldn't have perished. Sometime after these events, the jinn started to enter my dreams again. I'm very angry with you, Shepard. It was too dangerous for you to even come to that area if you brought your friend. How can I trust you now? I was filled with anger as the voice of the jinn echoed in my ears. I will teach you to protect yourself, he said, and his bright eyes glittered behind their black clusters. I don't remember what happened, but I never felt the same again. A few days later I returned to that land, the wind carrying the rustle of the grass to my ears and the fear inside me vanished. I was no longer afraid of anything. From that day on he came into my dreams every night and taught me how to cast spells. One of the spells was to heal my father. I wasn't sure if he tricked me or not, but I was ready to try anything to make my father healthy again. After a while, I noticed that my father was getting better day by day. He was getting better so fast that the doctors noticed the change immediately. In those days, the headman brought us some sheep. He said he would give us their offering, excuse me, offspring, if we kept them for him. Suddenly, everything became even better than before. The Jin woman in my dreams was always teaching me new spells. I was so excited that I tried them out and went on like that for a while. Then everything became more horrible. One night when the woman came into my dream again, I saw the dark silhouette that appeared right behind her and I woke up in fear. After that night, I never saw the woman again. It didn't take me long to realize that I was being haunted by a different djinn. I told you to obey my command. Now you're completely under it. There's no way to get rid of me couldn't hide you from me forever. That day I realized I was haunted by two different jinns. One wanted to protect me from the other, but the evil one had somehow defeated him. My father's health started to deteriorate again and I felt so helpless. I tried
tried my spells, but this time they didn't work. In the middle of the night, with my arms crossed, I thought, this is the end for you. I will not set you free. At that moment, the door of the room flew open and a bright light flooded in. The woman who had saved me from the clutches of the evil jinn reappeared and she said, I will save you. Cast a powerful spell that will destroy the dark jinn. This time, my father's health really began to improve, and I happily continued to practice what she had taught me. But the fear of the evil jinn reappearing always haunted me. One night when I was asked him, or excuse me, one night when I asked him about it, he told me that I had been going to that pasture since I was a child, that I was attracted to them, and that they were trying to use me to serve them. At first, this was his intention too, but then he took pity on me and wanted to help me. My fear increased even more after I learned this. After that day, he didn't enter my dreams for a while. I continued to cast spells to heal my father, and soon he recovered completely. That year, the sheep gave birth in pairs. We had twice as many lambs as the sheep at that. Thanks to the headman, he wanted to help us without embarrassing us and found such a remedy. Before I turned 18, I married a girl found by my family. We lost a baby in the first year of my marriage. I didn't want to resort to sorcery again, but my wife was very upset about it. It was eating me up inside. I knew I was sinning. But whatever you say, the child at that time was right. We welcomed our first child with the help of the woman in my dream. As the fear of something happening to my child grew every day, I realized even more that I had to stay away from spells. I told her I would never cast a spell again. She refused. When he said that he would take the child back, I realized that I had to get rid of the village and him somehow. With the support of my fathers, I moved to Mirsin, where I started working at a car wash. After learning the business, I opened a shop for myself and improved my business in a short time. With the good news of my wife's second baby, I cleared my head and moved to my father's in a house closer to us in Mirsin. All of my siblings studied and saved themselves. Sometimes that jinn comes into my dreams. I feel that she's angry, but I keep the realm away from them with the spells that she taught me. Sometimes my daughters talk about a woman calling them, and this worries me a lot. It was late that I realized that she had tricked me with spells and that they were all bad from the beginning. But it was too late. He passed away a month ago, and he now visits me all the time. A little background. Right before we broke up, I gave him an ultimatum which was either make a real effort to change by leaving his triggers behind and work toward battering himself emotionally, mentally, physically, and professionally, which I support, or respect that this is not the life I want and it's time that we end things. He gave me the most honest answer any addict could give, which was, I want to change, but I can't promise you I can, and I understand where you're coming from, and I'll respect your wishes. As hard as it was to end things, we did. And at this time, I was living a hundred miles away from him because I was in college. And though we had a lot of his property in my apartment, he stayed with his parents because he had a bar job near their home, which really was where he would get drugs. He drove down to have this conversation, but it was right after midnight when he arrived. I asked him to take his cat home gave him my ring, said I would pack his stuff and arrange for him to come and pick it up. He agreed. We cuddled for about 30 minutes, talked a bit. He then grabbed his cat and left. One of the last things I told him before he left was to never let me get the call that he died. He laughed, told me that that would never happen. After that, I never saw him again. His mom called me a few days later and said that he went into an inpatient care. She then stated that she and his father would be coming down to grab his stuff when I was ready for them to do so. 
His family and I got along wonderfully, and we still do, so I was happy to have them come down, and we arranged for it to happen a couple of weeks later. When they came down, I helped them move his items out. As I was loading their truck, his mom and I were talking, and she thanked me for everything, as well as reiterated that she didn't blame me one bit for leaving. She prayed that he would get clean and live a full life, to which I agreed. I told her, I don't ever want to get back with him, but I want to see him live a happy, full life and hope that we could at best be friends again. Time passed and we both moved on. I met an incredible man at school, whom I'm still with today. He met another sweet woman, whom he had a kid with. Sadly, they didn't work out, and however, he dated multiple sweet ladies, including the sweet lady he was with when he passed. I would periodically get texts from him over the years, and though I would reply, I was definitely not the talker between the two of us. I never wanted to give him false hope that we would get back together. In addition, I would hear through the grapevine periodically that he was still using, which his pictures on social media supported because I could see it on his face and in his eyes. This is where things got weird. On Friday, December 16th, I got the call I always feared. A friend from Hawaii, where we lived for four to six years we were together, called me. Called me to tell me he overdosed and he was in a coma. What was crazy was that I turned off my Facebook Messenger notices a few weeks earlier because I was getting so many notifications, yet before this call came in, his brother and sister-in-law tried to message me on there. I, of course, lost it. A friend said he was flying out to stay with his family to go see him in the hospital. So I told him we'll talk more when he gets here. The next day, our Hawaii friend texted me to tell me, well, he was coming in on Monday. Said his mom said there was no sign of brain activity, but they had more tests to run yet. It was this night when things started to get weird. I woke up at around 2.30 a.m. from a dead sleep and I felt him leave. It was a feeling I never felt before and I knew right there and then that he was gone. I knew he was not coming back. The next day I called a few other people who we knew in Hawaii that we didn't know. Well, rather that they didn't know what had happened. You know, to tell them that he was in a coma and we were sure that he wasn't going to make it. As I was talking to one of our other mutual friends, I suddenly felt I was about to get that call that he was officially dead. Within two to three minutes I had another call come in. It was my ex-brother-in-law. I answered and said, Is this that call? mumbled through his tears, yeah, I'm so sorry, sweetheart. I said, okay, thank you, I love you. He told me he loved me too, and we hung up. That night I woke up at 3.30 a.m. from a dead sleep, and I heard his laugh clear as day in the living room. He had a very unique laugh that I could recognize anywhere. I couldn't go back to sleep, I was in tears. I knew he was there. Later that day, my boyfriend and I started to pack for a trip we were getting ready to go on. It was the following week for Christmas. My boyfriend had his Spotify on, and eventually, it started to play random songs that were similar to his playlist. Three of my favorite songs that my ex would play, when he was a musician, they came on in a row. It tripped me out so much that I went and restarted the playlist midway through the third song. The next day, I went to the store to grab a couple of last-minute gifts and toiletries for a trip. As I was in the store, the same three songs that were played the day before, in the same order, mind you, started to play. When the third song came on, I dropped my items and left. That night, I woke up from a dead sleep at 3.30 a.m., but this time, it was because I felt someone sitting on the end of the bed. And I knew he was there, and I didn't go back to sleep. The next day, my boyfriend and I flew out of our holiday trip, landed in Vegas because it was the closest airport to our destination. I'd never been to Vegas, so we toured the, toured the whole strip before departing to our exact destination. I was having so much fun and getting lost in life. Then guess what starts playing in one of the casinos? The same three songs in the same order. I was completely freaked out. I couldn't believe it. 
things settled for about a week, with the exception of waking up every night at 3.30 a.m. precisely. This time, though, I wouldn't hear, sense, or see anything. I would just wake up. The day we were getting ready to head home, my boyfriend's brother was driving us to the airport. Guess what comes on the radio? The same three songs in the same frickin' order. By this point, I already accepted that it was him. His funeral was the day after we got home, which I went to. His family was happy to see me, our friend from Hawaii was happy I was there, and many of our mutual friends were there. They were very happy to see me too. All and all, I was glad I went, but it was hard. A couple of nights where I slept through the night, and then he started to appear in my dreams. The first couple I shrugged off as my grief third time he appeared in my dream, I couldn't dismiss it as grief. He kept telling me that I need to try hard cider with whiskey, as we sat in a recording studio with two of our other friends who passed years prior. I kept trying to tell a group outside of the room something through a loudspeaker, but kept getting interrupted by my ex and our other deceased friends. When I woke up, I couldn't stop thinking about the drink. I reached out to my friend from Hawaii who was staying on my ex's family's farm later in the day. I asked him without any context, Do you all have a thing with hard cider with whiskey? He laughed and was like, Yeah, why? This wasn't a thing I knew about, and it was definitely not a thing when my ex and I were together, so I was mind-fucked, but I was like, okay. After this, I started to wake up every night at 3.30 a.m. until last night. Last night, I had the craziest dream of them all. My ex and I were in this random hotel room in Vegas talking. He then started to ask about my current boyfriend, but not in a way that was uncomfortable, more like he wanted to know more. I told him how happy he and I were, and that I think that we're the best thing that ever happened to each other. He smiled and told me he was happy for me, and that all he wanted was for me to be happy. I asked him if well, I would lay down and cuddle with him, though. I said I would, but nothing sexual, because it's not fair to my boyfriend. He said okay, and we did. He whispered in my ear and told me that he'll always love me, always be happy, never give up, and change the world, and then I woke up. Today has been rather crazy been presented with three incredible opportunities out of the blue, one academic and two professional, all of which I'm considering and taking the next steps to apply for all of which would allow me to build my life-saving research project. In addition, I got a random message on LinkedIn from someone asking me if my current employer is hiring, which I verified they are, I didn't want to leave my current employer stranded, and I moved on to bigger and better things. I can't say if it was him or if it was all in my head, but somehow I feel a sense of peace. I know that he always cared for me and I always cared for him, but we were on two different paths in this world. I don't feel scared and I no longer feel alone. I have my best friend back and I have part of my old group back. They're just spirits, which I'm totally okay with, and in some ways almost happier about it because they're always there. I know some may dismiss this, but maybe my story will bring a sense of peace to others. Death is not the end. It is just another form of life. I don't truly understand it, but I do not fear it. All I know is that having my spirit homies is badass. And though it sucks that they died, I'm glad that they're around me. Ask Reddit. I worked for my local news station as a low entry level position. Running sound for live shows, operating cameras, master control in between live shows. About two years prior to this, I had a run in with what I've come to know as the Illuminati. The simplest way I can think of describing this thing is that it must be some sort of interdimensional criminal syndicate. Maybe their specialty is civilization seizure and control control is gained once you dominate a percentage of the mass consciousness. Anyway, I encountered the Illuminati when I worked briefly in LA doing film stuff. 
which was the experience that essentially allowed me to simply walk into news media jobs without having the school credentials. So, things are semi-getting back to normal after I was put through some trials and consequences of declining an offer or contract while I was in Hollywood. Ditto. Some pretty dire consequences that I believe I only lived through because I had earned God's favor somehow and earned some divine protection. Don't ask me how I earned that protection, but the only thing I can think of is that I was essentially the purest soul among those people I worked with. And the people I previously worked with must have been deep into some pretty dark stuff. I already had a rough idea from the conversations and the locker room talk that they had together. But I was always an outsider. I must not have broken any big laws or committed much sin, but at the time I had no earthly idea what sin even was. But somehow God had intervened and delivered me from Los Angeles. Three years later, estimated, having sat down to really iron out my timeline, I'm one year into my job at a news station, which was essentially, well, I guess a dead end. At least morally for me, because the longer I was there, the less and less I found purpose. I didn't believe in anything I was doing, and this only became more apparent when I started learning more about the values and morals of everyone I worked with. I feel ya. Meaning everybody I worked with was more or less dead, spiritually. There were perhaps one or two people that I felt had a strong sense of soul, but otherwise they were all dead. This began to have quite the effect on me, and somehow I became dead again and have forgotten everything that God had done for me. What I was delivered from in Los Angeles. I ended up reaching out to a former friend who was still closely associated with the undesirables I'd worked with in LA, unaware at the time that they, well, they sort of had this hold over him unknowing that they very well could have attempted to corrupt me again through my friend. I took a road trip to see this old friend, and we went to a concert together. He gave me some drugs to enjoy the concert with, made weird comments about his drug source being the FBI, saying things like, What do you mean to tell me you don't have an FBI guy? Lame jokes, most likely. But that evening at the concert was just bizarre. In the heightened state, I sensed I was being monitored. Most notably, there was one very odd fellow sitting right next to my friend and me. They seemed to have quite the interest in us. The guy was completely alone and didn't even seem to be interested in the music whatsoever, but his attention seemed to be fixed on my friend and I. My friend sensed my suspicions, although I never spoke them out loud. Then things just began to get very strange, and I felt as though I was under some sort of psychic attack. This is probably the hardest part to explain, but bizarre things just seemed to start happening from that point forward. I began to sense a number of people in the audience that just didn't belong. Loners spread out among the stadium with no real purpose in enjoying music, but were clearly up to something else. I theorize I was given some sort of experimental drug and was observed along with who knows how many others that night into our reaction to various stimuli responses. A study of sorts with implications and whose ends I wish not to know, although I'm pretty sure we all know. Fast forward about a month after this. I think I experienced some sort of flashback or suffered a delayed response to the chemical agent I was given set off with some sort of external trigger. Out of nowhere, one night when I was out of work, some dude on the sidewalk approached saying something about my shirt. Can't recall exactly what he said, but it was something really lame, like, Hey, that's MK Ultra, isn't it? Whatever, dude. Never saw him again, but weird events and people started approaching me on a scale that I've never much experienced in 20 years alive before that. In one week, I would have people coming up to me starting weird conversations when I would go years without anybody so much as looking in my direction. I suppose I was the recipient of something I've come to learn as gang stalking, or the targeted individual program. People would be following me everywhere to remote places I would often go beforehand for the very purpose of getting away from people. 
This all started to accelerate, until something happened one day when I realized how pointless my current path is. Any path, really, but especially the one I was currently on. The news was one big elaborate joke. Nobody was who they pretended to be, and they certainly didn't believe anything they were trying to get others to believe. My news anchors would put on sad faces and talk about horrific events or even the plain ordinary ones. And when their microphones shut off, they would mock the people they pretended to care about. Nobody said anything, nobody cared. It was all one big ritual until everybody was laughing at the same jokes. Jokes about people and very visible suffering or discomfort. I had had enough of sickness, decided I had to be somewhere very urgently. Another thing that's impossible to describe, but I was on my way home when I saw a sweet homeless lady on a corner who I'd met a few weeks prior. I bought her and her boyfriend some lunch and briefly heard her story, and I, well, I knew when I saw her I was meant to give her something. She smiled at me on the corner and I just emptied my pockets, gave her my phone and wallet and told her, you gotta keep this for me, I'm not allowed to use these right now. She asked me if everything was okay, but I knew I was about to face some trials. Her eyes looked saddened, but at the same time as though they knew what I was about to do. God had summoned me, and I dared not miss the call. What I just started to describe in the last paragraph happened in the middle of summer. Record-breaking heat, so they say. I had just the clothes on my back when I started walking to the desert and received some visions of utter destruction. I took off my shirt, and I can't recall if I had my shoes on or not, but I was pleading to God or just to let me suffer and not subject anybody else to what was to come. Left my shirt under the shade of the only tree nearby and just started walking. It didn't take long, but I began to feel as though I was about to pass out, and I did. I woke up with my face in the sand. My mouth was dry to the point I never wished to experience again. I was defeated, and I thought I was being prepared to die. About a mile ahead of me was a native man wearing black plastic trash bags as a shirt, who I kept trying to catch up with kept slipping farther and farther away. I think he was maybe a sort of spirit guide or something because if he hadn't have caught my attention, I wouldn't have discovered what, well, what might have brought me some valuable time. I eventually turned around and found a storm pipe, rested and found shade. No idea how long I was in direct sunlight after I'd passed out, but it must have been a while. I started to have difficulty breathing. My mouth was completely dry, and each minute I felt the coarse dryness start to extend down my throat. I knew I needed water, and I was about a quarter mile from the highway gas station, so I started walking. The last twenty feet or so were the most difficult. It was one shaded tree surrounded by a patch of grass that must have been for travelers and truckers. I knew this gas station as I had passed by it all the time on an old commute to work, but I don't know how I made it. The closer I got, the more weak I became, and my feet were on fire and my mouth and lips were beginning to seal themselves shut. literally felt my lips peel and tear, and when I attempted to open my mouth, it was just whatever I was about. Well, it just felt like the air it was only let in, only accelerating this dryness and choking my throat. Somebody was waiting for me at the tree, with a single gallon of water, and it was ice cold. He asked me some questions, and I felt as though he was telepathically extracting information from me. He wanted me to answer some questions first before he would give me water, and then he said I could have it. I think he was trying to extract some sort of blueprint or design that I had just seen before this all started, maybe even a day or two before it. But the last thing I remember about this man was that he called me by my last name, told me I should go back to that tree to get my shirt pretty sure it was verbatim. If I were you, mister, I would go find that shirt. I was convinced at the time that the only way that person could have known I would have, well, that I could make it to that tree is if they would teleport or time travel. It must have had some sort of implant or tracking device on me as well. I saw something at a shrine in rural Japan. 
This has been bugging me for a few years now. And as I use Reddit mainly to look up video game help and gifts of animals being derps, I would gladly repost this somewhere else if it doesn't belong here. I'll give some background, but the real question comes in at the fifth paragraph if you'd like to skip to that. No thank you. I will read all of it. About three years ago, my girlfriend at the time and myself took a two-week long trip to Japan. The original plan was to visit her grandmother, a survivor of the atomic bomb dropped in Hiroshima. Her dad's family and, well, take a much-needed vacation from a job that really could care less about me. Her father, who had moved to the U.S. in his teens, had always asked about my family history. As a fourth-generation Japanese-American with no remaining family in the first or second generations, most of my family history had been lost with the deceased. I would ask my father and his cousins, you know, about where our family was from and if we had any relatives back in Japan, but the answers I would get would be vague at best. I'd get answers like, your great-grandfather and eldest granduncle went back to Japan to help rebuild after the war, and that it was thought that we were from the Hiroshima area. No one in my remaining family sought to keep in contact with those who went back. So my ex's father would spend his free time doing research and share information that he could dig up about my family. He found that my family originated in the Wakayama, a city just south of Kobe and Osaka. And what the kanji for my last name looks like. Unfortunately, before we could make the trip, my ex's grandmother had passed away after a long fight with cancer. Eventually, the time came for us to spend some time in Japan, touring everywhere from Osaka to Tokyo all the way down to Yamaguchi and Hiroshima. We spent most of our vacation bouncing from hotel to hotel in major cities, sightseeing places like Tokyo Sky Tree and, the, you know, the deer that bow in Nara. Being the nerd that I'm forced, you know, sort of, well, being a nerd, rather, I forced us to make stops to see the Unicorn Gundam and Akihabara. My ex had a little bit, well, to say it nicely, she had no interest in, totally worth it in my opinion, and I agree, a Gundam, that's cool. Our trip finished off with a long Shinkansen, or a bullet train. That was a ride to Hiroshima, where we would spend an early morning seeing some of the buildings that were still standing after the A-bomb and the World War II Museum. After that, we would take a trip into the rural areas outside of the city to stay at her grandparents' home where we would meet her uncles and their family who took care of us for the rest of the trip. Her uncle picked us up from the end line, which both the train and the station were pretty run down, took us by car a few more hours to Max's grandparents' home. By the time we arrived, we were able to unpack and get situated with some daylight left to kill before we'd get dinner. Now, if you've ever been to rural Japan, go. It's awesome as the homes that are there, they look like something out of an old samurai movie. They're, well, they could possibly be uninhabited and look, you know, like they belong in a horror movie. So I suggested we walk around a bit to stretch our legs as we've been traveling most of the day. She agreed and we began walking down the narrow country roads. As we were walking, occasionally jumping across deep gutters to allow cars to pass, she tells me about an old shrine that sits atop a hill at the edge of a forest that she had visited with her grandparents years ago. Before I get any further into this, I feel it's important to mention that my ex is extremely superstitious, and I'm not. I also consider myself to be fairly perceptive, some may say paranoid, compared to her. Habitually, I'll notice things that are out of place, or for lack of a better term, feel when something is off. Mostly these things come into play when I'm outside and I can spot hidden animals or edible plants back home. That being said, I don't go looking for trouble in the realm of shit I can't explain, just in case. But I figure exploring should be fun, and still light out, I'm in a rural town that I'll probably never visit again and I've always craved adventure. 
I was thinking it'll be like the beginning of a video game. So about 20 minutes into our little exploration, we come to a large, unpainted and rotted tori. Those large, orange Japanese gateways, I'm sure you've seen. I thought they were red. Maybe a couple hundred stairs leading uphill into a forest where the shrine is located. Staring up the steps, something felt off. But I figured it was just the nervous excitement of exploring. I have a fairly athletic build, but my ex was a bit on the chubby side, so as we were making the climb up, she told me she needed a break, but to go ahead as she could tell I was excited. Double-checking to make sure she was okay, you know, with me going on without her, I continued to race up the stairway. Once I reached the top, the sun had begun to set, painting the clearing on the top of the hill in a beautiful orange hue. There were a couple of decrepit buildings atop the hill, the shrine which had been locked up and the path cleared of fallen leaves which seemed out of place that led deeper into the forest. This is where things started to feel outright wrong. The first thing I noticed was that at some point it became eerily quiet. No cicadas, no birds, not even a breeze rustling the branches in the forest. I cautiously walked around, looking between the boards that made up the walls of the shrine, trying my best to wait for my ex to catch up. That's when I heard it. If it hadn't been so quiet, I probably wouldn't have noticed, but on the other side of the hill across from the stairs, a quick rustle of dead leaves on the ground behind the shrine. I quickly focused my attention in that direction. I peeked around the corner of the shrine. Out of the corner of my eye, I caught a glimpse of movement. Calling out, Hello! I made my way over back to the shrine and looked down the hill, hoping it wasn't a person who slipped and fell. Nothing. I scanned the small valley, calling out, Hello, anyone there? And in hindsight, probably should have called out in Japanese. Duh. The forest remained still. After a few moments, I relaxed, thinking a branch had fallen and I was just being paranoid. Then off to the left of where I was looking, more rustling leaves. I caught another glimpse of it. It was big, maybe five or six feet long, pure white and ungodly fast. There was no way I would have missed something that large or white when I was looking down the valley. It seemed to just appear out of nowhere. Quickly it bolted behind a small bush and a tree growing next to each other and again there was only silence. Without breaking eye contact, I called out for my ex, hoping she was close to the top of the stairs and could verify what I saw. Nothing. I could verify, well, like I said, nothing, so I just called for her again. Still nothing. So I waited, my gaze fixated on the bush and the tree that whatever this thing was slid behind. I debated whether I should throw something toward it, but I was way too unfamiliar with Japan's wildlife to feel safe enough to do so. I didn't want to piss off something I couldn't take in a fight. Waiting for my ex to peek over the staircase, I was fixated on the bush, hoping I could identify whatever that thing was. As my nerves calmed, I came to realize that something that large and white couldn't completely hide in a bush that small. Feeling really uncomfortable, I slowly backed away from the edge of the hill and went to find my ex. She was about 20 steps from the top when I told her we needed to leave, and that I had seen something. The look she gave me was one of doubt, as she went behind the shrine to look and saw nothing. She continued to look around for a few minutes when she said that we could leave as we made our way back down the stairs. As we descended the hill, I could feel something watching us, stalking us even. We made our way back through the town down the narrow, dimly lit roads and I'd occasionally look behind us and into the surrounding areas, hoping that it wasn't some predator preparing to attack. After returning to her grandparents' house, we ate dinner with her family and went to bed. That whole night I couldn't sleep. I could still feel something watching us feeling that it carried with me until we left the town. After returning home, I began trying to look up animals in Japan that would fit the description of what I saw. When I realized that there was pretty much nothing that matched the description of what I could find, I started investigating more paranormal entities. Still, I couldn't find anything. 
If anyone knows what this thing may have been, I would appreciate it. It's haunted me for three years and made me nervous about exploring, which I'd like to be comfortable enough to do again someday. My terrifying ghost story that you'll all think is funny, but it's not. I'm now 50. I'm an electrical and electronics engineer, so I have a particular way of observing things, thinking about them and explaining them. When I go on a job, I have to approach it logically and methodically, work out what's really happening by testing, measuring, and observing. So I'm not taken to flights of fancy, and to this end, I actually don't believe in ghosts. Even to this day, with my experience, I can't bring myself to overcome my years of training and my experience to believe in something that I can't explain. I think orbs and photos are obviously illuminated dust close to the lens. I think EVP is whatever somebody wants to hear, and psychics are common and women. Excuse me, are con men and women. Sus. Or you just mean women are generally psychic, to which I agree. I'm also not religious or spiritual. I think once you're gone, that's it. You're gone. This is my initial experience. I brushed it off originally. And then my reassessment when my dad told me his story. This is 100% genuine, and when it happened, it terrified me, but when I tell anybody, they think it's funny or some kind of joke. I had put it totally behind me, but my dad, who's now well into his 70s, told me something recently that made me question whether I'm kind of fooling myself. I just don't know what to think anymore. So here I am, and here is the story. In 1985, which was my exam year, we moved house from an old Victorian terrace into a new house. It was new, built maybe 15 years earlier, in old friends. Or, on old fields. This is rural England, no Indian burial grounds, old graveyards. Early English or Roman graves or anything silly like that. It was pasture fields for cows. Always had been and nothing else. When we moved in, I was like 15, youngest in my year at school. Everything was great. Over time, I'd go through spells where I'd wake up feeling like I was being pushed into the bed or wake up from a deep sleep. I sleep really deep and never remember my dreams. While having a great dream, too, and feeling instantly afraid like there was something dark, otherwise known as evil, in the room. Lots of stuff like this. It would go on for a few weeks and then nothing, a couple of months later, would start all over again. I went to the library, bought books, talked to people, and yeah, this was, if you can imagine it, before the internet. I can. I came to the conclusion that it was sleep paralysis or something along these lines because it always happened when I was either asleep or just about to fall asleep. This went on for ages. And one night when I was about 22, 23, I was working 6 a.m. to 2 p.m., then 2 p.m. to 10 p.m. I'd be on the evening shift. By the time I got home, it was about 11 p.m. My usual thing was to watch junk TV for a couple of hours and sort of kind of wind down. While doing this, have a snack, have a few cups of tea, then go back to bed at 2 a.m.-ish. So there I am watching TV. Mom and Dad have gone to bed, and the only door into the room is right by my right-hand side. There's big gardens to the front and the rear room. No one there but me. I'm looking at an angle to my left watching TV, and suddenly to my right I hear someone fart. This is where people start laughing, but I swear it isn't a joke, and I wasn't laughing. In the split second it took my head to turn from the TV to the sound of the farting, I'd already come to the conclusion. My mom or dad must have walked into the room and farted. That's ludicrous for all manner of reasons. 
first their old school English, if they dropped one in public, they'd die of embarrassment. Second, there'd be no reason for them to walk into that room unless they were going to sit and watch TV. And third, the door at my side was definitely and firmly closed still. I have to admit the hairs on the back of my neck stood up because I was sure I'd heard it. But hey, I'm an engineer working in fields involving sound systems. And since no one's there, and therefore no one can have farted, I must have imagined it. What was the sound on the TV program? So I gingerly started watching TV again, even though I was a bit uncomfortable. I don't know how much later it was, 5, 10, 20 minutes later, I must have taken a sip of my cup of tea and completely forgotten about what happened. I hear it again from the same place, but this time I don't know if it's louder or clearer or if I was more edgy, but this time I am 100% sure that I definitely heard it. This is not some sound on the TV or my imagination. I turn and look again and there's nothing there, but now the hairs on the back of my neck are really standing. And as I sat there wondering what the hell just happened, within a couple of seconds max, the smell appeared. It was vile. Can't even describe it. It wasn't a fart smell, but you could, well, ever smell a smell that made you think the thing that did this wants to hurt you? That was the smell. Dumped my tea onto the coffee table, spun around and opened the door, shot out of it, just shutting it behind me, ran to my room and sat there all night with the light on saying the Lord's Prayer. And I'm not religious. I don't believe in a God. Freaked me out that much. Over the last 30 years, I've played it down and down in my mind to the conclusion that it can't have happened. Ghosts don't exist, and that's what I've stuck with. Till a few weeks ago, and now I'm not sure at all. What happened is, is that my mom and dad moved from that house to an even newer one, about 10 years old. My dad's been ill with pneumonia, and since he's up coughing and sputtering all night, he's in one room, my mom's in the other. One night, my mom's asleep. She feels someone prodding her arm over and over. She assumes it's my dad who isn't feeling well and is trying to wake her up. In her sleepy state, she says, Yes, what do you want? No answer. What do you want? No answer. And the prodding carries on. She wakes up and says, What do you want? When she looks, there's an old woman stood there, prodding her arm. Mom freaks out, hides underneath the covers. When she gathers the courage to look, no one's there. Wakes up Dad, they go downstairs, turn the alarm off. Downstairs only. No one there. Search the house, no one there. Freaky bit. I think my mom's imagining things and jokingly say to my dad a couple of weeks later, Hey, maybe it's the ghost from the old house that's following you. He says, No, we didn't bring her with us. So I say, What do you mean by her? Well, it was an old woman. How do you mean? I saw her. Turns out he'd seen a ghost at the old house plain as day. He actually thought he'd left the front door unlocked and somebody had wandered in. He was sat in the kitchen, the door opened, and she was stood looking at him. She turned around, literally a 90 degree turn, and walked into the living room where I had my experience. He followed her in, one door in, nowhere to hide, no one there. He'd always told me that he'd seen things out of the corner of his eye, but thought he must be imagining it, but never this. Talked to my sister, who moved out maybe five years before all this, and she said, Oh yeah, he told me that years ago, but he didn't say anything to you because he thought you and Mom would be scared and wouldn't want to move house couldn't afford to. So there I am, thinking I'm going mad, deciding I'm imagining things, and all my blinking dad had seen it and knew it was real. So, what does this mean? Was it a ghost? Do ghosts exist? Never had another experience since I moved out, and I still can't bring myself to accept it was a ghost over some other more rational explanation. I mean, why would a blinking ghost fart? And how could it? 
After 50 years, I can't accept ghosts are real and there isn't always a logical scientific explanation, even if it isn't obvious. I believe in the ghost fart. Smelling is believing. I think a ghost may have been trying to save me from an abusive relationship. I've been watching ghost footage compilations for days. It's spooky season, and it's been making me think about my own ghost experiences. In my late teens, it happened almost non-stop, and now in my thirties, I never experienced more than the rare door opening on its own, which I often explain away as being a draft. It's been such a harsh juxtaposition that these days I wonder if what I experienced back then was even real. But when I really sit here and I think through, I think a ghost may have been trying to save my life. When I was 19, I became friends with a guy named Thomas. We went for a long midnight drive listening to music. We had the same sense of humor and for a few weeks we spent all of our free time together. One day he admitted that he'd had a crush on me all through high school, which surprised me because he was a jockey guy who had run with the popular crowd and I was the quintessential 2011 emo kid who ate lunch in classrooms by myself. Thomas was not the usual type or even mine. He was six foot one and over 200 pounds, had a linebacker build. I was five foot five and 105 pounds, normally dated small skater dudes. But even now, personality and a sense of humor matters to me way more than a physical type. And we hit it off, so naturally we started to date. Days before we became official, I slept over at his house. He hadn't confessed to me yet, so we slept on one side of the sectional and I slept on the other. For the first time ever, I had sleep paralysis. It was the most vivid dream I'd ever experienced. In the corner of Thomas's living room, twisted, bloody people were having sex and cutting each other. They were watching me, watching them, smiling. I stared in horror before my body jolted awake, and as soon as my eyes opened, I heard, Get out! whispered directly into my ear. I had been facing the back of the couch, sleeping on my side, and I rolled over to see if someone was there. Thomas's dad was in the kitchen in his underwear, and he yelped when he saw that I was there. I was ready to chalk the entire thing up to just being a dream, but I was distinctly awake when I heard the voice, and Thomas's dad chastised him the next day for not telling me, they were telling him, that, you know, I was going to be there. Because obviously he would have put on clothes before he came out had he known. When I told Thomas about what I'd heard, he didn't respond for a while. Then he said that while he didn't personally believe in ghosts or hauntings, that wasn't the first person he'd had over that said they experienced something strange. After that, I pretty much listened to the entity that I'd heard. I came to Thomas's house during the day, but I didn't stay the night again. In hindsight, I don't think the ghost was just telling me to leave the house. I think it was trying to warn me to run away from Thomas completely. The second we put the boyfriend-girlfriend label on, everything changed. My funny, charming friend became a mean, controlling asshole. And the ghost activity spiked to a point I'd never experienced before. Soon after my sleep paralysis incident at Thomas's house, I had it again in my own. I've always had sleep issues, so I kind of sleep like a freak. I'm a super light sleeper, so I sleep with earplugs and under my pillows to muffle any sound. One morning I was asleep on my back. That's when the dream happened. My eyes were open, but I could only see out of my peripheral vision where my pillow was lifted. I watched the bottom of my bedroom door, and as it opened and bare feet walked into my room, I watched the feet walk to my bed, felt the indent on my bed as she climbed onto it. 
She put her hands on either side of my pillow, her black hair spilling onto the pillows and tickling the exposed side of my face. I could feel her breathing like her face was pressed to the top of the pillow. To this day, it's the only time I've ever woken up screaming. I can't know for sure, but it seemed like whatever spoke to me at Thomas's house had followed me to mine. One day, Thomas was driving me home from work. We were fighting because he was accusing me of fucking my manager. Mind you, this accusation came from me wanting to go to work at ten, ten minutes early. I always went in early because I have a lot of anxiety about being late. I always have. So we were in the car while he yelled at me outside my house and suddenly he stopped mid-yell and stared over me. I looked over to see what he was looking at. We both watched as the curtain of my bedroom slid back into place as if somebody had been holding it open. My heart sank for two reasons. Firstly, because no one was ever home at this time of day. My dad traveled for work and my stepmom had a day job. Secondly, I knew exactly what Thomas's reaction was going to be. He asked who was in my bedroom and angrily demanded that I let him see who was hiding. While I was defensive due to his accusations, I was also terrified and didn't want to go in alone. Thomas tore the place apart and no one was there. We were both a little shaken, but ultimately we let it go. The activity in my house spiked harder after that. One morning I was in the bathroom at 6 a.m. about to get into the shower before work. I heard a little girl giggle. To this day, I don't know why I didn't react more strongly. I simply took my shower, got ready, and left for work. When I left the house, the horror of what I'd heard settled in. It's almost like my emotions in that moment hadn't been my own. At night, I felt someone behind me constantly. It wasn't just a looming feeling of someone behind me. I'd hear footsteps running, and I mean running fast, right up until it was directly behind me. As I mentioned before, I sleep with earplugs and under my pillows. But in the rare instances that I slept without these things, I heard activity all night, bumps, groans, and walking. One night my parents were in Hawaii. The house was empty, so Thomas insisted on sleeping over. While we were watching a movie, I saw Thomas's face go pale. He was staring at something. I asked what was wrong. He said he saw a face in the window. He checked outside, didn't find anything. And since I didn't see it myself, he decided he had just been seeing things. It was dark after all. Later that night, we were having a rare, good moment in our relationship. We were playfully wrestling on the couch, and laughing, and we both stopped instantly. Next to our heads, we heard a female voice say, Hi. We sat up straight and just looked at each other a few times. The TV was off, the windows were closed. There was no way to explain what we had both just heard. I wish I had a good end to this story, but things really only got worse from here. My dad and I had a big falling out, and I needed to move out quickly. Thomas was thrilled to move in together. The controlling behavior evolved into flat-out physical abuse. If ghost activity was still happening, I honestly just don't have time or space to notice. My real life was so much more terrifying. The abuse went on for months before I strategically managed to run away. I had a long-time online friend that had a spare room in Los Angeles. He helped me move out, and helped me get on my feet. Since then, as far as I can tell, I've never experienced anything that consistently was paranormal. I've had sleep paralysis maybe once, and like I mentioned, a door or maybe two opening that could be explained away. It really makes me wonder if this girl, because it always sounded female, was trying to scare me away from Thomas. When Thomas first told me about how other people had experienced things in his house, he offhandedly mentioned that his dad once told him their family was cursed. That it was a story passed down to generations from the time when their ancestors were in Scotland. He didn't believe in it, and I don't really think I believe in curses either. 
but I don't have an explanation for what I experienced that year. The trail disappeared behind us. My girlfriend and I live in a small town in New Jersey. It's right by the Delaware River. We have many trails around here in the woods. And the one we went to last night is in a small state park right by the river. We had gone to this spot once before during winter, and all of the vegetation was gone this first time. The trail was quite clear. It had only a very thin strip of wood separating the road from the riverbank. However, this second time, it was different. Now that it was summer, there was thick brush everywhere in that spot. We parked the car around 6.30 in a small space right out of the road from where the trail starts. It was clearly visible. It was beckoning us in despite the thick brush. Thinking back, it was almost unnatural how beaten down the narrow slice of trail was in, really in contrast to this thick brush surrounding it. We start on the trail. Easily make it to our spot by the river in six minutes. There was one area where the trail led us to a small ditch. It was filled with plant life. But both ends of the trail were clearly visible from this area. After passing through, we passed by a big tree with thick roots coming from out of the ground. We made it to our spot by the river. When we got to our spot, we saw the river was quite high but we found a spot to sit down. We sat for about an hour talking about the tragic fire that recently happened in Hawaii. At around 7.30 p.m., we figured it would be a good idea to head back before it got dark. When we passed the big tree right at the start of the trail, we got down in the ditch. Something felt off immediately. I couldn't tell you what, but I felt terrified at the vegetation. It was so thick and suffocating. Standing in this ditch, the two of us tried to come back on the same trail we came through. But when we went in that direction, we noticed the brush had completely swallowed it up. It wasn't even dark at this point, it was just gone. We looked everywhere in that ditch for our trail. We even brute forced our way in the direction of the trail, but we never found a trace of it. No narrow slice of clear ground. Everywhere was covered in green. We wandered for about half an hour, coming upon a second, smaller tree with its roots above ground. Here we saw what looked like part of the trail we were on, but the entire path was completely blocked by stinging nettles. Which we hadn't seen any of on our way in, at least. This tree was a landmark we remembered from our first time coming here. We even have a video of it at that time. We searched and searched, and like I said, this wasn't a very large trail. We should have stumbled upon it. We were scared of the coyote pack and bear that call these woods home. My girlfriend was panicking. I wasn't much better. At this point, it was completely dark and we had only our phone flashlights. We ended up having to brute force our way through the brush to the road. It took far longer than it should have. It felt like we were running for hours. And we were walking, or rather weren't, we were running. It took us almost an hour to get back to our car at around 8.50 p.m. Again, it was only a six-minute walk on that windy trail. But when we were running almost perfectly straight toward the road, it took us almost ten times that. We also ended up farther down the road in the opposite direction of the trail, which should have been impossible. My girlfriend had her maps app up, tracking our distance to the road, and we were going straight toward it. When we finally got back to the car, we noticed the trail was totally blocked. No trace of the spot where we had entered. The plants completely undisturbed like we were even, well, weren't even there. That's honestly one of the scariest parts of the whole experience. We were so relieved, but on the way back home, my girlfriend brought up something from the first time that I'd forgotten about. 
she found a tattered rope on the ground, right off the side of the trail underneath the tree. It was unmistakably, and tragically, a noose. It had been cut cleanly on the end that would have tied to the tree. It was very dirty and had clearly been exposed to the elements for some time. Not wanting anyone walking the trail to have seen that, she kicked it to the river. Her heart was in the right place, but seemingly a foolish mistake in hindsight. Now, unlike my girlfriend, I'm not a very spiritual person. But when she said that, both of our bodies shuddered, and I felt momentarily that same anxiety and dread I felt in the woods. I knew how lonely whoever tied that noose had to be. I feel almost completely certain that they were behind the events of the night, that they wanted us to stay and keep them company, though I don't think they meant us harm. Today we went back to the trail, because my girlfriend wanted to perform a ritual for the spirit. She wanted to make right with it and bring it peace for the night. She set up a handful of witty type items and spoke a few words to the spirit. She brought flowers, placing them on the post markings, and still fully blocking the entrance, lit a black candle adorning the posts with just a little bit of melted wax. She said a few words and explained how we meant no harm apologizing for kicking the rope into the river. As she poured this wax, I saw something that I still doubt, but I feel like it's worth mentioning. Below the arching plants to the immediate left of the first post, I saw an amorphous blob of some kind. It didn't seem like a trick of the light as it was dark. We only had one small lantern and the candle illuminating the area. It seemed to reach out to her. Not in a violent or negative way, but in a longing and desperate manner. Still, I was terrified something would grab and take her deeper into the brush. She was incredibly calm, though. And upon pouring the wax and stepping away, the presence disappeared. We sat down in front of the posts. Kept the candles lit. It was the calmest candle I have ever seen. The flame slowly drifted, unflickering back and forth between my girlfriend and I, as if looking at us and checking us out. As we waited longer, the candle would grow calmer. Finally, as the stick of incense we were burning began to reach its end, the candle flame began to drift slowly away from us and pointed toward the woods. Are you ready to return home? I asked. The candle flame then began to flicker slightly, swinging side to side, then settling kind of calmly and centered, as if to say, Okay, I'm ready. When the incense finished burning, we blew out the candle, got back in our car, and we tossed our last couple of flowers into the river at the dock upstream, so they would make it to the trail. We both felt tired and relaxed after this whole experience. My girlfriend says that we made peace with the spirit. We want to go back someday, only during the day and only in fall or winter when the brush is cleared and we can't become trapped by it. But I'm hoping that we can keep it company. Nothing in this story has been fabricated at all. It's all true. We visited this place on August 14th, 2023. Just a day ago, technically two days, as it's 12.28 a.m. on the 16th as I'm finishing this post. Feel free to believe or disbelieve, but leave your thoughts in the comments. And the narrator doubles down on that. The comment part. It could have been anything, otherwise known as the monster that wasn't. During 2019, I ran my own ride service. Think of Lyft or Uber, not a promotion, it's like what I did. I did not work for either of those companies. I did this on my own independently as a means to get some extra money on the side. 
Now that I look back on it, it was totally more of a social experiment than anything. I had presented myself and my vehicle information to all of the local police departments, as with the state police in my area. As so, they knew, or who I was, or if I seemed suspicious driving around late at night in different areas. They were on board with it, and so was I. So I began the short stint of positive public service. That's where this begins. Aside from the occasional troublesome passenger, nothing out of the norm really happened. You know the saying, they only come out at night? This is very much true. I began this experiment in the late summer of 2018, and by February 2019, I was definitely deciding to put an end to it. I don't remember the specific day, but it was mid-February, and it was after 2 a.m. It was very cold, if not at or below freezing. I was finishing up a route that typically consisted of those needing a ride home from a night at the bar. I didn't have many passengers that night, so I decided to wrap it up and head home. I was leaving a neighboring town that's only about two miles from my own, sitting at a stoplight and intersection when the sudden impulse to take an alternate way home came over me. A road that cut up over a hill through the woods and semi-circled back to the same highway. Had I not gone that direction in the first place, I was tired, yet I debated with myself as to whether or not I should. I didn't have long until the light would turn green and I finally said, fuck it. I chose to take the road that went straight, instead of the usual one to the left. Why not? I do like a good little adventure now and then. There's where I made my mistake, to a degree. I crossed the highway, went up the hill, and hadn't driven very far until I was met by a pair of glowing greenish-yellow eyes. First thought, deer. Naturally, I stop. I was no more than 30 feet from it when the panic began to set in. It wasn't a deer. Whatever it was, it was lying on its side, looking up the hill. It turned its head to look at me, and that's when I thought it had to be a large dog instead of a deer. It was solid black in color, and then it proceeded to sit up on its haunches, very much like how a person would. At that point, I truthfully believed it had been some species of ape or large monkey. Let's pause. Whatever this thing was, it was very difficult to determine its shape despite the fact that my high beams were shining directly onto it. It wasn't that it was amorphous. It was to the fact that it was blacker than the black of night. When I sat up on its haunches, it, it continued to alter its focus from looking up the hill to looking toward my car back and forth, like I caught it by surprise. It then stood up on two feet. When I got the best view of it, it was approximately six feet tall, built and shaped in every way like a human man, head, neck, shoulders, arms, hands, torso, legs, and feet. It had no distinguishing features other than it looked like a living silhouette, or a person dressed in nothing but solid one-piece black spandex. I knew it couldn't be the latter for what person would wear that in the freezing cold of mid-February. Don't answer that. There was no texture to its appearance. No hair, no horns, no fur. Just that blacker-than-night silhouette-like shape with two glowing greenish-yellow eyes. It made no sound whatsoever, but looked as if it was deciding on what it wanted to do. Since my sudden arrival to where it was. I saw this thing for a grand total of what I guess would be between one and two minutes. It stood frozen in its stance before suddenly turning to the right, walking and stepping over a guardrail into the woods. My heart was racing. I was mortified. Despite this, I summoned the courage to drive to the very spot where it had been standing. 
One foot on the brake, the other on the gas, I rolled down the passenger side window to see if it would, well, if I would see it again or hear it or smell anything. Nothing. Not even the crack of a fallen branch or underbrush. Needless to say, I didn't stay there very long. I punched it up over the hill, covering all of about an additional hundred feet when I met by a second set of reflective eyes. Another fuck, I'm sure. I'm trapped. Either this thing is circled around to being in front of me again, or there's more than one. I know I'm not going to be the next one taken to my death, dragged off somewhere in the woods never to be seen again. So I give the gas pedal another punch. I'll either hit or run this thing over or die trying. I come to a sudden stop in my realization that the second pair of reflective eyes is actually a person. A man roughly my age wearing glasses, toting a large laundry bag or a basket. Quickly I roll my passenger window down and give the man a rather fast-paced explanation of who I am, what I do, and why I should enter my vehicle. Sir, I don't mean to alarm you, but I offer rides for people who need them and the local police already know about me. This isn't a trick or an attack, I'm not going to hurt you, but you're not safe right now. You need to get in my car immediately. Something to that effect, but spoken a lot faster than what you can probably read. I went pretty fast. Without question, he nodded yes. I unlocked my doors. He loaded his laundry into the back seat, and we were off. After he was in my car, I proceeded to tell him what I had just seen moments before. He lost the color of his face, but was on the complete level of understanding of the situation. He went on to tell me that he had finished doing his laundry, though I don't know what laundromat closes that late, and that he was walking to his home that wasn't far from where we were. He asked me what I saw a second time, and after listening, he calmly offered that I could have seen Bigfoot. I told him I don't know what it was, but whatever it was, it was watching him and studying him. That's when it sank into both of us. Had I not listened to my impulse to take another way home, who knows what that thing may have done to him in the dark wooded road. The rest of the ride was silent. I dropped him off at his house. He unloaded his laundry and thanked me. He offered me some money for the ride, but I declined it. I knew it wasn't right to take it, considering what had happened. We parted ways. I returned to my own home, very much confused as to what I witnessed. Since then, people have told me that i seen a shadow man, or a figure, or a demon, a skinwalker, a slender man, a rake, a crawler, or an alien. More times than not, I still get the possible idea that it could have been a Sasquatch or juvenile Sasquatch. I don't know. But I will go on to include that if I personally believed it to be one, knowing full well what one is, with all of the descriptions that entail, I would state that I thought it was a Bigfoot. Sometimes still take that road even though that happened four years ago. Almost daring myself if I will or won't see that creature again. A Silent Hill The year was 2014. It was a fine morning at my workplace somewhere in Nagaland with the beautiful scenery of mountains. We were situated at the top of hills along a new setting army camp. I was posted there as a site engineer, and a Nepali boy named Ramesh, name not revealed, was a cook, was a cook come caretaker of the site. I don't know what that means. So he received me with a welcome and began to show my room near the site, where he also had his room attached with the kitchen. Since the place was in a rural area, the houses were made of roof sheets made of tin, with ply boards fixed to the interior and plastic sheets as ceiling. Because during night time, water drops and fall inside the house due to the sweating of the tins. The place was very cold with less sunlight and warmth. It's very difficult for someone like me to survive that cold, followed by precipitation every ten minutes. You can imagine how much freezing it could be. 
So Ramesh would collect money for me. And every evening, for the ration and vegetables to cook during the night, during the day, we used to eat in the army canteen with the free cost, which was allowed for us by our company, and they were paying for our day meals. Now Ramesh had an urge to eat fish, so he said he was good in cooking fish. So we both went outside the gate, and there was two crossroads, and between was the market where a fisherman sit always, but no one was buying from him. He was sitting still. I said to Ramesh, let us buy from him. So he has no customers. Ramesh argued with me, saying, and showing he is the super senior than me, and he was there a month or so before I arrived. I couldn't figure it out, his rude behavior towards me, and why was he angry when I showed him the fisherman. I told him, okay, do whatever he want to do, since it was his section to look out. I escaped from there and went to buy a cigarette pack crossing that fisherman's place, and while smoking, I looked at that fisherman. He was holding a doll by his side as he was waiting to deliver it to someone special. Maybe his daughter, I guess. I walked near him with a soft tone and asked him, How much for the fish? He was in another dimension, he didn't hear me, and I noticed his pupils are dilated as if he's dead from the inside. I was scared, but I asked him again, Are you here to sell fish? After a pause, he responded, The fish are already sold. I said, wow, I didn't see anybody near whom he sold his fish. Then Ramesh appeared from my back and he said, what are you doing here? He had an anger in his face. Things began to escalate quickly because he insulted me once before with a heavy tone and I replied, it's none of your business. Just do your work. He said again, you're not supposed to talk to him. Stuff like that. I was like scolding him saying, what the fuck's wrong with you? Man, it's my life. My rule. Later on, we were on the house together, and he said he just don't do things what I don't tell you to do. Again, I argued it'll be me to say what to do and what not. He said, okay, then you cook your food yourself. I'm cooking mine. That being said, I was calming myself now, and it is an unknown town, and the only person staying with me was him, so I couldn't comforted him by saying, all right, you won. I was just kidding with you and offered him a cigarette. First he denied, but later he thought he has to keep going the whole night, so he accepted. And we were friends now. Then I asked him about the matter in the market, why he behaved so awkward. He said that the fisherman was possessed by the devil. I laughed so hard I couldn't stop. He said, wait for two days. Here you will get to know by yourself. Okay, I said. I said that I was reading a joke on my phone and reacted to that and not to his words. That night I got to know his cooking skills, and by my surprise I got to know that he was working in a restaurant in town before joining his company. Things were going fine. We both go to work together during the day and we used to keep records of the laborers like a site supervisor do. And also collect their ID and stuff. What a supervisor were supposed to do. It was cool with it. I was supposed to go through the blueprint of the structure and locate the orientation of the structure, like a little survey work to be done. And good to go and so on, things were going fine for two to three months, until one night I heard a girl crying in the woods. Since we're on top of a hill and the crossroads, one going to the top of another village and the other one going kind of down right beside the site, the house we're living, and another side of the road was a thick forest literally can be seen from the mountain forest all along. I then called Ramesh, it was near 11 p.m. and he was listening to some rock music with his awful sounding speaker. He was playing Highway to Hell from ACDC. I felt like what a fucking coincidence. That guy was always drunk with a local rice beer, which he called Juto. That's in his language and I called him more than thrice. Then he responded with a bottle of Juto in his hand and I took it from him and drank and he said, What the hell you took like you bought it? I said, I'm going to need this tonight because I'm hearing a girl crying in the woods. He said even he too hear it every day, but today it's too early. 
He always hear girls scream around 12.30 a.m. to 3 a.m. Now I knew things are going to be really creepy. I told, remember I said not to talk to that fisherman? I said, yes. That was his daughter dead by getting raped by the local goons, which was also some underground party. I said, really? He said, that ghost girl is out for the night hunting for males. Anyone passing from there would be killed by her because she thinks they're one of those who killed her. Then I knew, of course, I saw a doll beside the fisherman whenever I go to the market, and that fisherman would look to me as if he knows me, like from a long time ago, and wants to settle his unfinished business. Came to my room and slept, and that juto helped me to sleep, and next day passed as usual. And again, during that night around 2 a.m., I could hear the scream this time, and it was louder. The sound was approaching as it was coming toward us the next minute. It was like screaming outside my house. I was so frightened and helpless, and couldn't even call Ramesh since he always loaded at night, but beside a wall was a small hole. The sound was approaching, and I could hear the footsteps, too. I quickly peeked from that hole to call Ramesh. To my surprise, his door was open. He was not in the room didn't even hear his voice or unlocking his door bolts and hinges. I was calming myself and hiding under my blanket. Slowly, slowly, the scream was fading away. I was thinking of Ramesh. What had gone wrong with that guy? Must have gone too high with Juto and Baba shots. The next morning he went missing. From that day, the fisherman disappeared too. Incident was reported accordingly to the army authorities and they declared a red zone. Trespassers will be persecuted. I managed to get out of this mess, though. But the real mess was Ramesh. Ask Reddit. When I started college, my mother and little sister moved into an old house way back in the woods in Mississippi. The road leading up to it went from four-lane highway to two, to gravel, to dirt track, with two ruts worn into the dirt with branches slapping up against the side of your car as you drove in. It was miles from the nearest town, and that town was very small, and many, many, many more miles from the next town was isolated. That's what I'm saying. The owner, who was the nearest neighbor, told her it had been built in the 20s sometime, but it was sturdy and well-maintained. A simple but handsome little house, shotgun style. Had a concrete porch on the front and backyard big enough for maybe some chickens and pigs if you wanted them. All around, nothing but miles of forest. There wasn't any air conditioning. Normally, for my mom, that would be a big no. But there was an attic fan which worked really well at keeping the temperature under murderous. It, because of this isolation and age, it was dirt cheap as far as rentals go. Moreover, though, mom took it because she said that from the moment she set foot on the property, she got this happy, positive feeling about it. A kind of peaceful vibration. She said it felt like a home more than a house. When I came to visit for the first time, I had to agree. I immediately felt the sensation of welcome there. Almost like it was constantly a holiday and any minute somebody you love is going to come through the door, like maybe I'm overselling it, but it was just a nice little place to be. It was only a couple of hours drive from me. So I visited as often as I could, especially when I felt like I needed a retreat from school. One night I was there for a weekend, sitting in the living room waiting for dinner. That's when I hear my sister and mom from the kitchen talking about the Indians, quote-unquote. I couldn't hear exactly what they were saying, but it sounded like people they knew. As far as I was aware, the local native tribes were way long gone from the world, so I was curious who they meant asked her later about it, you know, at the kitchen table. Oh, sometimes we see these people running through the backyard from the kitchen window. Your sister calls them Indians, but they look like children playing to me. We only ever catch glances of them through the window. If you go outside, they're never there. 
She went on to tell me that she had seen all sorts of unusual things since they moved in, mostly small things that could be easily explained. Two were very strange, though. The positive feeling she'd felt about the place had bloomed into a full-on nurturing. It was basically to the point where when she went to bed at night she felt as if the house was tucking her in. No physical sensation, just a sense of being loved. I'm jealous of her house. She kept seeing lights in the front room. She said at first she thought it was cars pulling up into the front yard and lights reflecting off of them into the windows. But she never heard a car and would go outside to find no one there. It was almost like someone shining a mirror into the windows, just moving glints and flashes. Oddly, no one found any of this disturbing. I never saw any of that myself, and things went on as usual. Then my first year ended, and I came for one last visit before going out of town for my summer job. It was late one night. I was sitting out on the front porch, enjoying a cigarette. The stars that, well, far out into nowhere, they're just amazing. I was happy for the way that the year had gone and excited for the summer, and I just enjoyed the night. It was hot, but there was a little bit of a breeze. I could hear the hum of the attic fan behind me in the house, and from the woods, the whine and chirp from the crickets and cicadas and countless other night critters. Those of you who've heard it know it has some variation, this symphony, but it is a constant wall of sound. I had mostly tuned it out, thinking of not much of anything, then I noticed it seemed to be getting louder. Then it was definitely getting louder. Then it was kind of scary loud. Then it just stopped, full-on stop, not a chirp or a creak or a croak. Not only that, but I couldn't hear the fan going on inside anymore. Even the light breeze had stopped. Just silence all around. I was afraid I'd suddenly gone deaf, but I could hear my feet scraping on the porch and my own breathing. I thought about making a bigger noise or calling out, but I was startled by the suddenness of it. I also figured that many things going silent all at once might be a precursor to something else. Sure enough, I started to hear something else. It was a sort of rhythmic thrumming, very faint, a steady and soft vroom vroom sound. Low, similar to a heartbeat. It built a bit, but never got loud always just barely over the threshold of my hearing. It almost could have been a train, but there were no tracks anywhere near us. The weather was clear, the highway far off. It didn't sound mechanical anyway, but it didn't sound entirely organic either. I walked off the porch into the front yard to try to hear it better, and I could feel it in the ground. This soft pulsing in time with the sound. I was barefoot, and I think even with shoes I'd have noticed it. I could feel it in my ankles and knees, the whole world beating like a big heart. After a while, I wasn't even sure if I was really hearing it or just feeling it. There was no major change from that point on, though, and I imagined it, and maybe was just continuing to build. Then after some time, I've no idea how much, it just stopped. No fade, just silence again. Then just as suddenly as they had stopped before, the crickets and other noisemakers started up again. I went inside, and I went to bed. Mom had to move out of the house while I was away for the summer. Different story. But she still talks about it. She told me she'd mentioned all this stuff to the owner, who was a very nice older lady, and that she suddenly went all cagey on her, didn't want to talk about it. Last I heard the owner passed, and her heirs sold the land. The house is surely gone now. Greetings, fellow explorers of the mysterious. 
Join me at Paranormal M as we uncover tales that defy explanation. Remember to subscribe and turn on notifications to embark on this journey with us. We promise it'll be an adventure like no other. Ghost in the Coal Mine I was born in 1968. I'm the son of a miner father and a miner myself. I'm the father of two children. The incident happened to me in a mine where I worked a year or two before I retired. Everything started after an accident in the mine. That day I went to the workplace as usual. In the morning after having breakfast in the canteen of the workplace, I got into the cage to go 600, excuse me, 260 meters underground. And when I say cage, I mean elevator. We mine workers preferred to call it a cage instead of an elevator because it was a simple device that worked with a large crane rather than an elevator. Anyway, I went down into the mine. After working until the end of the shift, I started walking toward the bottom of the shaft. We call the place where we got into the cage the bottom of the shaft. As I walked slowly, an engine passed by me quickly. What I call an engine can be considered as a small train. It was a relatively simple device compared to the train, pulling only wagons weighing up to one ton at most. There were workers on the engine. Normally, they're forbidden to do this, but sometimes when the workers are very tired after work, they ride on the engine to avoid walking. I continued to walk slowly as the engine sped past me. Then there was shouting coming up from ahead. Someone seemed to be moaning in a wheezing voice. I moved toward the direction of the sound in order to understand exactly what was happening. I started to look around carefully. When I approached the place where the sound came from, I saw that somebody was lying in the water channel on the side of the air door. Blood was flowing from the person lying in the water channel as if from a faucet. At that moment, I went into short-term shock. In that chaos, we immediately carried the injured person to the lift entrance, which we call the bottom of the shaft. We sent him to the hospital. I could still not get over the shock of that image, and that day that person who was injured in that accident died. This incident affected me deeply. My psychology turned upside down. According to what I learned later, the accident happened as follows. While the workers were traveling with the engine, the door didn't open. Since the engine was also fast, the engine hit the door with great violence. The worker who was caught between the engine and the door was crushed badly during this impact. In the days following this incident, when I passed through that gate, it always seemed to me as if someone was still lying in the water channel. Couldn't pass through there by myself. Since the hearth wasn't sufficiently lit, it was always very dark inside the hearth. It was only illuminated by fluorescent lamps, which were very sparsely placed in certain parts of the hearth. Because of the effect of this incident, I was completely disenchanted with work. I didn't feel like going to work at all, but I had to. Anyway, one day when I was at work again, I was the last one left at the end of the work area of the mine where I was working. When I looked around, everybody had left. I sat down somewhere. Such a weight fell on me that it seemed like a lifetime to go from there to the lift area, which the workers called the bottom of the shaft yet again. I said to myself, I'll rest a little while I'm sitting here and then I'll go. My eyes closed for a while and I was between sleep and wakefulness. I saw a man approaching me from the head, holding a lamp in his hand. There's no work left at the stove at this hour. I guess he stayed later like me. As I said this to myself, that light that was approaching me suddenly disappeared. Oh my god, where did this man go? Then I thought, let me sit for one or two more minutes. Maybe the man who just disappeared will come back and we can go to lift together. Then my eyes closed again. I don't know how much time passed, but suddenly I woke up with a very severe slap. 
But what a slap. I thought my neck was broken. I immediately recovered and looked around me. There was no one. It was impossible for somebody to hit me and run away. And for this reason, I started running toward the lift in fear and panic. That day, I didn't tell anyone about what had happened. One or two weeks later, I was the last one again. This time, I hurried up and went straight to the lift entrance. As I sat down and waited for the lift to arrive, I noticed that something jet black was coming toward me. It had a hand lamp and a hard hat, but neither of them was lit. It was slowly approaching me, and I called out from afar. Master, what's wrong? Did the lamp malfunction? He didn't answer. Instead, it just kept coming towards me slowly. I felt a strong sense of fear that I didn't know why. I wanted to get up and leave. I even wanted to run away, but I was paralyzed. I couldn't move. Although he was very close to me, I couldn't see his face or body clearly. It was as if the man coming toward me was not a tangible substance, but a shadow, a silhouette. Don't ever sleep on the hearth again, he said to me. I could feel the man's speech not in my ears, but in my brain. He spoke to me and almost telepathically and disappeared. I had heard of such events from a few other people before, but I didn't believe it. At that moment, those stories I had heard just went through my mind. I read all the prayers I knew. That black silhouette had not harmed me, but living that moment had further disrupted my already broken psychology. I couldn't get up from where I was sitting for another one to two minutes. After a while, I pulled myself together and walked away from there. When I told my friends what had happened to me, they didn't believe me. When I told them what happened to the imam of the village where I lived, the imam believed me and said the following. They are the owners of the mines. As you know, according to Islamic belief, the souls of martyrs can choose to stay in this world instead of going to the hereafter if they wish. According to a saying of the Islamic prophet Muhammad, those who die under the rubble are considered martyrs, just like those who die in war. That's why we call people who died in the mines, mine martyrs. Most probably that thing you saw in the mine was the spirit of a mine martyr and it warned you. He wanted to protect you. After that day, I never slept in the mine again. Creepy Call Center Experience So a little background. I work as a manager in a call center, more of an emergency care line. You know those pull cords and pendants that vulnerable elderly people have? Well, we're on the other end of them. I've worked there for around two years, never had anything spooky or paranormal come through, despite dealing with death on a daily basis. I want to start by saying I do not believe in the paranormal, nor am I religious, and I'm still trying to rationalize the events that took place. Although I didn't see them firsthand, they still sent chills down my spine. It was a Friday night, must have been around 21.30 as I had just come back from my break. I was the only supervisor on duty. I received a call from an operator, home working due to COVID. They were stating that they had received a call from a paramedic. We had called out for an alarm activation in a property with no response. They wanted a supervisor to call back. Now we get a lot of people saying that they want to speak to the manager, and it normally means somebody wants to complain about something, so I shrugged it off. The weird thing was, is that when I asked the operator why they needed me specifically, she said that the paramedic wouldn't tell her, which is really odd. So I called them back on the number, and they provided, and they were I was kind of thinking to myself which operator screwed up now. It must have been relating to a mistake. When the paramedic answered, he sounded a little shook up, not specifically scared, just awkward and nervous, which was weird as the thousands of calls I've made and taken from paramedics, they always been so confident. He answered with, Hey, sorry, I have to ask you directly, I just want to know, some people got upset with this kind of stuff. Now, to me, that's code for I've just found a resident that's passed away and I didn't want to upset an operator. 
so I got ready to take down the details of the deceased. He gave me the address of the emergency and what the callout was for. I brought up the details in our system and we didn't have anyone listed in the property, which isn't uncommon. Maybe we hadn't been informed of a new tenant yet. The paramedic advised calmly but nervously that he had attended and no one was in there and there was no problem, which was weird because why couldn't he just tell an operator that? Then he said that something weird happened in the property, something that he needed my help to explain as he couldn't find a logical conclusion. He said that he arrived at the property at the same time as the house manager, who had also called out just after the paramedics. The property manager advised that it was weird that they had been called out as the previous resident had passed away in the property over two months ago, and after the property was gutted, no one had been in. Anyway, they unlocked the door and entered it. The air was musky and dry, which made sense as the place was empty. But as the paramedic called out to see if any help was required, the property manager stopped in the doorway, frozen still. The paramedic asked what was wrong and said that was the last time he was in the property. The couch was in the middle of the lounge. Now it was sideways up against the wall. A few moments passed and he put it down to the resident's next kin, maybe. Maybe they were just moving it to clear up. The two ventured in, the paramedic calling out still. And after they headed down the corridor to the kitchen, the paramedic froze. On the ceiling there was one of the resident's pull cords spinning parallel to it rapidly. Then as he just watched and waited, the cord began to slow down. And as it did, it began to move away from the ceiling. He then took a step, thinking somebody might need help, and the cord span slowly. The cord span slowly to a stop. Spun. It was just dangling there as if it was never even moving. Both men searched the property thoroughly, thinking that somebody must be in there to make the cord spin that much, but no one could be found. They both met just outside the kitchen again and the property manager said that he had just had to go back as he had to go and make dinner. But the paramedic knew that the man was shaken and just wanted to leave. They both stood in the hallway, looking at the cord for a few moments before leaving swiftly. When both men were outside, they tried to rationalize why this cord could be spinning and what caused it to call through to my call center. The property manager said that the next of kin, the resident, they had a pendant at their house. So that may have triggered the activation, although they lived over a hundred miles away. Over the phone, the paramedic asked me if this may have caused the call-out. I know these devices have a range of about 300 meters. It would be impossible for the device to have caused the call-out. I asked if it could have been caused by a draft from the window or the door or the extractor fan. He advised that the extractor fan was off. All windows sealed shut. There was very little wind that night and due to the location of the kitchen, there was no way that any breeze from the door would make it in there. Now I just want to reiterate his tone of voice. He sounded genuinely concerned. Said that in his 11 years on the job he had never, not once, seen anything like it. I had only been working in the call center for two years and this is the first time something like this has come through to me. He said that it reminded him of watching one of those ghost hunter shows where the mystery can always be put down to special effects. He couldn't explain what he had seen that was making him uncomfortable. He also let me know that he was going to call me from his responder car just outside the property. But he got a strange feeling that something was watching him. He drove a mile up the road before calling. Anyway, he said that we could update our notes as there was really no one in there. And he was going off to get himself a drink. It was the end of his shift and he needed to forget what he had just seen. I wished him a good rest of his night, and the rest just sat there thinking of what could have caused the pull cord to spin. Don't get me wrong, I could easily put the, you know, activation of the alarm down to maybe a simple error. Happens all the time, but nothing could explain what he saw in that property. From my perspective, if a resident or next of kin or even property manager had advised me of the happenings in the apartment that night, 
I would have chalked it down to them just being a little crazy. But a paramedic who sounded genuinely terrified while telling the story on the phone? That just doesn't sit right. I don't know what caused the pull cord to spin, and I never will. I just hope this is the first and last time I hear of something like this happening. I saw something in the woods, and I'm still not able to figure out what it was. So this has been stuck in my head since it happened, and I don't want to say it was traumatic, but it was a big lesson for me at the time. To be honest, it was so off-putting and weird, it stuck with me. So I've lived in western North Carolina basically my whole life, and the woods and I I wouldn't say are a huge deal, but there's not much to do here, so that's what people like to do, hunting, hiking, hell, mushroom hunting. I, in all honesty, have had weird feelings about the woods, before and after what happened. But that's never really kept me from going into them, and I do enjoy being in the woods, but they always give me such a dreadful feeling. Anyways, when I was about seven years old, give or take, I'm 22 now, and this is really foggy, so I can't remember all the small details, but some of the details may be off. My dad was working for my grandfather, who owned this small warehouse kind of thing. That's where they would do welding and machining for things, such as boats and cars, and honestly, just random shit that people need fixed. Well, it was tucked back behind other small warehouses. Those were surrounded by nothing but woods. Where my grandfather's building was, was literally the last one in the little road that went down there. The reason this is important is because my dad would frequently take me and my brothers with him to work, because nobody could watch us. Well, I'm the oldest of my brothers, so my dad would pretty much let me do whatever I wanted as long as I wasn't in anyone's way. So we ended up bringing my bike over there, so when I got there I could ride my bike up and down this road. I had a little route I would take, where I would go behind some of these buildings between the tree line of the woods and back to these buildings. I would get to the last building and go around it, go back down the road toward where my grandfather's building was. It was basically a little trail for me. I used this route for, if I had to say, maybe the next two to three weeks when I came over there anyway. Well, one day I was just doing my normal thing, playing with my brothers, messing with bugs and some trash on the ground. You know, normal seven-year-old shit. Then I decided, hey, I'm going to ride my bike a little bit so I do a loop a couple of times. Can't remember why exactly, but I had to tell my dad something, so I went to go find him. I ride my bike back to my grandfather's building. Ask my brothers, like, hey, have you seen dad? And they say no find my grandfather and I ask him. He says that he saw him outside last. So I do a loop around the outside of my grandfather's building, and as you guessed it, nothing. So I thought maybe he needed me and went looking on the trail to find me. So I took off. I remember going the opposite way this time because I thought maybe we'd run into each other. So I go up the road first, then take a left, and at the end of the road, go around the first building. I remember thinking it was weird that I haven't seen him yet, but to be honest, I was just enjoying riding my bike, so I didn't care. Then I got to the part behind the buildings where the woods was. This time, the woods were on my right side, and I still hadn't seen Dad to this point, so I was roughly about a two-minute ride from my grandpa's building. I looked to the right, in the woods, and I saw someone in the woods, probably 75 or 100 feet away. There was a bunch of bushes and limbs, of trees, and, well, they were just far enough away that all I could really see was the black silhouette of the person. So I stopped thinking it was my dad, and I yelled, Dad? But yelling. No response. Me thinking he didn't hear me get off my bike and started to step into the woods, and at this point, I realized that they hadn't moved at all since I saw them, and it seemed like they were just staring at me. I didn't find this like frightening at that moment, but I found it very odd because I was still under the assumption that this was my dad. I then started to walk pretty slowly towards them, periodically saying that I was looking for you and asking what he was doing. 
I was honestly trying to just get him to respond because at this point I was pretty spooked. When I was roughly about ten feet into the woods, they started to walk toward me. They still didn't respond, and that's when I about shit myself. I stopped. I remember my adrenaline kicking in and my face getting tingly. But I completely froze. All I could get out was, Taz, I you? Still no response, but they still continued to walk toward me. I was scared to run because I didn't want them to run after me, and I remember just being so terrified that I didn't know what to do. Keep in mind, it was only seven while, of course, now we dipped out that way before this, but at the time I was just a dumb kid. I don't know how long I stood there, but I do know that they got about 50 feet away before I decided to run, and I remember the reason, well, for lack of a better word, snapped out of it. It was because at this point the silhouette was completely black, and I remember realizing that whatever this was was really fucking tall. I want to say eight to ten feet. It's not reliable at all because it was so long ago and I had a huge adrenaline dump. So I honestly couldn't tell you, I just remember it was abnormally tall. Needless to say, I fucking ran at this point. Left my bike and just ran to my grandfather's building. When I got back, I was crying. And I saw my dad outside of a bay door. My dad just finished smoking a cigarette and was going to go back in when he saw me. He asked me what happened. I told him everything. He told me to go with him to where it happened. We went back to go check it out and get my bike back. When we got there, nothing was there. My dad stepped into the woods a little bit, didn't see anything. Told me that there was nothing over there, at least not anymore. I'm not going to go. I'm going to leave soon. Well, I had no reason to worry. Grabbing my bike, we walked back to the building with him. My dad never really leave me alone in sight the rest of the time that we worked there. I don't know if he believed me or not. I never brought it back up to him because I don't know if he would remember it. This all sounds so stupid and fake, I know, but I've honestly never told anybody this because of that, but that's why I'm on here. I was curious if anything like this has happened to anyone else. And if so, I'd like to know your theories. I thought Bigfoot for a long time is stupid as it sounds, but I don't think that was the case thinking anything from some sort of weird energy in the woods, some weird creep who just so happened to be there or something. Now, I know my mind could have been playing tricks on me, but truly, I don't think this was an animal or something. But I don't know all I do know, is that it's been in the back of my mind since I was a kid. A protective spirit lives in my home. Since I was little, a spirit or being has been protecting my family. I don't know what kind, but it wants to stay. I didn't know about this until I was an adult, and when my mom and I got talking about our ghost experiences one day. Some background. I've lived in three homes. The first I don't remember because we moved when I was a couple of months old. The second I lived in until I was sophomore in college. The third I lived in and still with my family from junior year until now, the year after my graduating. In the second and third house, there's always been some areas of the house that felt strange. Creepy, like somebody was intently watching you, but not unwelcoming. Still, it was strong enough that I didn't like these areas at night when I was a kid. In my second house, it was the hallway that led to the dead-end laundry room, the kitchen that hallway was attached to, and my parents' bedroom. Similarly, in my third house, the feeling was in the kitchen, my parents' bedroom, and stairs. I never saw the spirit, not that I remember, but somehow I knew it was very tall and skinny. He only sometimes had very short horns. I never had a reason to feel any creepiness from these areas because I never saw anything there, or so I thought. I'd never told anybody about the feeling or the spirit until my mom and I started talking about ghosts that one day. I mentioned it. Without missing a beat, my mom says, Oh, that's the old grandpa. Mom then proceeded to explain the exact feeling I would get in the same areas of the house. She also explained he was very tall. That's all she knew about him. 
This spirit's been following her since she was little. She experienced similar feelings in areas of her childhood homes, but never thought much of it until she moved into my, and my parents, first home. When I was a baby, I would frequently wake up in the night and cry. Mom would get up, turn on the light, breastfeed me, and then put me to bed and turn off the light. One night, my mom woke up with the feeling of creepiness I described, but extremely intense. She got up to check on me since it was about the time of night I would wake up, but this time she didn't turn the light on, not wanting to wake me if I was still asleep. And I was. As she was watching me, she heard something, a tapping on the window. Slowly, then a little louder and faster, just enough for me to wake up and start crying. As soon as I did, the sound abruptly stopped. A quick visit from the police revealed a peeping Tom would tap at the window at night to wake me and then he would watch my mom feed me. Ew. My parents moved within the next couple of weeks. Good. The spirit followed my mom to the second house where I grew up. She credits several instances of warning before danger to the spirit. One example is her waking up to that feeling before an attempted home invasion. Nowadays, in our third home, we live in a much safer area, so nothing like that's happened to my knowledge. When I asked if she knew why he appeared in the kitchen in her bedroom, she laughed and said, Look, he's creepy and kind of a perv, but he's harmless. She does say to not be surprised if he starts following me around when I have kids. You kind of want to help protect. That's why she calls him the old grandpa. Now, my experiences with him, they're mostly the energy I feel from him. Rarely anymore. One time when I was in middle school, I was doing dishes in the kitchen of my second house. I had one earbud in and the other out. Why, I could feel that feeling, and I was trying my best not to look over my shoulder down the hallway every minute or so. The one earbud was out to hear if anybody walked up behind me, dumb I know. Then through the earbud that was still in my ear, it started like a whisper. Fritmer. Nearly had a heart attack, yanked out my earbud and started down the hallway. Nothing. Never knew what that was about, but I now assume that it was him. One last thing of interest. When I moved to my apartment for college and lived there during school, came back for holidays and summer, I never felt his presence. And I've never felt it outside the two houses I remember. My mom, however, has felt it only one place in the world outside of her homes. Scotland. My heritage is Scottish on both my mom and dad's side. My immediate family itself is not from Scotland. We're regular white breed all-American cheese. White bread. Even so, we decided to take a trip there. One of the places that we visited was burned down and currently being restored. It's a Dunan's Castle, also known as Fletcher Castle. We were signing our family in for a tour, but our guide stops us when he sees our last name. As in the Scottish version. When we confirmed yes, our guide smiled and said, I've got a surprise for you then. On the side of the castle is a plaque of two hands shaking, both the Fletcher and our family name on it, along with the inscription, Letcha Do. From what I remember, our family back in the day and the Fletcher family helped each other in times of need. That trip was a few years ago and I never felt anything. But later during our ghost story telling, my mom told me that she felt old grandpa there. That's the reason that I've started calling him the Scottish Gaelic word for grandpa. Seigneur. Seanair? S E A. N A I R. I can't do Gaelic. Want to? Nowadays he hangs out. Ever since that day talking with my mom when I mentioned being really freaked out in certain areas of the house, I don't feel his presence much anymore in those areas. Almost as if he felt bad for freaking me out. I must never feel him in the kitchen anymore, and instead of being at the top of the stairs, I only ever feel him at the bottom, and only when I'm going to bed. He still likes my parents' bedroom a lot, but I'm almost basically never in there.
Whenever I mention him to others now, and even as I was writing this, I get overcome with a feeling of staticiness in my limbs. A sort of cottony feeling in my head, like dizzy in a good way, which is a little strange. I'm not sure what it all means, and I don't know if he's actually Scottish or what kind of spirit he is, but other than sort of emanating a kind of creepy energy, he actually seems to be doing more good than harm here. So I'm happy to have him. One of the strangest paranormal experiences of my childhood. Have you ever heard of the back rooms? That maze of nondescript rooms and hallways that seems to repeat itself over and over again. A place with no windows, no doors, and no obvious way out. A place where you always feel like you're being watched. Just a creepy pasta, right? Just some strange story you read online. Nothing to worry about. It isn't real. It's real, and I've been there, or at least to some version of it. I have to be lying, right? After all, I'm just some random person on the internet. You don't know me, and I don't know you, but I'm not lying, I promise you. My name is Cole. I'm a 26-year-old woman, and I grew up in a town in upstate New York. My childhood home is old, built around 120 years ago. The land it was built on is even older still. My town sits near what was once a front line for the both French and Dean War. The American War for Independence, also known as the American Independence. Because of the amount of historical bloodshed that occurred around my area, we obviously have had our fair share of not-so-living residents. My town and several of the cities around me are known for ghostly hauntings. I can also attest to that. The area is practically a swirling pit of paranormal energy. So it comes with no surprise that my home is among the many to experience its share of unexplicable goings-on. From toilet lids slamming to doors opening and closing, unexplainable footsteps, and even the occasional appearance of a strange shadowy figure moving in the corner of your eye. There was even a point in time where I was too afraid to sleep in our living room, simply because I was paranoid of what might happen. Before my being to be able to tell the back room story, I have to give you a basic layout of the house. It'll be pretty important in just a little bit. When you approach our house from the street, you'll notice that it's basically at the top of a small hill. You have to kind of go up two steps just to get to our property. Then it's another small set of stairs onto our front porch. Then another, another real step up into our home, and when you enter the front door, you enter into what my family calls our front hallway. Basically, it's a pretty good-sized room, separate from the rest of the house, by a pair of beautiful French doors. To the left is the main staircase to the second floor, and to the right is my dad's office, what used to be the front parlor. For those of you who don't know that there's sort of a reason for the living room. It's, well, pretty well called a living room, basically. Funeral parlors didn't become popular until about the 1920. So when a person died, their funeral was held at home. And considering how the front parlor in my home is set up, I don't doubt that there was at least one funeral held there. Anyway, after you pass through the French doors, you come into the dining room. Living room separated by a good-sized archway, and then a short hallway leading to the basement door. A second staircase in the kitchen with a butler's pantry and a small half-bathroom attached. The second staircase is different. Where our main staircase is, it's grand. Obviously meant to impress. This one isn't. It's dark, fully enclosed, and hidden away behind a solid wood door. If you walk up the main entrance, you will enter into a moderately-sized hallway. To the immediate right, you'll come across the first and arguably largest bedroom. Down the hallway and around a left turn are the other two bedrooms. Large bathroom, a door to the second staircase, and my mother's sewing closet. And a nursery. My childhood bedroom was directly across from my mother's sewing closet. I used to sleep with my door open and always terrified of my mother's sewing closet. It's closed off by a set of double doors, but there's always been something dark about it. To me, unless the light was on and my mother was actively working in there, it always seemed like there was something lurking inside. Something evil. I had a number of experiences in that room. 
most of them not involving my mother's sewing closet. There are a few experiences, however, that stick out in my memory. They're a bit far. Well, they're, I guess, rather, by far, the strangest dreams I've ever had. <sighs> All right, I said it. My strangest experience revolve around dreams. Go on, poke some fun. I'll wait. Poke, poke. You done? Okay. So all throughout my childhood, I would have strange experiences around the time I'd be falling asleep or shortly thereafter. There are a few times where I can remember waking up in my mom's sewing closet. In front of me was the narrow opening to the closet. The closet actually does exist, and it really is as creepy as I'm about to describe. It wasn't so much a closet as it was a gap between the walls. All exposed rafters, an old dirty linoleum floor, no light source to speak of. In my dream, I would always walk into the closet. I would walk and walk, never reaching the end. I'd either turn left or right and climb through a little hole in the wall. What I saw on the other side still weirds me out. I actually try to not think about these dreams as much as possible. Anyway, I would enter into what looked like a near-perfect replica of my own home. Only it was massive, seemed to go on forever, and everything was pure white. What was strange, though, is no matter where I went, in this other house I could never find my own room. It's like I didn't exist. The door would be, there'd be nothing. In fact, no matter which hallway I took, always ended up back in the main area of the house. The first few times I had this dream, I felt completely safe. It was just me, this weird-as-fuck house, and a childish need to explore. When the dream was about to end, I would always end up climbing back through the hole, back through the closet, and into my mother's sewing closet. But then it changed. The more I dreamt of that place, the more degraded it became. What had once been a pure white had turned into a dirty, sickly yellow. The place had once been consumed by a soft white light. That glow was long gone. In its place were dingy, flickering lamps that seemed to create more shadows than they did light. I went from loving the thrill of freedom and exploration to becoming almost scared to move. I would still explore, but I felt like I was being watched. Like I was being haunted, even. Those dreams would end up with me running for the hole and escaping my mother's sewing closet as though somebody had set my ass on fire. Thankfully, I haven't had a dream like this in years. For which I am very glad. Every time I think of what I saw, I can't help but shudder. My Haunted Bathroom So to start with a small background to my story, I'd like to say that my mother's side of the family, especially her and my grandmother, they've experienced a lot of paranormal experiences during their lives. Some small ones that are probably explainable by logical things, and some very scary. Sometimes almost unbelievable ones that I wouldn't believe if they didn't come directly from them. So since I was a kid, I always had a passion for paranormal things. I would always ask family members to tell me stories about frightening things they've experienced. I would watch paranormal story times and read paranormal stories, you know, on the internet, all the time, really. But I never looked forward to experiencing anything paranormal myself. I wasn't scared of it, but I just didn't really want to. So I never played Ouija or did anything to cause paranormal things to happen to me. Now, a few years ago, I was 14 or 15, I think, I studied in the French system, so we basically have two-week vacations every two months. It all happened during my two-week vacation of April, during my last year of middle school. As the 15-year-old teenager that I was, I spent the night watching Netflix, YouTube, checking my social medias, and talking to friends. I slept way after sunrise every day, like maybe at 6 or 7 a.m., something like that. Because I slept so late and woke up pretty late also, like 5 p.m., my rhythm was completely fucked up. So I was always washing my face, brushing my teeth, and using the bathroom very late at night. 
One night I went to the bathroom I share with my sister and washed my face before going to sleep. It was around 3 a.m. and keep in mind, I only used the bathroom sink, I didn't use the toilet. Right after I finished, while I was just washing my face and brushing my teeth, I started walking toward the bathroom door to go back to my room. That's when I hear a noise coming from my toilet. It sounded very, very weird. Just like multiple children whispering at the same time. I wasn't scared, and yet I thought I was making scenarios and that the noise was just a problem with the pipe. So I moved closer to the toilet and approached my ear to the back of the toilet. That's where all the piping is. Only to hear the same thing but louder. I can swear to you that I heard in the pipes of my toilet at 3 a.m. voices of multiple children chatting together quietly and indistinctively. I didn't hear any words, just a quiet hubbub. I'm Muslim, so after experiencing that, I just went back to my room and read the Quran before falling asleep. I don't know why, but it, I really wasn't very scared. Later that day, I told my mom and my sister what happened, and they just told me I was paranoid and that it was just water running down or a problem with the pipes. But I knew, and I still know what I heard. Two days later, I was taking a shower in the same bathroom and at this point I've completely forgotten what had happened. At around midnight, I think when I got out of the shower, I looked at myself in the mirror and saw many little red scratches all around my torso and my breasts. They didn't hurt at all, but they were very noticeable, and I at the time didn't have nails long enough to scratch myself that much without noticing it. I even tried to scratch myself to see what it would look like. It didn't look like the scratches I had. And it wasn't caused by hot water because since I've been a kid, my grandmother always told me not to use hot water at night. It's a Muslim belief. So when I showered at night, I showered with room temperature water. Of course, it scared the shit out of me and I rushed to my mom to tell her what had just happened. She reassured me by telling me that there is really a logical explanation. But deep down, I think she was scared too. She told me to pray to stop using the bathroom, and especially water, late at night, and to put the Quran in my room before going to sleep. At this point, I was horrified, and I used the guest's bathroom instead of mine. And I never went there late at night either. It lasted a week or so, and then I started to use my bathroom again. Nothing happened for a few days, until one night. It was 9 or 10 p.m., not too late. I was in my bathroom washing my face, brushing my teeth. The usual night routine. Now, as I already said, I share the bathroom with my sister, who's not experienced anything weird in it so far. And that night, she knocked on the bathroom door. She wanted to use it. I told her I was almost done, and she'll have to wait. A few minutes after that, I heard a laugh behind the bathroom door. It was kind of a creepy, evilish laugh, and I asked through the door, my sister, you know, why was she laughing? She did not answer. So I asked again, and she still didn't respond. I then slammed the door open, and then there was no one there. I went to the living room only to find my sister talking with my mother, with the TV turned off. I started shouting at my sister and telling her that she wasn't funny, that she knew I was scared of that bathroom, and that her prank was just dumb and mean. I really thought she was pranking me. She didn't even understand what I was talking about, and the same for my mom. So I explained to them what just happened, and they both swore it wasn't them. They looked scared, and until this day, there's no logical explanation for that laugh. My phone was in the bedroom, and there wasn't any video games on, and if it did, I couldn't have heard it from my bathroom. The living room TV was turned off, my mom and sister were talking and not laughing, and once again... I wouldn't have heard the laugh if it came from the living room. As I said, this happened a few years ago, and since that time, nothing else happened in that bathroom, except three days ago. And this is what made me want to post about my story on Reddit. My sister wanted to take a shower late at night at around midnight. That's when she entered the bathroom she saw her cat in it, growling at nothing. My sister told me about it, went back to her room and waited for the next morning to shower. 
consult the cat. Vampire or no? This happened to me in 2015. I don't remember the exact month as I didn't pay enough attention to the time of year. But I do want to say it happened between April and June-ish. I had lived in a rented house that I have aptly named the Little Red Chicken House. It was small yet livable. I had smoked back then and I would always go outside to have one. This night in particular I was outside and it was still foggy. It was a foggy night. Complete overcast of fog. My town is a river town, so it's not uncommon to have thick fog during that time of year as the weather is transitioning from cold to warm. My house was one house down from the intersection of the main street. For the sake and purpose of concealing my real location, let's call it Jackson Street. The street where my house is located was on Cole Street. You'll need to know these names to follow along with me here. I was on Cole Street, and during the course of my smoking, I had walked to the intersection where Cole met Jackson. Nothing out of the norm, but then I noticed a particularly odd or peculiar piece of fog. This fog was approximately three to four feet in diameter by approximately seven to nine feet in length. Keep in mind, there is very little wind movement, if any at all, this night. This fog was following the power lines that ran parallel with Jackson Street on its own accord from north to south. Now, I'm no scientist or electric technician by any means. I don't know and I cannot say that there isn't some weird, freaky way that fog couldn't be attracted to a power line. And somehow, some ways, follows it in a straight line of movement. I dare to say that there isn't, but I'm not making the case that it can't. This fog moved at about what I had to guess is like 10 miles an hour. It enveloped all of the lower power lines and moved fluidly and perfectly. Again, it was like it had its own mind or something. Well, I'll be damned, I honestly thought. I didn't pet any more stock into it other than that it was some odd, rare natural occurrence. I watched it move along those power lines. That's when the creepy kicked in. This fog made a perfect 90 degree right hand turn without the presence of any wind or blinkers, turned itself off at Jackson Street into an alleyway at the end of my block. My town has some smaller blocks in certain places. And as it turned, it lowered its altitude a bit. I shook my head in total disbelief and I knew without a doubt that something was seriously wrong. Well, what and where are you smoking? Some of you might wonder. <laughs> well, I was smoking a typical black and mild brand plastic filtered cigar that you can probably find at your local gas station. It wasn't tampered with and I didn't add anything to it for some unwanted extra kick. Not my bag, baby. As this fog was moving down the first alley toward a fire station at the opposite corner of my block, I paralleled it on foot. I was walking down Colt Street. Again it made its second perfect 90 degree right hand turn into the alleyway that ran alongside my house. So now... It was headed south on Jackson Street, made two right-hand turns and was coming north through the alley. I know fog doesn't do that. And so, well, and so do you. I stood at the end of the second alley right beside the little patio in front of my little red chicken house and literally watched it come up toward me. I mustered some bravery, or shall I say at the time, dumber curiosity, took a few steps towards it. That fog, or whatever it truly was, had no intentions on stopping. As it approached me, I got this overwhelming sense that this entire scenario wasn't right by any means. 
I had that primal fight or flight instinct kick in and I chose flight. The fog felt predatory. I don't know how else to explain it. It felt intimidating. That's all I know. But I also know in life when something that looks like fog, smoke, mist, or vapor doesn't behave like fog, smoke, mist, or vapor, then it's not. As it came toward me, I made a beeline right for my door. I didn't even look back. I quickly closed and locked my front door behind me, and that was the end of it. No sudden knock at my door, nothing. Must have left. Let's roll to the here and now. I know enough about the paranormal and supernatural for myself. I do not and never once have claimed to be that I'm some sort of expert in these fields. I personally believe that there can't be, but I digress. And I know that predatory, independently moving fog cannot be a good thing. But here's my thoughts. The fairies. A fairy troop. A ghost or spirit. A vampire. I'm at a blank as to what it really was. I know that all of those possibilities can take a fog-like or mist-like appearance. And have heard of all of those mentioned as to, you know, what it could have been. I couldn't tell you. I've never once seen such a thing like that before, or until that night that it happened. And I haven't seen anything like it again. But I'll go on further to say that I kind of want to. That's how I roll. And if I must be completely honest, I've been looking for that fog again as of late. But who knows what a strange and wondrous world we truly all do live in. And my little dot-on-the-map town has its share of strange elements. An incident I had five years ago. To start in a typical fashion, I don't really believe in this stuff. I'd like to, and I have had small, strange incidents throughout my life that could possibly be explained, but ultimately are a little bit beyond the norm. I grew up in rural Ireland. I think in my teens the idea of the supernatural simply excited me. Being surrounded by old farmers with their strange folk tales, and even members of my family who held defiant stances against the paranormal world, but had inexplicably experienced strange things. I grew up with an eager attention towards these things, but definitely do not hold any strong beliefs. Either way, I've experienced some weird things that may interest some of you, and I intend to write a few of them up, just because. This particular situation is just what happened. I'm implying nothing nor making any assumptions or conclusions, just writing it up as it happened. About five years back, I lived with my father in the UK over summer while awaiting my uni to start again in September. It was a relatively newish house in a nice residential area of a large town. The house was at the top of a hill and nearby was a small graveyard. I had my PC set up in the dining room. It was on a table placed so that way I had my back facing a large bay window. That night my father was away somewhere. It was just me and my stepmother at home. At this point she was in bed, and it was quite late, definitely after midnight. I got a text that he'd be back in about an hour, maybe two hours' time. Despite knowing he was coming home later, while just browsing stuff, I heard a tap on the window. I instantly assumed it was my father having returned super early. I turned around and couldn't see anybody, but this didn't shake that idea that he must have been home and wanted me to open the door for him. Bear in mind... This was the back of the house, so in the adjoining kitchen there was a back door only about five feet away from the edge of the bay windows, so it did make sense for him to be tapping on the window. I get up, go to the kitchen, open the door, and find no one there. I figured, oh, well, I guess it's a strange occurrence. I shrugged it off. It was a nice night, though, and I just stood in the doorway for a minute and looked at the stars. It was only a minute, but suddenly, exactly where I was looking, I saw a weird shape flash across the sky. 
It was like a shooting star, but it was very rapidly sped in the same shape a heartbeat monitor makes and then blips up and down, only from left to right instead. That's sort of to say that it traveled in a line from right, shot up, then directly down, then back up halfway and off again in a straight line. I felt like it, like I was watching it move, but it went so fast that I basically saw the whole shape in one instant. It was about as long as your finger would cover at arm's length. Again, I just thought it was weird. Immediately after, though, I heard stuff move on the kitchen counter directly behind me. In fact, it made the exact noise of the kettle being placed on its base. So similarly that I 100% believed my stepmother had woken and was putting the kettle on. I spoke to greet her and turned around only to find the room empty and still. Thought it was weird, but I left things alone and went back to my PC. The night ended normally. Now the next bit is hard to describe effectively, and in my opinion is both more explicable but understandably hard to believe. It may also be totally unrelated to the first half of the story, keep that in mind. Over the next two to three weeks, I was harassed by a tiny shape. I remember it starting almost immediately after that night, but in no way can remember specific time frames. We had a piano in that same dining room, and in the middle of the day I was sat playing it. While playing it, I started seeing this little shadow about five or six inches tall dart behind things. For instance, I would see in my peripheral, hide behind my leg, or I would be looking at the piano and notice it move behind a picture frame on top. It didn't stay exclusively in my peripheral. It would sometimes move around quite close to the center of my vision, but just in areas I wasn't directly focusing on. It wouldn't move across large stretches at first, either. More just like I would notice it quickly hide behind things as if it had been peeking out and I hadn't previously noticed it. I remember while playing the piano this first time over this ten minute window, it happened over and over to the point where I became really frustrated and tense. It wasn't frightening at all, but so frustrating that I began stressing out. This happened, as I said, for about three weeks. And this time I also moved out of my father's house and into my new student house. I was happy to be back with my friends in a free environment but was still kept on edge by this constant shadow. I didn't mention it to anybody for the duration it happened for. It escalated at one point to where I'd be sitting in a room and see it fly around the ceiling and hide behind light shades like a bat flitting about. In the few times I clearly remember seeing it, I was alone, although it may have happened a few times with other people in the room. And then, just as it started, it suddenly stopped. And that was it. I was left alone, I accepted it, and I moved on. And that's the first of my potential incidents. Sorry for length, but I didn't want to split these two instances up. Generally consider them as one instant. I know of people who experience stress kind of through weird visual hallucin or, excuse me, hallucinations. I suppose it could have been this, although I don't remember being stressed at that time, nor for really a long period. Never experienced anything similar. Invisible Mysterious Woman on Security Cameras I'm an anesthesiologist. I work in the intensive care unit for 14 or 15 years now. The event I'm going to tell happened in 2014 when I was working in the intensive care unit in a private hospital in Izmir. We had a patient who was from Diyarbakir. Diyarbakir. D-I-Y-A-R-B-A-K-I-R. D-R Bakir. Her name was Sabiha. She was in the hospital because of the CRF and the CHF diagnosis. She was 74 years old. Since there was no room in the general intensive care unit, she was staying in the CVC, which is the cardiovascular surgery, uh, cardiovascular surgery intensive care department. 
our cardiovascular surgery intensive care department, it had three beds. I was on my night watch. My only patient was Mrs. Sabia. The intensive care unit line rang at 2.45 a.m. The caller was the night supervisor. He told me that, Hey, bet two women might come. Take them in. Let them visit their aunt Sabia. I told him, Won't the nurse complain in the morning? It's forbidden to accept visitors at this hour. He replied, It's all on me. However, the doorbell rang, so I went and opened the door. There were two women in their twenties at the door. I forgot how to speak when I saw them. They were so beautiful that I can't describe them. I helped them to wear an apron and bonnet, but they weren't speaking at all. I told them, come in. They entered. They were right next to the patient. They weren't speaking again, but it was like they were communicating with their eyes. At the same moment, the night supervisor entered and sat next to me. I was still watching them. I told the man next to me, Brother, what a beautiful two women. One of the women looked at me and smiled. Then one of the women took something around her chest area and put it in the mouth of the patient. Whoa. I suddenly stand up and yelled, What are you doing? Both of them started to scream, and I think they were afraid. The night supervisor got mad at me and told me to leave them alone. I said, Brother, don't you see they stuck something in her mouth? He replied, Don't worry. Okay. The women left and I was curious. I went and opened the mouth of Mrs. Sabiha. I saw three strings of hair in her mouth. I took them and threw them away. I asked her, Who were they? Didn't you know them? She replied, Who? I didn't see anyone. I said, Are you sure two women came next to you? No, my son, no one came. This put stress on me. I called one of the nurses from another floor. I told her that I'll take a ten minute break. I went out and started to smoke in front of the emergency unit entrance. Meanwhile, the night supervisor came. I told him, Brother, you put me in trouble this night. He replied, Hey, Bet, what are you talking about? I don't understand. I said, Brother, you sent two women to the CVC as the relatives of the patient. You told me to take them in and that you also visited me. He said, No, I didn't come and send anyone to you. What are you talking about? I said, brother, you called me and said two women will come for a visit and let them in. And then you came and sat next to me. I was really getting mad as I spoke. He said, I'm sleeping in the doctor's room in the emergency unit for three hours. What are you talking about? It doesn't make any sense. Okay, brother, never mind. And I went back. I entered the intensive care unit and sat down. I was about to get mad. Then the night supervisor came again and he told me, I bet, what just happened? Tell me. I told him what happened and he told me, Come, let's check the security camera footage. We called security and visited the room. We checked the footage. I see myself helping somebody wearing the apron and even trying it on, but those two women were not on the screen. It all looks like I'm doing everything on my own. After five minutes of footage, the door opens on its own. I said, look, here you are entering the unit, but you are invisible right now. Anyway, my shift ended in the morning, but I didn't go to my home. At noon, patient relatives are accepted. I waited for them, especially the relatives of Mrs. Sabiha. At noon, her relative came and her son and spouse. I talked with them before they entered and talked about what happened. Two of them started to laugh and said, This isn't the first. That's my dog. This is not the first. They've tried plenty of times before Habet. I replied, How, brother? I didn't understand. He said, My mother has land and fields in the village. My stepmother's trying every possible way to get these lands and fields. Spells, amulets, hauntings. She tried all the dirty work. This should be one of them. However, thank God we get rid of them all. 
Do not be afraid. Get used to it. I told him, how can I get used to this? I can't deal with such things while working. We went to the chief physician with the night supervisor and explained the situation. They transferred her to another hospital. Catholic School Haunting So this account happened several years ago. I was 18 at the time. My father asked me if I wanted to make a little extra money. Of course I said yes, and he got this contract from a school for the summer to clean and get ready for the next year. He had other jobs to do, so I helped him with this one. And of course he would pay me for the work that I did. I had worked a couple of nights with my dad. He would tell me what to do, where to go, just to get me familiar with the school and show me what keys open what doors. So once I had that down, he would leave me to go do other work while I would stay at the school. I had a morning job. So did my dad. So we would go later at night, like at 8 or 9 to start, and depending on how quickly you know, I did the job, I'd usually be done at 1 or 2 in the morning. Anyways, this school was big. Three floors, two gyms, and several offices, and a small chapel, too. There were crosses everywhere and pictures of Jesus, of course. I never felt uncomfortable. But this one night, I had just finished waxing one of the gym floors. I was alone that one night, and my dad would come back and pick me up later. It was about 11.30, and like I said, I had just finished the gym. I was walking down the hallway back to the janitor room to get more supplies. When I heard the gym door close behind me, it scared the crap out of me. I knew I had propped the door open, but I paid no mind to it. I just went back, opened the door again, and propped it open again, making sure it wouldn't slam shut. Nothing else happened for the next half hour or so, till I heard someone calling my name. It was faint at first, like at a distance, I thought it was my dad. So I waited till I heard my name being called out again, and it was much clearer this time, and it did sound like my dad. I yelled back that I was in the office. I kept cleaning, waiting for him to come my way, and I waited like five minutes. But he never came, so I dropped what I was doing and yelled again. Dad, I'm in the office cleaning. As I was walking down the hallway, that's where I heard him calling me from. That's when I realized it couldn't be him. The doors are locked so no one without a key can get in and I had all the keys with me. I checked my pocket just to confirm and sure enough, the bunch of them were there. As soon as that happened, I grabbed my cell phone and I called my dad to see if maybe he was yelling from the outside in. I get a hold of him, ask him if he was finished with his other job. He tells me he's just finishing up and it'll be there maybe another 30 minutes. My heart sank and my blood ran cold. I said, okay, I'll see you later, and I hung up. I tried hard not to think about it as I returned to the office to continue working. Aside from strange noises here and there, what really got me were the voices. Specifically, the mimicking of my dad's voice. The next time I heard my dad's voice, I was working in one of the washrooms. I was just finishing up the mopping of the floors, and I had the door held open by a bucket. As I was exiting the bathroom and moving the bucket away from the door, I could clearly hear his voice say my name from inside the washroom. There was no way it was him. I didn't hesitate to walk right in and look for him. I opened every stall just to make sure, and of course there was no one. Like I had mentioned in my last story, this school had a small sanctuary, and in the sanctuary it had a statue of the Virgin Mary, and several pictures of Jesus on a cross. Nothing that would creep anyone out, I would think. But this one time when I was repolishing the seats, I could swear someone or something was watching me. I was unsettled. I kept looking behind me, never seeing anybody there. But I did notice one thing. The statue was in a very different position than before. 
Believe me or not, I know it had been moved. Originally, the Virgin Mary had her head positioned downwards and to the right of her shoulders, eyes closed. But when I saw her eyes opened, I looked behind me and I knew something was different. Not only that, but her head was more raised and centered, as if she was looking right at me. I was so uncomfortable and just plain freaked out about it. I dropped what I was doing and left. There was no way I was going back there, and I did tell my dad that I never went back in there. And every time I would walk by there, I'd hear the organ that was in there playing. But that was only after the statue occurrence happened. Now, it could have been automated. I kept telling myself, but I wasn't going to check. I started bringing my MP3 with me and listened to my own music. Of course, I told my dad about the strange happenings, and he never did question it. I asked him if anything similar had ever happened. He said that he would hear noises and people talking as well, but he would just brush it off and keep working. On the last day that I would work there, my father and I finished up and started making sure all the doors were locked. We started to head to the main entrance and I held the door open while my dad started inputting the security code. When he finished and closed and headed my way, he closed the door and we both heard the organ just blasting. It startled both of us, it was so loud echoed through the halls. We stood there just for a second and turned around to make our way back to the car. I was so relieved that I would never set foot inside that school ever again. It all ties together. As a small child, I would see an old man every night. He looked like a farmer in a t-shirt and like bib overalls, but they hung on him as kind of did his skin. Like he was just skin and bones and he wore some kind of small billed hat. He glowed green. Every night he would walk out of my parents' room and across the landing that served as mine, my twin's room. And then down the stairs. Never felt scared or like he was bad. I always just watched him do the same thing. Him never noticing me either every night, except one. One night as his face was level with mine, he turned his head and looked at me. I wasn't scared, but I did feel as though I'd gotten caught doing something I wasn't supposed to be doing. I turned around, walked back up the stairs, and came to stand next to my side of the bed. I wasn't scared, but shut my eyes and pretended to be asleep anyway. Like I would be if my mom caught us talking after we were supposed to be asleep. I was four years old, and we only lived there a year or less, but I remember a lot of weird shit that happened in that house. Fast forward to when I was twelve. I was asking my mom if she believed in ghosts. She does, when she asked me if I did. I told her that I did and related the above story. My mom blanched white as if she had just seen a ghost herself. I asked her what was wrong, and she said, That's J.J., then she told me the following. When my oldest sister had three, excuse me, when my older sister was three, and my mom was pregnant with my next sister, nine and six years older than me, she lived in a very small house miles from the towns in central Nebraska, and her husband was at work you know, with their only car. It was sunny that day, but the weather changed quickly in the afternoon and worried my mom. The sky got ominous. The wind whipped up and my mom grabbed my sister and just took shelter in the cellar. It was loud above them like a freight train with the wind banging all around. My sister starts wailing. She actually still hates storms. My mom, a scared 17-year-old herself, and just began looking around for something to distract my sister. The first box she opened had a beautiful angel in a clear box, a Christmas tree topper. My wailing sister grabbed the box and became quiet as she gazed at the angle. Angel, I think they meant. They sat, my mom and my sister on her lap, both looking at the angle as the storm noises faded and then stopped. They stayed down there for a few hours, poking through the boxes of the previous tenants. That's before my mom was brave enough to venture back upstairs. She said, I don't know anything about tornadoes, and I don't know if, well, if or would come back or not. I would have said what? 
As she came out, she only had one shutter that had been knocked loose on the house. The corn wasn't very tall yet, and she could see the nearest neighbor walking toward her through the path of destruction left by the tornado. They assures each other safety, continued to follow the path. It seems the tornado had been aimed straight for her little farmhouse when it abruptly changed directions, etched a half circle around the house, then finished off another quarter mile on its previous heading, a straight line with a fifty-yard semicircle around the farmhouse. Lucky. Neither she nor the neighbor could believe her luck. She says that angle protected her. Is it angle? Is it angel? She says the angle protected her, and we used that topper. It's got to be an angel. On our Christmas tree every year of my childhood. Fast forward a few years, and my mom's living in a different state with the same husband and my sisters. Side note. My mom married her first husband at 13 and her second husband at 17 because he said he'd sort of pay for her divorce to an abusive first husband if she agreed to marry him. She only liked him like a brother, but took the deal and married him as she had no other means to get away from her abuser. Apparently, the poor South in the 1960s was a fucked up place to grow up. Never loved the second husband, but he was a kind man who loved her very much. She knew a woman while she was living there who claimed to be a medium and a clairvoyant. And that woman had told her, Mom says without knowing anything about her, that she had a guardian angel. It says angle, but I said angel. That had picked up from the farmhouse, his farmhouse. He had died in the farmhouse during the Great Depression of starvation. His name was J.J. She also told my mom that she hadn't met her true love yet, but that she would, and his initials would be SDS. A few months later, she got the courage to divorce again, and a few years later, she had a fling with a guy that resulted in her being pregnant with twins, myself and my twin. My dad's initials are SDS. They got married when we were five. Some things just feel more than like a coincidence. Never heard the story about the meeting before that day, and in fact, she had never told anybody because she wanted the ribbing she'd get for it. Didn't want the ribbing she'd get for it. My mom had always spoken of her guardian angle, but never by name or degree. I always assumed that she meant her Christmas tree topper, because I did know that story. Demon Creek, an event in Turkey. This story happened to a friend of mine. I share it here with his permission. My friend described what he experienced as follows. The year is 1986. There were no electricity or road in the village. The villagers had to go to Elizig, a city in Turkey, to meet their needs. The road to the center was two to three kilometers from the village. It was necessary to be on this road at 4.30 a.m. to reach Elizig. There is only one car that goes to Elizig. The car was coming back like noon. The road used to go to Elizig was called Sindresi, Demon Creek, by the villagers. And they thought that strange events were happening there, and that it wasn't auspicious. Me and two of my friends started preparing at 3 p.m. to hit the road. The road we had to cross that included the Demon Creek to reach Elazig was on our minds. First we planned to cross the Ridgeway, then the Demon Creek, and enter the highway that leads to Elazig. Afterwards we hit the road. We lighted our cigarettes while we were in deep conversation. It was utter darkness. There wasn't even moonlight. We were slowly encouraging ourselves to cross the Demon Creek and thinking about that moment. We were getting close to the Demon Creek, but first we had to cross the Ridgeway. The path was so narrow that two people couldn't walk side by side, and it was filled with big bushes. We were moving in a single line. I was the last one in the row. The first guy in the row named Kamal suddenly stopped and he mentioned that there was a black dog watching us without moving on the way thought to myself, 
It's one of our village dogs. My friends were very nervous. They were getting more scared of the stories that we had heard since their childhood. I was scared and started reciting Bismillah, the Muslim prayer. Bismillah. The dog suddenly got out of the way and disappeared after moving a few meters away in bushes. After the dog had disappeared, we thought to ourselves that the dog was what it was doing there and continued to walk. After walking for one or two minutes, Kamal suddenly stopped again and yelled, It's the same dog again, Hassan, before moving a few steps back. Three of us didn't know what to do because of confusion and fear. The dog was looking at us again. I recited Bismillah again. The dog stood up and vanished again in the bushes. My friend said, Hassan, let's go back, don't go there. I said, we need to cross this road. If we don't, we'll have to tomorrow. We'll use this road for shopping. Calm them down and we continued on our path. My friends were scared. Of course do I. We were talking about why did the dog appear to us again. I tried to calm them down and saying that it's just a common dog and it was following us. We continued on our path. We couldn't believe our eyes that we had seen after three, five minutes. A coal black goat was standing on the road, like blocking the way. We were so scared we started to pray and recite Bismillah. The goat suddenly disappeared. Well done. Disappearing of the goat made me comprehend that these events weren't ordinary at all and we got scared seriously. But going back was unnecessary. I calmed my nerves and went to the first row of the line and I just backed my friends. I was both praying and continuing our route. It was only a sharp corner left of Demon Creek. We were shocked when we finished crossing the sharp corner. What we had seen was indescribable. Long, white as snow, shiny silhouette, shape, mass, whatever. It was obvious that it had arms and legs, but its face was ambiguous. So it started to create sounds of rumble, screams, and cries. We closed our ears with our hands. We were throwing ourselves out of fear and flapping on the ground. In the same time, there was blindly shining. I started to recite my well-known prayers. My friends were yelling, cursing, and they didn't know what they were doing. I was thinking about how to escape the situation and how to stay calm. I dragged my friends out of that incident. The screaming voices turned into laughter while we were escaping from there. The laughter echoed in our minds. We head back to the village. We didn't know how we could come back. At the entrance of the village, there was a house of Kamal. When Kamal's parents saw us, they couldn't believe their eyes. They said, what's the matter with you? You have paleness in your face. We couldn't speak, trembling continuously, making noises like dummies. They informed our relatives. They also came here. They tried to grasp with the mind the situation. I rest for a while and drank some water and told them the story. The villagers were stunned. They told us to thank God that you could come in one piece. We thought that we saved ourselves, but from the sunrise to sunset for 40 days, we had heavy headaches, skin rash, huge herpes in our lips. Ew. Jin Sultan in Love With Me A Story Lived in Turkey I was 13 or 14 years old at the time. One day I went with my brother to collect firewood. As we were walking, we were just taking the brushwood that we came across on the road, which were suitable for burning and throwing them into the bag as we saw them. When I bent down, collected a bundle or two, and returned to my bag, I saw that it was full. My brother was far away from me, and it was impossible for him to do it. I still asked. Brother, I'm already in front of you. It's one thing if I'm behind you. Besides, how can I fill the big bag in such a short time? We continued on our way. We started to collect firewood by the creek. 
was hitting the dry trees with my tara, but the trees around me were creaking and falling down by themselves, resembling the sound effects in horror films. It was obvious from the outside that my brother, who realized what was happening, was frightened. In fact, I was in the same situation, but I continued to collect wood as if nothing had happened so that my brother wouldn't be more scared. Meanwhile, my eye caught on a tree that had been dragged into the stream. I said to my brother, Let's get that tree out of there. If we can do that, we won't need to collect firewood for a week. My brother grabbed the branches of the tree, pulled it left and right, but the tree didn't move, even an inch. Brother, it's impossible. As soon as I touched the tree, I didn't grasp it, I just touched it. The tree came out of the mud and the shore as if it were being pushed from behind by an invisible hand. Seeing this, my brother swore, I will never come here alone with you again. Ran away from there. I remember involuntarily shouting after him, Don't tell my father what happened. When I finished my work and returned home, I saw that my father's uncle had come to visit us. My father's uncle was a strange person who was interested in sciences of the Kawas. It was rumored to be married to a jinn who played the tambourine and stuck his head in out of burning stoves. Okay. He sat next to me. He made some gestures that I didn't fully understand, recited some prayers that I didn't understand either. Then he turned to my father and said, A bird of fortune has landed on your head. She is a very powerful person, and the sultan of his people. Or something like that. Then I learned that he was talking about a very powerful jinn who was supposedly in love with me. My father said to his uncle, Do what is necessary. We don't want to use it. They asked me my opinion, and I said, I don't want her. Keep her away from me. Then my father's uncle made a square black amulet. Wear this on your right bicep. She can't bother you anymore. So I put that amulet on my right arm, just as my father's uncle had described. That same night I had a strange dream in which someone was attacking me, and someone who was hiding her face was protecting me, but I couldn't come near me. I said to the person hiding her face, Show me your face and I'll thank you. She replied, If you want to see my face and want me to come to you, wrap that amulet in a red triangular cloth. I had a nickel for every time somebody said that to me. I did what she said, and that's when I got up in the morning. A week later, my father's uncle came to visit us again. He saw the amulet, and when he asked, why is the amulet like this? I told him about the dream I had seen. He laughed. She had the seal broken, just for herself, he said. Another night, my brother and I fell asleep in the same room watching television. My brother was lying on the sofa bed in one wall of the room, and I was lying on the other sofa bed across the room itself. Later on, I opened my eyes with a shudder. I don't know if I thought my eyes were open, because what I saw could have been a dream in reality. Still not sure about that. Anyway, a very beautiful woman entered the room. Her face was very beautiful and her gaze was full of kindness and compassion and love. She was tall enough to touch the ceiling. Next to her was a man who was shorter than her, but also very tall for us. Judging from his mannerisms and behavior, it was felt that this male was something like a bodyguard for the other. As the woman approached, I was getting scared. Her facial expression seemed to say, don't be afraid. When she was coming toward me, she was moving very slowly, as if she was trying not to scare me. I want to shout at my brother to wake up, but no sound came out. I could only turn to the woman and say, I don't want to. That beautiful woman suddenly paused. A sad expression covered her face. She came closer to me, put a red rose on my chest. The red rose from my chest to the ceiling, or rather the rose rose from my chest to the ceiling, and when it touched the ceiling, its petals fell onto me. I felt a sense of peace. Normally it was impossible for me to sleep with that fear, but I slept soundly like a baby until morning.
things we experienced in Haunted Vineyard House. As a friend group of four to five people, we visited the vineyard house. It belongs to the father of one of her friends. It was summer and the weather was nice. It was almost, well, pretty much almost evening. That's when we arrived at the vineyard house. This was because we hit the road late. After all, we were planning to spend the night there. We immediately prepared the barbecue when we arrived home and we chatted in joy and peace until 2400 hours. Although it was late, we were still enjoying tea in the open air on the porch of the house. One of us threw the bread and leftovers from our feast right across the exit gate of the garden, right bottom of a rock. One of our other friends urinated on the same rock where we left the leftovers. One of us threw the remaining embers from the barbecue in the same place. As all of these were not enough, one of us poured water on the embers, which were thrown around the rock, and of course... We didn't know that we should do all these events in those times. It was our ignorance. Meanwhile, I'd like to take note that none of us use any alcohol or any substances during these. There was another house about 100 or 150 meters away from our house. It was a ruined house with no one living in it. It was located on the mountainside. It was a completely abandoned and forgotten property. While we were enjoying our tea in the porch, suddenly the lights of this dark house turned on. They were far away from the city, it was impossible that homeless punks or junkies would be living in that house. Also, as far as we know, no electricity was provided to that house since there was no one living in it. Even we were supplying electricity with a generator since there was no permanent residence in our house. Imagine what a place it is. Although it was a mysterious event, what was frightening was not the sudden turn-on of the lights in that house. It was the thing that was looking at us from the window. It was a looking like a human, but without any exaggeration, his arms were one meter long. He had a small head with quite wide ears, but he was short. He was staring at us without taking his eyes off. When we noticed it, we started to look at each other in silence. However, everybody already understood that it was one of them, a jinn. None of us reacted suddenly or unusually since we didn't want to scare or panic each other. The man was hitting his face and watching us. From time to time he was looking right and left and then start to stare at us again. They were all remarkably strange and meaningless. Well, strange and meaningless actions. As I said, we all tried to keep our silence as we promised to each other. However, I was frozen. I almost lost consciousness due to fear. That creature made a strange sound suddenly. It was like he was calling us. Suddenly, everybody got up in fear and panic. We went to the car quickly and drove away from there at full speed. No one talked to anyone along the way, too. As I said at the beginning of my story, people have some kind of crazy courage due to ignorance in those ages. In the morning, we gathered with our friends and we talked about what we had experienced the night before. As a result, we also called our friend. They were nicknamed Haja, since he knows more than us in religious matters. In the evening, we went to that house together again. However, it was around 10 p.m. this time. Our goal was to drive the Jinns away as it was our duty. Our friend Hodja started to recite prayers there. There was also a dog next to us at that moment. The dog started to howl bitterly. Then that creature appeared at the window again. However, this time everybody was almost paralyzed. The Hodja was the first one who ran away and we followed him. The dog was running with us too. We entered the car, but it didn't start. We pressed the pedals again, but this time our friend forgot the handbrake. The dog also started to howl like a human. We started to run away, and you can burst into tears if you'd see us. I wish God will not let anybody experience such an event like this. The one we called Haja was about to faint. We left him in his house and we ran into the building. We were in the city center, but we were still afraid. 
Our family elders, whom we told our stories, found a real Haja who's experienced in these events. He treated us with his breath. Treating with breath, it's a process of reading some verses of the Quran and healing prayers next to a person to protect him from the evil eye, jinns, etc. Later on, those creatures left us alone. Otherwise, they would take us away that day. I highly recommend you not be bold in these events, no matter what. Meanwhile, according to what we learned later on, the owners of that house shot himself and suicided there. The reason why we were haunted was that we left leftovers and embers and urinated on them. We learned that leftovers are the food of jinns and things such as embers and pouring water hurt jinns. My Mother's Day Visits In 2013, I believe it was Thanksgiving Day, my sister and I found out we were both pregnant. We were both very excited to be pregnant together. We were the closest of the four of us siblings and thought it would be a great way to share this experience. I had already had two children and she had one, so the pain was gonna, you know, trying to go to each other's doctor's appointments and have a baby shower together. In January was my first ultrasound. She wasn't going to miss that, so we went to the appointment and she sat next to me excited to see her new niece or nephew. The ultrasound technician came in and began, and like I said, I had two children and my sister had one already. So looking at the screen, you could see my child, but something wasn't right. I couldn't hear anything and thought the tech might have the volume down, and then I stared at the screen, but no movement. Looked at my sister and I could tell she had the same concerns. The tech was nervous by this point and kept moving the wand around saying something, but couldn't tell you what until she said, let me go get the doctor. We both knew why. We sat there in silence until they both returned and the doctor came. Ma'am, your baby has no heartbeat and it's passed. I want to add that my sister is a very soft-hearted person and I knew the loss of my child crushed her. I, on the other hand, am not bothered by death as badly, and yeah, this was my unborn child, but I have thicker skin when it comes to this. At the time, I was okay. Fast forward to the beginning of February. I was scheduled for a DNC. This is a surgery where the doctors remove the fetus. I didn't want my sister to go to this because this wasn't really a happy time, and the mother told me that she'd go with me instead. We're also very close, so that was great. The day of the surgery, however, my mother woke up with the flu and was so sick. My dad reluctantly stepped in. Not because he doesn't love me, but because this was awkward for him. I remember laying in the bed before the surgery, my dad next to me in the chair. We were watching the news. They were calling for snow, which didn't happen often in the city that we were in. Then the nurses came to wheel me to surgery. In this part of the hospital, all of the patients were in rooms against the back wall with all glass fronts, you know, curtains for privacy. At the end of the hall were a set of double doors. You went right and then immediately left into another set of double doors to the surgery suite. I remember climbing onto the surgery table myself because I'm very stubborn. The last thing I remember is the anesthesiologist taking me and then telling me to count back from ten. I remember getting to nine, and the next thing I knew I woke up in recovery feeling like I'd been hit by a truck. My throat hurt and my body ached. I'd also like to point out, my dad's side of the family doesn't do well with anesthesia. The doctor came to see me and said that he had to put a tube in my throat because I stopped breathing. But everything else was fine. So a couple of hours later I was released. I just wanted to go to bed. We'd just gotten out of the hospital driveway in the first stoplight and it began to snow. We had a 30 minute drive and had plenty of time for small talk and enjoying the snow. We arrived at home and I asked my mother if she could watch my children so I could take a nap. By this time she was feeling better and pretty happy to do so. Now, here's where my ghost story comes to play. 
As I said before, I wasn't emotionally torn up by my loss or very religious at this point in my life. I crawled into my bed and went to sleep. Then I started dreaming. In the dream, I was back at that pre-surgery room with my gown on and those fuzzy socks they give you. But now I was alone in the room and standing at the door. Looking down the hall, I could see myself. Well, the back of me walking down the hall to the double doors. And with me holding my hand was a little boy about one year old, curly blonde hair, jeans on. But I could see his little diaper sticking out. A long sleeve burgundy shirt holding a sippy cup in the other arm. We got to the double doors and I now I was like holding on to my child's hand. The doors opened and all I saw was an extremely bright light and heard a voice saying, I'll take it from here. I woke up ruined emotionally. I was crying and heartbroken but happy all at once. My mother came to see what was wrong because she said I hadn't been asleep that long and thought I was in pain from surgery. I told her about the dream and she hugged me and started to cry with me. I know I got the chance to see my child. And now every year on Mother's Day, no matter how cold, a tiny blue butterfly always finds me. I know some people will say I'm looking for it, but I know it's my son coming to visit me. It always gets super close to me and stays for a bit and then flies off. It gives me such peace. The last thing I'd like to add is after my surgery, my sister went to the doctor and her baby had passed as well and felt guilty. It felt like she was so upset about my loss that it caused hers. Don't feel guilty. Beware the boot on the bridge. This happened to me roughly within fall of 2021. The main bridge of my town sees a lot of traffic year-round, so it's not unexpected to find various miscellaneous things there that people have either lost, forgotten, or have abandoned. One day I had errands to run for my family, which required me to cross this bridge in a total of six times. It was an ordinary day with ordinary circumstances. Aside from the fact that somebody had left a single brand new looking boot on the right hand sidewalk as you're in the lane exiting town. I was in said lane when I first noticed this boot. Now as for things being left behind on this bridge and as I've stated it didn't appear out of the norm that this article would be there. But it was a beautiful boot as far as boots go. It looked as if it may have been unisex, like a work boot in this style. It had a medium chestnut red-brown color, had metal lace clasps, which I could presume to be polished steel. It had black laces and a black, unworn, treaded sole. Yeah, I got quite the good, clear look at it. Six times that day, no less. The thing about this boot was is it drew or pulled me to want to have it. It crossed my mind to actually stop in traffic, exit my vehicle and retrieve it as if it were my own. That's to say that it gave me a rather compulsive desire to want or to have it for whatever reason. Now I'm not a hoarder, and my sincerest compassions of concern go out to those who have the affliction. And to those who know that others do, but this was only one boot. It didn't have its match. So what good was it to me? Each time I passed the boot, the urge to stop and pick it up grew stronger. I had a bit of a minor inner struggle with myself. Actually, I was trying my best not to take that boot. But reality kept spurring me. What if someone lost it and will return to claim it? What if it's stolen merchandise? This could be a setup. Now I know the last thought may seem stupid. Maybe. But it's the one that stood out to me the most. Again, for whatever reason. Maybe I'm overthinking things and no one would leave a brand new boot on a very well-trafficked bridge in order to make a drop 
or some drug or money-related deal. Again, dumb, right? Then again, the pair of shoes dangling from a power line by its tied laces seems pointless and stupid, too. These were my thoughts that day, and ultimately I didn't take the boot home with me. Approximately three days had passed since my first sighting of the boot, and in that time as I crossed the bridge it remained there. Though the desire to take it lessened due to the fact that in my mind I knew taking it would be too easy, I don't want wrapped up in some fandangled mess of having to explain myself to police or anyone else for that matter as to why I took something that didn't belong to me. I left it at that. The boot was gone, either found or disposed of after the third day, but it stuck out to me that there was definitely something way beyond just an ordinary boot lost or forgotten on that bridge. In curiosity, I tried to research if there were any urban legends or similar accounts related to a boot left on a bridge. I tried all of the better-known search engines for quite some time and no results. I don't know how much time had passed, two weeks plus or minus from my last research attempt, until the day I told this to a very close friend of mine I've known for 15 years. I told him everything as I've explained it now, and he had this to offer. Paraphrased. The boot is a very old type of spiritual trick or lure. Whomever or whatever leaves something behind in our plane of existence as a bait. Something then would draw attention and desire to take it. If you don't take it, you have nothing to fear. If you do take it, you give up all your spiritual rights, and the one who left it can do whatever they want to you as a punishment. Makes sense to me. Kind of rang a bell similar to the experiences of others regarding the black-eyed children. No. My experience isn't related to that. But I can see the resemblance in the way that somebody has to be accepted in order to have these nefarious forces to accomplish their means. I've never seen that boot or any other boot left on that bridge since. But I'm passing this along so that others may know or beware of the boots on the bridge. I might take it. I think something is impersonating my boyfriend. I've been living with my boyfriend since March. We live in an apartment, so you can pretty much hear everything because it's kind of small. Few little things that have happened. Like feeling like someone or something is watching me. Things falling, keys moving when they're laying down, doors closing. I choose to ignore it because I've been dealing with this shit for like a long time. Usually ignoring it, for me at least, will make it stop or not engage any further than the little things. Then yesterday happened, and I'm honestly a little bit scared now. So I'm taking a nap in our room and my boyfriend says he's run out to do something. So I go back to sleep. I guess like 15 minutes later I hear a door open and close and usually make noise at each other, so he starts making the noises that we do when we walk in. I was too tired to do it back, so I just went back to sleep. I'm not that much of a heavy sleeper, so I'm aware of what's happening around me. So he walks into the room, and it sounds like he drops his jacket on the ground, and I kind of open my eyes. I'm awake now, because the vibe that I'm getting from him is just... not good. Like I feel scared that he's in the room because I know he's angry at me. Something didn't feel right. I don't know how to explain it, I just know I wasn't dreaming because I moved my fingers and my arm a little. I even kicked my leg a little to make sure I wasn't asleep, or, or even having like sleep paralysis, or even lucid dreaming. I looked at the time too, it was around 5pm. He exhales angrily and leaves the room. I'm still pretty tired so I just go back to sleep but I don't know how long it was. My eyes shoot back open because I hear the dishwasher swing open and he violently starts putting the dishes away. 
I do the same again with my arm and leg, just to make sure I'm actually awake. I got scared again because he didn't get angry at me like this, and I was just thinking in my head like, I was gonna do the dishes when I wake up, but I guess you want to argue when I wake up. Bastard. And a couple of nights ago, he got a little irritated with me because I didn't do the dishes. Nothing serious, though, just a little bickering. So this is me thinking he's extra mad about it. Sat there pretty scared, then fell back asleep. I guess another 20 minutes go by, and I hear the door open and close again. I'm thinking, what the hell? Did he leave again? Not tell me? But I don't feel scared this time. I hear him put his stuff down and the TV turn on. Waited a little bit to come out, and I'm like, Hey. And he's like, Hey. He's like happy to see me and gives me a kiss, and I'm like, okay. I go and open the dishwasher, and they're still in there. Kind of gave him a look and said, are these the clean ones? And he's like, yeah, can you do them, please? I asked how long he's been back, and he says about 10, 15 minutes. You okay? So I do the dishes and brushed it off, but then I really started thinking about it. Whatever this thing knows a lot about us. It knows that we're into kind of getting to a thing about the dishes. It knows the noises we make at each other. And I swear to God, it sounded just like him. It's like it knows how to lure me to it, basically. And this isn't the first time it's talked to me in my boyfriend's voice. I was talking to a friend on FaceTime one night, and I was getting a drink out of the fridge, and I heard my name softly said. Hi, Poof my nickname he has for me. It sounded like it was right behind me. I jumped and I was like, you scared the sh- It wasn't there. Look at my friend and told her I was like, what the fuck? And another time I was sitting on the couch and I heard it again. Hi, Poof. And I looked up, walked back into the bedroom and he was sound asleep. One night was really scary because I heard this noise. It didn't sound human at all. Aw. It came from the bedroom. I was on the couch, and my boyfriend was sleeping in the bedroom. Waited a few seconds, and darted back there. Wasn't about to leave my boyfriend with whatever the fuck that was. He was sound asleep, and nothing there, and of course I woke him up and asked him if he was okay, and he was. He even told me one night he said that I came into the bedroom and stood on his side of the bed and apparently said, Why are you sweating? Which never fucking happened. I did come in later and just sort of took some of the blankets off him and said, You're sweating, but not in a rude way. And he said, I know you said that earlier. And I was like, Fuck no. He said, Yeah, you did, and you were standing on my side of the bed for some reason. And I said, I didn't, though. He was like, Okay, then. Another night, I walked back in there and whispering something to him and walked out. Apparently, whatever it is, has impersonated me, too. He also said he was sleeping one night and felt something sit on the end of the side of the bed. He quickly turned the TV on and didn't tell me till the next day. Three Open Graves in the Field about five years ago, late in the evening, I was sitting with six of my friends, one of whom was an imam, and we were chatting. During the conversation, the topic turned to the subject, and finally we started talking about jinns. We realized that dry talk about jinns doesn't excite us. Let's go out into the forest, thinking that maybe we would meet one. Anyway, we were wandering the forest, chatting and chatting. It was around 1 a.m., and we're moving through the forest. But at the same time, we were scared. But nobody shows that they're scared. The forest is pitch black. We move forward with the phone light. After walking like this for a while, the forest area ended and we reached a grassy field. There we discovered three grave-shaped pits about 1.5 meters deep, which I guessed had probably been dug by treasure hunters. After seeing these pits, I started to get scared. We'd better go back now. Let's not fall victim to a blind bullet by hunters here. But my companions ignored me, continued to examine excavations with curiosity. I mean, okay, three graves dug in the middle of a field were interesting as well as scary. 
but I wasn't sure what my friends had found in these pits to examine so much. Were they going to find treasure or corpses just left in these open pits or graves? Even my friend, whom I called my imam friend, was bent down like the others examining one of the pits with careful eyes. Suddenly something hit this imam friend in the chest very violently. We couldn't even see what hit him, but the sound of the impact was very bad. My friend was thrown back three meters by the impact and fell onto his back. He stayed where he fell. We all froze. I thought my friend was dead. If that thing that hit my friend was a physical substance, it would have been impossible for us not to hear the whistling sound of an object coming at that speed. Also, after the impact, that object would have had to somehow bounce back or fall to the ground, just like it did to our friend. But there was no object that we could say. This is what hit him. My first involuntary reaction was to start reciting Falek. Falek. Falak. F-E-L-A-K. Dash. N-A-S. But I say, Kul Yezu by Rabil Falak. And the rest doesn't come. And I say, Kul Azio Birabanas. And the rest doesn't come. You know when you're in a nightmare state and you're awake and you want to shout, call someone, or recite a prayer, but you just can't? I couldn't pronounce the suras that I'd memorized since my childhood. And after reciting the first verses of these suras, I knew by heart I was locked as if I was tongue-tied. Couldn't read the rest. I feel ya. Thus, about a minute or so passed. After we got over the initial shock of this unexpected event, we lifted our friend up. He wasn't in as bad of a condition as we thought. He was able to stand up and walk. He was just a bit dazed. He was also a bit dazed just like us. After lifting our friend to his feet, we panicked and said, let's get out of here and set off. We started to walk back the way that we had come in silence, with all of our timidity. We had walked 150 meters or so, and we were just near the end of the field where the beginning of the forest when we heard two people talking at the same time. Cracking sounds come from the forest. We all stopped at that same time, we looked at each other. This fearful silence lasted for a while. It's hard to say really how long it lasted. To make sure that we had heard the same thing, we all stopped for the same reason. I asked the friend walking next to me why he had stopped. He said he heard his voices talking. Yep, now we were sure. We were not alone there. One of the instinctive cautions, we all listened to the sound coming from the forest. The sounds of talking kept coming. But the voices that we heard speaking were not in our language, or rather in any language that we could understand. Someone or something said strange words that I still remember today, even though it's been a long time since the incident such as Arak Varak Tarak, which didn't make any sense to us. Another voice, as if responding to him, pronounced some other meaningless words, such as Gara Kuru Daki Madak. The Imam started reciting some prayers for protection. After what we had just experienced, it was not wise to go into the forest, but it was the only way to reach the roadside where we had parked the car. The first time we had entered the forest with a smile, now we entered the forest out of fear, reciting prayers. We came out of the forest reciting prayers. We finally reached the road when we reached our village, our home, and talked about what we had been through until morning. But we couldn't come to a conclusion, other than the conclusion of tonight's stories. See ya. My uncle had a demonic experience. My mom had three brothers. She was the second child, her oldest brother, let's call him Dan. They died at the age of 24, eight months after my grandma died at 42. The other two brothers of hers, my uncle, are twins. One of them is mentally ill, but the other is healthy and well. He has a family and ten kids, by the way. Let's call him Ben. After my grandmother had died, there were some weird things happening to him. Firstly, he had bad dreams. He saw my grandmother unfolding a, a black blanket in front of him. 
It was his first nightmare, but he didn't give it any attention. After a while, Dan had suddenly died at 24, as I said. It was a shock, his brother Ben was heartbroken, but he hasn't showed very much emotion during that time. The time has passed. We were healing from our loss, and the first weird thing happened to Ben. It was the Christmas Eve evening. I was sleeping in the same room with my grandfather. In the other two rooms, there were my uncle sleeping, the twins, and my parents. I was five years old at the time. My grandpa had a glass window in his bedroom door. Sometimes around 3 p.m. my uncle had been jumping through the door's glass, hurting his hands, screaming, and making signs with his hands. Unable to talk. It was frightening. After we got better, he realized that in his dream in which he was dying, he unconsciously ran and jumped through my grandpa's door. At that point, we should have known there was something off going on with him. But everyone just ignored it. After another couple years, he began dating his wife. He was missing most of the time and got out in the club, and shortly after, she got pregnant with his first child. They moved in together, and that was the moment paranormal thing began to happen more often. She told us that he used to wake up at 2 a.m. and go to the cemetery where my grandmother and uncle are buried. At first, she thought he was cheating, so he asked a neighbor to help her follow him. They found out that he was sitting in front of his brother's grave and was talking to him. The weird thing is that it seemed like he had a dialogue, not a monologue. Then he went back home, and the next day wasn't even talking about it. Other time, before they had their first child, they were at the club. He suddenly disappeared from the crowd, so she started looking for him. She found him standing on the edge of the club's balcony looking down at the river that was running by. He was staring, but didn't move. She called him, tried to pull him off the railing, but he wasn't moving at all. She asked for help. There were three men who tried to pull him away from the balcony, but it seemed like he was too heavy. Then he started to take a step in the deep. Fortunately. Take a step in the deep. Fortunately, the men were quick to drag him, saving his life. After he cleared his mind, he told him he saw his deceased brother in the river, telling him, Come on, brother, let's play as we used to when we were kids. I miss you. Creepy. After another year, they had their second child, and it was a boy this time. My uncle had always wished for a boy, so the child was extremely special to him. On one night when they were all sleeping, he saw a tall man dressed in black and white. He had a face he couldn't see. That man bent over their bed trying to catch the little boy. That was the moment my uncle stood up from his bed, took his shoes, and was ready to run after the man he saw. His wife woke up and asked him what happened. He looked at her with an ice glance and lifted her two feet off the ground. She was terrified. Somehow managed to slap him on his face and he came back to reality. After he made his mind clear, she apologized. She apologized to her and told her about what he saw. Hmm... The years passed. Nothing weird happened anymore until it started again. This time, the real-life nightmares were very often. He was seeing hands. Yep, only arms with fingers. They were in black gloves that weren't letting him sleep. And this was happening no matter how much he tried to push them away, no matter how many times he told them he's not afraid of them. They were just not going away. My mom found out about this episode after three months since it was happening. She asked me what we should do in studying theology. So I recognized the demonic activity. So I guided him to a good priest I knew. He gave him a special prayer to say every day and the thing stopped happening. My uncle was baptized, but he never confessed a sin, never took communion, and not even married before God. That's why I think he suffered all these things. There are many other episodes I've not related here, but the point is, the devil is real and God's help and protection is required for every human being. Four Deaths in My Family Okay, 
So on to the first experience. I was around six at the time and playing outside when I suddenly really had to use the toilet. So I'm sprinting to the house to go do my business and as I pass the front window, a disembodied hand appears on the opposite side of the window pane. It clenches its fist, knocks on the window three times before vanishing. Me, being a brave but dumb six-year-old who would be first to die in a horror film, makes the wise decision to go inside anyway and ask who's there. Of course, no one answers since my parents are outside gardening and my other living sibling are also outside playing. Notice how I said living. At the time, I had one other deceased sibling who had died many years prior in that same house. I like to think the disembodied hand was that brother trying to scare me into peeing myself, but joke's on him because I managed to hold it in. Now the creepy thing is that after we moved, that house flooded twice before burning down. All that's left is an empty lot. Part of me thinks that my brother stuck around to prevent natural disasters, and once we left, he left too. Cut to a decade later. This is when we get into the really heavy stuff. So be warned. I feel warned. For a couple of months prior to my 17th birthday, I had recurring dreams about being diagnosed with cancer, which was odd because it was something I'd never worried about before. Then on my birthday, I had an absolutely terrifying dream that my sister was going to die so vivid that I woke up sobbing and even told my mom that I thought my sister was going to pass away soon. She didn't believe me. And sadly, by the time my sister came home, I convinced myself it was just a dream, too. I never warned her. That was a mistake. A month later, she passed in a car accident. At this point, I'd like to remind all those reading to be careful driving in the winter especially when ice is partially melted and slippery. The narrator seconds that notion. Another weird thing with my sister's death is she seemed almost subconsciously aware that she would die soon, even though it was unexpected, and that I failed to warn her. She told my mom multiple times in the months leading up to her death to make sure to let her horse see and sniff her body and if she ever passed away so that she knew she didn't just abandon them. About a week after my sister's death, my dad's biopsy results came back. This is where the cancer dreams become relevant. Turns out he had stage 4 cancer for a while, prior to diagnosis too. Same cancer I'd been dreaming about. Not a year later he passed away. At the time I was devastated, it was unimaginably painful to lose two family members back to back. I was also dealing with guilt and dissociation and... Reality felt unreal, especially with the prophetic dreams blurring the lines between past, present, and future. Sadly, this was not the end of those dreams. Cut to four years later. I started having suicide dreams a few months before college winter break. Later, while on break, I found out that my brother had been depressed and suicidal for these some past few months. I talked to him about it and told him that I was there for him and that I loved him no matter what. But I guess that wasn't enough. Thought he was doing better. He had just gotten a new, well-paying job, and we had just finished a nice family dinner, and something we hadn't had in quite a while. He went downstairs to his room, and I went upstairs to bed. That night I had another suicide dream, but in hindsight, this one was different from the rest. It felt more like a visitation dream. In it, my brother led me downstairs to his body. He explained to me why he did what he did. Not with words, but with emotions. I could feel what he was feeling. He then said, he had to go now, and I woke up screaming. You'd think I would have learned my lesson by now, but I guess not. I convinced myself that it was just a dream, and I decided to go downstairs to do some laundry, and I found his body instead. It was lying in the exact same position it was in my dream. Because of the way it was propped, I thought he was still alive and went to say good morning before I realized that he had passed. 
For a few days after, I couldn't sleep because all I could see was my brother's body. But one early morning, it just stopped and I could sleep again. I suspect that my brother was helping reduce my PTSD from the other side. Rest in peace. Shapeshifter There was a village in some southern part of the city, and it was quite rural. People won't visit there after dawn. People living there had some great stories to tell, so I visited once to clarify if the stories they tell is, well, whether they're true or just a hoax. So I met a person there named Tarun. He was calm and the silent type of a person. I said to him that I just want to visit this place for a very long time. Especially since I heard great rumors about this village from people around the city. Tarun said that you heard it right. That was not a rumor. I said, what? Then why are the people here so scared of? He said when the moon is full it turns to red and people could see a wolf man roaming around and killing people who ever want to hunt him comes in his way. He said, are you sure of what you're speaking? He said, come near the Purnima, the full moon. Come near it this month, and you'll get to know what we're looking at. I took it, and let's find out the mystery behind it. I left that place that day, since it's going to be dawn and return the night before Purnima, full moon. I returned with my bags and belongings, and to my luck, I found a small inn where I could rest for a night or two. That night nothing happened as I was awake all the time in the morning. Nothing mysterious happened. I went to see Tarun and he was not in his house. What a typical person he was, he left his house open and no one was inside. That day the street was also empty and the crows were feeding on dead animals beside the road. A horrifying scene. I checked in my room, took my meals, and the rest of the day just went reading and lying on the bed. As in time of dawn, I heard a howl, like a big adult wolf out for his hunt. I quickly looked out of my room and I saw the inn owner running toward his home. I asked what happened. He said, just remain inside and don't come out of your room. The devil had come. I saw it toward the moon and I was just turning to red like a blood moon. I remembered what Tarun had said, so I was ready to see if it was real. Then I could hear the cows mooing from a nearby farm and the people came out with whatever weapons they had to hunt that beast. That wolf man killed two cows with a single stroke of his hand and dragged his prey before the farmers could even arrive at the spot. I was ready to join with the hunter's group and I brought an axe from that village that day. It was a traditional axe, sharp and effective. So I was with those farmers looking for that beast and hunting. Some carried two barrel guns and shotguns with cartoons, which was good for hunting that beast. I was with them there and I met a young boy around 30 years, I guess. He was the son of the chairman. He carried a gun, so I felt safe with him. Then we heard men crying from the north as the group split up to smaller groups, fled in all directions. We run towards them and we saw two men lying on the ground, badly wounded. One's arm was ripped off with blood spilling all over the place and the other had got a bite on its neck, breathing his last breath. I said, oh my god, what is that thing? The chairman's son replied, these creatures kept coming for a very long time. They kill their friends and family and whoever gets killed by his bite turns like that beast. Keeps killing again and again so the infected must be burned, not buried. To kill that beast, infection, it's deadly. Then at the top we heard the howl. The chairman's son and his friends run to it and I was also with them. There we saw that thing. The boy took a shot from his gun but missed. Everyone fired at that thing but it was too fast. Now they began tracking his footprints and followed to hunt. Suddenly, a gust of wind passed right by my ears and I knew that it was near and I screamed. They saw that beast was running toward me. That boy fired the bullets and hit that beast in his leg. I was like a bait for them. Everyone had guns, but I didn't. Suddenly that beast disappeared and came from behind those men and ripped one's head off from his body. 
before anybody could fire, I threw my axe toward it and hit its body, and he was wounded. I went inside his body and he kept hanging there. I fired multiple shots, but that thing wouldn't die. Suddenly, that beast jumped toward the chairman's son and bit him. As he was in combat with that beast, his gun fell on the ground and it fell near me. I took it in my arms, pulled the trigger, aiming right through his eyes to his head. The bullet made a hole in its head, splashed his eyes out and brain opened, and he fell two feet across the body's boy. The boy's body. The boy was saved, and the remaining men came to see that beast's body, and guess what we saw? The beast was turning out to be a human, as if it shapeshifts. Slowly recognized him. It was Tarun, laying down there. Is an imitator always aggressive? I work in a basement at a bank. I have several co-workers. I love my job. Everybody gets along great. The basement's well lit, cheerful, tastefully decorated. Very nice. And recently renovated. We have very comfortable catered conditions. We have fun conversations throughout the day. Nothing creepy at all, except for the old vault. It's an underground tunnel which used to connect to a bank across the street, but it's been sealed off in the middle, so now it's just a creepy underground tunnel in the electrical closet. But I don't feel it's malicious, it's just that dark unknown tunnels are just naturally creepy. A couple of years ago, before the basement was renovated, a few loan officers were still working in their offices in the basement after 5.30. A normal occurrence. On one end of the basement was one of those big plastic trash bins on a rolling cart. Suddenly, the trash can on a rolling cart made its way across the basement floor before rolling to a stop in a now call center. The room went silent. Everybody quickly left together, unnerved. Being a bank, cameras record inside 24-7. They kept the footage of the basement from 5.45 to 6.15 and saved it in our internal server. Nothing extraordinary happens in the footage, a few bugs with discernible bodies and wings flying in and out of frame in an erratic pattern. Then there are orbs. There's literally nothing else I can call them, they're clearly round circles that move smoothly. Occasionally disappearing, but reappearing exactly in the path you'd expect them to be moving in. I'm sure I can find a way to share this video if there's enough interest. And worst case scenario, I can use my phone to record the computer screen. We've been down in the basement for about seven months now, since the remodel and renovation was completed. There's nothing to report save for an extremely small and minor, but reoccurring occurrence. Reoccurrence, you could say. Our call center is made of cubicles that you cannot see over unless standing. My co-workers and I have all been alone in the call center at one point, and each of us have experienced the sound of somebody sitting idly at a desk across from yours, directly across or diagonally. Not discernible typing, but the sound when somebody just kind of rests their fingertips on the keyboard when they're thinking of what they're going to type. Brief movements of the mouse on the desk and general desk shuffling like brushing aside pens and paper. It was to the point where each of us have at one point asked aloud, Oh hey, didn't realize you were back from lunch already. Only to be met with silence, because co-worker is still at lunch. One of the offices in the basement needed some kind of work done in it. So they moved the manager who works in that office across the basement to another office temporarily. He's already back to his old office, but he wonders if something about that office being occupied has some kind of effect on the energy. The manager from that office could see the Christmas tree in the middle of the basement. Yep, it's almost March and still up, whatever. One day, just a week ago, movement caught his attention and he watched two ornaments on different sides of the tree fall, roll and meet each other in front of the tree. A note that these were his personal ornaments he brought from home to decorate the tree with, he took them home today. The manager would frequently yell out, Hey John, come over here! across the basement when he was in his original office. Now all he had to do was speak it to an inside voice since he had temporarily moved into the office next door to the employee. They had several times summoning him to pass on a report that needed to be done or a member that needed to be called. 
On the last day of being in the temporary office, John heard his boss say from the office next door, Hey, John, come over here. He got up and went to the office to ask what boss needed, only for the boss to tell him that he never summoned him. John swears that he heard this clear as day in his boss's voice. That was last week. Today, as my coworker Kayla ends her call, another coworker, Tiffany, asks, Hey, why did you say my name on that call? What's up? Thinking she had previously spoken to the member, Kayla tells Tiffany that she never mentioned her name. Tiffany states that she heard Kayla clear as day say her name. The energy that resides in the basement is always described as friendly and harmless. And I agree, even with my involuntary shielding ability, it seems to bear no ill will. But the mimicking is new and honestly kind of gives me the creeps. Is every mimic definitely malicious? And should we attempt to release it and free ourselves from it? Ignore it. Could this be a peaceful energy that simply enjoys mimicking? Or that's all I really knows how to do, maybe. Skinwalker, I think. So around six months ago, I was over at my cousin's house and we were asleep. My younger second cousins and my stepsisters all decided to get drunk, take alcohol from my uncle's cabinet. They're minors and females, which is also important to the story as well, like 17, 15, and 15. I believe that, but they got into trouble the next day, so there's that. Anyway, my cousin who goes by the name of Nick and or excuse me, goes by the nickname, Jay, woke up at the same time as I did, which was very strange at 2.30, almost 2.40 a.m. Like 30 seconds later, my cousin gets a phone call from my stepsister's phone, and on the other end was my cousin, the 17-year-old. She was broken into tears, and both I and my cousin, 18-year-old male, got the chills. Now, he lived in a small town, literally in the middle of nowhere, so Jay told me to get dressed, as he also frantically got dressed himself. He said that his sisters and my stepsister are lost, and that one of my younger female cousins and my stepsister, the 15-year-olds, were so drunk that they were walking. Down the road, a dog followed them, and their cat, the owner is my 17-year-old female cousin, they followed them too. When the dog disappeared, and the cat disappeared off into the woods, they started looking off into the woods. So we get into Jay's truck, start driving like over 80 and a 45 to get there fast to get him. Now, here comes the scary part. So there was a light from the stars and moons we could see clearly. Until we go over the railroad tracks, then it suddenly became pitch black to the point where even with the brights, we can only see about 10 feet ahead. We both got the coldest chills ever. And then we picked up my two female cousins and my stepsister. Now we drive back to the house and get everybody inside safely. My 15-year-old cousin and stepsister falls asleep instantly due to being too drunk. However, my other female cousin, the 17-year-old, didn't. And she said that she heard voices, dangerous, non-human voices. They were all calling them into the woods. The 17-year-old didn't fall for it. However, my other cousin and stepsister did fall for it and started following the voice. My cousin tried her hardest to get them to stop, but they wouldn't. Not until my cousin and I got to them where the voices stopped instantly. Now, my cousin and I knew something was wrong. And we were 100% correct, because something, or more like things, followed us out. So fast forward a few days and my cousin's cat returns, which is normal, by the way. We thought everything was fine, you know, I kept getting super, super bad chills, but that was nothing new. So eventually I thought that whatever it was left, but... I was wrong. So a few days later, my cousin was at work, 
The girls were at school, and my aunt was at work also. So it was just me and my uncle in the house. Him in the living room, and me on the other side of the house in my cousin's room, just scrolling TikTok. Then I heard breathing. Heavy, deep, but soft breathing that eventually turned into a growl. A low, deep growl that came from no animal I know of. Right outside my cousin's window, too, which was covered in a thick, heavy blanket. I slowly turn around and look at it. It was just there on the other side of the window, and though I could see it, I'm not sure it could see me. Then I started moving and the growl got deeper following me and then stopped as I moved in front of my cousin's back door, which was locked, and I saw through the window at the top of the door. A small black shadow It ran in front of it, and it looked like it was about seven or eight feet tall. So because of that, I ran to the living room where my uncle was. Chilled with him until my cousin got home, and I told him everything that happened to that. But since then, nothing like that's happened since. And I don't know what beast was following me, or if it is still. But I just wanted to share that experience I had, and ask what you'd think it was. And what that thing was that was stalking me. And do you think I'll be seeing it again later? Please tell me, I need to know. Banshee visits in Irish countryside. We lived in a bungalow in the Midlands. I had my own room, box room, nothing fancy, with like a bunk bed up against the wall, to the right of the door and the window on the far left side of the opposite wall. These bits are relevant, I'll explain in a bit. One night in August of 2000, I was eight. It would have been late in the night, and I woke up and looked out the window. From what I know now, it was the Banshee. Some people might be dubious. They have their own options and opinions, but from what I saw, it corresponds to previous accounts. My granddad, maybe grandma or grandpa, had a similar one out by Sandy Mount. The banshee was like a fluorescent yellow, brushing its hair and floating. That's what got me. It kept coming toward the window, had its mouth open, flesh missing in parts of the face, and it wore what looked like a dress or a nightdress. Anywho, I saw this coming toward the window and I was stuck, half in amazement and half in fear. Thinking back to it, it felt like I was being beckoned some innate feeling of needing to wait. Only when I realized that it was approaching the window did I bawl out for the folks. A few days later, a friend of my parents died, heart attack on his tractor. We then moved a few years later to my mom's family home. Folks bought it. A few years ago, my dad and myself went into the house having been out. We both heard someone run from the top of the stairs, across the landing, and toward my folks' room. It was child's footsteps. My brother was only young, but still able to climb the stairs, so we thought, crap, maybe it's him, or my younger sister. Turned out they were both still in the car. When we moved into the house initially, my parents told us the story of how one night in the room below them, they heard children singing Ring-a-Ding Rosie. Hmm, I call it Ring Around the Rosie. And they were laughing. There's been some crazy stuff. Pipe smoke by the old fireplace, flashes of something in the corner of your eye, and our shed. Got a homemade gym out there, and man, there's something not right about it had this feeling of being watched that all of us get when we're out there. My man won't go in at times because of it. I had another encounter last year with what I reckon is the Banshee. We have an old mobile home that we gave to my grandparents years back when they came to stay with us. I use it to study in, you know, when uni exams come around. 
This time, I was out there working away on the laptop with some music playing. I heard some whining and wailing in the background. In fairness, this mobile home isn't the greatest of shape. It's missing a second front door and we do have cats. The only thing is, this wasn't like the cats wailing as I've heard them before. It was mournful. As you can expect, the volume went up and I sat until eventually it just dissipated. The following day, a local man who lives on a hill we can see from the house died. It's funny, I was talking to my sister last week and she reminded me. A few years ago, I went to the States around July. She remembers waking up one night and looking out of her bedroom door. It's a box room that's quite, you know, continuous with the landing. She looked out and saw this figure, pale white mouth open, gazing at her from the window next to my bedroom door. Needless to say, she doesn't like the window. Again, a neighbor died the following day. One more and I'll leave you to it. My granddad died in 2006. A few weeks later, I was in the sitting room reading paper when I felt a pinch on my back. I checked the mirror and there were nail marks in the skin. Funny thing was, my granddad used to do it a lot to me as a kid. Plus, we were really close. My home is an 18th century Georgian farmhouse. So it's got the works. Unwanted Spirit Started about two weeks ago now. Small things here and there, knocking noise, hearing footsteps. There's nothing for me to be too worried about. I was usually alone until my wife started to hear things too. That would be when she was alone and also when we were together. I started to get more attentive about it when I, you know, brought my nine-year-old a new tablet. Not even four days old. My family and I were all downstairs watching a movie. That's when we heard a loud crash from upstairs. It startled us a little, so I went up to go see what it was. I looked around and found my daughter's brand new tablet on the ground, smashed and face up. It wasn't the only thing either. She had a couple of trinkets and plushies laying in the middle of the floor. Now, from where it fell off, I had to assume there was a small bedside table. I was definitely more upset than scared, but now I had my radar up. It started ramping up the knocking and the footsteps around my house. And it has an added bonus, my youngest, she's my daughter of three, started to talk to something more often and she started shouting, stop at her, don't do that. Then one day I was looking after my aquarium that sits in my living room. My three-year-old was playing with her toys in the middle of the hall, and I have a clear view of her in her bedroom from where I was standing. If you can imagine looking straight down the hall and looking into her room, the first thing you'll see is her bed. And somewhat on top of her bed, she has like a fort or a teepee, if you will. Anyways, as I was cleaning the tank out of the corner of my eye, I see the teepee start tipping over. It was tipping onto its side. I look up from what I was doing and it looked like it was going to fall over. That's when my three-year-old turns and looks into her room and shouts, Stop that! It goes back to its original position. I had chills. I grabbed her and said it was okay. I asked her what she saw and who it was that she was screaming at. She said it was the monster daddy. Now, what was the last straw with me it was just on Monday. It was about 10 p.m. and my wife had just put both kids in bed. My littlest one will come in and out of her room to ask for some juice or milk. Maybe she needs to pee or whatever. It was just what she does. And we're used to it. Well, this night, after the many times of her getting out of bed, we finally got her down, or so we thought. My wife and I were sitting on the couch watching TV when we started to hear the door handle of her room jiggle. Soon we knew she was awake and about to come out. But she didn't. The door kept opening and closing, not fully, but just enough to hear it unhinge and close again. 
We paused the show that we were watching just to make sure, and sure enough, it was her door opening and closing, opening and closing. I was upset, and I got up quietly to go in and surprise her, catch her in the act, tell her to go to sleep. As I approach the door, I clearly see... I see it. So I timed it to when it would be back in the open position. So all I had to do was push the door. It wasn't my daughter. The door flung open and my daughter was in bed covered in her sheets. She looks at me. I was stunned to say the least at that moment. I knew it wasn't her. I asked her, were you playing with the door? I knew it wasn't her, but I wanted to see what her response was. She tells me yet again. It was the monster, Daddy. She slept in her bed that night. And like I said, I had enough. It's that same night after my wife got my daughter settled into her bed, I went back into her room and decided to confront whatever this entity that was in my house and just what it was. I had the light on, went to the center of the room and told the spirit that it was not welcome in my house. I didn't want it here and that it did not belong here. I ordered it to leave in a firm voice. As if I knew there was someone there, I wasn't scared, just upset about this whole situation. As I was speaking, the lights in the room started to flicker on and off. I didn't stop, I kept repeating myself over and over again until it stopped. Not sure how long it lasted, but when it did stop, I prayed. There's been, well, really no more activity since. But I'm still watching and listening and waiting with hopes that whatever was there is gone. If anybody has maybe some suggestions on what else I should try, please let me know. I don't want whatever is there to come back. Death Dreams With reluctance, I've decided to share another part of my life that I haven't shared with anybody beside my family and my husband. For as long as I can remember, I've had dreams right before somebody passes away. Most of the time it's been family members, but sometimes it's been people I don't know. I'd first like to point out that my family is familiar with deaths. I say this because we have a large family and are pretty close with each other. My husband and I were discussing death, and why we were so uncomfortable with it. He shared that he had only had about five people he was close to pass. I had like 33 that my mother, father, and myself could think of. I would have rather had vague dreams about the deaths, but most of the time, due to the circumstances, I could discuss or decipher who it was. The two that stand out most are my grandfather's passing and my mother's cousin. My mother's father was a very hard-working brick mason. He'd never show weakness. When he was a child, he and his brother had to have blood transfusions. Both of them, unfortunately, got leukemia. My grandfather's brother chose to do chemotherapy and passed when I was two. My grandfather chose to take chemo pills and lived until I was ten. Like I said earlier, my grandfather was a brick mason and a very hard worker. He worked up until a week before his death. We all know when he stopped working that the cancer had gotten better of him. For that last week, my mother and her sisters called in hospice nurses. They're the end-of-life nurses, essentially. The night that everybody was sure it would be his last, my mother and father called my father's aunt and uncle to take us to their house for the night. My entire life I remember going to kiss my grandfather and telling him goodbye. I remember my great-aunt and uncle being there to take us to their house for the night, but I never really remembered going to their house or waking up to go to school the next day. But I remember the dream I had, like I was present in a room as my grandfather passed. In the dream I was standing at his bedroom door watching his breathing slow, watching his daughters coming in and out of the room and eventually all of them gathering together as he took his last breath. I would also like to point out that my mother knew about my dreams and came to accept them. The day after his death, I remembered my mother and father coming up to the school to pick my sisters and I up. I still see her walking down the hall to meet us with absolute sadness on her face. I was the oldest, and my sisters were still pretty young. So she looked down at me and said, Pawpaw had passed. I was confused in my little ten-year-old mind why she was telling me this when I really thought I was there. 
I told her. I know, Mom, I was there. She told me I wasn't there, but asked why I believed I was. So on the way home, I told her about my dream, and I could see my parents exchanging glances in the front seat. Later in life, she told me my dream was accurate with the events that went on that night. But how do you deal with a child that has these dreams? The next dream happened when I was a little bit older. I would say I was about 15 or 16. At the time, my mother's uncle was diagnosed with stage 4 pancreatic cancer. He was a very sweet man who was religious and loved to play the guitar. The one thing that stood out to me about him was his fingernails. I thought for a guy they were pretty long. The family knew he was pretty sick and his passing would be soon. I went to bed like normal with no discussion of his looming passing and I hadn't thought about it really. In this dream I could see a casket. I went down the arm to see long fingernails but I could also see flames behind the casket. I woke up distraught. All I could think about was this very religious, very kind-hearted, loving man going to hell. If he went to hell, then I wasn't making it to heaven. I jumped out of my bed to talk to my mother about my dream. I flung the door open and she was already on the phone. She was upset and I thought I knew the news that she was receiving. After she, sh after she hung up the phone, before she could say anything, I asked it, was it her uncle? She said no, it was her cousin. Apparently, her cousin and her husband had kind of went to bed and sometime during the night her house had caught on fire. They had both passed. Everything in my dream came rushing back to me and it all made sense now. The very feminine nails, the flames, all of it. I told my mother about my dream and how I thought her uncle had went to hell. I was death of her cousin, but I was still relieved that I didn't dream of somebody going to hell. My fiancé and I saw a spirit at her mother's house. So last week we spent a week at my fiancé's family at my mother-in-law's house. Everything was fine when we got there, but the second day that we were there, her grandmother tells us that a couple was murdered in the house several years ago. They even showed me the article for it later in the week, and I'm torn. I really want to share the article, but it includes a picture of the house which would essentially dox them, and I don't want to do that so I'm intentionally being vague on the location details. Anyway, this was creepy, but not a huge deal, but she told us this well, because my fiancé, my fiancé's grandmother, and my fiancé's uncle, they'd both seen things in the house. One being a time where the chandelier in the dining room was swinging, and when Grandma rebuked it in Jesus' name, it stopped. And my uncle-in-law saw it too. Another time they saw a woman walk out of my mother-in-law's bedroom, turn around and walk back in. But my mother-in-law wasn't home, and again, Grandma and Uncle Manny saw it. We were all kind of skeptical because nobody else in the house had any experiences. So on the third night, my fiancé was complaining that she needed to go to the bathroom upstairs, but it was dark. We were staying in the basement, so I offered to go with her. She had to go with me outside to get our charger out of the car, and then we left. It was really dark outside, too, and I didn't want to go alone. Side note, my sister-in-law and her stepdad left earlier in the day to go visit family, and had been gone for a while. So about 20 minutes before we decided to go upstairs, four of the dogs in the house started barking. We assumed that they had gotten home. We head upstairs, and my fiancé has her phone light on, and when she opens the door, we notice the sink light in the kitchen is on. It's usually off at night, but again... We attribute it to her dad and being home, or her stepdad, rather. So when you open the door from the basement, you enter pretty much in between the kitchen and the living room. The kitchen's on the left, living room on the right. There's also a dining room across from the basement door on the other side of the wall, so you can kind of walk into the living room, then turn left into the dining room, then turn left into the kitchen. So it's essentially a circle. With that established, on to the encounter. She opens the door, I'm still a few steps behind, so I'm about eye level with the door and I see a pair of legs facing away from us in the living room. Then they turn and walk into the dining room. We walk to the top of the steps and I notice it's really quiet and I wait for whoever was there to come around the corner. 
But after a second of hearing nothing and seeing no movement, my brain went into denial mode. I started to think I was mistaken, hadn't seen anyone, until my fiancé says unprovoked. I'm not crazy, I just saw someone. Which I immediately confirmed that I did too. So we thought that maybe her stepdad was methin with, excuse me, messing with us. Because this is something that he would do. So we give out a couple hellos before my fiancé goes into the living room on the right night and just stands in the kitchen. So if he was hiding around the corner, he would have to pass by me to get away. She confirmed my fears and said, There's no one here. I triple check by going around the other way to confirm that no one else is in the room. I'm Christian, and I always thought in that situation I'd be something kind of saying like a mighty prayer, you know, to rebuke any spirit, but instead I squeaked out in Jesus' name and before we booked it to her mom's room and just woke up to tell her what we saw. We eventually went to the bathroom together, prayed in the bathroom together, rushed to get the chargers and hurried back to the basement where we woke her sister up in the next room and told her what happened. We prayed again. Went back upstairs, grabbed some water, and prayed again in the living room. Ended the night back in the room watching the office to try to lighten the mood so I could fall asleep. My fiancé confirmed that what she saw was a man's full figure with a white shirt and shorts who had his back to us, then turned and walked into the dining room, which was consistent to what I saw from the knees down. So yeah, that's my story. If it wasn't for also seeing it with the person I trust the most, I think I would have immediately rationalized it away, and even after having a witness, I still second-guess it sometimes. But it was a crazy experience, and very surreal. Last side note. Before this happened, I had spent the previous two to three hours watching spooky videos from a YouTuber named Nexpo. I literally paused the video on my phone to go upstairs with my fiancé, so to go from watching that to immediately seeing some kind of spirit was surreal. My real life haunted house experience. So this all started when I was around the age of 14, which is 12 years ago. My younger brother and I decided to swap rooms. From the first night I slept in my new room, weird things started happening. I usually sleep through the night, but I started abruptly waking up at exactly 2.17 a.m. on the dot every single night. Each time I would wake up, I always felt that sixth sense that something or someone was watching me from the right corner of my bedroom. Always I felt good energy from spirits before. Family members have passed, and this was something different. It seemed invasive, intimidating, and I was freaked out that whatever this was could see me, but I couldn't see it. What's weird was when I slept in my mom's house, I never woke up at 2.17, only at my dad's. Then small occurrences started to happen. I was staying at my mom's when my dad informed me my alarm clock radio turned on by itself in the middle of the night at full volume and woke the whole family up. I hadn't been to his house in days. When I was home again, my little brother and I would play in the driveway. He had to go to the bathroom, so he went back in the house. But all of a sudden, a tennis ball came flying out of the garage. It was nowhere in the garage. One night I heard paper shuffling on my desk even though the window was closed. A different morning, I watched my dad's sunglasses on the kitchen counter move several inches by themselves. I was the only one awake. My older sibling began to believe me when random lights would come on by themselves in the house. What's strange is we caught on to a pattern that paranormal activity would happen mostly when my little brother wasn't home. Fast forward to when the house was empty since my parents were on vacation. My grandma would check in on the house with my siblings and each time they'd go back, a new light would be on. The last night before my parents came back from vacation, she triple-checked all the lights were off. My parents were surprised when they arrived home to find every light on in the house. My grandma swore our house was cursed, refused to visit anymore. My stepmom then began to believe my paranormal stories. 
My older brother and I heard footsteps running up and down the stairs together one night. That's when my younger brother was at a sleepover. It really freaked us out. At one point, it even got dangerous. The gas stove burners had been turned on by themselves on the low heat overnight. If any of this had been a prank previously, I can guarantee no one in our family would mess around like that putting our lives in danger. My dad finally began to believe me about eight months into this haunting. That's when all the kids who weren't home one night he heard whispering in the hallway. Freaked out grabbed his knife, thinking that there were robbers. When he opened the door he found my TV had turned itself on and people were talking on the TV with low volume. The last thing to ever happen was one night I had come out of the shower and went to change in my room. The mirror was foggy from the steam. My older brother knocked on the door and asked what I wrote on the mirror. Confused, I went to look and we both sat there in awe as letters began showing up in front of us slowly. The whole family gathered around to decipher it. It said, I am watching blank. The last word we couldn't figure out. Our family didn't know how to justify what we saw. After that day, the occurrences stopped and I stopped waking up every night. A year later, my dad called me and said he found something really weird on my brother's birth certificate. He asked, Didn't you used to say that Nick, your younger brother, was somehow connected to the haunted stuff that happened in the house? After confirming, he casually mentioned that my younger brother was born at exactly 2.17 a.m. Speechless. There was no coincidence. From that day on, I've had so many more questions than answers. Two years ago, I had a psychic medium meeting. That was after sharing my story. She said how the entity targeted me because I acknowledged it. It's no longer in the house, and she confidently said an entity like that is attached to an object or a person that has since left the house. I definitely think something was attached to my younger brother. My daughter was haunted by a man and a little girl. This all started December 2018. My daughter, who was four and a half at the time, wanted this doll for Christmas. It was sold out, so we bought one only second hand. It was basically brand new. The doll looked like your average baby doll. Plastic movable arms and legs, brown hair, brown eyes that opened and closed with a big head. Typical little girl's doll. She was so excited on Christmas Day since it was one of the things on the top of the list. Everything was good for the first week to two weeks. Then little things started to happen. First she started to take things, neither ruin nor his things. She never had a reason why she took things and ruined them until later. I got annoyed with it but shrugged it off as a kid thing. Then she started waking up in the middle of the night at 2 a.m., 3 a.m., and odd times in between. Want to sleep with us? This went on for a few weeks, then she started saying weird things. She would tell us the little girl was waking her up at 3 or 3.15 a.m. Now, mind you, she was almost five, but didn't have a clock in her room and also couldn't tell time. We shrugged this off as maybe she saw something on TV. She then started talking to us about how the man in her room wants to take her to the clouds, and how he makes her not feel good. This is when I started asking her questions. She said the little girl who comes in her room always woke her up to play in the middle of the night, and this little girl would tell her to do bad things, so she could be a bad girl. I asked her about the man, and she said the man scares her, but the little girl was her friend. She said the male, or excuse me, the man, told her that he wanted to take her up into the clouds to be with him and the little girl where they belong, that he was the one who makes the dolls. She told us about a dream that she had where the little girl took her hand and lifted her up to show her where she lived. And while they were flying, she said she got scared, wanted to come home, and the little girl got upset with her. 
She would wake up with belly aches, and at one point she said her lamp was making her dizzy and nauseous because the man was making it spin when she would look at it. She would always reference this doll when talking about it, saying they always are playing with the doll with her. After about two months of countless sleepless nights, nightmares, and a complete change in my daughter, her dad was in her room playing with her. He said the doll just looked creepy. He doesn't believe in any of this, by the way. So he takes the doll and moves it. My daughter then hollers and says, No, you can't be mean to her. You have to be nice. She'll get mad at you. He said, Well, no, it's just a doll. It won't do anything. She told him, Yes, it will. She tells me to do bad things. I don't want her to be mad at me anymore. He then took the doll again and said, No, you don't listen to the doll. You only listen to me and Mommy. Now he said after he moved the doll, he got a very bad feeling and an uneasy feeling. The way the doll was positioned, it was just looking at him. We talked that night, decided to get rid of it. I took it from our house to my parents' community and tossed it in a dumpster. Oddly enough, after it was gone, things were fine. My daughter started sleeping again. Hasn't spoken about being woken up. She did tell us her room was haunted about six months later after she said she saw a lady in the window. I have a window for screaming bloody murder after seeing it. We've since moved her bedroom into another room of the house, and nothing else has happened since. It was honestly the weirdest two to three months of our life. There were other little things that happened in that time, such as things moving, and I would feel uneasy like somebody was looking at me at times. We even had a house guest who slept in a room one night, and the next day she told us she would never sleep in there again. It was really that creepy. She couldn't explain why, she just said that she didn't sleep well, and it felt like somebody was there. We never told her about what was happening. Rude. But understandable. I'm being haunted at yet another school. So I was laid off of work for a couple of months. I was lucky enough to find something temporary as a custodian at my law school. Excuse me, my in-law's school. So for the last week or so I've been having strange occurrences while working. I can go at my own time and finish whenever, which works out for me. I prefer to work alone anyways. So I started to go in around 8 p.m. and finish around midnight or so. But the first few nights nothing happened. At least that would set the alarm and like lock up behind me and that would pretty much be it. Then one night about a week and a half ago I started to hear some noises from down the hall. Footsteps. I was sure I was alone. But with the alarm deactivated, anyone with a key could come in and teach her or anyone else the custodians. So I could hear these steps down the hall getting louder, closer to the room I was in. And when it sounded like somebody would have been right at the door, it just stopped. I look out the door and down the halls and call out. No response. I was a little freaked out, but I just brushed it off. Later that same night, I went into another classroom and immediately felt strange. Like a little bit lightheaded, but it was cold. Right as you walk in, you can feel the temperature drop, but it was an eerie feeling I had. I started cleaning and wiping down the desks and putting them in the corner since there was no more school. As I was putting away the last desk, I noticed one of the desks was in the opposite corner of all the others. So I moved it back and went to go grab the mop and bucket that was outside the classroom door. And as I walked back in, I noticed the desk back in the same corner. I left the room, turned the lights off, closed the door, and left the building. I was scared. I know I was alone, but as I exited the building and headed towards my car, I saw the room. The lights were on, and I could see a woman there, clear as day, looking right at me. I wasn't going back there in that night. I let several days go by. I was finishing up all the other classrooms, and I would constantly hear footsteps down the hall. 
My cleaning supplies would be moved from one place to another and I could feel like there was someone watching me. So uncomfortable. Just last Friday was my last day. I only had two rooms left. The one I ran out of and the adjacent room. So I started with the adjacent room. Nothing weird about it until I was just about done. I could hear a faint cry or moaning coming from the hall. And all I can think of is you've got to be kidding me. My hair stood up. I froze. I'm about to leave the room, but there's no way I'm going to go out into the hall hearing someone crying. I was five minutes. I stood there just listening, and I finally decided it's now or never. Grabbed my cleaning supplies and headed out of the room. Just one step into the hallway and it stopped. Relieved, I turned and locked up the classroom door. The classroom I'd been avoiding was untouched, except the one desk I was in and out with no further incidents, thankfully. I was done, my work never needed to go back. I had my mother-in-law over for dinner. She works as a teacher at the same school. So I asked her if she's ever had any strange things happen to her. And she said, oh yeah. She has many staff, that she says. Then tells me that there was a cemetery that was moved about 12 years ago that was visible right from the kids' park. And since the move there, have been strange happenings in and around the school grounds. So I told her what happened to me while working there, and she starts crying. I wasn't sure why, but she gathers herself up and tells me that about 10 years ago, that was her class. And around that time, she had an EA teacher's assistant. She committed suicide in that classroom. She hanged herself. It was my mother-in-law that found her next morning. I made my mother-in-law cry when I described the woman I saw in the window. It felt horrible, but at the same time I was sad. Probably shouldn't have been afraid. But what can I do? Knowing what I know, I might go back one day. My Friend's Magnificent Gin Last year, 2021, an acquaintance of mine came to my workplace with a friend. We had a small trade with this acquaintance. In the meantime, we had a casual acquaintance and a short conversation with a friend that he brought with him. Three days later, close to closing time of our store, one of my childhood friends came to my workplace to shop. After we finished shopping, I closed the store. In response to my offer, my childhood friend told me that he was going to meet another friend and said, Come along, you can meet my friend. I politely declined my friend's offer and avoid embarrassment, but my friend insisted, so I accepted his offer. We went to a cafe together, and my friend's friend was sitting there waiting for us. I recognized my friend's friend as soon as I saw him. This was the person I mentioned at the beginning of the story, the person I met at my workplace. Such a coincidence, but of course, he recognized me too, but he couldn't quite put his finger on it. I think we've met you before, he said. I said, we've met, we've met. He burned the jinn who fell in love with him. We sat down and started chatting. As the time progressed, the conversation got darker and fairy jinn, etc. conversations opened up. During the conversation, my friends told me, I had a fairy until two years ago. She was in love with me. Then he started to explain that this fairy appeared to him through a queen who had lived in ancient times. How she came and went and so on. I asked him, What happened then? He replied, I had it burned by a Hadja two years ago because it confused me so much. I was out of balance. He answered my question. The Hadja gave him a guardian jinn. After he left, others, malicious ones, started coming. They tried to haunt me. So I went to another Haja who said, They won't be able to bother you anymore. I'm giving you a guardian jinn. And he gave me a grandfather jinn. A Muslim jinn. He's even with me right now. He comes when I call his name and in the evenings. But he gets angry with me if I call him for no reason. And if I drank alcohol. He's very imposing. He always will have a rosary in his hand. But of course I didn't believe what he told me. 
I let him know that I didn't believe it either. He's here now. He's looking at us. I can show it to you if you want, but he'll be scared to shout. I said, show me. He wouldn't. Aha! I said. It's a lie. The thing in the fog. Anyway, we finished the conversation and left. Two weeks passed and we met this friend again one evening. We sat in a cafe and chatted. Then we got into the car and started traveling. We were driving at a speed of 40 to 50 kilometers on a straight road, leading to a village road. A fog descended on the road ahead. My friend asked me to stop where the fog started. I stopped. He got out of the car. The roadside was grassy. There was no trees around. There were only bushes. You see, it was a flat open land. It was foggy, but this fog was only where we were. He asked me to get out of the car quickly and go to him. I got out of the car as my friend told me, and he pointed to a spot ahead and said, Take a good look here. And I looked. My friend's glorious guardian Jin. I saw him where he was pointing, about 50 meters ahead of us. He was 5 meters tall, maybe taller. He was going left and right. I could only see him as a gray shadowy figure from his feet to his chest. Strangely, I couldn't see his face. I watched him for about three minutes. His outfit resembled the costumes of Hasavat Keragos. After three minutes, he disappeared. The fog disappeared with him. Then we got into the car and my friend asked me to drive the car to the school. We arrived in front of the school and there was about 150 meters between us and the school. The staircase lights at the entrance of the school and the lights of a few rooms in the building were on. At the top of the stairs there was a jet black man standing there. He disappeared after one minute and after that I started to believe what my friend had told me. Haunted Hospital Edmonton There's an old abandoned hospital in Edmonton called Charles Camsell Hospital. And this happened to myself, my older brother. I'll call him Omar and a couple of our friends. I was 18 at the time and he had gone ghost hunting this one fall night. We had gone to his cemetery that night hoping to see something. We spent about an hour or so and our friends said that there was this one hospital nearby and said that it was reported to be very haunted. We were getting nothing being at the cemetery, so we said sure, why not? It was still early, it was like 1.30 a.m. We made our way to the hospital and my brother Omar drove there, it was about five minutes away. We pull up to this hospital and it was fenced off with no trespassing signs posted all over. Now, I don't condone trespassing anywhere. Make sure you get some proper permission before doing any ghost hunts. But we were young and dumb. So, yeah. Anyways, when we pulled up and got out of the car, we walked along the fence to see if we could get in somehow. That's when we heard some voices coming from the front entrance of the hospital. So we ducked down and silenced our voices. It was a bunch of teens, roughly the same age as us, who were being escorted out of the place by security. I'd imagine they had, well, probably many vandals and teens looking for a thrill inside the hospital. So they had security patrolling the area and checking inside the hospital, too. It was two security guards escorting them out, and they walked them back to their vehicle. We thought this was a great opportunity to get in. No security for a while, we thought and an open space not five feet from us. So we quickly went through the small hole and went in. This place was spooky, I'll tell ya. It was dark. We had flashlights, obviously, and we headed through the main entrance. Decided to go to the hospital floor by floor, starting from the basement. We went through with nothing happening, and it was pretty much a bust. Locked doors to some areas, and we were sure security would be coming around again soon. But before we left, Omar suggested we try one more floor up. We agreed to it. Why the hell not, right? So we went up and Omar didn't have a flashlight. It was dark and pretty hard to see. But with the city lights and the moon illuminating inside a little, it was somewhat possible to walk around without a flashlight. He took the lead being the oldest in the group and we followed behind with our flashlights. 
That's when we all heard giggling. It was faint, but we all heard it. We stood still to see if we could hear it again, and we all did hear it again. Same giggle, but it was more audible. It had to be from a child. We were getting a little freaked out. And all of a sudden, I see Omar dart straight down the hall, ran behind him, and I asked him, Omar, what the hell? He said I saw someone at the end of the hallway. I told him to slow down, and for some reason I felt uncomfortable about the situation. I don't know what it was, but something wasn't right. Omar was wearing a hoodie that was, well, was lucky for him. I caught up to him. I just grabbed him by the hoodie and pulled him back, dropping him to the floor, because I had seen something in front of him. Must not have seen for whatever reason. Dude, what gives me yells at me. And I said Omar looks and I shone the flashlight about two feet in front of him and there right in the path he was headed was a big hole in the middle of this cross section. That's where it leads to other corridors. We got up and we stepped closer to the edge and it was a straight shot down to the basement. We were several floors up. Now I know it was the basement because it was completely flooded at the time and I threw a stone or a piece of cement down the hole and just saw how far down it went and sure enough we heard a splash at the end. After the stone hit the water Omar, excuse me, after the stone hit, Omar and I heard a giggle again. We looked up from the hole and sure enough on the other side of this massive hole was what I would say looked to be a figure of a little girl. And just as quickly as she was there, she was gone. Just gone again. I had my flashlight, I shone it in the direction of the little girl and there was nothing. Just the corridor with some hospital beds. That's it. My grandfather's hitchhiker. It's weighing on my mind. This is something that happened to my grandfather in the late 80s. And I was wondering if anybody's experienced anything remotely similar. This is all word of mouth, by the way. I was born in the early 2000s, so I didn't directly witness this. The story's been screwing with my head for days now. I'd love some answers, though. For context, Grandad used to work in the mines of a Waikato region of New Zealand, and there was a lot of death and raw emotion there, especially in that time period. Mines in general usually don't have the best vibe, but I've been to this one, and it's so incredibly off-putting to be inside of it. it. gives me shivers to just think about it. Anyway, at some point, my Grandad picked up what's called a hitchhiker, from what my mom's told me, this is an inhuman spirit that attaches to you in order to take something from you. I wasn't alive in the late 80s, so I genuinely don't know if it's true. But there are at least six eyewitness accounts that attest to this happening, so I don't necessarily distrust it. I've looked all over Google for ghost-type hitchhiker, but all I can find are urban legends and supposed car spirits. In this case, the entity wanted my grandfather's health and energy. He began to deteriorate physically, getting body pains and significantly more brittle bones and other odd shit. Between doctors and hospitals and specialists, it got to the point where the government would have been making fucking bank had we lived in America. It got to the point where my nana and grandma called in the Maori priestess to help because they had tried literally everything else. For anybody who doesn't know, the indigenous Maori people of Aotearoa, Aotearoa, New Zealand, are very spiritual folk. My grandparents believed that Granddad had picked up something from work, which was confirmed by the priest. She came to their house and the first thing she did was ask my nana about a necklace that had belonged to her grandmother. Apparently, no matter how hard she tried, Nana could keep that necklace on her body. Or rather, could never keep the necklace on her body. The clasp would undo itself, which according to the Maori priestess, was her grandmother messing around with her from beyond the grave. That's what honestly solidifies my belief in whatever shit show I've been told that happened next. But like, how the fuck do you fake that? 
She took one look at my grandfather and began to explain the concept of hitchhikers to my family. She knew that something was wrong. Now, I don't know exactly what happens here, but she started a cleansing ritual. She laid my granddad down on the couch, spoke what was assumed to be a Maori prayer, and began making scooping motions with her hands. She was taking handfuls of something from over my grandfather's body and dumping them into the air around her. She continued this for a good ten or so minutes, and once she was finished, I shit you not, her hands were stained black as if somebody had smeared soot on them. I know this because there's photos. I'll talk to my mom tomorrow and see if she knows where it went. It was skin-deep pigment, but even after washing her hands, there was still residue. I've mentioned this because as far as I know, my entire maternal family could be lying to me, and I have no idea. I want to know if there's anybody or anyone who would know about hitchhikers or Klingons, or anything else that could be similar. Also, if anybody can feasibly justify why the woman's hands turned black would give me some peace of mind. I've known about this for at least four years now, but it recently it's just been bothering me because I saw a video the other day of some ghost YouTube channel where there is an entity leaving a trail of black dust. It reminded me of this story. Haunting of the Stockade District To help set things up, I should tell you that I live in a small town that's more of a suburb for a city just across the bridge. The city across the bridge is several hundred years old. It was founded in the late 1600s. It was little more than an outpost for those who wanted to govern themselves. It was a small, little, more than a few city blocks. Decades passed with little consequence for the little community. However, that was not to last. In the weeks and months prior to February 8, 1689, the people of the outpost wrote repeatedly to the regional governor. Their walls had no guards, their garrison was empty, and they didn't have enough cannons. In short, the outpost was defenseless. It was in the middle of the French and Indian War. They came that fateful night on February 8. The French and their Native American allies came knocking. The raiders came down upon the outpost in the middle of a cold New York winter. They marched past two snowmen, the town had erected as one and only, like the one and only defense. Through the snowed open gates, they waltzed into the middle of the slumbering town. In a frenzy, the French and their allies razed the town to the ground. Of the town's inhabitants, sixty were killed, including thirty-eight men, ten women, and twelve children. A portion of the Albany militia, along with their Native American allies, pursued the raiders. In the hopes of rescuing the 27 captive villagers, as well as the 50 horses the French had stolen. Sadly, the rescuers were only able to liberate five men. The rest were taken back toward Montreal, where they said they had been tortured to death by one of the Native American tribes that allied themselves with the French. But those who survived and escaped capture they fared a little better. They were forced to trek through the wilderness on a cold February night with nothing more than their night clothes to keep them warm. Many did not survive the journey. As if this story weren't brutal enough, the French are said to have done horrid things to the villagers they terrorized. There is one tale in particular that stands out. It's that of a young mother trying, well, trying her burning home with her infant wrapped tightly in her arms. She made for the door she found her path blocked by a young French soldier. Backing away, she found herself cornered against the flames. Is he heavy? The shoulder asked the young woman. She had done little more than nod when the soldier ripped the baby from her arms. He held the baby by the feet and swung. The child's head smashed into the doorway, splattering its mother with its brain. Whatever happened to the mother afterwards is unknown. That was the worst thing I read this month. I apologize to anybody listening. Hundreds of years later, and the remains of the victims are buried in a local cemetery, original headstones and all. It's called Vale Cemetery, if you want to look it up. 
As sad as their fate was, it seemed that even in their internal rest, they're still tormented. To this day, there are reports of statues bleeding from the head, screaming and crying. I can vouch for the strange things happening there. A few years ago, I decided to try some new photography techniques. I'd gotten a camera for Christmas, and the weather had finally started to warm. My friend and I decided to explore the historical sites of the neighboring city. The first place we went was Vale Cemetery, so I could use some of the statues to practice taking portraits ahead of my participation in a weekly art class that I'd started taking that winter. Once I got home that evening, I went to put all the images I'd taken that day onto my computer so I could weed them out. The fine-tune the ones I decided to keep, only to find that every single one of the several hundred I'd taken at Vale Cemetery to either be gone entirely or corrupted beyond use. To this day, the entire district that was built on top of the burned outpost is extremely haunted. It's also said that Vale Cemetery is extremely haunted too, with reports of black and white figures walking between headstones, shadows that sit among the branches of the trees, strange singing in the church, and statues that cry and bleed. Ask Reddit. Happened back when I was around 11 or 12, so about 14 years ago now. Parents and I moved from a small town to the city. We got a great deal, apparently, on a house on a hill with a great view. I remember the days we were moving in the previous renters. Mom and son. Kid was close to my age. They were just finishing moving out, and I'll always remember the look on the mother's face as just being unsettled, to say the least. Anyways, fast forward a few weeks ahead. We had everything set up at this point, and the way the couch was set up in the living room, you could see the hallway to my parents' room, as well as the laundry room out of the corner of your eye. I shit you not, almost every single time I'd be watching TV or playing games, out in the corner of my eye, I'd see this shadow going back and forth between the two rooms. It was almost constantly whizzing back and forth. My dad said the same thing later as he didn't want to freak the shit out of his little kid. That was mainly the extent of it for some time. But it was all the time. Like I got used to it as best as he could, sort of thought of it as my buddy, the ghost shadow. I remember talking to it out loud and constantly asking it not to scare me if it could. So that was fine, lived with it for the time being. Time passed over six months to a year. My parents got divorced, dad left to live elsewhere, and I stayed there with my mom because it was an unreal deal, apparently. My mom used to work at a restaurant, I stayed at home alone until 11 p.m. usually. One night, it was around 10 p.m. I was watching TV, and I had a weird sense of being watched deeply. That hair standing on the back of your neck feeling. And all of a sudden, almost instantaneously, as I got that feeling, I looked to the window. You know when you can see someone in the reflection of a window? Well, it was like that, except in the reflection... All I saw was a shadow inside the room, about seven or eight feet behind me. These panes of glass were huge, too. So I saw what looked to me like a silhouette of a human. I looked for what seemed like endless amounts of time. And I looked away to comprehend what the fuck I just saw. I didn't move, and I didn't take my eyes off the TV until my mom got home. It was because I was sure as shit didn't want to see anything else. My mom's experience was a bit more startling. She didn't tell me until I was older. She didn't want to add to any of the terrified feelings of myself being home alone. I was at my dad's for the night. She was sitting on the same couch that I was when I saw the shadow. Apparently, using her words... Her Lady of Shallot picture lifted off the mantle of the fireplace. That was in the living room. 
It stood mid-air for a split second, fell to the floor glass down. I remember the night because my mom called my dad and we had to go visit mom late at night and my parents stayed in bed together as I assume my mom was scared shitless. We eventually found out to our surprise that the original owner of that house was the then landlord's uncle. He was apparently very disgruntled towards women. And when we would constantly see the shadow whizzing back and forth between the laundry room and the hallway, there was the area that he had his workshop before they remodeled that area of the house. We also found out that he was found dead in the house right next to the area where I apparently saw the shadow. On another twisted note, when we moved out of the house, the landlord asked my mom in front of me, So, did you see him? Step into the shadows with Paranormal M, your gateway to the supernatural. Join us as we unravel mysteries that defy logic and explanation. Hit subscribe and turn on notifications. Drop a thoughtful comment, perhaps, and stay tuned to our latest eerie adventures. Let's journey into the darkness. Ask Reddit. When I was eight, my dad bought a house close by my grandma's place. We shifted from city to countryside. It's a single-story detached house, erected on one acre of land. My grandma's house was less than five minutes' walk. To get there, we need to walk through the one-acre land which is connected to my grandma's land. My dad planted fruit plants, cocoa, durian, and similar things. We had a mini poultry farm, chickens, ducks, and turkeys. It was a simple life where everybody knows everybody. After a year without incidents, my mom started to have strange and vivid nightmares. Nightmares where she was chased by monsters and dark figures. Soon the poultry animals were affected. One by one started to fall to the ground out of nowhere and die. Their bodies turned completely blue as if the blood's been sucked out dry. My dad and uncle, grandma's youngest son, simply assumed it's a type of disease affecting the birds. A few days later my uncle came to our house for something and went back to his place passing by our orchard. Five to ten minutes later, Dad went to the orchard to feed the birds and immediately saw close to seven ducks lying dead right on the pathway. It was impossible for my uncle not to notice them. Soon my uncle's family started to experience similar episodes, like nightmares and birds dying. Strangely, none of our neighbor's poultry animals were affected by the strange disease. In the midst of these strange happenings, Mom went to stay at her sister's place, which is about a three hours journey by bus, it's pretty near to our former house, to attend a wedding. The day after the wedding, Mom went to visit her friend. At the time of the visit, Mom's friend had a visitor. The visitor was apparently a medium with psychic abilities, whom my mom's friend invited to consult on some issues the family was facing. The moment the psychic lady set her eyes on Mom, she told my mom that something did black magic on her and that she'll die if nothing's done to remove it. Mom obviously didn't believe the lady and told her, I'm sorry, but I got no money to do a reading or consultation. To this, the lady simply replied that she needs no money, asked Mom to sit in front of her. She made a talisman for Mom as protection to wear around her neck. However, the lady said it's only a temporary remedy, and Mom has to consult a more powerful psychic or shaman to remove the black magic if she wants to live. The lady reminded Mom to never, ever remove the talisman from her body. Feeling bewildered, Mom came back and informed Dad and the rest, basically what happened. Grandma immediately contacted the shaman, who also happened to be a family friend told him about the incidents and asked his opinion. The shaman agreed to help. He requested us to prepare some items for the ritual and prayer, that he'll be coming over in two days. He was living in a different state. 
In the meantime, Mom started to get really bad rashes from wearing the talisman to the extent that Mom wanted to take it off, but kept it on due to Grandma's insistence. On the day of the ritual, the shaman together with my dad, brothers, and uncle went into the orchard, bringing the necessary items for the ritual and prayer. Since I was pretty young and I was, well, it was past midnight, I wasn't allowed to follow them. From what I heard from my brothers, the shaman said someone did black magic on Mom out of jealousy. It didn't make sense, but whatever. And it was someone who was related to us. Long story short, everything was back to normal after the ritual. No more nightmares, no more birds falling dead. To this day, everything remains surreal. We've since moved back to the city, mainly for better education and employment opportunities. We still own the house, though. And I'll still never forget what a durian smells like, or tastes like. Ooh. See ya. Ask Reddit. Suicidal subject. Let's call him Stan. Known to most of the guys I work with, former military, wife called saying he claims to have powers, thinks he has to kill himself to save himself. Yep, you read that right. Thanks. Of course I was working that zone that night. The other two people on my side of the county working with me were on other disturbance calls fairly far away from me. They had just got on the scene. While driving to the house, I asked dispatch to get someone from a neighboring city to assist. Protocol dictates that I had to request assistance so they could leave their jurisdiction. But the closest officers were tied up too. I'd be alone for a while. I'm not looking forward to the call. The man was big and had what we called farmer strength. He wasn't ripped, but he was incredibly solid and his hands were like grabbing rocks. Last time I had to wrestle with him, he threw me through his trailer door, and I'm six foot two at 240, and at that time, pretty solid. I pull in his driveway, and he's sitting on the porch, rifle in his lap. His wife is nowhere to be seen. I put the charger in park and quickly let dispatch know that he's with a rifle, and I went next. I went net direct. If anybody knows what net direct is, I'd like to know. Stan, where's your wife? I sent her away. He days without even looking at me. Well, shit. Dispatches in my ear telling me that backup is inbound from two towns over. I have to know where his wife is, and I have to get that rifle out of his lap. Come on, Stan, why don't you put the rifle down and let me talk to you? I walk to about 15 yards away, ready to draw. That's if he so much as flinches in my direction. Finally, he looks at me and says, Okay, I don't need the rifle anyway. Throws it to the side. I have powers. What kind of powers do you have? I ask as seriously as I could. He grins and says, You'll see. Right on cue, I notice something white and big moving in my peripheral vision. It's my car, and it's going forward about ten feet before running into an old rusted barbecue grill. He starts crying. No, that's not a strong enough way to describe it. Stan starts bawling. In between sobs, he says how sorry he was and that he needs help. I tell him I can get him some help if he'll just let me cuff him. He stands up, walks forward off the porch before getting on his knees. Cuffs go on, ankle cuffs too. I ask him where his wife was. He told me the truth. He had sent her away. She was next door through a wooded area. The rifle was an older, like .306, and it was unloaded. Hadn't been fired in a while. He's now calm enough that he can be transported by ambulance to a hospital that he's frequented. Yep, some of you cyber detectives have probably guessed that I had left my car running when I got out of it. 
It was pretty common to leave it running almost all night. See, my laptop's battery was shot and it would die if the car was off. But anyway, I did put it in park. The part I'm leaving out was the transmission trouble I'd been having after my car had been repaired after an accident. Another fairly long story for another time. See, the car was hard to shift into drive, and just getting it to gear was trial and error. It didn't shift into park and apparently didn't even shift into neutral or reverse on the other way. It sat with the front tire. It sat with the front tire. It must have finally built enough torques to make it over the hump and right into the grill, right? Man in my car. May 8th, 2020. 10 p.m. Tonight, I saw a ghost. Here's the story. Believe what you want. I got in my car to go pick up my little sister from a friend's house. It's about eight minutes away. I got in my car like normal, started up and start to drive to her house. It's important to know that immediately when I got in my car it felt off. I chalked it up to the fact that I was, you know, 15 driving a car without a license. But I just couldn't brush it off. Because of the unsettling feeling I had, I never turned any music on or pretty much just drove in silence. I wanted to be extra careful and aware of my surroundings. It's also important to know me and my best friend always see flashing lights or lights flickering in general because of the past experience. Maybe it's a warning. So I'm driving through this neighborhood I've been in a million times. And out of the corner of my eye I see this porch light like turn off and on and I say out loud, Okay, I see ya. I don't really think much about it and I continue my way to my sister. Eventually I come to the stop sign and the street light above me turns off completely and off and on again, again. I freeze staring at the light, take a deep breath and keep driving. I take a turn to the street the house is on. Out of the corner of my eye I see someone's garage floodlight flashing. It was so, so fast like a light bulb was about to blow. I look out of my driver window to look at it while I'm slowing down. My head's out of the window, and I'm at a rolling stop. I'm so caught off guard. Suddenly, out of the corner of my eye, I see someone sitting behind my passenger seat in the car. My heart froze. I check to double-check what I saw, so I stop my car completely in the middle of the road and turn all the way around. Clear as day, a man is sitting in the back seat of my car, and I can describe him very clearly. His head was down, but he had blonde hair parted to the side. It looked like Ryan Gosling in Crazy Stupid Love. His arm was resting on the armrest on the door. I can't remember his clothes, just his eyes. They were sunken in. His whole face, in fact. He had a really long point nose and bushy eyebrows. He was very, very, very tall. His knees were up so high they were basically at his chest. He didn't say anything, but I could see his chest rise and fall. He was there, and I could see every detail of him. There was no way it was my imagination. I looked at him for what felt like hours, when it was probably only 15 seconds at most. And suddenly he was gone. Didn't see him float away or anything. Just like that, he wasn't there anymore. I parked my car in the middle of the street, got out, looked outside and inside my car for someone. I was so confused and convinced a living, breathing man was just in my car. The worst thing was is the way he made me feel. I've seen ghosts before, and from my experience, they don't acknowledge me or give off that energy. He did. When I looked at him, time froze, and I felt like I was in danger. I felt like he wanted to hurt me. It was malevolent. I got back in my car and continued to drive to my sister. Picked her up and we left. I was holding back tears and shaking like a leaf. The thing was I knew deep down the whole drive something was off, and I wasn't alone the whole time and that the lights were indeed a warning. This man scared me. I came home and broke down in tears trying to tell the story. 
Again, believe what you may, but this was real. Now since this has happened, I've been to a medium, sold the car, stopped ghost hunting for a while. Now I'm back and I'm so excited. If you want to hear any other stories, I'm happy to share. A demon haunted me after I cast a candle spell. Last year, I heard a candle pray. It was from my aunt-in-law. This prayer is said to a candle so that you can make the person you want to fall in love with you. So I did. I started to see something in the form of smoke around me right after I started to, to say the prayer after 12 at night. I didn't care about it a lot, I kept saying the prayer. However, after this practice, I started to wake up suddenly at night. I was lying in the bed for hours without thinking about anything or doing anything at all. In the following days, I was experiencing this problem not only at night, but also while I was sitting or watching television. I started to feel something touching my body. One night I heard something call me Hatem by hitting the bed head while I was sleeping. The voice was really creepy. When I told her what happened to my aunt, she told me the demons gave this name to you. I was surprised about what happened. My aunt told me that she's going to order a talisman from Aleppo and bring it to me. A few days before my talisman arrived, I was washing the dishes in the kitchen. I saw a headless short being with an undershirt passed behind me from the reflection of one of the plots. I left the dish and went to the living room, but there was no one there. However, my tongue tied due to fear I couldn't speak for a while, or pretty much at all. I was trying to speak, but I couldn't. It was like someone was holding my jaw with all of his strength and I couldn't do anything but cry. I didn't want to hear them when my relatives said prayers to keep the demons away from me. I was feeling like somebody was cutting my ears when they were saying prayers. In time, I improved a little bit, but now I feel really tired when I'm sleeping. I feel this weight on me. I can't move and I can't even open my eyes. Later, I feel like my right cheek is swelling like it's going to explode. I also hear sounds like a siren in my ear as my ears are going to explode, too. I don't know how to get rid of this now. I'm being punished for saying a prayer to a candle by not knowing it. I cannot pray when I do and I can't sleep at night. I hear voices and have nightmares. It's not like this before. I used to feel relieved as I prayed and said prayers. However, it's not like that anymore. 1. What is candle pray and why is it said? Although it is known as candle prayer, basically it's a spiritual ritual. Therefore, it's considered a sin in Islam. It's a type of love spell. Although it has different practices, the main practice is as follows. One Friday night, you burn a white candle and put it in a glass. The ritual performer thinks that the heart of the person he or she loves burns in the fire of the candle. It's also thought that the glass or jar is also in the chest of the person. While looking at the fire, they elge yet to... Uh, oh god, I can't say that. Oh no. Ve elge to aleke mahabitimni. Tried. Sura Taha 39. It's repeated seven, maybe even 41 times. Some might say 51 times. Later, the performer says, The flame of my love burns in your heart. Be mine with everything. This practice is repeated until you get the results. Each time the candle should go out on its own.
eerie cello music. Read to the end. You got it. I've moved into my house about three months ago and some weird things have been happening. Context. This is a house built circa 1890 and used to be a medical office as well as a house. It was used by a doctor and his wife. Couldn't find out what specialty it was, but he just did some consulting here. The doctor died in his bed in the house. His wife also died here too. There was a murder that happened next door where a man stabbed his brother, but this wasn't in this house, it was the neighbors. I have the biggest bedroom, and although I've been trying to find the blueprints since I moved here, I have nothing. I think my room must have been the master bedroom and potentially where they died. Some slightly weird things have been happening. Some things that although weird or weird coincidences, they can be explained scientifically except for one. First thing is, is that happened, it was very commonly, it's like the wall behind my bed, by the way there's nothing behind the wall in the house, it just ends there, it makes a lot of noise. Imagine if you'd taken a sledgehammer to the wall and hit it really hard. You know that sound of the subsequent falling materials, that's what I hear. Obviously it could be explained and houses do make noises, but nobody else hears this. The previous tenant also didn't. Makes little sense, since this isn't a hollow wall and there isn't anything there. Secondly, I woke up with three deep scratches on my cheek, even though there is nothing in my bed. My nails were extremely short and none of my bed sheets have any zippers mm -hmm. and my pillows don't have feathers. Thirdly, I have a salt lamp beside my bed which has previously been pat tested by the university and deemed safe for use. It started flickering when I was on FaceTime. I was with a friend, so I jokingly said, Oh, hi, Dad. For context, my dad passed away a couple of years back. The second I said that, the switch of the lamp started heavily smoking and sparking. Obviously, things break, but weird that it happened right after I said that. The one that I cannot explain is the one that happened two nights ago. For context, I'm a cellist but my cello is currently in a different city. I had a recording of me playing the cello and learning a song, and I stumbled across it on my camera roll, so I played it. It was one of the first times I played the song, so it wasn't very good and contained a lot of mistakes. I played it and cringed, turned it off, went to do something on the other side of my room. I started hearing the recording again, so I just assumed my phone was playing the video again, so I went back to it. It wasn't playing from there, and keep in mind, although this was faint, it was very clear and going on for at least two whole minutes. It wasn't a cello rendition of the song, it was specifically my playing with all the mistakes. I didn't think much of it, I assumed it was my laptop because I have them connected. Went back and it wasn't coming from my laptop, I assumed it was my AirPods then. So found them, and they were dead in their case, so the sound wasn't coming from there either. I turned my entire room upside down, trying to find where it came from, with no luck. I had no other technology in my room, and although it's a big room, an echo would last two minutes and wouldn't be so clear. After around two minutes, it stopped, and I was a bit freaked out, but kind of calmed myself down. I started speaking to my friend and was sending a voice note explaining the situation. The second that I started explaining, my room went from pretty warm to freezing within a second. The window and door were closed. I got freaked out, didn't come back for two hours because I was so scared. Never had anything like it happen. And I'm not sure what to do. I've spoken to the previous tenant and she's never had anything like this happen. Ask Reddit. I'll take two schools I know best. My former high school and a high school where my dad works. My former high school has a particular spot no one would ever fuck with. The northwest corner of the whole school where mathematics and physics classes are. It's not particularly about the classes, but instead an open space behind them. 
One case where I experienced personally is when an overnight activity was conducted in the school. It's some kind of mandatory scout program, there we are, and the freshmen learned how to set up tents and such. Accompanied by some students from sophomore year as a committee. We slept inside the classroom, though, the east wing of the school. In the middle of the night, all of us were woken up by the committee to play a game. That's where all students were divided into pairs, and one by one the pair had to walk through the school by following some clues placed beforehand. They would bring a flashlight, and there's some rules to oblige, such as running, screaming, and shining our flashlights up. Well, along the path, some of the committee had hid the surprise to us, but not in the obvious jump-scare way. It sucks, indeed. One of the paths is through the center of the school behind the mathematics and physics class. That's where I saw someone in a fetal position hiding in a bush between the wall. Thinking it's just another committee fucking with us, of course my friend and I were just keeping the pace higher instead of shining lighter, sort of confronting it. After it all ended, we shared our stories on how ridiculous it was. Some committee put on ridiculous makeup and dress, too. When the topics about the corner of the school hit, we realized that we saw different things in the corner of the school. Some said they saw someone up in a small tree. Some said they saw someone inside the classroom looking out through the window. Some said they saw absolutely nothing there. Later in the morning, the story spread that it came to the committee in the teacher's ear, who later confirmed that none of the committee dared to be in the corner of the school that night. The teachers gave the second confirmation plus resurgence. Resurgence? Reassurance that at least nothing bad happened. We know that the committee fucked with us, but teachers' involvement regarding the issue made us realize that... It was a dead serious thing that something's there. The second one has actually happened a couple of weeks ago. A guard in high school where my dad worked just chilled in his tiny room at around 2 a.m., making coffee. That's when the electricity was out. No biggie he had candles in the stock, as it's not unusual to happen. When he tried to light the candle, the fire was repeatedly died. Sometimes wind can be so slow that we can't feel it, but it can affect fire, right? As he was getting annoyed, he heard clear as day a sinister laughing of a woman inside his tiny room. Needless to say, he bolted out of his room, running out of the school to go home near the school. Later that following day, some people who were staying outside the school guarding a rice barn told the guard that last night they saw an old woman in white making her way through the main gate of the school, going inside. Same school, but some years beforehand, a teacher friend of my dad was working overnight in the teacher's office, getting some work done. Later in the dead, almost midnight, he heard some kids playing in the school's main yard, circled by buildings, accompanied by a woman. It was eerie, of course, but he thought perhaps it's the school's guard's wife and kids, not the guard from the previous story, who lives nearby. So he didn't bother to take a look out of the window. The next day, when he asked the guard's wife whether she and the kids playing the school last night, she said, nope. You heard her. Haunting Experience in 1950s House, Hampshire, UK Before I moved to London, I used to live in a 1950s built house in Hampshire, UK. My parents had purchased it in 99 from an old couple who'd lived in it since it was built, so no one had died in it. The first strange thing that happened was the cats wouldn't stay in the house. They would always bolt out for some reason. After my parents started renovating, my brother and I both started to feel like we were being watched in the house. And at night, in the living room, you would always feel like something was watching you from the new glass doors. Perhaps from the hallway or even the stairs. After a while, if we were sitting downstairs, we started to hear footsteps moving from my bedroom to the room above, walking to my brother's neighboring room, then across the landing to the hallway to my parents' room. 
My parents both dismissed it as the pipes cooling or the floorboards settling. But you could distinctly tell exactly what boards the footsteps were treading on. At one point, my friends came over and I was alone. <clears throat> and as he walked down the street, you could see into the living room. They asked if I had relatives, saying that they had seen people sitting on the sofa. Things started to move. You'd place shoes by the door, and then they'd be under the stairs, or things like keys would be moved somewhere else. Then it gets really creepy. One day I had run a bath, and I was listening to music on the computer in the study in the next room. It had been a while, and the music had stopped as the PC had gone into standby mode. I had been in the bath about an hour and fell asleep, and as the water had just gone past my nose, the music on the PC shot back on louder and woke me up. Bearing in mind, in those days, you had to mash the keyboard and really jiggle the mouse to wake up the computer. And it saved me from potentially drowning. I took this to be whatever was in the house wasn't bad. However, a few weeks later, I woke up bolt upright like something had woken me up. It must have been around 2 a.m. My door was open to the landing, and it was a bright full moon night. It was shining through the hallway onto the brick landing. I looked, and in my terror, I saw an old man. He wasn't standing up. It was like he was laying down on the stairs, and his head was at foot height, staring around the landing wall directly at me. The moonlight was on his face. It haunts me to this day. I closed the door and slept with my light on for the rest of the night. My parents sold the house in 2004. That's when they moved to New Zealand. When I spoke to my dad about it later, he said he knew something was in the house, but hadn't wanted to scare my brother and I. He'd had his own experiences. He'd heard the same footsteps on the floorboards, and in the mornings, when he'd get up to make tea for Mom, he'd hear footsteps behind him in the kitchen walking toward him. Something brushing past him and taps would turn on by themselves. Years later, when I told him about the old man I'd seen, he said on a few occasions he'd been in the lounge at night, and in the reflection of his reading glasses, he could see the exact same man sitting in the armchair behind him. My dad's a massive skeptic, a policeman back in the day, and no-nonsense project director. Apparently, he was so freaked out he went to the public records office to see what our house had been built on. The area had been made up of old mansion estates back in the Victorian times, and it looked like our kitchen had been built over a pathway leading from the old big house to an ice house outbuilding. He thinks maybe it was the servants or whoever walked that path. Very spooky. Suicide at the Barracks on 5th Armored Division Drive. It was 2010. I was at Fort Drum, New York. My unit, the 1st Brigade Support Battalion, just got back from deployment. We were doing 24 guard duty at the brigade. One guy that was there a lot ended up becoming well known by us in our unit. Every time I'd be on guard duty, I'd talk with the guy. There was nothing else for me to do except to watch movies or talk to the other guy I did guard duty with. So I'd wind up talking with the guy a lot, and eventually he told me his story. He said that he was upset because his unit was deployed, and he'd been held back on what's called reared because of some psych problems that kept him from deploying. He said the army was looking into his case and that he was planning on deploying sometime later. He told me the unit he was attached to was the second unit that he was attached to. The first unit deployed without him because of the same problem and a couple of people knew he died. A couple of people he knew had died. He rotated out of the 24-hour duty and after some weeks it became my turn again. I remember not seeing the guy after thinking about him and getting up, looking all around the building for him to talk with him and see how he was. I felt bad for him in a situation, and I remember not seeing him. I just went back and sat next to the other guard on duty, asked about what was going on with this guy, 
why he wasn't there. He told me the news that he had just found out that he was not going to be deployed again. I think I might have thought that I'd see him again. It was sometime soon after that that I was just getting home from work in the DFAC near the 5th Armored Division Drive. I got my barracks and noticed police cruisers with their lights in front of the barracks next to ours. That's where the unit he was attached to stayed. Probably didn't think much of it and just went to my room. Now at the time it was the new barracks where you have your room that you shared with the other person. But then you have your own personal room, and your neighbor has his own personal room, just to give you an idea of the kind of space. My room size was just big enough for one bed along the back wall. One desk just before the bed, and one dresser near the butt, to the left of the foot of the bed. The room also had a closet on the other side of the dresser. It was late at night. Well, I'm just about to go to bed. I get changed, turn the lights off, and turn the TV on. The nanny was playing and laying on my bed. I never even closed my eyes. I hear a dog growl coming from my closet. Dogs aren't allowed, but it wasn't a dog, because nothing wasn't a dog in my closet. Hmm. I immediately sat up with my feet on the ground, sitting on the side of my bed. That's when I seen an orange orb from near my door and shoot past my head. Went across the room in a second. Without hesitation, I got up and went to the window to see if it was a car. But then it occurred to me that the closet road was on the other side of the field a good distance away, probably 200 feet away. The tree lined the road in front of the field. There wouldn't have been any way that a car could cause that. Plus, I remember the blinds being down. The thing that's real fucked up. The next morning, we were in morning formation and the first sergeant put out that there was a suicide in the barracks right next to us. If anybody knows the person, there's counselors available. To recount this still makes me choke up. But I remember this recounting vividly because I tell it over and over. Because there's always people that don't believe in ghosts. Plus, I always write down my experiences to limit the inaccuracy and to be as factual as possible, which I suggest for others to do as well. I second that. The Big Black Bear My Son Sees Hopefully this isn't related to the memes. So here's a little background information about my family. We bought our house three years ago and my son was one. He started talking really well right after he turned two. His speech went from being one or two words at a time to short but complete sentences or phrases. I also quit my job away from home to work from home around this time. That was in order to be able to stay with them 24-7. I started teaching English online and nannying a little boy. This is important because the little boy helps validate my son's experiences. I noticed my son has always stared and waved at nothing, and all the other creepy shit babies do, but this was different. One day he started randomly looking down the hallway and whining and crying. I asked him what he was crying about, and he said it's scary. So I asked him what was so scary. He said, the bear. At this point, I thought maybe he saw one of his stuffed animals in the room that scared him and he was remembering it. Because you actually can't see into his room from the hallway, so I asked. Honey, what does the bear look like? He stared at the same spot for a minute and said, It's big and black. Unlike a lot of other people, I'm not a skeptic. And I've had a lot of paranormal experiences in my life. So I immediately believed him. He started crying again and ran back towards me. Fast forward like a week and he's been doing this every day. One day I was watching him, a little boy, I was nannying. And he started creeping around the hallway looking at something. My son looked at the same spot and they simultaneously started crying. They both ran to me. 
This is when I asked my son where it was. He pointed to the hallway. I couldn't see anything and after a minute he pulled on my dress and said, Mommy, Bear's in there now. Talking about the room, that was my office back then. So I held both of their hands and walked toward the room. They let go whenever we got there. I went inside the room and again couldn't see anything. Meaning that they wouldn't go in there. Instead, they were peering around the doorway, crying. Honestly, whatever that thing was was starting to piss me off. Scaring my baby and his friend was not cool. I had my mom come over a few days later and we did a cleansing with sage. We also used a candle that you're supposed to blow out at the end to complete the ritual. My mom asked my son to blow it out since the activity seemed to be centered around him. He tried to do it about five times and the flame would flicker but would never go out. So we redid the cleansing and he was able to blow it out that time. He saw the bear again every few weeks or months. And we would do a cleansing each time and it would go away, at least temporarily. My son is four now and he'll still randomly mention the bear, especially if he's scared before bed. He'll say something like, Are you sure there are no monsters, even the bear? I have a one-year-old daughter now, and her bedroom is the same room that used to be my office. She'll randomly say, hey, to nothing and stuff like that, just like my son did. I'm not looking for advice because I'm pretty used to this kind of stuff. I just thought I'd share. I think... I had a black stick man sighting about a year ago, but I think it attempted to touch or contact me in some way. So this occurred about a year ago. I had to walk to my bus stop on the way to school. Usually I'm driven as it's about half an hour walks away and my bus leaves at seven. But I had to walk up this day. Anyways, I'm in the Southern Hemisphere, Australia specifically placing this in the middle of winter when it was still pitch black outside. As I just got to the end of my driveway where the road starts, I saw someone walking on the other side of the road. Their body was dead black with no facial features or really anything at all. This scared the shit out of me. Even more so as I live on a backcountry road with no one else around, meaning it wasn't just someone going for a walk. Terrified and hoping it was just somebody going for a walk all the way out there for whatever reason, I tried to speak to them and just say hello. When they completely ignored me, I got my phone out and shone my torch on them. As I did, they disappeared, starting where the torch was. That was enough for me to nope the fuck out of there and just start walking back toward my house. But I walked backwards, facing where I saw the entity, as I was really far too scared to turn around. As I did, it came back into view, but it was much larger, three to four meters tall when before it was the size of a normal person. I could see it glowing as it got larger, it continued to follow me back until I got back inside of my house where I just stayed. I ended up getting my mom to drive me to the bus stop instead. I was just far too scared to go outside and walk down there again. That's all there was to the encounter. But there's some other things worth mentioning. Things I should probably note. This was a one-off encounter. I've never experienced or seen anything similar before or since. In the weeks following the encounter at night, I heard two people conversing, but couldn't make out any of the words, whilst I was either the only one home or everybody else is asleep. It was ruled out by a doctor that it was psychosis or something similar. When I encountered it, I immediately had the most fear I've ever felt before, but I wasn't frozen in place and I could still move. I also felt a general sense of dread, common with stickman sightings. It seemed to have multiple sides, but also be 2D, like a sprite from an old, like, Doom game. 
Not pixelated, though. It was dead silent when I saw it. But I think I may have heard it walking. It was not gliding, and I could see it bobbing slightly as it walked. It did not look at me until I started retreating, when it was staring at me and coming toward me fast. It had no facial features of any sort. I didn't notice any air illusions around it that I can remember. It seemed more bulky than normal stick man. It was more like what you would see in a bathroom male or female sign. For a few weeks after the encounter, I heard people walking around my house, changing from walls to ceiling to floor. This wasn't rats or anything, it was definite human footsteps. I was fully awake and alert at the time. I didn't get the sense that I shouldn't be seeing it or anything. If anything more, it felt like I was meant to see it. And lastly, I know what I saw, and that it was real and not any illusion from the light or anything else. Are there any urban legends that you've experienced firsthand? So here's my story. When I was 14 years old or so, I used to experience some creepy as heck stuff in my sister's two-story house. She never believed me and accused me of making it up to try to scare her family. So we used to sleep over all the time, but slowly things started happening. I kept waking up at 2 or 3 or 4 a.m. I was always having trouble falling asleep, so they would all sleep at 9, and I wasn't used to that since my mom would let me sleep whenever I wanted. Well, it started off with me just having sleep problems, but then I started noticing a dark spot in the hallway, darker than anything else around it. And at night, I'd stay over, kind of just started to get darker and darker and more detailed, till I finally realized it looked like a man standing in the hallway. I was looking into the room I was in, or so I thought. I couldn't make out the face all, and I just knew he was wearing a hat and he would stare into the room, obviously. I'd be freaked out, and I would force myself to sleep. One time, I remember going to the swap meet, and my sister's family had some lady who went up and grabbed my hand and told me, You see stuff, don't you? I was puzzled, and my sister intervened and said, I can help you. She then turned to my sister and told her that she sees things that are trying to get her attention. Don't let her interact with them. They're dangerous, and they know she can see them. They want to cause harm, so be very careful. She turned to me and said, Don't talk to them. Don't give them your attention. She walked away, and she was a completely random woman, but I remembered it a day so clearly. It was during the time the paranormal stuff was happening at the house, and then everything that was happening became too much. I didn't want to sleep over, but my nephew insisted I did, because they wanted to spend time with me. So I decided on the worst. And last night, changed rooms. I slept in the next room with my niece, who was around eight or something years old. I was thinking things would be different, but oh, was I wrong. That night I had no trouble falling asleep, but this time something changed. Instead of me waking up on my own, my niece woke me up at 3 a.m. to take her to the bathroom. So I did. We went back to bed as I was lying there having trouble sleeping, and I heard a little girl giggling. I turned to look at my niece and just asked what was so funny. She was fast asleep at the same moment, a kitchen toy set that was no longer working or had batteries went off. The toy sounded bubbling, not water, but went right off after the giggles, and I turned to look down the hallway and realized the shadow wearing a hat had been looking into that room the whole time. Not the other one I was in, to begin with, but when I freaked out and something started pounding on the wall right next to my ear, I pulled the covers over my head and panicking, thinking, holy moly, I don't want to get dragged downstairs. Then everything went quiet. And all of a sudden I hear something whisper. Whisper my niece's name into my ear. Well, I don't know why this was happening, but after that night I decided never to sleep over at my sister's house ever again. Skip years ahead. Now a few months ago I'm watching a YouTube video online of urban legends paying half attention as I'm crafting something when I hear the words. This legend is about a hat man, and it instantly got my full attention. I looked up scary stories after the hat man and everything everybody was saying was exactly like how the stuff happened to me. 
I never knew the legend of the Hackman, but apparently I experienced it, and hearing it now of some of the people with worse experiences and even physical ones, I'm feeling very lucky. There was other paranormal things that happened to me in that house, and to my nephews. But that was probably the worst thing to ever happen to me. First period. For those of you who don't want to read the whole thing, my experience with an urban legend was the Hat Man. See ya. Something is crying in my house at night. Okay, a little bit of background. I live with my husband and five children in a ranch-style house. We've been at this place for five years now, and our kids range in age from 13 to one year old. For the past three or four months, there's been something in my house that cries at night. It's not my kids or my cats, it's something else. These disturbances typically happen between 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. Usually what happens is my husband and I are in our living room at night, watching TV and unwinding from the day. All of the children are asleep because they have a 9 p.m. bedtime. Suddenly we will hear the sound of a child crying, and the cone on my dog's head being scraped against something. And I mean loudly crying, not just whimpers, but big sobbing cries. One of us will immediately jump up to go check the kids. All of us and my children have had night terrors and typical childhood nightmares at some point. None of them are ever awake. They're all fully asleep. Completely peaceful. This will repeat a few more times until we go to bed. It doesn't happen every single night. Maybe only once or twice a week. But it's very disturbing when it does. 13-year-old has also heard the phantom crying. She was up late with my husband one night on the weekend. Also, my children don't have TVs in their rooms, and their tablets slash switches are always off. So it's not a sound coming from anything like that. They're not crying in their sleep either. They're always peaceful and undisturbed. Not even moving around when me and my husband go to check on them. We don't have a baby monitor, so there's no chance of interference coming from one. I do have two Siamese cats who make noises, well, that sound exactly like human voices. They're always in the living room with us at night or sleeping in front of the heater in our kitchen. So I've been able to confirm that it's not them. As well as the crying at night, we often hear the sound of doors opening and closing. Most often, the door to my daughter's bedroom. It makes a specific sound because the door sticks a little and you have to put some force into opening or closing it. We always go to check on the children after we hear this. All of them are always asleep. These things are not just heard by me, but my husband too. So I know I'm not just going crazy. The only thing even remotely like this that's ever happened to me was when my current five-year-old was around two, about three years ago and in the same house. We both heard the sudden and extremely loud sound of what I can only describe as something or someone pretending to cry like a baby. I know that sounds weird, but it's the only way I can describe it. Imagine a grown adult almost mockingly pretending to cry like a newborn. That's what it sounded like. It was so loud and frightening that my daughter instantly started screaming in fear, packed us into the car, and left the house too sweet. We spent the rest of the day at my sister's, and I refused to be alone in the house without my husband for the next couple of days. So, what could this be? A demon? A ghost? I don't really believe in the idea of dead people just hanging around your house for eternity. A mimic? What could this thing want, and how do I get rid of it? Ask Reddit I lived with and took care of my dad when he was terminally ill with esophagus cancer. He fought bravely for four years. 
We had both been through a traumatic experience of losing my mom, his wife of 30 plus years, it was very suddenly to pancreatic cancer. He didn't know how to live without her, and neither did I, but we got through it somehow. So when he said he was going to fight the cancer with chemo, radiation, and then a very extensive surgery, I was so happy, but I know he really wanted to just be reunited with my mom. After four years of fighting it, his journey was coming to an end. He had been on hospice, and his time was running out. I was exhausted with being his main caregiver, and the last weeks of life was just administering meds to him every two hours. So needless to say, I had been very low on sleep. I had such a relationship with my dad that a lot of times I knew what he needed or wanted before he'd even speak a word of it, almost in a telepathic kind of way. I had just administered his meds. I went to lay back down in his bed because he was in a hospital bed now, and we were in the same room. He had blackout curtains because he was a night owl his entire life, worked night shift also. So he still slept during the day and never got out of that habit. I must have been asleep for maybe 30 minutes or so, but something woke me up. I didn't open my eyes, I just listened to see if Dad was talking to me. I hoped I could go back to sleep until my alarm just went off to give him his meds. What happened next only lasted seconds, but I can look back at the memory and see it in slow motion. So as I'm listening with my eyes still closed, wondering what woke me, I get the brightest light shining in my face. It was warm and just blinding, as if the sun was right in front of me. The light dimmed, and I see three orbs. One in front, two in the back, like a triangle each orb the size of a cantaloupe. Then I hear a voice say, Thank you for taking such wonderful care of your father, but we'll take over from here. The orbs travel down to my feet and over to where my dad was in his bed. They circle his head and then they enter my dad's head. I sat up instantly and looked around the room wondering what the hell just happened. Then the orb said, Six days... He had six more days left on Earth in his body. I looked around the room to make sure none of the blackout curtains had lifted, to explain the light. Checked the home to make sure no family members had stopped by or anybody else shown a flashlight in the room, but everything was how it was supposed to be. I had texted my friend and a few family members about the experience. I told them that I was either so sleep deprived that I'm having hallucinations or that this really happened. And that in six days, Dad'll pass. And that's exactly what happened. Passed away six days after. I don't know why it happened to me, and I don't consider myself religious. I guess I'm spiritual, but part of me thinks that I needed to be reminded that we're all souls having a human experience, not the other way around. As I went into such a dark place after losing my mom to cancer, I honestly can't say where I would be after losing my dad, too. But that experience brought some sort of peace to me. It helped me come to terms with losing both my parents to cancer at a relatively young age. And it reminded my soul that there's more than just this material world. Moving Stars in the Night Sky So for the past several months, I've encountered a very strange phenomena. Every night, I sit on my back porch and look at the stars. Back in April, I was doing just that. It was around 10 p.m. and I was sitting at the top step. I found Venus in the night sky. I was mesmerized by its constant red flaring from the solar radiation. There was three stars surrounding Venus, one to the bottom left, one to the top right, and one to the bottom right. As I was staring at the planet, I noticed that the star at the bottom right began to move. I've been looking in the same point in space for a solid five minutes before it started to move. It went up and up, gradually getting faster and faster. Now to me, it looked like it was going up. But I was looking south, so it may have been moving north, but from my position, it looked as if it were traveling straight up. 
After two minutes of watching this object get farther or closer to me, it disappeared into the black abyss. I know what you're thinking. Stars can't just decide to travel away from its respective solar system and just yeet itself off into space on a whim. And you're right. But something very, very strange happened tonight at 9.30 Eastern Standard Time. It's a very clear sky tonight, and I can see millions of stars in my sparsely populated neck of the woods. As I was watching Venus flash its brilliant red colors, I noticed that exact same star was in the exact same position, to the bottom right-hand side. watched it intently, looking to either side of it to help my eyes identify movement. Sure enough, after ten minutes of manic staring in anticipation, it began to travel up. The hairs on the back of my neck and my arms stood up so fast as if they were trying to rip themselves out of the follicles. I got an incredibly uneasy feeling in my stomach. There was no flashing, no sound, nothing to identify it as a plane. And planes that just, you know, don't have VTOL capabilities can't just chill in the air. I've never ever seen a plane travel this fast. It must have been going Mach 12 or 13, literally the fastest thing I've seen in my life. And it accelerated from stationary to extremely fast, instantaneously. By the time I stood up to get a better look of where it was going, it was gone, completely vanished. I was sitting on the top step looking up at the sky, completely stunned by what I just saw. I knew I wasn't imagining anymore. I lit up a cigarette and smoked half of it in like three hits. I ashed over the banister and looked back up. Oh my fucking god! I slipped from my lips. There were an entire fleet of these stars that I've been looking at for over an hour, moving the same direction as the first one. I counted 26 consecutively before I succumbed to my gut feeling and went inside. I do not live near an Air Force base or any other military base or outpost. I do not live anywhere close to an airport. The same stars return to exactly where they were the next night after my experiences. It doesn't happen all the time. I have no logical explanation for any of this. I pulled my phone out to try to record what was happening, but it was far too far away. The light was so dim that my camera couldn't capture anything. If I have to invest in a legit camera for nighttime sky photography, I will. This isn't fake. This isn't made up. This is reality. Meeting a dead relative. So this happened to me when I was about 13 or 14. It was years back in Mexico. It was at my aunt's house. To get a better understanding of the story, you first need to know the layout of my aunt's house. It's a two-story house. It has two bedrooms upstairs and a washroom. There are stairs that go downstairs, but you have to go outside to the stairs to the yard and into the backyard of the house. Or rather, into the back door of the house. Not the best design by any means. When you open the upstairs door to go out, look to your right, there's a small edge of the roof that you can walk along to get to the other side of the bedroom and onto the roof of the house. This ledge also runs along the other side of the room, but the cement is broken down and if you were to step on it, you would fall and there's nothing to hold on to either. Nobody walks on that side of the roof. I'm about six feet tall now and there's a window on the broken side of the roof that's still about five inches above the top of my head, and this is important. So now that you have a somewhat good idea of the layout, hopefully, I can continue with my experience. It was about 2, 2.30 a.m., and I had to go to the washroom. So I got up, headed there, and did my business. I was headed back to bed when I suddenly had a strange feeling of being watched from the window. I froze suddenly turned my head toward the window, and there I saw a man. He was at the window, and he was an older man, I'd say 50 or 55. It was clear as day, lighter skin with a fancy mustache and black hair. He was also wearing a cowboy hat. It didn't click at the moment that there was no way this guy was that tall or the fact that it was impossible for him to be standing on a broken side of the roof. He didn't notice me, though, and he kept walking. 
I lost sight of him after he went past the window and he walked around the other side of the roof where it was like a big bay window. You could see the whole roof on that side and the top of the neighbors as well. There was no mistaking it. This was a solid-figured man standing on the roof. Then I noticed something else. He was holding a trumpet. And as I noticed it, he raised the trumpet to his lips and started playing it. I could see his fingers moving and his cheeks puffed and it looked like he was playing it, but there was no sound. I didn't hear a thing. It felt like minutes of me standing just looking at him playing the trumpet the lengths of a regular song. He finished playing, turned to look at me, smiled, and started walking right off the roof. I could see him clearly, he was walking on air. As he kept walking, he started to fade out with every step, starting from his feet to his head. He was gone. I was so shocked, not scared, just shocked. I went back to bed. The next morning I told my mom this at the breakfast table. My aunt and cousins were there too. And as I told her what I had seen last night, my aunt got up from the table not sure where she went. My aunt walked back in and she was holding a painting of the man I had seen. I jumped out of my chair because it startled me. She asked me, is this the man you saw? And I said, yeah. She then proceeded to tell me that this painting was of my uncle's father who died 20 years ago. I asked her where she got the painting from. She said it was stored away with some of his stuff. My aunt also mentioned that he'd love to play the trumpet for kids, and that she also had that stored away with the painting. Humanoid with bark-like skin. I have trouble sleeping sometimes, and when I do, I found it helps if I go for a small walk. Usually I stick to about 15 minutes just to get blood flowing and to collect myself. Today I decided to go for a walk after not being able to sleep. I decided to walk along an abandoned railroad track that's right behind my apartment complex. I've done this before, and usually I go there and end up seeing feral cats, the occasional raccoon or possum. I usually only walk till I hit a few minutes and then turn around and come back. Today was much, much different. I began walking down the tracks in the same direction I always go. Get to the spot I normally turn around and then come back as I've done before. Upon walking back toward my apartment, I noticed I could hear what sounded like footsteps to my left down the brush below the man-made fill that was the railroad tracks. I paused to listen a large amount of animals can be identified by the sound that they make when they walk. I noticed, however, when I paused, I could no longer hear the steps, as if whatever I was hearing also paused. So then I began to walk again and almost immediately started to hear the steps, so I paused again. This time, the steps continued and sounded bipedal as if another person was walking through the brush down below. So I stood there, continued to listen. The steps continued moving, then stopped, what I'd estimate would be like 30 or so meters from me. I noticed when the steps stopped, however, that whatever the animal was had stopped completely downwind from me, which I thought was odd, and then I heard it start to scale up towards my direction slowly at first, and then stop again. I kneeled down in the middle of the tracks to try not to silhouette myself continued to observe. I then gave out a small alert whistle, big mistake, which then prompted the animal to pick up its pace. I grabbed some big leaves of gravel, or pieces of gravel as I was unsure of what was quickly approaching me, placed them in my hoodie pocket. I then pulled out all my phone's flashlight and held it out in front of me, and to my absolute horror, only a few short seconds later I heard the creature crash through the last brush. I could then see it with my own eyes, assisted by the flashlight. It was humanoid with some normal person proportions, but its eyes had a slight reflection to them and a bluish color, similar to that of a deer. However, its skin looked like tree bark. I saw no hairs on its head and where it was standing. I could tell it wasn't a camouflaged person. 
I locked eye contact with it for I'd say a solid 15 to 20 seconds. Then it immediately stepped back into the brush and stayed there. I continued to stay in my exact spot for a few minutes as I knew what I'd just witnessed was likely waiting for me to move. After just a brief few minutes, it then began to walk down into the brush below again. I then ran the rest of the way back down the railroad tracks to my apartment, immediately started this post so I could record my encounter as sharply as possible. Does anybody have any ideas on what this could have been, or experienced anything similar? I'm an army vet with a large amount of time in the woods and grew up hunting and fishing along with exploring a nearby state park my whole life. Never experienced this kind of thing before. Ask Reddit. We have a ghost that mostly misbehaves for my partner. The first time we encountered it, he shook me awake at 2 a.m., eyes wide with fear to tell me someone's in the house. I'm instantly awake, reaching for a weapon and asking what he heard. He shook his head and pointed out her bathroom door. The laundry light had switched on. Now I was skeptical. Somebody with the skill to break in without a noise, without alerting the dog, is somehow stupid enough to turn on the light? Maybe it was to bait us out, trick us into an ambush. We don't live in an overly dangerous place, but there is a meth problem. In any case, we knew we had to go find out. I tried to ignore the gnawing anxiety in my gut and throw myself out of bed. We sweep the house until we reach the laundry. No one had broken in, the animals are peacefully sleeping. I look in the laundry. The light's on, but the switch is off, and I frown, wonder if I just misremember the way the switch sits. I reach in and flick it back and forth. The light stays on. Figure maybe it's just the wiring. The house we rent has plenty of problems, excuse me, plenty of problems. This wouldn't be the first. Before I can say anything, I get a weird feeling. Then the temperature plummeted and the light blinked off. I'm too tired for this shit. I grew up in a haunted house. This isn't my first rodeo. I laugh about the house being haunted and go back to bed. Partner doesn't sleep. He, unlike me, didn't grow up with a house that goes bump in the night. The ghost played with the light on and off. I'm used to it switching on and off around the same times of day. The ghost seemed to have a little routine, but it wasn't bothering us. One night when I was out of town for work, my partner called me. Again at 2 a.m., all the lights had turned on, and the overhead fan in the kitchen had turned itself on its highest setting. That was where it was different. The button on the range hood was pushed in. This was more than a wiring issue. It was getting worse. If I was out, the ghost seemed to escalate. I started to notice the door unlocking itself, things falling from stable places, things going missing and turning up days later. I unintentionally just ended things one night I was home alone, sitting on the floor scrubbing dirt for my sneakers, causing myself to buy, well, rather cursing myself for buying white ones. When it got cold and the laundry light started doing its thing, now I'm much less brave alone. I'm protecting others. I'm full. A lone, absolute coward. The only way I can get courage is by getting mad. So I stood up, turned to the laundry in the best dad voice I could muster, shouted, Oi! You paying the power bill? I'm not paying for you flickering my lights on and off. Cut that shit out right now. The light flicked out immediately. That's what I thought. You keep misbehaving and I'll evict your ass. You want to play with lights? Pay some goddamn rent. No problem since. Now I tell everybody having spooky issues to be firm and channel your inner dad. As I explained to my stepmother, you can't let them push you around. You're the boss. Tell them to go to their room and stop running up the power bill. My father, a skeptic, nods sagely at my advice.
My aunt's haunted house. My aunt has been diagnosed with various cancers for the last 10 years. Back in 2020, during the COVID lockdown, she had a close call. We ended up living with her for about half of the year. While living with her, my family had many paranormal experiences. Here are some of the more notable experiences. My aunt rented the upstairs of a three-bedroom house. My sister and I had to sleep in the living room because the other rooms were being used. My first paranormal experience at that house happened around 2.30 a.m. I could hear footsteps walking down the hallway from the bedrooms into the living room and kitchen area. Whatever or whoever it was stopped at the foot of the couch, then walked back down the hall. I wasn't the first one that heard it, as my cousin and aunt who lived there also reported hearing bodiless footsteps pace the hallway. A hot spot for paranormal activity was in the small bathroom. My cousin said they'd heard things being moved around in the bathroom whilst they were showering. My experience in the bathroom happened while I was talking to my cousin, looking in the mirror, applying makeup. My cousin turned around to sit on the bed of the tub, and then just out of the corner of her eye, and mine, we both saw something small and yellow suddenly materialize out of thin air. We saw my little sister's small Pokemon toy briefly floating in the air. Then it suddenly looked like it was placed down perfectly in the ground at a super fast speed. When we told everyone what happened, my sister said that her Pokemon toy had been right next to her on the nightstand in the other room. A couple of days later, my mom and I were sitting in a bedroom across the hall from the bathroom talking. She was putting on her shoes. I was looking down at my phone when she abruptly said, Did you see that? I said that I did. We both saw a small black object the size of one of those small, hard, bouncy balls appear out of thin air. It looked as if it was thrown across the floor and rolled directly in front of her feet, then went under the bed that we were sitting on. My mom was recovering from a knee injury at the time, so she told me to quickly get down and look under the bed to see if there was anything there. I was too afraid that I would see something looking at me if I looked under the bed, so she got down and looked under herself. I said there was nothing there. Another experience I learned occurred after a really long day of driving around to visit several family members in various cities. I was exhausted by the time we got back to my aunt's, so I went straight to bed. Just as I was beginning to fall asleep, I suddenly heard a baby screaming cry. It sounded as if it was coming from the downstairs apartment, but the young couple below us didn't have any children. I asked my cousin and sister if they had heard a baby crying, to which they looked at me with puzzled expressions and replied that they hadn't heard anything. I was surprised because the crying was so loud. The next morning when I told Aunt about the crying baby, she shared an experience they'd had earlier that year while they were leaving for a very early morning doctor's appointment. Apparently, the night before the doctor's appointment, there was a snowstorm. When they opened the front door to leave, they noticed little barefoot footprints in the snow the size of a child walking away from the house. My cousin followed them to the sidewalk. That's where they disappeared without a trace. They noted that there were no footprints walking back to the house. I saw a shadow person right before my eyes. So lately around our house we've seen a spike of paranormal activity. It's the closer my mom is getting to her death date. She has cancer, and she's expected to pass away sometime next month. Lately, paranormal activity in our house has been spiking a lot. Before, it was just the dog looking at random corners and staring down the hall off into the distance, which is something she's never done before. We've also heard random thudding from time to time. It's extremely rare when it happens, and it's usually across the house, and she's usually bedridden, so I don't know what... Rather, so I know it's not her causing the noise. She says the dog is usually next to her, too. Lately, about three months ago, I started seeing a black orb in the corner of my eye from time to time in the ceiling. Thought maybe I was just tired. 
but I saw the dog look at it too. That happened several times over the last couple months. I brought it up to my mom and she said that she saw the orb from time to time too. It would be late at night, but I always saw it during the day usually in the family room. A couple of times we've seen a white orb pop up randomly, recently within the last couple of weeks. And one time, my mom said she's watched the black orb pop into view and shortly after the white orb chased it off. I've only seen the white orb once or twice. I'm not an expert in the paranormal, but normally the only thing I've heard about orbs being mentioned is in photographs, never with the naked eye. I've never seen a ghost, so I don't know if I believe in them, at least anymore. But the orb thing is just hard to ignore. Usually I would just play it off as seeing like a spot in my eye, but the fact that my dog reacted to it, my mom confirming it, freaks me out. I should also point out our house is not haunted, and this activity started recently after her death date's getting closer. Now that I've explained all of that, I'd like to explain my shadow person's sighting. I should point out that this was in broad daylight, not in the corner of my eye. Most people, when they see a shadow person, it's always in the corner of their eye. This thing was dead in front of my line of sight. The best way I can describe it is there's a chair in my dining room that was pulled out from where my mom was sitting about an hour ago. She didn't put it back. I went to go grab something off the kitchen table, and for half a split second the air got really heavy and thick. The outline of a man appeared with a bald head and hair on the side. I looked down and I saw his arms in his lap. I want to be very clear. I did not see a person or ghost. It was the outline of a shadow. I brought this up to my mom and she went pale, pulled out a picture of my grandpa and asked me if it was him. I've never seen grandpa before because he passed away a long time ago. But the second I saw his bald head and the hair on the side like I saw in the shadow, I sat in disbelief. Now, I'm an extremely skeptical person, and a believer in the paranormal. But despite not having my own paranormal experiences before this, just really was hard to write off. The Mysterious Death of Aunt Fiden My father's family used to live in the Palu district of Ilazig City, Turkey. He had an aunt whose name is Fiden. She's been able to talk with three-lettered beings since her youth. Aunt Fiden was in her 70s when the story took place. However, my father was still young then. My father was passing in front of the house of his aunt while going to the coffee house. Aunt Fiden was in the garden. When their eyes met, Aunt Fiden's gaze was like the gaze of someone in a trance. The father greeted him, but this aunt didn't respond. He thought, wonder if something happened. But he didn't care a lot and kept going on his way. In the evening, my father remembered his aunt and decided to visit her. When he arrived at the house of his aunt, Aunt Fiden was sick and lying on her bed. She was talking in her sleep. Small jinn come here. The green jinn do not climb up on the ceiling. The father took her to the hearth, or excuse me, to the health center in the village in his car. They gave her an injection and she regained consciousness. Again, one day the village guards, there's two of them, they saw Aunt Fiden running in a hurry and looking at her back toward the fields in the dark. They yelled, Aunt, stop! But Aunt Fiden didn't listen to them. When the guards followed her, Aunt Fiden had already disappeared. In the morning, the guards told my father what happened the previous night. My father visited the house of his aunt. His aunt was at home, and he asked, What happened, aunt? Where'd you go? His aunt replied, No, I didn't go anywhere. One night, Aunt Fiden disappeared. Her neighbors were alarmed and started to look for her. Everyone was looking for Aunt Fiden in different areas, and in the end, my father's uncle Mahmoud found Aunt Fiden next to Lake Murat, 
which is about 400 meters away from the village. Aunt Fiden was sitting in the dark on her own, looking at the waves in a trance-like state. However, her feet were bare. The interesting thing is she didn't have any scratches on her feet. However, despite he was wearing shoes and socks, Uncle Mammut's feet were bruised and scarred due to thorns and gravel on the path to the lake. Aunt Fiden didn't have any physical discomfort or sickness when they took her home that night. However, she was talking and screaming by herself. She didn't have any mental or physical sickness before she started to act weird. No one could figure out how a healthy woman can turn into the state in just a year. The next morning, Aunt Fiden was found strangled to death in her barn. As much as I learned from what my father told, according to the villagers, Jin's tortured and killed Aunt Fiden. Despite years past, some villagers claim that they see Aunt Fiden walking in a hurry. In Turkish, the word Jin is written as Sin, since it is believed that the mention of the word Sin summons the Jin to the place where the word is mentioned, the number of letters of the word is often used instead. Village Guard the official security unit serving the rural settlement areas in Turkey, which are mainly local workers. Ask Reddit. When I was growing up, my family moved to a cul-de-sac. When I was around eight, my brother was in a ballpark of nine. We immediately befriended two girls who lived next door to us who were basically our exact same age, so we hung out with them every day. We would frequently go down to a bike path located behind the circle of houses that occupied our street to ride around on our skateboards, walk to the nearby shopping center, and eventually led to. It was very long. We would basically just hang out. The bike path went through the woods and went in both directions for a long time. We would often wander into the woods and play in the creek and catch crawfish and frogs and all that huckleberry finn kind of stuff. Well, the first or second week we lived there, my brother and I, these two girls, were playing around in the creek, a good ways down from our house. We went exploring into a short sewage pipe. It was barely 20 feet in total and you could easily see both ends, which drained into a collection of large rocks. Well, after we had sufficiently crawled around in this sketchy rainwater runoff pipe, we started climbing up the rocks to leave. My brother noticed something in the rocks, picked it up to discover that it was a small, wallet-sized and relatively recent portrait of himself that had been taken at our school for the yearbook the year prior. It had signs of aging and water damage and seemed to have been there for a while. I think our initial reaction was to laugh at my brother for looking goofy or something, but looking back, I can't believe I didn't see how sinister it seemed. I kept going back for a long time, and it wasn't the last creepy thing to happen on that bike path, or in that neighborhood. We continued to hang out on the same bike path on a regular basis for the next two years or so. We would have a lot of snakes, and, well, during the summer, spring months, we would run over a lot of them when we were riding our bikes, which would scare the shit out of us. The snakes were usually garden snakes or some such similar harmless snake. One time, with the same group of people, my brother and these two girls, we ran over a huge black snake at least four feet long, had writhed around in pain and started lunging defensively at us, which we decided to think was dangerous because we were kids looking for a thrill. I'm definitely not proud of it, and I regret it now, but we proceeded to chase the snake down the bike path and eventually cornered it against a tree. My brother ended up throwing a stone, killing the snake. We poked it a while, and my brother was actually ballsy enough to pick it up and try to freak us out with it. All that childish stuff. We ended up getting called into dinner at some point and said that we would meet up after and head up to the local shopping center after we were done eating. When we reconvened, we started to head back down the bike path. When we got a little ways down, we noticed something ahead of us, barely three feet off the paved path. It was a cross made of bound together sticks with the snake draped over the horizontal arms of the cross. We stood
stared at it for a long time. Or at least it seemed like a while, without saying much. A runner eventually came and tore it down hastily, reprimanding us and calling us delinquents and mumbling about blasphemy. At this point, we started getting cautious about going down there at night. Shadows lurking with a new baby at home. We've recently moved home again, due to my work being located in different posts. It gets messy, but this time we've made the most of it. This time round, however, we have a new baby, so all the more tearing a move. Tiring. Upon moving, my mother-in-law and her own man were helping. Their first impression was of a petite house with none of the spirit baggage some houses bring. Within several days, on climbing our rather steep stairs, a quick shadow passing in the mirrors affixed the wall, like the last step that caught my attention. It was an odd shadow, as the back door, PVC security type, has like half a glass panel, frozen glass, and it let out a considerable amount of light in. Continuing on, as the night settled and our baby adjusted, Although 5 a.m. starts aren't for the faint-hearted, I began hearing the stairs creak. This house is an X-50s block build. The purpose home was for, like, joists for the next house to transmit sound. The sounds I'd hear were purposeful steps up the stairs, weight shifting until it's reached near the top, and several times it made it to the top till I shone the phone torch out or made a mad dash to assail whoever was coming near the baby and the boss. As the weeks progressed, I asked my wife what she felt. She's on maternity leave. The baby, so. She's here more than I am. To describe, we have a small porch and the opening hallway door. It's like a 3.5 foot by 3.5 foot space. There's a door after that that opens into the sitting room. She mentioned that several times she had seen the shadow of a man, bald and broad, several inches taller than myself in the porch. Just glimpses, but enough to know that she was being watched. I saw some further shadows at the end of our tiny hall, and the noises on the stairs continued. My wife still felt that she was watched from the porch and began to see glimpses elsewhere. So after one night of particularly noisy stairs, I lost it. I decided to just tell whatever was lurking just to leave us alone. Particularly my wife and baby. It was an angry, non-polite message, but to be honest, well, a little foolish barking the thin air, but in fairness, there wasn't a whole lot else I could do. Seeing her giggle and stare at a certain corner of the room left me decidedly fearful enough that whatever it was, well, we could see it could be interacting with our baby that I wasn't going to have. Since the time I told whatever we had lurking to politely fuck right off, we've had an odd peace in the house. Still feels like something might be here, but the message got through. Come near my baby and I get angry. My mom experienced something scary about a week ago. Now the most I've experienced there was, it would be like three or something in the morning and I would hear it sounded like two ladies talking. I didn't feel scared though, more confused because I didn't sound really like my mom or my boyfriend's daughter. Couldn't make out what they were saying and everyone for a fact was sleeping. Kind of thought I was just crazy until my boyfriend stayed over and at like three something in the morning we were awake. Went downstairs to get some water and I heard it again. I stopped, listened for a few minutes, still not hearing what they were saying. Shook it off, just went back upstairs. 
But as soon as I got into my room, my boyfriend was like, Did you hear that talking? And I was like, Yes. Sort of relieved because I wasn't crazy. Neither of us felt scared that we had heard talking, knowing it couldn't have been my mom or my boyfriend's daughter. Now my mom's story. So she calls me this past Saturday, and she told me something happened. Now, mind you, my mom sleeps with earplugs, and she never really hears anything in the AC in the center room. It's kind of obnoxious. She's dead asleep with earplugs. She starts hearing footsteps in the hallway, as if a man's walking with heavy boots. She's sleeping away from the bedroom door. She takes out her earplugs, and she already feels nervous hearing this. When you get to my mom's bedroom door, there's a single step that you take into the room. Whatever the fuck it is takes a step down into her room. She's so terrified she hides underneath the covers. She said that it slowly walked to her side of the bed and she just started to feel it, staring at her. Then it walked over to her boyfriend's side of the bed and I don't really know how the fuck it didn't wake up, but it sort of walks back to each side of the bed and I think one to two more times until my mom finally got the courage to say, Go away, I don't want you here. From under the covers, too. Poor thing. The next thing she said made my heart fall out of my ass. She said it walked back over her door and it was like it took its shoes off. Continues walking around each side of her fucking bed. She's literally sweating under these covers. She's literally stuck in fear. When finally left, she wakes her boyfriend up. She's told him what had happened. Of course, he's a non-believer. But he still said not to say anything to his daughter. She just turned 18 and she's fragile. My mom agreed. She called the old owners of the house and it was like 5.30 in the morning, but she didn't give a fuck. She asked if they experienced anything and the son said that they had heard someone walk up and down the stairs, walking in the hallways late at night. Basic shit for ghosts. The next day, my mom's boyfriend's daughter looks at my mom and says, I gotta tell you something that happened last night. Her heart dropped. So the daughter wears glasses and she put them on her nightstand. She says that when she's sleeping, she heard her glasses being shaken around on her nightstand and she also froze. She didn't want to see it either, I guess. My mom still never told her what she experienced. But the next night they all slept in the living room. They got sage and when all the rooms in the house... They're all opened. All the windows, anyway. Something mimicked my partner's voice. I was out in the garden with a friend when my partner, we're going to call him Bob, called our dog. Let's call him Spot. Just his name. Spot started running towards his name and then stopped dead in his tracks. He stopped at the same time about of time it took Spot to hear his name and run a few steps. I thought Bob's calling Spot, I wonder why. Wait, was that Bob? That last thought came just as Spot stopped with one front leg raised mid-step. A friend and I looked at each other, eyebrows raised. Did you just hear that? Yeah, it was Bob calling Spot. My friend replied, a bit dubious. You see, Bob was about a hundred yards away, and last I knew, and his voice seemed to come from closer and to the right of where I thought he was. Feeling something was off, I yelled, Bob, did you call Spot? He responded, What? From where I thought he was, and because he's a bit hard of hearing, trying to be heard, I yelled, Did you call Spot? To which he replied, Spot! <laughs> Thinking I was asking him to call the dog, and instantly, Spot takes off running to Bob. My friend and I look at each other with one more eyebrow raised and agree that that was weird. Ten minutes later, when Bob joined us in the garden, I asked him if he called Spot. He said, yeah, you told me to. And I said, before that, before I yelled to you. He said no, and he thought it was weird that I was talking him, or telling him really, to call Spot. I told him what happened, and he immediately guessed that it was a raven mimicking him calling our dog. Then I was dubious, assuming a raven wouldn't exactly sound like him, or enough alike to fool myself, my friend, and Spot. Also, we've never heard of ravens talking before. 
Fast forward three weeks when I mentioned to my friend and a group of people who have never been creeped out at our place before, but that I can't stop thinking about it. He says, me too. Then suddenly remembering, he turned to Bob and said, earlier today when you walked up the hill, did you call for Nick? Remembering his partner who was also visiting, and Bob said, no, I don't think I've ever called for Nick. My friend then relates a similar story to the first one, hearing Bob call for Nick, but not from where he thought Bob should be. Feeling doubtful, then going to find Nick to see if he had heard it too, and he hadn't. This happened outside, and we live in a fairly remote place in Northern California. It's a national forest that borders three sides of our property. We have neighbors to the north of us. None of the neighbors are close enough to hear, and they don't sound like Bob. I looked into Corvids, as them having many ravens and stellar jays. The first one could be explained by this. Bob calls spot often enough that it's not too far-fetched for a Corvid to be mimicking that. The second one's a bit harder for everybody involved to really swallow. Bob hasn't said Nick's name very often on our property. Mostly just in the last week that they've been visiting and certainly not calling it. I also looked into cryptids. I was told once that the natives believed an entity lived on the mountain I now live on. I wasn't told much, just that it was neither good nor bad, but that the natives stayed well away from it. And I hope you guys are well far away from a bad night's sleep. See ya. Weird Experiences Watching the Ring The first bit of this will be my experience watching the ring. It came out in 2002. The second bit will be from my brother's experience watching it. I don't know if just watching a movie can bring about stuff like this, but we both of us saw it. And we were at our respective friends' houses. Neither of those friends have had any issues with stuff like this before or since. So for me, I watched the movie with my friends. We were in their bedroom with all parents and siblings out of the house for a few hours. It was just the three of us when we started the movie with the bedroom door shut. The closet opened just a bit so light on side of it wasn't completely dark. We were totally engrossed in the movie. About halfway through, one of my friends asked us to pause for a bit because they were freaking out. So we did, only to realize that the light we left on was now off. So now it was completely dark. We did the whole, you get up and turn the light on, no, you get up and you get up, till I decided to bite the bullet and just go turn the light on myself. I hop off the bed and we all had crowded onto in order to watch the movie. This was before TVs and bedrooms were really a thing for teens. So we all had to cram together to watch it in a tiny portable DVD player screen, and I immediately land in a puddle of freezing cold water. I instantly sprint to the light switch by the door and turn it on. The closet door that we had left open was now closed. The room door that had been closed is now open. The closet light was off and there was a puddle of water left on each side of the bed. No one besides us was home at the time and we didn't bring up any of the drinks to the room so there's no way somebody could have just spilled water. We never finished the movie that night and I haven't seen it since. About ten years later I had come home after being in the Marines. In that time, my younger brother had taken my room, so I used his. Had some other weird stuff happen that I can get into another time, and I was telling my brother about it only to find out that it had the same stuff happen to him for years sleeping in that room. This led us to telling each other a bunch of other spooky stuff that had happened to us, and so I told him the story about the time I saw the ring. It was the first time I told him about it, and he gave a story of his own that happened a few years after when he saw it too for the first time. He was with his friends and their parents. They were all crowded into the living room watching it. About halfway through, around the same part I'd stopped watching the movie, they heard heavy footsteps, and then a door slammed in the hallway behind them. Like a loud slam. The dogs there didn't even bark or growl. They were just cowering away from the hallway. The hallway was one that could only be accessed through the room that they were all watching the movie in. No way for an intruder to get in any other way unless they broke a window while all the windows in the bedroom and the hallway were locked and intact. I even confirmed it later on with the adults who were present at the time, just in case it was my brother over-imagining things. 
It really did happen just like that. They didn't find anyone in that hallway and had no way to explain what they heard and also never finished the movie. Not sure at all what might have really have not really sure what this might have been, but still haven't seen the rest of the movie since. Curious to try again someday and see if some things happen again, but don't hardly want to tempt fate. Mexico Haunting This was a while ago and I was living in Mexico at the time. It happened when I was 15 years old and it's an experience I won't forget. My family and I had been looking for a place to live and we were fortunate enough that my aunt had a friend who was renting out the bottom part of her home. It had its own kitchen and bathroom and also a separate entrance. So we had moved in and it seemed weird but I never really liked how the place felt. I always kind of had a negative vibe about it. It wasn't long before strange things started happening at that place. Things like the faucet turning on full blast without anyone being home. And we see it running while we're out. Our first thought was maybe it was the owner playing a trick on us for whatever reason. Other occurrences would include things going missing and then reappearing right where they were last knocking on the bedroom doors, and this one time while watching TV the volume went from a decent set all the way to max. And not gradually like TVs are supposed to do, but it just jumped all of a sudden, much like it did, or rather like I did when it happened. Now this one night though is where it really scared me. Now my parents had their room and my brothers and I shared the one just down the hall. It was storming. We had the windows open. My brothers and I went to bed and after a while finally went to sleep. At about three or four in the morning I was woken up by a large crash from within the room. It sounded like a bookshelf falling over and hitting the floor. I jolted up and there was nothing there amazingly though. Both my brothers were asleep. And I at least knew my older brother was for sure because he snores and snores really loud. It took me a while to calm down and try to rationalize what that sound was. Maybe it was just thunder from outside, I thought to myself. Anyways, as I was finally settling down and ready to go back to bed, I heard a faint whistle coming from outside the window. It was getting closer and closer. Now let me tell you though, that window faces nothing but a cement wall. If that's not creepy enough, the storm I thought had stopped because all I could hear was whistling at that moment. But it was still raining and I could still see the lightning flash through the window. It lasted for what felt like minutes before the whistling finally stopped. I could hear the rain and the thunder. I did nothing about it and didn't wake my parents or siblings up. I just laid in bed till I was able to go back to sleep. I know, so dumb, but I was scared and I was a kid. The next morning, though, my dad did tell us that he came to wake us up after he had made breakfast. But when he got to our door, it was slightly open, but it closed on him. He tried to open it thinking we were playing. He got mad and told us he was banging on the door yelling to let me in. Now, we didn't hear him. We were fast asleep. He told us that he started to push on the door and felt as if somebody was pushing back. My dad finally got tired and so he rammed the door open and of course we didn't hear him still. That was when he rushed in managing to open the door. He saw us fast asleep and under the covers and there was no way it was any of us. I'm Still Haunted I've done research of my house, and the area I live in. And sure, people die all the time. I haven't found horrible deaths that have happened in or around my home. So I do assume it has to be me who is being haunted, but it's not every day. It happens every once in a while, but it mostly happens when I'm alone, and my wife and daughters aren't home. I have a man cave in my basement, and that's where I spend most of my time when the wife and kids aren't home. I also have very thin flooring, so you can hear a pin drop from upstairs. 
I mean, there is nothing it can't hear from downstairs. Anyways, this last time that I was alone, I was really freaked out. I was alone watching TV with my dog. That's when all of a sudden my dog, who was laying on my lap, got off and went to the stairs and just sat down, looking up. This wasn't weird. She does it every time she hears someone at the door. So I half expected a knock on my door or the doorbell. Nothing happened, so I paid no attention to it. So I called my dog over, but she looked at me and looked back at the stairs, started to raise some alarms. But again, I chose to ignore it. As I started to turn the volume back on my TV, I heard a large bang from upstairs. My dog got up and started barking up a storm. I got up off the couch, told her to be quiet, trying to calm her down. I picked her up and put her on the couch, and although she stopped barking, she just kept growling and looking toward the stairs. I wasn't scared, so I went up and checked to see what the hell that noise was. And as I went past the kitchen and into the living room, I noticed that my kid's bin of toys was dumped over, and the toys were scattered all over the place. I was a little scared by this point, because this bin was heavy, and not only that, the bin was up against a wall in the living room, and yet some of the toys were even down the hall by my daughter's room. That made no sense, so I quickly picked up all the toys and put everything back in the toy bin. I went downstairs, and as I got to the couch, I heard footsteps coming from the kids' room. But it wasn't one set, it was multiple feet running back and forth. It was at this point where I really felt a chill down my back. So instead of sitting down, I had to make sure there wasn't an intruder in my home. Of course this wasn't possible. My home alarm was set, so I know nobody could have been in my house. As I made my way to the stairs again, I got to the first step, and the running stopped. But there's a door that blocks the basement to the main door, and it slammed it open quickly and slammed shut. I froze, and this is where I got truly frightened. All of a sudden, I could hear footsteps running down the stairs, and I was at the bottom. Although I didn't see anything, I definitely felt a rush of cold air hit me. This wasn't a light breeze but it was quick and hard, almost pushing me back. I didn't have the balls to go up, so I just got back to my couch, turned the volume up on the TV, and tried to ignore what had happened. I later went back upstairs to check on all the doors and windows, making sure everything was secure. Wicked Witch There was a village across the other side of the road where I spent my childhood. It had a small Katcha road between two small huts, and it leads to the path that joins the highway to the other part of the city. It was a very long time, I never went there really since my childhood, but there was an incident that happened when I was a small kid. I still remember those beautiful sceneries I had across the fields. Memories of nature, quite comforting. I wish if I could go back in time and stay there for a while. So across the field was a hut of an old lady, who always shouts at people unnecessarily since she was old, and people would not really do anything, but some would taunt her, so she shouts more. At night, that village reports of hearing an old lady asking for food, weeping and knocking on everybody's door, but it can't cross the road because this side of the road is not a village but a township has a proper boundary fence, not even a cattle can pass through it. A few days passed, people now started speaking of that weeping sound of an old lady hungry for food. They hear that sounds disturbing their sleep, and they doubt that an old lady across that field, so they were superstitious that some of the old men suggesting to bring a tantric to know about that weeping lady. Then, next day, the tantric arrived and without a second thought pointed out that lady's witch that something very bad is going to happen to all the villagers in that area. They were afraid and decided to kill that old lady. The tantric went there and pushed the lady to the ground. Everyone gathered there as if they were watching a witch and next the tantric tied a rope in her neck and dragged her in front of everybody and no one came forward to speak for that lady. 
She cried and begged not to be killed and also said that she knew that witch. But no one would believe her. Then the Tantric threw the other half of the rope across a branch on a tree and pulled it, making the old lady to hang and suffocate. And others just threw kerosene on her to burn her alive. Soon the Tantric threw the fire on her and burned her alive in front of the whole village and everybody was staring and celebrating. Gross. They were too sure that they killed the witch. That night there were no sounds of crying women anymore, and since they were thanking the Tantric to get rid of the witch and preparing for a farewell of the Tantric, but they would not know that bad was going to start soon. After the farewell party, everybody went to their houses to sleep. Then they hear the Tantric was screaming as he was possessed by some evil spirit. Hope it was that lady. As they were out of the house, they again heard the weeping of the lady, but this time was more ferocious than ever. Then nobody went to save the Tantric the next day, and Tantric was found dead in his room with his skull open in two places. They went to see that old lady's house where they found all the things that a witch would be afraid of. That old lady was protecting their village for so many years, and now the witch has no one to fear and roam freely in their village killing whomever she likes. Slowly, slowly, people started dying, and most were men. The whole village became haunted. That wicked witch took her revenge. Late Night Call This happened to me a couple of days ago. Like most of the people in the world, my cell phone is permanently attached to their hand. As was mine. I keep it charged all day long, and when the battery runs low, I plug it in. Except on weekends. I don't like to be bothered. So most weekends from Friday till about Sunday evening, my phone will be dead, and I'll just sort of stay that way until I plug it back in on Sunday. Well, this last Friday, my wife and kids were gone for the weekend. I was home alone. No surprise there. Anyways, after work at about 6 when I got home, I had about 15% life left on my phone. My wife knows I won't charge my phone for the weekend, and if she wants to get a hold of me, she could send me a Facebook message. My tablet's always charged, or I'm on a computer playing games anyway. I had dinner, watched some TV, and by the time it was basically 8, my phone was dead. So I threw it. Threw it on the nightstand. That way I don't have to look at it. So I went about my night and I played a couple rounds of Call of Duty Black Ops 3 before deciding to go to bed at around 1 or 1.30 a.m. I'm a pretty heavy sleeper, and I'm not one to wake up unless my alarm goes off in the morning. But, at around 3 o'clock my alarm did go off. I found it strange. Why would I have the alarm set to go off at 3? I didn't think too much of it. So I laid back in bed and I was just about to shut my eyes when all of a sudden my phone starts ringing. Two things came to mind when that happened. One, the ringtone wasn't one that I would have had for incoming calls. And the other one obviously being that I knew my phone was dead. I opened my eyes and I can see the brightness of my screen on the wall, so I know I wasn't imagining things. I had a cold chill run down my back as I turned around to reach for the phone to see who was calling. It was no one, and I don't mean an unknown number, I mean it was a white screen with only the slide to answer or decline buttons on the screen. I was already awake and afraid, so whether or not I answered the call, it didn't matter. I picked up and hesitated to put the phone to my ear. I said hello. Didn't get a response, so I said hello again. And I could hear a faint whisper, but I couldn't make out the words. Then I heard laughter that chilled me to the bone, and it startled me. Dropped my phone. Just as it hits the bed, I hear this sinister laughter coming out of my speakers, and behind its laughter I heard screaming. I couldn't move, and I'm not sure how long it lasted, but it felt like minutes before it all stopped. The screen turned off. My room was dark again. Only the red glow from my alarm clock was illuminating my room. I was still shocked looking at my phone the whole time without blinking. I reached to grab my phone and the first thing I did was try to turn it on. 
Nothing like I said. I know my phone was dead, so I turned my bedroom light on and plugged in my phone. Went back to bed in the morning, I turned my phone on and checked my calls. Nothing. Can't explain it, but I do hope somebody has a similar experience happening to them. Positive Experiences with the Paranormal Question. From an outside perspective, it appears as though there are many more neutral or negative encounters with the paranormal. Very limited positive ones. Personally, I think that this may be due to what people tend to focus on. Negative memories tend to override positive ones. I was wondering if indeed positive experiences were just as numerous as negative ones, but less recognized or remembered. Out of what I believe to be the few truly paranormal experiences that I've had, I can remember only one that seemed positive. Most of the others were neutral, looked like a few being negative. I discussed my one positive experience in another post about haunted hosts, or excuse me, hotels, but I thought I would include it here as well. I actually had a positive encounter with a hotel ghost, so I would say that they aren't always bad to have around. Basically, it was a very, very old hotel that was repeatedly haunted. Ghost tours and all that. And at the time, and still somewhat, I was incredibly scared of the dark and of sleeping in new locations, especially given the haunted reputation. So instead of sleeping, I was on my phone. Just got my first smartphone at the time. Expected to stay wide awake all night fighting with my fear. As I was reading my phone in position to the window, in my peripheral vision I could see that the curtains were blowing back and forth in the breeze of the AC. This movement was startling me, so my eyes started focusing on it. Slowly, an apparition started to form in front of the moving curtain. It was translucent but colorful, and I could still see the curtain behind this figure. It was a girl, roughly 11 or 12, with an old early 1900 dress and black shoes and stockings. Her hair was braided down her back. She appeared to be staring at the window. I saw her for roughly a minute before she started to fade from existence. And the whole time I was filled with this deep sense of peace. Like everything would be alright. This was odd because usually the thought of anything paranormal scares the heck out of me. I've never felt such an intensely positive emotion before since this encounter. At best. I would liken this to the feeling that people say they feel when they experience an NDE and meet God. But I wasn't dying at the time. After she vanished, I turned over befuddled and trying to warp my mind around what just happened. And at that point, a face started literally overlapping my vision. It looked like an older man with a thick brown beard. Think of your stereotypical lumberjack or brawny man. I got the distinct impression that this was the girl's father. Then the face morphed into that of a blonde woman and I got the impression that this was her mother. Then the face disappeared and nothing happened after that. But the sense of peace remained. I was able to sleep soundly through the night and something that wouldn't have happened if I hadn't been for that encounter. I like ending on a positive note. See ya. What was this? Okay, so for context, I was home alone, as far as I know, last night. I live in a pretty rural area in a tight-knit community with only a couple hundred people in the town. So chances of this being a break-in or something is low. Even then, it didn't really explain it. I had three rather creepy experiences in the middle of the night last night. I've always been a rather disrupted sleeper waking up several times a night for no apparent reason. Nothing like this has happened in a couple of years. Prior incidents have been chalked up to overactive imagination of a young kid. I'm now old enough to be almost certain that the most recent incident was not my mind playing tricks on me. So I wake up in the middle of the night and there's this banging sound coming from my kitchen or veranda. I have cats, so 
so I don't really suspect much, but I go to check just in case one of the cats is injured or scared. When I get into the kitchen, my cats are nowhere to be seen. I presume that the banging was the wind. That's until I turn around, look out one of my windows onto the veranda. The lights suddenly flick on into a red color. They're those Christmas-type tree lights that can change to any color and have no motion sensors on them. The switch to the lights is also outside. My cats are kept inside, so it couldn't have been them. I go back to bed and a little bit creeped out, and I wake up again a couple of hours later to a weird, scratching type of sound coming from the corner of my room. Except I can't see what could be causing it. Sounds like claws being dragged along the wall, but when I look, there's nothing there. I turn back around my bed and my dog's bed. It's been moved into the middle of the room. She's nowhere to be seen. My dog is a small Jack Russell. Wouldn't have the strength to move the bed. This terrifies me a little bit because my dog has separation anxiety and gets scared when I exit a room. She follows me everywhere. Would never leave a room that I'm in, at least when she has a choice. Some of you may be assuming that she left to use the litter box or something. She would rather go to the toilet on the floor in a room I'm in than leave to use the litter box. Trust me, it's happened. I go back to bed once again, very creeped out. This final incident is the one that scared me the most. I once again wake up and it's still late at night. There's no noise to prompt me to leave bed. So, as I mentioned earlier, I wake up a lot during the night. This isn't unusual, so I close my eyes and try to go back to sleep. It's only been a few moments when I hear a feminine voice kind of whispering in my ear. She talked for a couple of minutes in a language I couldn't understand. I didn't open my eyes to see if there was anybody there, because if I can't see them, they can't see me. I don't remember falling back asleep after this, and I woke up in the morning with perfect recollection of all the events. I'm not sure if this is connected, but my black kitten had been acting really spooked and odd the past couple of days. Can anyone explain what this may have been? Some short stories of strange things I experienced. 1. Red Lights in the Forest I was driving home at night through the forest, and I always take this way, and I saw a bunch of red lights in the rearview mirror. They were in the forest itself. No road went in the forest, and they were clumped together in a way that fit for car and bike backlights. Could have been a bunch of kids, but it was weird, since it was already dark and there was no flashlight. Just this clump of red lights in the middle of the forest. 2. Old Woman in Our Milking Parlor I live on a farm and our family worked on the farm for over a century. We built a new milking parlor for five years in, an area that used to be a field. I walked by it after a walk and I saw an old woman in a dress that was common for farming women 50 plus years ago. I remember seeing pictures of my ancestors and it was common for women to wear this headband and dress while milking cows. But this was only one of those encounters where I saw it in the corner of my eyes. And when I took a closer look, she was gone. It could have just been my imagination, but it still stuck with me. 3. My PC played a report of a crime. I don't know how detailed I can be with the no legal stuff rule. While I was playing a game on my PC, it suddenly started playing a report about a crime. After I realized what was going on, I tried to find out where it came from. Closed all the tabs, checked the sound mixer to see if any program was making the noise. My mixer told me it was Skype. I didn't have Skype installed, having used this program in ages. There was no window open. And I even checked Task Manager to find any task for it. None. It disappeared once the report was over. Only much later I realized that the crime was a similar to something that happened to a friend of mine when I was six. My consciousness kind of 
buried the entire thing in some kind of self-defense. And only when I thought about it after somebody asked me about the paranormal stuff, that's when I made the connection. Never heard anything about this crime after. 4. Shadow Figure Walking on the Ground This is the one that got me interested in paranormal encounters in general. I was walking to work in the morning and it was still pretty dark with a bunch of street lights on. When I walked under one, I realized that something was off with a shadow on the ground. It was a person just walking by, but it wasn't mine. I froze in place and just watched the shadow leaving the light of the street light. It was cast as if another person just casually walked by me, but there was no one else. I was even sent home from work because I looked so pale. I paid close attention to the same light the next few weeks, but nothing happened. I continued to work there like normal, but I still get this cold feeling when I pass that light, even today. WTF What was watching me in the woods tonight? Poland At 4 a.m. tonight we got back from our walk. We live in Poland, pretty much on the Czech border. Usually take a late walk. Around 2 a.m. we took off our road vehicle into a nearby forest that we've been to many times. We parked the car and walked across a bridge to a spot we visited in the daytime. So there's two separate sides of this forest. We walk deeper into the woods. Surrounding us are mounds, which I think are old war trenches based on the area's history and items we've found there before. The ground is full of dead leaves, so you could hear any movement. Especially tonight, the woods were completely silent. All of the grassy plants and shrubs on the ground around us looked like they had been recently crushed, not cut down, and they were all facing the same direction. It was like a herd of buffalo came from top of the mounds and ran down and trampled them. I assumed deer did this. As we're walking closer to the mounds to venture upwards, all of a sudden we hear this heavy thud on the ground like a 60 kilogram weight landed approximately 5 meters away from us, closer to the mounds. We don't see anything or hear any other movement, so we decide this is the time to leave. The bridge is only about 20 meters away. I'm trying to move quickly, my partner's clapping and shouting in case it's a wild boar. When we get to the bridge, we're still on the same side before crossing back to the vehicle. We both stop and shine our flashlights at the forest to see if there's something there. We don't see or hear anything. About 30 seconds later, we begin to cross the bridge still with our flashlights pointed at the forest. But now in a bush about three meters away are two sets of round yellow eyes staring at us. The first set of eyes is one and a half, maybe two meters from the ground. The other set is about one meter from the ground. Even though we had just shined our flashlights in that exact spot and were still in earshot of this bush, we didn't hear anything moving there. You can't take one step there without the leaves going... <laughs> the only time we heard a sound was the initial thud. So how did this thing move so quickly toward us without making any noise? We walk the rest of the bridge backwards while shining lights at this bush. Whole time, these eyes are watching us. Jumped into the vehicle and got the fuck out. Luckily, it didn't follow us. Whatever this was stopped, stared, and stayed behind the bushes on the other side of the bridge. I can't tell if it was after us or if it was just making sure we left its side of the bridge. Initially, though, it was a wild boar. But I've seen, well, I've seen it many times in my life, and even at night these eyes don't look the same. I don't know how else to explain it, and there's no other large creatures like that in this area. We will go back tomorrow in the daytime to see if there's any animal prints near that bush. Ask Reddit First, a disclaimer. Every logical part of my thinking doesn't believe in ghosts. 
but I always go back to the memories of the house I grew up in, and I can't help but to second-guess my logic. We, me and my brothers, we all thought the back bedroom in the house I grew up in was haunted. We all witnessed weird stuff happen in that room, unexplainable things that really spooked us. I won't get into all of it, but this particular incident happened about 25 years ago. One of my older brothers moved back home and into the back bedroom. I was 16 or 17. Anyway, one night we're hanging out in my older brother's room and it had a lot of boxes of his stuff from his apartment in it. It was still being unpacked. We started talking about the bedroom and scary shit that had happened there when we were growing up. But neither one of us were really getting spooked, just having fun reminiscing. A little backstory. This was my maternal grandparents' house. They raised us because my real mom and dad died in separate car crashes years apart. My adoptive dad, Grandpa, built most of the house by hand. It was originally 50 years old, they estimate. It was a log cabin when my grandparents purchased the house in the 1950s. My aunt told us stories about the back bedroom, too, and how it also spooked them and their friends. She told us about a particular spooky night involving her friends in a Ouija board. Just typical friends scaring friends with a Ouija board stuff. Anyway, back to the story. So I asked my brother if he thinks that the bedroom really was haunted or if it was just us being stupid kids with overactive imaginations. If it was haunted, why? Is it because of the Ouija board? Does he really think something was summoned back then and trying to communicate with us? Right after I asked him that question, a phone started ringing which scared the holy hell out of both of us. Scarier still, the ringing was coming from one of his boxes of stuff. We located the box that the ringing is coming from, and the phone that's ringing. A cordless, unplugged phone sitting in his box just ringing. I pick it up and try to hand it to him. He looks too scared to answer. I push the button to answer the phone and put it up to my ear. No one's there, no sound at all. Trying to be as logical as possible, I conclude that something fell on the test ring button inside the box and caused the phone to ring. My brother, who still looked white, tells me that's impossible. I ask him why and he grabs the phone and opens the battery compartment to show me that it's empty. He distinctly remembered removing the batteries before packing the phone as to not drain them while in storage. I have no idea how or what made that phone ring that night. Ghost Train Peak, South Carolina I was 22 years old and just moved in with my cousin. We had a band, so of course we tried to party hard. That being said, we always had a house full of bandmates hanging out. One spring night we were done practicing and chilling in the living room. I was sitting on the couch across from my cousin who was passed out in his recliner. All of a sudden he springs up from his recliner and looks me in the eyes and says, We've got to go to the train, Trestle, now. The train trestle was an old abandoned, torn up railroad track that led to a wooden, still intact wooden bridge over the river. We grew up in a small South Carolina town and there wasn't much to do, so we would go hang out at places like that to drink and hang out. Back to that night. When my cousin sprang up and said we've got to go to the trestle now, I thought maybe he was joking or just really baked. But he kept saying it and he was dead serious. The trestle was 30 minutes away and it had to be after midnight, but this was so crazy that I had to go. So we start heading out the door and all of our friends outside smoking asked what the hell was going on. I told them what my cousin said and they couldn't pass it up either. So around six of us piled into my cousin's 93 Red Ford Bronco and headed out. The 30 minute ride to the trestle was completely silent except for a few drunken, What the hell are we doing? My cousin kept saying, I don't know, I just feel like we gotta go. Turned down the gravel road that leads to an abandoned train trestle. 
Followed up for like a half a mile, make a left turn, and we're looking at the trestle and about 11 o'clock vantage point. We all get out of the Bronco and walk toward the bridge. We don't even make it 10 steps when a faint light appears in the distance and it keeps getting brighter. The light keeps coming and now it's crossing the bridge. Remember one of my friends fearfully asking, what the hell's going on? The light keeps getting brighter and brighter and I finally comprehend what I'm seeing. It's a train. The train was bright white and gray, completely silent and passing from our right to our left within 20 yards. Then out of nowhere, the train just kind of slows to a stop. At this point, I'm in such disbelief that all I can do is stare. I know I sound crazy, but I swear the next thing that happens is people start walking off of the train. To wearing what appeared to be like my 20-year-old brain, just old clothing. I remember top hats on the men who were grabbing the bags and women in big dresses departing with cars. Next it gets a little fuzzy because it's been 17 years, but the people just vanished, and the completely silent train starts moving again and slowly disappears to our left. After the train disappears, we were in complete shock. Reality sets in, we start freaking out trying to figure out what the hell just happened. I can't remember who yelled it, but somebody screamed, Let's get the fuck out of here! We all bolted and Bronco and tore out of there. Seventeen years later, I remember it like it was yesterday. My Husband's Story This was about two years before we moved to the house that was featured in my previous post. As I mentioned in that previous post, my husband is a magnet for the paranormal. He's seen things for as long as he can remember, still freaked out when things happen. Anyways, he had went to an abandoned hospital with a friend. When they went, it was broad daylight. Once they were inside the building, my husband kept track of any turns that made or that they made, so they could make sure that they went back the same way. As they were going through, we noticed bullet holes in the walls and blood stains that looked like people had been drugged down the hallways. They saw things running around the peripheral vision and had chairs rolling across the floors right in front of them. They even heard things running around. They said it could have been animals, but they never saw a single animal, so who knows. After that, he said things started to feel weird, and then he noticed that it had gotten darker outside. But it didn't make sense to him, because it felt like they were only there for maybe an hour. So they were ready to leave at this point. He started following his notes to backtrack to get out, and once they reached what should have been the stairwell to get them out, it ended up being nothing but a solid wall. He said he knew that they were in the right spot because the graffiti on the wall around it was the exact same as when he saw it when they first got in. It caused them to panic. They started trying to get out of any door they could find. They came across a door that had a sign on it that says, Do not enter. Dead inside. It ended up being the morgue, and they had to go through it to find the way out. The only door he could force his way through was a door leading to the roof. Once they got outside, they had to go across the roof and down into a stairwell of another part of the hospital just to get out. He said it almost felt as if whatever was in there didn't want them to leave. This last part sounds a little crazy, but he swears by it. He said when they got back to the car, he noticed he had dropped something, went back to go look around the window for it. When he got back to the window, there was a little girl standing just inside and threw what he was looking for on the ground in front of him as she was telling him not to come back in. He grabbed it and ran so fast he ended up tripping and actually tore something in his knee and still has problems from it to this day. Choose to believe it or not, he goes white as a ghost and starts sweating every time he tells the story. I had asked him to take me to check it out, and he refused to ever step foot back in there again. He had tried tearing it down for years, or they did, whoever they are, but every crew that went in would leave and refuse to go back. 
It wasn't until around two years ago that they successfully tore it down. Now it sits in piles with the parking garage still standing. Ask Reddit. My friend and I used to go ghost hunting when we were in middle school. It consisted of me asking questions directly towards spirits and ghosts. This is pre-smartphone days. We also brought a handheld voice recorder that was pretty expensive. It was his dad's who was into music and playing instruments. We brought the recorder because we knew it was more likely that we would get an EVP than an interaction that we were aware of. EVP, Electronic Voice Phenomenon. That's when you record a noise or a voice of a spirit or a paranormal entity on your device. When you play the recording, you hear the EVP which you did not hear with your own ears because the frequency was too high. I've had several interactions, but I'll talk about two right now. The first I actually heard, and it was terrifying. It was an especially creepy night at the location we were at, which was frequented for these interactions. So creepy it took us 15 to 20 minutes to walk 20 feet. Other nights we would freely walk around and not be creeped out, because we didn't feel like there was another presence. Well, this night, there was something there. And after I asked a question, something in front of me, about ten feet away, swiftly glided toward me while gargling a low, <sighs> which got progressively louder and more aggressive as it came toward me. The noise came all the way right up to me before I could start to run away. It moved really fast, but I could see absolutely nothing in front of me. There was no one there. My friend and I bolted, ran all the way home. We listened to the recorder the next morning, since we were too afraid to play it that night. It was exactly like I described it now. The other experience, this was an EVP. We were listening to a recording at his house, and we had just recorded. On the recording, I was casually talking to him about something when all of a sudden there's a blood-curdling female scream. On the recorder, it was way louder than my voice and long and drawn out, as if a woman had just been stabbed or seen something horrific. It was the most chilling scream I'd ever heard, and I didn't hear it at all when it was that, well, when I was at that creepy location having the conversation with my friend. On the recording device, when the scream happens, I'm in mid-sentence, and I don't pause or react. Neither of us do. I remember that night, and we hear, or excuse me, and we heard no scream. I've had some other experiences that are just as scary. Seen an actual apparition, seen poltergeist. Had my girlfriend physically hit and pushed more than one occasions. And I've had some other EVPs. Ask Reddit. When I used to work late second, second shift, I would get home around one in the morning. There were always weird things happening in my apartment, but this was the weirdest that happened. But first, I'll share some of the weird things. On multiple occasions, my wife and I would hear loud banging noises, as if there were someone upstairs drunkenly walking around. We always assumed it was our neighbor who was a heavy alcoholic, but he wouldn't be home most of the times we heard it. We also had one of those stackable washer-dryer combos, and anyone who's ever had one knows how high up the washer lid needs to be to latch open. Well, dozens of the times we would start the washer only to have it stop halfway through the cycle with the lid open and latched to the bottom of the dryer part. Thought maybe it was because it rocked back and forth, it was an old shitty washer. Same with the whole place, a real slum run by a slum lord. Maybe it just popped open. No possible way for a face flat and then popping itself back upright. 
We also had a hanging light in the upstairs area by the kitchen. This light is part of my main story. It would randomly sway back and forth as if someone was gently tapping on it. There were always big trucks driving by and going down the back alley parkway lot, so we had assumed it was vibrations from them going by causing it to sway. Well, it started to sway more and more, as if somebody walked by and gave it a good tap to get it to start swinging. Nothing that vibration from big trucks could do. Otherwise, our cabinet doors and items on the wall would have been knocked over. This kept up for a few months, with it getting slightly stronger in sways as the weeks went on. My wife even captured it swinging on her phone one night after she got out of the shower and messaged me at work asking if I was home because it was swaying as if somebody ran into it. So I get home from work, and I believe it was around 1.30. I get inside, I change out of my work clothes, head upstairs to where the TV, Xbox, and hanging light are, get myself a snack and start playing some video games to unwind from work forget exactly which game it was, either Smite or Call of Duty, I had the hanging light on. It had a sliding dimmer switch that controlled the brightness went on. I had it on the lowest setting. A nice relaxing dim light. I was in the middle of my match and something compelled me to look to my right where the kitchen light switch and hanging light were. I sat there and as I was looking in that direction I watched as the sliding light slide all the way to the high setting and the hanging light illuminated all the way up. Finished my match, went to investigate. Maybe thinking the spring inside was busted or something was amiss with the switch. It was fine. Just did as it basically had always been. It took more than just a teeny bit of force to move the slider. It was maybe six months later we bought our own house and moved out of there. Do I live in a haunted house? Bit of backstory. I recently broke up with my girlfriend and moved to a new, amazing, and super cheap flat. Clarification, cheap because the owner is more than generous, not because somebody died here. The flat's a perfect size for me. The coolest thing about it is the three huge windows occupying one whole wall. Also, the flat's in the shape of a boat. I'm a captain myself, and I love sailing. I fell in love with this flat almost immediately. So I live here, I go about my day. But then the weirdest thing started to happen. Nothing big, just a head-scratcher. Lights in my bathroom were almost always on when I checked. In the beginning, I thought I was just, you know, being forgetful. And I know myself, I would do something like this. But one day in particular, when I came back from the city, the lights were on. Again. So I said to myself, very mindfully, Turn off the lights and leave the apartment. When you will be back, make sure you remember to turn them off before. And so I did. After a few hours in the city, I came back home, and lo and behold, the lights in the bathroom were on again. So that was my first head-scratcher moment. Still don't know why this happens, but it does. Okay, no biggie. I've had far crazier experiences throughout my life. This is okay. Then there was yesterday, when I was waiting for my taxi in my flat to go to the theater. My first time ever, and I'm 33. I heard the weirdest noises coming from the middle window. It sounded like a mix of someone knocking on the window, third floor above the ground, mind you. And like alien sounds. Smiley face. Again, I was waiting for the taxi. I was pumped for the theater, so I brushed it off like it was nothing. Then there was this photo from today. I didn't mention I have a dog. He's a Ridgeback. In the morning, I went to pick up my dog from my ex-girlfriend. We're still good friends, still. When me and my dog reached our building, I noticed a beautiful sunlight coming through the glass wall on a common hallway. So I did a photo. The photo you see is not edited in any way, but as you can see, there are some weird lights and shapes on the stairs, and it even looks like the stairs are mirroring it a bit. My first thought was it was a glitch in the Matrix. 
Then I connected everything that happened so far, and I had to share this. Maybe someone will know more. Does anybody know if this is a problem with the camera, or is this something else? I did more photos from the stairs, and I can post them if you guys are interested. And it's on each and every photo, but it's in different positions, and sometimes different shapes. I've had this phone for about a year, never did this weird glitch. I checked lots of past photos, nothing. I also tried to take photos after, and it doesn't show anymore. Automatic writing, first try. Although I do not believe it is actually paranormal in this case, as I knew what I was going to write while I was writing it, but only two to three words in advance. This is an interesting example of automatic writing. I translated it from my original language into English, so it might sound strange. It even sounds strange in my original language in which I was written, but maybe this is a subconscious part of my brain making up a horror story. In any case, I thought, well, some in this sub may find this interesting. The boys that are there aren't just here because of the old men, but the fact that they're here at all means that they're fallen for their own. And in this place, it's not just that it's the case that it only brought them here because they were too gullible, and then they are here forever and cannot disappear, so I don't speak against it. I have to accept their fate like the others who are still here. My name is Robert Lampert. My wife's name was Elizabeth Lampert. Now I'm here and I have to stay here and I can do whatever I want and I will because I've paid my price and now it's time to have fun. I'd like to talk to you first and really get to know you. I'm really looking forward to it. I'll also include that there's things I've previously gotten in the form of an image, although you probably won't be able to read it, as it's German, can't even read it myself. You can see it in the attached image. I've also tried asking questions and getting answers by telling the entity if yes, move the pencil up slightly, if no, move it down. I'll include a transcript if you're further interested in that. The questionnaire was conducted by me before I got this first message in this post. Did you die? Yes. Do human souls exist? Yes. Do you have a name? Yes. I tried going through the alphabet to get its name, but no response, so I asked. Can you tell me your name? No. Is it dangerous for you to say your name? Yes. Were you ever human? No. Are you a ghost? No. Are you male? Yes. Are you female? No. Are you lying to me? No. Then I tried to verify any supposed paranormal activity going on by holding playing cards behind my back. So without me seeing them, he should move the pencil up if the card was black, and down if it was red. He did that five times, each time getting it right before stopping communication. I'll keep you on track if I'm able to actually, well, eventually, verify anything, and I'll record it if I'm able to. I'm also interested in what, if it was a real entity, what it could have been. As it said, it did die. It's not a ghost and never was human. Mysterious Jin Wedding in Midyat. The year 2001. At that time, I was doing maintenance and repair work on irrigation transformers in villages. A customer called me from a village in Midyat district of Mardin. You need to come urgently, he said. It was around 06.07 in the evening. Okay, I said to my customer. I'm on the way. I would travel three hours if not in the worst case. I'll stay there for the night and come back in the morning. So I set off. 30 to 40 kilometers before the village, my car broke down in the village road. It's almost 10 o'clock at night. It's pitch black. I started to wait, thinking that maybe somebody would pass by and help me. 
but I wait and wait and no one comes. There's no cell phone reception either. There is a hill a little further up. I'll go up there. Maybe my phone will work there. I'll call the customer and ask him to pick me up. I went up the hill and nothing. There was no signal here either. Then I looked up and there were two people coming. Aha, I thought. So there is a village nearby. When the men approached, I greeted them, and they took my greeting. I'm stranded. Can you help me? I said. Well, we have a wedding. We're going to a wedding. It's not safe here. You can come with us. We'll figure something out after the wedding. They were short, old-dressed people. I realized there was an basically no other option, so I went with them. We walked for about 40 minutes. I don't know where we ended up at the end of this walk, and where I was, there were about 25 to 30 people when we arrived. It was a mixture of men and women. They all looked almost the same. The women have onion skins. They have onion skins on their wrists and necks. They're playing the tambourine and playing. One or two fires are burning. That's all the light. I look around and there were no children or villagers. I started to get scared, but I didn't show it. Anyway, they danced, danced, played, and sang. Of course, from time to time, they made me get up to play, too. Two or three hours passed like this. Then someone came up to me. He started asking me questions like an interrogator. He asked me my religion, where I was from, etc. I don't know what happened, I just passed out. When I opened my eyes, the sun had risen and I was in the car. There were onion skins on the seat next to me. Two to three hours later, a tractor passed by. I asked for help. We tied my car to the back of the tractor and I had it towed. I finally arrived at my customer's place. My customer was worried about me until morning. I told them what I had experienced. Their elders had experienced such situations once or twice. They told me, You've come across the wedding of jinns. Child Voice in the Woods The following is my account of what occurred in the woods while kind of hiking a couple days ago. After lots of frustrated research, I haven't come any closer to explaining my experience. Hopefully somebody who's had a similar experience or knows what they're talking about and kind of stumbles upon this. I don't post often, but I figured someone on here might be able to help me out. I'll give it a try too. Tuesday afternoon, I decided to take advantage of the nice weather, go for a little hike or a walk wanted to explore a nature preserve I'd only previously explored briefly. This nature preserve happened to be nestled between a cemetery, a church, and a school, and a mental health hospital. After about 30 minutes of uneventful walking in the woods, I came across a slightly developed area. It was tucked down a hill and in the middle of the forest. I was shocked to find a paved area and a couple isolated concrete walls. A feeling of adventure and discovery took over, and I instantly became excited to explore. When I stepped close to the paved area, things started to change. I started to feel a little uneasy. I didn't pay much attention to it, but when I made it to the paved area, I became confused. There was an empty metal chair sitting in the middle of the cleaner, clearing, really, on the concrete. Part of me was fascinated as I thought this looked cool and creepy. I snapped a quick picture, too, to capture the moment. After staring for a minute, I decided to investigate this chair. However, I again got an uneasy feeling when I got closer to the chair. Due to this, I decided it would be best to not explore that area today. Slowly turned and began to walk off as quietly, and I said, This place is creepier than I remembered. This is when my first experience occurred. Almost like someone was responding to me, I heard a loud and direct, Nobody likes it here. I quickly whipped around to scan for the person. Based on the voice, it would have been maybe five or eight-year-old boy. However, when I turned around, there was nobody to be found. 
the likely explanation would have been some kid just playing in the woods. This doesn't add up, though. This was only one path in and out of the area, and I was standing on it. I also didn't see another person the whole time I was there. The absence of my parents or any real route in or out suddenly hit me. My concern quickly changed to fear. I took a last look, only to see nothing before I started sort of sprinting up the path and out of the woods. Eventually caught my breath, but still I had no explanation. Even after I heard the voice, there was no movement that I would have expected to hear from a person. I've never had anything close to a paranormal encounter before, and I've always been pretty skeptical. However, now I don't know what to think. I can't rationalize the voice or situation at all. Historical research hasn't given me any special leads. Weird Activities in My House My older brother recently moved into a house with his pregnant wife. That was last summer. My younger brother, he's not younger than me, just younger than my older brother. And they moved in with my dad in October, and me and my mom moved in in December. The house was made around the 1930s. During those months, we encountered nothing out of the ordinary, except for when me and my mom moved in. The baby was safely born in November. During the summer to October, it was just my brother and his wife. Nothing weird. The house has two floors plus a basement and a driveway in the back. In December, my sister-in-law's phone wallpaper changed to Tom from Tom and Jerry. He was smoking a fat cigar, otherwise known as a stogie. She left the phone on her bed in the second floor and left for three minutes, then came back. Nothing weird. Thought it was just a glitch. Then, in mid-January, when my older brother and his friend were in the basement, there were three knocks on the basement back door which leads to the driveway. There was also some movement outside which my brother saw through the glass window. When I heard this, I thought it was the wind. My older brother was shook. He said it was definitely a person or figure. Then, a few days ago, while I was passing my young brother's room, I saw two feet on the bed. thought it was just my brother in his room, but when I went downstairs, as soon as I went, my brother came in the house through the front door and asked, Weren't you upstairs? He said, No, maybe it was a ghost. I was so sure I saw two feet that I actually thought he was in his room. I went back upstairs, retraced my steps, noticed it was just a box. How could a box look like two feet? But I didn't have my glasses on, and that could be it. My eyesight's pretty bad, and my mind is probably just playing tricks on me. I also watch a lot of scary movies, and that adds a lot more to my fear. Yesterday we were wondering about the phone wallpaper changing, and we all agreed that no one did it. We're all serious people, so no one would actually lie about it. My older brother said that maybe they changed it to Tom smoking a cigar because my dad smoked cigarettes in the back of the house. Not fat ones, just regular ones. It makes sense, but it's just dumb to me. Is this thing toying with us? Is there even a thing that exists? We still haven't told my younger brother about any of that because he's going to stay in the basement after the renovations are done. This all also started when the basement renovations started themselves. My younger brother doesn't want to even go to the first floor if there's no one in it. Is that, well, he's just that scared. Please tell me what you think. Is there something in my house? Seeking advice on a possible haunted apartment building I lived in for 18 months. I want to say that I always keep an open but skeptical mind. It took many occurrences to get to this point, and I, my wife, and my cat moved into this apartment about 18 months ago. In that time frame, little things kept happening. I would just brush them off as being, well, me being tired. Now the activity doesn't happen all the time. Sometimes nothing happens for weeks, 
Other times, things happen for days at a time. Just to give you some memorable things that have happened. Also, for some reason, these occurrences are happening more frequently. More things seem to happen to me, and they only, well, only happen to my wife very seldom. My two kittens also react to it as well. When it's around at times, when it is around at times, I get this intense feeling. It's like a chill that runs up through my body, but different. I can only imagine it feels like energy. One, sitting at my computer and feeling a strong rub against my leg. I'm sure it was my cat at the time, but when I reached down, there was nothing there. My only cat at the time was sound asleep on the other side of the room, and there's nobody else in the apartment. I also get the sensation of my hair being lightly touched at times. 2. My wife woke up freaking out, swearing that something was touching her. Normally, that would be me, but I was in the living room with her only cat. It only happened once, but freaked her out. 3. I've seen what looks like a small black flame floating in the air on multiple occasions mostly in broad daylight and just totally random. 4. I have this thing recorded on my phone. My buddy suggests I should ask it questions. Last month it was around 1 a.m. I usually stay up late. Randomly that feeling came on. I decided to whip out my phone and ask it questions. I asked it if I'm here and I have a voice that's kind of hard to make out but it says I'm here and it mumbles something else. It was much deeper than mine and kind of gave me an old man vibe. Yes, I still have that recording. This was in combination of my kittens acting in a weird way I've never seen before or since. They were freaked out and one even hissed at her brother. The boy slinked around the wall and was on edge and I've had them for four months and never seen them do that. And this all happened within a ten minute time span. Five. Just tonight by accident. I got a crazy intense orb on my camera. I have a nanny cam to keep an eye on my crazy two kittens while at work and I had all the lights off in the room, just the back TV lights to test the IR feature. I've seen it once and decided to try to record it if it happened again. I got a big bright orb coming out of nowhere and it's really bright considering almost all the lights in the room are off. And yes, I have that on camera. Dark Beings, Entities So my friend, who's a psychic, and really intuitive, had a run-in. It was with two girls that she was asked to hang out with. It's a long story, but basically, these girls were putting a spiritual attack on her. She mentioned talking to them telepathically, being pushed into another dimension with them in her own words. We were here, but everywhere at the same time, like astral projection. Once she figured out that they were trying to see through her, like something out of her, she blocked off their telepathy, came back to our dimension, then told them to speak to her here. Her guides are telling her she's in danger and to protect herself. She starts protecting herself and her energy, her space, etc., they don't seem to like that. They've become slightly aggressive toward her, saying strange things like, They don't like that. I don't like that. They can see her being protected and are mad about it. She mentioned feelings like they were trying to kick her guides and protection out. She mentioned having the feeling of being choked, like a drowning sensation. She was being held down and couldn't move from the sitting position that she was in. The girl next to her was holding her, and she was doing it. She also mentioned them talking about vampires and how they like blood. Seeing what her reaction was, which she gave none having the feeling her curiosity would lead to something bad, she also said when she was shifting through dimensions... She said that one of the girls, like, looked scary and demonic and not human at all. She could see it in her eyes, in her human form as well. When all of this stuff was going down, she said that, well, time was non-existent. 
She was there for over three hours and didn't notice. She mentioned how in the other dimension, she felt like she knew one of the girls prior to the, well, ever meeting them. And they almost had the exact same tattoo. On her way home in the car, she said that she could feel them trying to get into her head, trying to confuse her and make her tired, like they were trying to take her back to one of their dimensions. She felt like they were going to hurt her physically as well as just spiritually. It's a lot more than what I'm saying, and I feel I'm not quite getting everything explained properly. It's just some crazy-sounding-ish. But I'm wondering if anybody may have had similar run-ins with quote-unquote people like this, or have an idea of what they can be. Please let me know I'm trying to give her some clarity on the situation that's just shaking her up. Ask Reddit. This was more of a weird occurrence that happened for about a month, and it happened about three months ago. The layout of my house is there's a kitchen that separates the hallway leading to my bedroom and the living room. So whenever I open the fridge in the kitchen, I can see the hallway at the corner of my eye. During that weird month, Every time I opened the fridge, I would see a man standing in the middle of the hallway out of the corner of my eye. I would only see it in my peripheral vision and it'd be gone by the time I looked there, so I only see it for a couple of seconds. I try to recreate possibilities to see if I could see it again, and I don't believe in ghosts, by the way, but I failed. I tried to see if it was just my brain trying to fill in the gaps, so to speak, but nothing there looks close to the silhouette of a man. To top it off, I would only see it when I least expected to. This kept happening, well, somewhere past midnight. Another instance was during the morning. I sat in the living room face toward the kitchen. I would play a game on my phone and again I would see a man in the kitchen from my peripheral vision. Only this time it quickly would walk across the kitchen and fade. Like last time, I tried multiple times to recreate how it was positioned and moved to see if I could see it again, and just like last time, I only saw it when I least expected it. I think any rational person would tell themselves it might be the outlines of certain objects. Maybe we moved things around the house so we're not used to seeing new things at certain familiar places. You know, that your brain would fill it in so it looks like a person. Or maybe... Since I wear glasses, it could be a reflection of some other instance. Like a car moving outside that happened to be reflected through the window into my glasses. But let me tell you, things like this interest me. Whenever something weird happens, like I know there's an explanation, but this is the only time I couldn't find any. The thing I find interesting is that it consistently looks like the silhouette of an adult man. Lastly, about a week or two since I last seen this man. I drove my mom to work. She asked me if I'd seen anything weird in the house lately, and that's when I told her about it. Apparently she's seen it too in the same places I saw it, and in other parts of the kitchen. We usually never talk about things like this unless we watch unsolved mysteries or anything paranormal related. This was completely independent of that. And like my experience, she only saw it in her peripheral vision and it was specifically looking like a man, not a female, not a child. After that one month I haven't seen it, my mom hasn't talked about it. I don't believe in ghosts and sometimes my friends and I would go ghost hunting or be edgy and fuck with Ouija boards or explore abandoned places just for fun. But I have to say that shit is weird. Spirits that just won't leave me alone. When I was growing up, especially when I started school at six years, I used to hear voices in my head. Everyone hears voices in their head, but these ones are different. It felt like they were deeply connected to me or reality. They would tell me things, often telling me what would happen in the future. 
Things like which guests I'll find when I get home after school, which person I know that has recently passed away, how certain events would change if I did some things. I can't remember others because there's a lot, but I'm hoping to remember them as I type. I used to refer to these voices as angels, or God himself, because the things they did to me were only good things, and they seemed to want to protect me from everything. I remember this one time after school, a group of friends decided to grab some snacks at a nearby shop, but I declined to go with them, because this voice told me to go straight home after school, and the same friends got robbed at that shop, and one of them got stabbed in the chest, but everyone survived, thank God. Another time after school, a street vendor was selling some flavored ice, so I decided to buy one because it was very hot that day. However, the problem is, another voice warned me not to buy from him as something bad would happen. And it did. After I bought that ice, I forgot to give him the cash and I left. Not necessarily running or anything, but it completely slipped my mind and he came after me. I was surprised why he was yelling at me because I thought everything had went well between us. And this guy pulled out a knife on me. But he didn't hurt me because I apologized profusely. I was super scared and disturbed because I was only 16 at the time and I'm relatively very small compared to my peers. I'm 22 now. The voices kept telling me since I started hearing them when I was six that they stopped talking to me once I told everyone, even my parents, that I was hearing them. And they also had enough energy to affect reality around me. So when I was 16, after that street vendor scene, I got worried that I might be faced with something very dangerous that's trying to lure my soul into hell. So I told my parents what had been happening to me all those years. Yep, the voices stopped revealing themselves to me. But I can still feel the presence of these beings around me. They never hurt me or anything, as it seems their primal goal is to look after me. By the way, my family has never been religious. Even to this day, I don't know what these things are. Before 16, every time I'd ask them for identity, they never really gave me a clear answer. Do you believe pets can haunt after their deaths? Throughout my life I've grown up with six cats and two dogs, the cats passing slowly over my childhood. The cats we had were Zoe, Tigger, Sheba, Patches, TJ, and Jack, from oldest to youngest. Now Jack passed away as a kitten, Sheba the mom wouldn't feed him. One time, when we had gone out for a couple of hours, she had climbed out of his basket. My mom found him freezing. Despite a ton of effort, he couldn't be saved. The little nine-year-old me was super sad. I cried, and I, I named him after his passing. The next cat to pass was Tigger. He was a fat cat, and kind of hoovered his food, you could say. I hadn't seen him much over the course of the day, and when I feed him at night found him unable to stand up on his own hind legs. Mom and Dad grabbed him, nursed him for a couple of hours, and when he woke up the next day, prepping to take him to the vet, he was already gone. The vet suspected he had a heart attack. He picked up his ashes on the 10th birthday. A few months after he had passed away, I woke up in the middle of the night. No idea why, but when I looked down, I saw a cat-shaped cloud curled up between my legs. When he was still alive still, he and Shiba would curl up there together. Over the years, each cat slowly died. Patches in 2006, TJ in 2011. Sheba a few months later, also in 2011. Then we lost our grumpy girl, Zoe, in the beginning of 2012. That's when I really got to experience the ghost of a cat. Zoe was a climber in life. We'd hear movement up on a high shelf, and then things would start shooting off and hit the floor like spices. She had a bad habit of trying to eat dog food. My dad came out one morning and saw a full-on apparition of her sitting in front of the dog bowl, which she knew she wasn't supposed to do, as evidenced by the fact that she immediately ran away and disappeared. 
earned a, you're not supposed to be in the dog's food, you little shit, from my dad. She was also very much a window cat. You would always see her trail twitching out from underneath the window covering, tail, which my mom saw on many occasion after Zoe had passed. And finally, my experience. We had a wood-burning stove in this house, and just off to the side of it was a dining table. I was sat in front of them, but still partly between them. Right behind me, I heard Zoe's little, I want attention, chitter. Something I never really heard from her when she was alive, and as her, well, she was my mom's cat, and only my mom was worthy of that chitter. Even though they've all been gone for at least a decade, I still miss them very much, and I do wish I could see them all again. Unfortunately, we no longer live in either of the homes where the activities happened. The Blue Light So I'm taking over my sister's Reddit to share my own experience with the supernatural. The setting was a three-story apartment that me, my sisters, and let's call her Crisis. And Nana. Crisis and Nana. Moved into there after I left my mother's house. It was pretty late, around midnight, and I was the only one awake and was reading on my phone and waiting to get tired. Crisis and I shared a room. Well, our Nana had the second. It wasn't a problem, because it wasn't like we had done it... Well, really, none of... Bleh, bleh. <laughs> I'm falling. I think I'm just... struck by the word, or name, crisis, that I'm falling over everything. Oh, well. So, for context, the layout of the apartment of our room was... Crisis's bed was against the left wall, and then there was a nightstand that was between her bed and mine. My bed being closest to the bathroom. Now, we only had a blue lava lamp on the bookshelf between the bathroom and my bed as a nightlight, seeing as neither of us were very fond of the dark. The bathroom had two doors, one that connected to our room and the other led to the entrance hall, which is where the front door was. The entrance hall opened up into the dining room, which had the kitchen in front of it and the living room to the right. So, on to the story. I was laying on my back and staring at my phone. That's when I noticed something odd. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see a flickering blue light, like a candle. I could see it from the open bathroom door, since we had both left doors open that night. It seemed to be coming from the entryway or the dining room. Nor did it first, because while crisis might investigate, I tended to ignore paranormal happenings, racking my brain for anything that might possibly be producing the weird light. There was nothing, there was no rational excuse for this blue light. Dropped my phone flat against my chest to plunge the room in relative darkness. Looked directly into the bathroom. The light was still there. Laid there for a moment, debating what to do, but ultimately throwing my covers back and climbing out of bed. I warily padded into the bathroom, stopping at the threshold of the second door. Goosebumps rose on my arms when I saw that there was no light source. The rest of the house was pitch black. Confused and rattled, I stepped out into the entranceway, and I shit you not, as soon as I left the bathroom, Crisis woke up screaming. I don't think I've ever flinched so hard in my life. I rushed back into the room and flipped the switch for the bathroom. Crisis was clearly disoriented, confused as to why she was even awake. I asked her what she saw, and although Crisis said that she didn't remember, the timing was too perfect for it to just have been a coincidence. Fortunately, that was the only strange experience I had in that particular apartment. She wanders the halls. Once again, I work at a nursing home as a security guard overnight on a 12-hour shift for well over a year now. I've had paranormal stuff happen to me before, but I didn't think anything of it most of the time because I'm just tired most nights. But something started about a week ago that scared me at first, but then ended up quite sad after thinking about it for a while. So lately we've been getting complaints from residents, 
that's in the 1200 hall about knocking on their doors in the middle of around 12 o'clock in the morning to 3 in the morning. They describe it as a slow, heavy knocking that knocks only twice. At first we thought the building was settling because we just had put in a new roof. It was because of hail damage. Others just believed it was something in the vents. But that couldn't be possible considering that the knock would have been followed by an echo after hitting metal. Then I heard the knocking for myself. It scared the hell out of me. I couldn't find where it came from, nor did I find it or where it did, and after about an hour it got me thinking. So we had this couple that lived in apartment 1202. It's the side that I work on. It consists of two wings. There's the 1400 wing and the 1200. Each wing consists of three stories. The story that they live on was the first story. The wife had a drinking problem. She'd get drunk and around midnight to three in the morning, go around knocking on people's door. At the time, Greg, one of my co-workers that switched to the daytime position, was working. His only job was to make sure that she didn't leave her room. The wife soon after passed away on November 7th, 2018. She passed away in the building, and then a year later in September 2019, the husband passed away in a hospital. Within the year that his wife died, he switched to DNR, which means do not resuscitate. After that, I was the only person to talk to him. He used to come out at around 2 or 3 in the morning and sit in the cafe area drinking coffee. He would always go back to his room before everybody started to come out. From what he told me, he just wanted to be with his wife. He was always so sad when I sat down to talk to him. Since she died in the building and he died in the hospital, I think she wanders the halls where she used to, trying to find him. It's around the same time that he and she died. It's a super sad story and I wish her the best. It doesn't freak me out anymore because I know the story behind the knocking. Stuff like this is bound to happen in a nursing home. But I hope one day they find each other. Me too. What did I see? When I was 11, we moved into my grandfather's house. That's after he decided to move out. He claimed bedroom doors would open even though he was always shutting them. When I stayed over with him about three to four years before the room became mine for five years, I always felt scared, uneasy, and just not safe. I always attributed this to me being about seven or eight and easily scared of the dark. Once we moved in the room I slept in where my younger brothers, well, Once we moved in the room I slept in, when I, W, as younger, became mine, hmm, I immediately began hearing scratching sounds. We had cats above my room, but none below it, which is where I swear these sounds were coming from. It also sounded like a WWE match was going on above my room at night many times as well. And again, we had cats, so I didn't panic. But I don't know how two small cats could make that much noise. About three years after we moved in, I began sleeping with my TV off to get better sleep. One night I woke up, heard whispering that sounded like it was two inches away from my ear, in a language I couldn't decipher. The whispers happened a second time about a week later. Both times, they awoke me from a very deep sleep. I eventually had two sleep paralysis episodes, the second of which I was somehow aware of and woke instantly from. The first was absolutely terrifying. Other than the scratching and banging, things were calm for the next two years, though. Until one night I was woken by my TV turning off. I swear it made the stereotypical poltergeist noise. I looked over to my door and saw a roughly eight-foot-tall white apparition with no facial features and gangly arms. It almost reminded me of a Slenderman look-alike. 
stared at it for a few seconds, frozen in fear, before I turned my lights on. As soon as the lights came on, it was gone. I tried to comfort myself for a few seconds, but as I did, so my dog just leapt off my bed and began barking in the general direction of whatever it was that I saw. We lived there another year and a half after, and other than scratching and banging, nothing of note took place. Since moving to our new home, I've experienced absolutely nothing I would class as paranormal. I'm just curious if anybody's had any insight into what I saw that night. All I know is it wasn't from this world, and I still get goosebumps thinking about it. I think my departed best friend is hanging with me. My best friend passed away one year ago this last February on the 19th. She was 36, effervescent and salty. She was fine one day and the next found out that she had a brain tumor. But a year later she was gone. I hate that she's left and I'm sad my son won't know her laugh and I'm still devastated by her loss. Not sure if I'll ever recover. She had a ha-ha sense of humor. She found mild inconvenience amusing but would have moved heaven and earth if we needed her to. The first time I realized she was with me was during a fairly devastating day at work. I don't have a difficult job, but it could be emotionally heavy and repetitive. Went to my car for my break and turned on the radio and started scrolling my phone. The song came on that everybody hates. I only say that because I've never met anybody who likes it. You cut out a piece of me, and now I bleed internally. Bah. Awful. I hate this song. And immediately the dial shifted to static. Not to the next station, not to the next signal, just static. To the very next number. I was listening to 100.7. It was now 100.8. Looked at my steering wheel, I pressed the buttons on the surface to see which button would make the dial move only one digit. There wasn't one. That was the first time. There are other things, like my toddler son... Like my toddler son, having random conversations with the wall, but the most obvious is the earring game. I've since realized that there's this game she wants to play, when she wants to show me something or wants me to pay attention to something. My right earring will fall out. It could be a hoop, a stud, a post with the back. It could be a chandelier and a wire, whatever. I don't designate my earrings left and right, I just put them on. But some days, and especially recently, my right earring will just fall off. If it had it back, it's either still stuck to my ear or on the ground by my foot when I go back down to get the earring. It sort of became a joke in my office because one day, on my way back from just being outside, someone noticed my earring was gone. I went back and found it and didn't really think much of it until it happened again with a different pair. I made a joke about how I must have had this ghost tugging at my ear and it hasn't happened in a half dozen times since the four others. Not sure what she's showing me, but I always get some good clarity in those moments. I don't know if it means anything, and if it is anything, or if I'm just missing my friend. I'd like to think that it's her way of pulling my ear to remind me that I have better things to do, or to complain less, or just to let me know that she's not so far away. So I put on earrings every day, hoping that I might feel one fall away from me, just so I can say thanks to her for always keeping me company. Ned. My nana, my stepdad's mom, and my stepdad told me a lot of stories when I was a teenager about my nana's house. My stepdad is a non-believer of everything, the paranormal, the afterlife, and religion. So when he told me these stories, I really believe him. He's never been a liar or exaggerates. My nana lives in the back of a back-to-back -back terraced housing in the outskirts of Wakefield. I don't really know how long she's been there for. She told me about a spirit she has in her house named Ned. Some small things happened in the beginning, stuff moving around and whatnot. Gordy, my step-granddad, also an unbeliever, seemed to be his main target. He said he'd be walking down the stairs, 
wash basket at the top of the stairs and a sock would hit him in the back of the head. Or one day, the wash basket knocked over behind him. He put his towel on the rack of the bathroom and when he got out of the shower, it would be on the floor on the other side of the bathroom. My Nana was sat in the living room one day watching TV. She turned to the side and a figure stood next to her. He was wearing a striped shirt with large cuffs on the wrists. My Nana ran up the garden screaming to Gordy. She said she was too scared to look up at his face in case it was horrible looking or something. Another was when my stepbrother's mom was pregnant with him. She was sat on the sofa and on the leg of her PJ and started slowly raising up her leg. My Nana shouted, Ned, stop! And her PJ leg dropped back down. My uncle also had an experience. He was on leave in the army. He had a friend staying with him at my Nana's. He let his friend sleep upstairs, and he slept in the living room. In the middle of the night, he woke up to the dog flying open. The dog flying open. And the dogs, two tiny Jack Russells, came charging to the room looking unsettled. My uncle then saw a figure run from the back door into where the pantry is. He was that scared that he slept on the floor upstairs next to his friend. When I used to stay over, I would share a room with my stepbrother. He's a few years younger than me. He used to be terrified of Ned in some nights and get some really weird feelings. We would wake up hearing someone walking about our room or on the landing. My stepdad didn't say much about his own experiences in that house, but he did tell me that he came home from base one weekend and saw his neighbor across the road pull on his motorbike. It was at his usual home time from work. He waved at him, said hello, said hello back. My stepdad went inside and my nana asked him who he was talking to. He told her the neighbor and my nana seemed shocked. That guy had died in a motorbike accident that week and my stepdad didn't know because he was posted a few hours away. Please help. Do we have some kind of attachment? It's getting to a point where we're starting to get concerned. Not necessarily for our safety, but because it's escalating. I'll begin with what led me to making this post. Last night my boyfriend heard something clearly whisper his name into his ear, followed by something touching his foot. He said it was almost like something was digging their thumb into the bottom of it. Here's why this is so concerning to us. In mid-2021, we had driven to a dead-end road that was built away from the main part of town to look at the stars. We were standing outside the car and he told me to get back in the car and then immediately drove off. He waited a few minutes until we were far enough away and said that he saw a black figure starting to move towards us in the tall grass a few hundred yards from us. The entire drive back to town, we could feel it in the back seat. I can't describe it in any other way than we both knew something was back there. I remember my boyfriend was very emotional after, saying that he felt like he was going to uncontrollably sob and that he was overcome with grief and dread. Since that night, we've moved into three different apartments, all of them being in new build complexes. The first two we always joked about being haunted, we'd hear weird noises regularly in shadowy areas and the closets felt really off. Sometimes things would move, a light would be on that we couldn't remember turning on or the tap would start dripping. I literally said to my boyfriend, I hope that ghost doesn't follow us to the next place. When we moved from the second place, it did. We moved into our current apartment this past summer, and the weird noises continued. Then we started to feel it again. We could feel it peering around the corner into our living room all the time. It also continued to make the closet just feel weird. Then a week or two ago he asked me if I had just laughed out of the blue. I hadn't, but I also hadn't heard anything. Then I heard something whisper, hey, and he didn't hear it. Then last night happened. So it's starting to get more comfortable or something, and we just don't want that. We both believe in ghosts and spirits, so honestly, it just makes noises. It really wasn't a big deal. 
What we don't want is it getting more aggressive. So please, if anybody has anything, we're open to suggestions. We aren't sure what to think of it. We already try not to acknowledge or talk about it when we're at the home, but we're wondering what it could be and what we could do to combat it. My packages delivered themselves. So I work the night shift. I've worked here for roughly nine months. The building's four years old. I'm the security guard that keeps an eye out for the independent living, otherwise known as the IL side of the building. I work alone. This building is huge. There's four wings, the 1400, 1200, and 1100, and 1000. Three of the wings have three stories to them. Not to mention the ungodly long hallways with nothing but doors on each side and little dolls that the residents put outside their door. The residents just think the dolls are cute, but they creep me out. The first month I worked here, I heard some stories about the building being haunted. Now in my mind, I'm like, there's no way this building is haunted. It's only four years old. God, did I regret that thought. I've had multiple encounters with noises and hearing breathing that wasn't mine, or footsteps that get progressively louder and faster. Anyway, six months later, something happened to me that freaked me out. Bone chilling. I was delivering packages around 1.30 a.m. So it's dark outside, almost pitch black. We have this cart that all the packages get put on and wait to get delivered. I was dragging it through the hallway and I had to go up to the elevator on the second floor on the 1200 wing. There were five packages on the cart and they each needed to be delivered on a different side of the building. Pick one up to place it in front of the door, turn around to grab the handle on the cart. Well, I grabbed air. Realizing what just happened, I just kind of stood in shock for a second. I head back down to my office thinking, maybe I'm just tired and I was imagining delivering the packages. Well, the cart was still nowhere to be found. After an hour of looking for this cart, I was constantly checking the time because the packages needed to be delivered by 3 a.m. I sit down, put my hands over my face with my eyes closed for a second. I then open my eyes, look out the door of my office. I was in disbelief. The cart was right there with no packages. I could not believe it. I go walking around trying to find these packages and to my knowledge they're all delivered. I know I didn't deliver those packages. Thought I blacked out, but I couldn't have blacked out considering I was looking for the cart. I went home after my shift and couldn't sleep that day. I was in shock. Luckily, I had the next morning off, so not sleeping didn't really hurt my schedule. Ask Reddit. I lived in a pretty spooky New York City apartment for three years. The place was on 29th and 3rd, on the first floor in the back of the very old building. All of the windows looked out to a narrow brick alleyway, so naturally the place was very dark all the time. When my roommate and I first moved in, we smelled something awful coming from the apartment next door. It was akin to rotting garbage and cooked cabbage. I figured perhaps it was actually just garbage because we all get lazy from time to time and don't want to put pants on to take out the trash. After a few weeks though, I told the super about it who knocked on the guy's room to no avail. A few days later I came from class and there was a cleaning crew clearing out the place. Pretty sure what I was smelling all the time was dead guy funk. And that's when weird things began to happen. My roommate Audrey swore she heard something moving around in the closet on more than one occasion. New York City apartments are notoriously small, and this place was no exception. The closets in that place were tiny, scarcely large enough for a person to stand in wedged into the corner of the room like an architectural afterthought. I chalked it up to mice or something. Those little fuckers have been eating my mac and cheese for months. 
until she said she actually saw movement in there. Like a shadow, something dark. Nothing else happened for a while until one night when Audrey was home alone talking, excuse me, taking her makeup off. It was always a long nightly ritual for her. She was standing in the front mirror when something walked straight past the open door. There was a wall right next to the bathroom. There's no logical place somebody could have disappeared to. Oftentimes, I would stay up late painting in my room because I would always kind of save my assignments for the last minute. Perhaps it was sleep deprivation or delirium, but I swear I'd seen a figure standing in my doorway in the early morning hours. As soon as I'd turned my head, my heart's racing. I'd seen nothing. But here's the worst part. It was just a few months until we were about to move out. I was in my room working a good 20 feet across from the bathroom with my door opened. That was while Audrey was doing her makeup thing. All of a sudden she yells at me, telling me to get off. I lean back in my chair to look at her across the living room and she realizes I'm way too far away to have touched her. Something had grabbed her shoulder from behind and pulled her around. Something she didn't see in the mirror. She was shoved quickly, but not necessarily violently, by a hand that wasn't there. That place still gives me the creeps. See ya. Either something in my bed is with me, or my imagination and body going wild when I was younger. So when I was in high school, I had something happen as I slept. Over the years, I've tried to justify it away. I was just asleep, even if I didn't realize it. My arm fell asleep, and that's what happened. If people can strangle themselves with their own hand when they fall asleep, then I could have done this. Only problem with these justifications is I was wide awake at the time, still to this day vividly remember it. Trying to justify it helps myself, but doesn't change what happened. It was at night, one of those nights where you toss and turn, but can't fall asleep. Not for lack of trying, but not even a tired but can't sleep state. Just wide awake, but knowing you should be sleeping. I just rolled over to check the time and saw it was around 3 a.m., I can't remember the exact time, just remember the realization of, well, I only had three hours of sleep if I conked out right then. I rolled back over to my back and throw my arms out in exasperation. Only my right arm, the side facing the inside wall side of the bed instead of the open side, hit something cold and hard. I immediately pull it back, sit up slightly and try to get a better look, and tentatively reach back out. The second I touch that cold, hard thing again, it's just a flurry of movement. Like I woke something up. Can't feel the rush of air. Next thing I know, I'm being dragged back to the headboard by my hair. Something is gripping it and trying to pull me down between the bars of my headboard. I'm fighting for my life, but also can't get a sound out. I'm trying to scream, but only pants escape. And I'm trying to pull my hair and my head free, but can't get a grasp of the narrow space between my headboard and the wall. I finally do get free, but it wasn't from anything I did. I had black spots in my vision at the point where lack of oxygen and still couldn't get in a full breath. I sat in the middle of my bed, just circling 360 degrees for about 10 minutes, searching for threats as I tried to get my breath back. Eventually I calmed down, and this was still in my dumb teenage phase with no sense of self-preservation, so I tried calling out for whatever was there. I even stuck my arm down the headboard to see if I could feel anything. Nothing. I then got up and turned on the light, grabbed the flashlight to check under the bed, too. It was empty except for a clump of hair that was underneath the headboard by the wall. Didn't get any sleep that night. Never had it happen again. What might that have been? Was it just my arm falling asleep and attacking me? Was it something else? And has anyone had anything like this happen? It's been bugging me for a while, just wondering if I'm the only one to go through something like this. Something weird happened to me in a forest, and I still can't forget it. This thing happened to me in the past, when I was around nine. I always used to hang out with my oldest cousin. He was seven back then. We were pretty inseparable. 
at the time, at least before everything changed when he turned 18. I was spending a night in my granny's house. I used to sort of be your personal dog sitter. He decided to come and hang out with me before he suggested a good idea to go into the nearby forest. It was almost next to her house. We were living in a medium-sized city, but the forest is almost always near buildings at some parts or areas. Around 10 or 11 p.m. to just walk around the edge of the forest, since it would be foolish to go deep into the forest that late. I nodded and told him that it would be a pretty good idea since we were bored and feeling adventurous. So we headed out and just started to walk toward the edge of the forest, and having a small adventure. But that didn't even get half an hour before the weird things started to happen. I remember when I was standing against a big tree and looking just in front of me, while my cousin was near my side, like six or seven inches away from me, and seemed to be searching something, which is still unclear what exactly what. But, when I was looking in front of me, I saw red eyes staring at me. It was out of nowhere, but they were far away from us. I turned toward my cousin and asked if he was seeing what I was seeing right now. He just ignored my question, so I turned back to look at the eyes, and they were closer than before. Blinked a few times, but of course I couldn't see anything around them, and they weren't getting any closer now. I only saw trees, and I turned back to him, asked the same question, but he kept ignoring me. So I turned one last time to look at them, just to see if they were even closer. I just kept watching them, feeling a little bit afraid at this moment. I swear that they started to come towards me even when I didn't look away. So I just grabbed from his hand and just ran as quickly as I could with him until I saw the street lamps. After that, I've never seen or experienced the same thing ever again. The funniest thing is that I never heard them letting out any kind of noises when I was approaching, even if they would have been a lot of branches on the ground and it was the size of a wolf or a dog. This has been bothering me. It just made me question myself, like, what would have happened if I didn't run away? What if I would have just stood there to find out what that thing was? Even if it's been 16 years already when it happened, it's been staying in my memories. Haunted house living with four others. Knee tapping in figures and a moved painting. I've had quite a few strange occurrences, but this one house I lived in was a lot. I lived with three friends, all in our early 30s. The house would have been built in the maybe 1900s or maybe even earlier. My room. I would sleep terribly. I'm a great sleeper. And as soon as my lights were off, I would feel a suffocating feeling of darkness. It's hard to explain, but the air would feel thick. One night I fell asleep on my back with my knees up as I had a sore back. I woke up to the feeling of someone rhythmically tapping hard and thudding on my kneecaps. I was frozen in fear as it was dark. It was like a forced feeling. Bolted out of the room and ran to my friend's room. When I would shower, I would hear a roommate arrive home. Stomping in the wooden hallway. Typical loud roommate movements. And then, it opened, you know, he'd open the door and start chatting after a shower and the house would be empty. I would text everyone and not a single person had been at home. This time I was worried also about an intruder, of course, but had a feeling of dread every time. We had a new male roommate. They moved in. A really sweet guy. He was decorating his room when moving in and hung a cross decoration on an existing hook. It was kind of goth. A while later it caught his eye and it was swinging side to side against the wall. He had just moved in so didn't want to seem weird and tell us this, but this guy was spooked. We found out when things got worse and we all discussed it. Another roommate had a wall in her room with a, like a walk-in wardrobe area behind it. One night she woke up to what she thinks was a person peeking around staring at her, like the exact silhouette and screamed for us to help and there was nothing there. Well, no, real person anyway. Last thing, we had lights which kept blowing. 
We asked our electrician friend to come check out the attic space as it was an old house and could have been anything, but went up there while we were all at work. Apparently he had his torch up there as it was kind of dark and he shone it on a big framed painting. Got a fright. Went to look closer and it disappeared. Like searched the whole perimeter of the space and this giant painting was gone. He got such a bad feeling over him that he almost fell out of the manhole trying to scramble out. Anyway, that's all. We all still talk about it at times, but obviously moved out as soon as possible. Sometimes I drive by that house and still get a shiver. Such bad energy. My girlfriend saw my uncle's death. This always struck me as being a bit weird. I'm still not quite sure what to think of it. I met my girlfriend, female 22, online two years ago. We lived four hours apart and hadn't met at the time. We'd been talking for a couple of weeks and at this point I'd mentioned my uncle to them. He'd been a huge part of my life and sort of stepped in as a father figure for me before I had to move far away from him at nine years old. When I was in my teens, my uncle unfortunately passed away. His death had greatly affected me, and I'll be honest, I'm still not over it. Never told my girlfriend exactly how he died. I just let them know that he had passed away, and that I miss him and have some regrets that I didn't contact him more. My girlfriend had never met my uncle as they've never been in the same state. I had never even shown my girlfriend a picture of him as well. Well, one really nice day, I decided to walk to work. While walking, I was speaking with my girlfriend over the phone, which is when it seemed like, out of nowhere, my girlfriend asked me what my uncle looked like. I was a bit perplexed, but described my uncle to my girlfriend, who oddly enough was giving me details of what he'd looked like. My uncle and I didn't look alike at all, by the way. Before I could get in those details, the really odd question was asked. They asked if I'd be willing to share how my uncle died. I agreed to share the story with them as kind of a bit tragic and upsetting. I won't go over all the details here as it's very personal. I apologize, but I don't want to put his death out on the internet. He had an accident though, and it was truly heart-wrenching. As I told my girlfriend the story, they began giving me details on everything that happened. I was shocked and a little unsettled girlfriend was able to practically tell me how my uncle died and details about where he was when it happened. I didn't know what to say, but my girlfriend then told me. I had a dream and had seen this all happen. I'm not sure how that happened. I do know that my uncle sometimes appears in dreams and checks up on us. My mom's told me he'd appeared in her dreams and told her that she needed to wake up so she'd be ready to take me to school in the morning before it was too late. He's appeared in my dreams as well, with his iconic laugh and just would check up on me. I'm not sure what that means, I'm not sure if he shared that information with my girlfriend and why his death, if he did, or if it was beyond that. It's still something I think about two years later with my girlfriend. Old Haunting When I had a child, I had two separate experiences that may have been supernatural or may have simply been my mind playing tricks on me. However, when I was about 18 or 19, I experienced something that was definitely supernatural. On the southern tip of Staten Island, there lies the Conference House and its surrounding park. Up until the early 2000s, there was about a half a dozen houses on Parks Department grounds. They were vacated and demolished so they could make walking trails and such. An ex-girlfriend of mine, they lived in one of these houses with her mother and sisters. When I would spend the night, I would share the pull-out bed with her in the living room. However, there was one night where it was particularly hot. So we went upstairs and slept in her sister's bedroom since it was cooler in there and they wouldn't be at home at that night. For whatever reason, I couldn't sleep comfortably. 
I would wake up and just look out toward the window across the room. Around the third, I woke up. I saw something standing between the bed and the window, nearer to the window. I was told this house was haunted, and in the year and a half since, I started hanging out there with my ex and her sisters. I'd never seen anything. So this one night I see standing near the window a silhouette of a human figure. It was just standing there. Even though the room was dark, there was still enough moonlight illuminating the room. Yet what I saw was pitch black. I'm talking as black as black can be. I wasn't able to make out any facial distinctions. It was like devoid of anything human. It really was just a black silhouette and it was terrifying. After staring at this entity for what seemed like forever or just three seconds, I woke up my then girlfriend. I asked if she was seeing what I was seeing and she did. I quickly asked what we should do. She said we should go downstairs, to which all I could say was okay. Luckily, the door to the hallway was about two feet away from the bed on her side. After she got up, I quickly followed. Instead of getting up on my side, which would have been placing me between the foot of the bed and the entity, I rolled across the bed and hurried on my way out, never looking back. That was the one and only time I ever experienced anything in that house. But that moment has stayed with me for nearly 20 years. Even though those houses were demolished in the early 2000s, I don't dare walk down that block at night. My grandma is haunting my mom. For context, my grandma died in a traumatic way. I, a 29-year-old female, live out. My great-grandmother, paternal, passed away, so my mom and I returned home for the funeral and stayed with my grandma, maternal, for the time that we were there. When the week was up, we returned home. The day we left her house, I turned around to see her watching us leave, and for some reason I had a gut feeling that it would be the last time I saw her. I quickly brushed the thought out of my head. We weren't even home for more than two weeks, and my uncle called to tell me that his wife found my grandma dead in her apartment. She had been there for four days before anybody found her, and she'd like to turn her AC off at night so the decomposition was so bad that they couldn't even pinpoint the exact cause of the death. I talked to her maybe one to two times a week, so not hearing from her for four days wasn't out of the ordinary since I also work nights. The week after we returned home, my mom's boyfriend mentioned that last night he woke up to use the bathroom. He looked over and saw my grandmother standing over my mom. She was just staring down at her. Some nights they'd hear someone pushing down the toaster and hearing them just pop up like somebody was making toast. Some days, they'd even find that the thermostat was turned up to 85. Fast forward to 2021. We were looking through some of her things and found her journal. And I know we shouldn't have read it, but curiosity got the best of us and we read a few pages. I won't go into detail about what they said, but it was, well, that I wish I really never read these things. The next day, my mom came to me told me about the nightmare she had about her. She doesn't even know if it was a dream or not because it felt that real. She said she was laying in bed and falling asleep when out of nowhere she smelled this putrid smell. She said it smelled like what happened to her in her apartment and what that whole thing smelled like after they found her. When she opened her eyes, a decomposed version of her mom was standing over her and just staring at her. She could even feel the bodily fluids leaking on her as she stood over her. She couldn't move or scream, so she shut her eyes really tight and when she opened them again, she was gone. Since then, she's had the same dream maybe once or twice a year. Ask Reddit 
My dad told me and my brothers this story when we were growing up. It's always stuck with me, particularly on long drives when I'm feeling a bit sleepy. The first time I remember hearing it was after I asked him if angels were real. I was probably seven or eight years old. He drove trucks decades ago, before it was born and before labor laws around limits and brakes were more standard. I'm assuming it's different now. Hmm. He'd fairly, excuse me, fairly regularly accept calls that would extend his shift to where he was driving 24 or 36 hours or more without a break. At least a break longer than like a quick bathroom or fast food stop. My dad has a pretty mathematical brain. He's the type to make up logic puzzles out of something totally mundane just for fun. Whenever we were driving around town, he'd regularly ask me things like how long would it take us to get from home to the store if we were going 30 miles an hour but had to stop for 5 minutes in the middle because of family kittens or crossing the road, etc. He'd come up with similar equations for himself while he was driving solo that involved things that he was seeing like the odometer, mileage markers, the time. Then he could test his speed based on the equation. One night after having already driven a particularly long day, he noticed his eyes getting droopier and the whole roll down the window and blast the music up thing didn't seem to be helping much. It was a rainy night on a pretty windy mountain road without a shoulder to pull over safely. So he started doing those logic games out loud to keep alert and keep awake. He was saying something to the effect of, I just passed mile marker 146. So what time will it be when I reach 200 if I'm going 55 miles an hour? He closed his eyes, took a deep breath, and felt his head do the nod jerk thing when he woke up with a gasp. He opened his eyes to see he was driving straight toward mile marker 158, which would have sent his whole truck tumbling down a random ass mountain ravine. He was able to crack the course safely back, but it was a matter of seconds between that reality and certain death. He insists to this day that he slept through 12 miles of windy mountain roads going 60 plus miles an hour, only to wake up right at the last moment between life and death. The story usually ends with him tearing up saying, I don't know if there's angels, but I know there's something bigger going on in this universe than our human brains have been able to understand yet. If I wouldn't have woken up right when I did, you kids wouldn't be here today. And that's something that feels pretty close to spiritual. My Haunted City I live in what is known as the original Sin City, otherwise known as home to Bobby McKees. Living here means you hear stories and theories about the city. The first house I lived in, only four blocks from Bobby McKees by the way, was the worst. The first day I was in the house, me and my sister and my mom were unpacking. When I was walking away from the TV, a big blue vase was thrown across the room at me. I tried to recreate it to see if the floor was on level or shifted, but nothing happened. The stand the case was on didn't move, even when we would jump by it. A few nights after we moved in, me and my siblings were upstairs sleeping. My cousin and my mom was watching a movie downstairs when we heard running up it. My cousin thought it was us messing with them, so my mom came in and checked on us, but we were asleep. When my mom went downstairs, it happened again, so my cousin decided to scare us, still believing it was us. So she crept up the stairs and jumped out to scare us when she heard footsteps get close. There was no one there. My mom said that she has never seen my cousin run so fast in her life. This house was a three-bedroom. But you'd have to go through me and my twin sister's room to get to the other rooms. Kind of weird, I know. But my mom didn't have a room, so she made the dining room downstairs into her bedroom. She had her bed up against the door of the basement. The only way to get to the basement, by the way. We would always hear scratching and banging from the inside of the basement. Sometimes it was so bad the entire house would shake. Every time my mom would go down there, the basement was empty. No animals, no people, nothing but old holiday decorations. It got so bad that one day my sister went upstairs to get a bottle of water. She had left it in our room, but 
When she was walking in there, there was a woman in a white nightgown. She had her hair in a tight bun and blood running down her neck. My sister ran downstairs and was terrified. We all went upstairs, and of course no one was there, and we moved out when I was 11. There's a new family there now, and they're experiencing things as well. Soon after moving out of that house, that's when I realized I had a gift of seeing and speaking to the dead. I don't know why I have this ability, but I'm not the only one. My mom and sister have a gift as well. I don't think the spirits in the house were evil except for the one in the basement. Other than that, I think that they just wanted to help and answers. Which I hope they do get one day, but until then, I'm convinced they'll keep trying to be noticed by the living. My Wife's Haunting Morning, it's kinda long. My wife told me that when she was around eight years old, she had started having several paranormal happenings in her bedroom. Like her toys would be nicely put away in her toy chest, specifically her dolls. It would be before she would go to bed every night. And when she would wake up, her dolls would be in a row, sitting in an upright position facing her bed. If that wasn't creepy enough, she said that it would escalate. And it was, well, be to the point where they'd be able to hear footsteps running across her floor. When she would turn her head to see what that noise was, there'd be nothing. Now this was just the beginning too. Whatever this entity was, it made itself more known. This happened for two more years. And she had moved about two more times in that span of time. Like I said, stranger things started to happen. And one of the more astonishing ones was... Well, when she'd be playing at the park, waiting to be picked up by her mother, she was usually the last kid around. She started to notice the park equipment would be moving the swings. There'd be no breeze or kids around, it was just plain weird seeing the swing move back and forth as if there was a kid on it. Not long after the park equipment moving by themselves, she started to see a little girl following her, or so she thought. My wife had never seen her before, and she wasn't scared by any means by this little girl. This girl, she said, was not ghostly looking and could see clearly. Only thing was that girl would always be hidden behind something, peeking around the corner or just far away from my wife. So one day she decided to try to talk to the little girl. She saw her at the playground this time and walked around toward the girl. As she moved closer and closer, the girl would start to hide herself behind playground equipment. My wife kept calling at her, saying, Do you want to play with me? With no response back and the girl moving away from her, she just gave up and went on with her day. My wife finally told me how she knew that little girl was a ghost. My wife was walking home from the park and she noticed the little girl in the strangest place. Sitting on top of a light post... How was that even possible if it was the strangest thing ever and every day after that she would see her on the rooftops and light posts? Just the most peculiar places. It's been years, but now that my wife is older she says that she can hear footsteps around the house and the giggle of a little girl whenever she's alone. Treasure Guard Slapped Me in the Face The story I'm about to tell you happened in 2008. I started working in a central Anatolian city where two other people were there also to excavate an illegal tumulus, a king's tomb in search of treasure. Our goal was to dig nine meters to reach the tunnel in the burial chamber. On the first day we dug three meters we dug at night and stopped working early in the morning. The evening after the excavation, I went to the excuse me, ex why can't I say that? Excavation site and saw that somebody had covered the pit. This didn't mean anything to us, but we had to start digging again. This time we managed to dig four meters deep. However, when we went to the site the next evening, the pit was covered again and we had to dig again. 
After the excavation, I went and slept on my left side, in my single bed. I dreamt that I was digging in the area. The last axe blow revealed a hole leading to the tunnel. When I widened the hole and entered the tunnel, there was a tall man holding a sword. His skin stuck to his bones next to a pile of gold coins. After we looked at each other for a while, I asked, Who are you? He replied, I'm the guard here. Who are you? I said, I'm the new owner of this place. He stood up and said, Stay away from here, otherwise you will die. He slapped me hard in the face. After the shock of the dream, I went to the bathroom to check myself in the mirror. and There were purple fingerprints on my face. Couldn't leave the house for a week because of this horrible dream. My friends from the team called me and asked me why I didn't come. I told them about the horrible dream I had and told them that I would never go there again. Advised them not to go there either. 1. Illegal antiquities. Oh my gosh. Illegal antiquities and treasure hunting is very common in Turkey which is home to many ancient civilizations that have lived in the region for thousands of years. Two, according to Islamic belief, it's frowned upon to turn the left side and sleep. Hmm. Three, there's a widespread belief in Turkey that treasures that remain buried for a long time are possessed by jinn, or the people who bury the treasure try to protect it with spells or talismans to keep thieves away. Illegal treasure seekers work with hojas who talk to jinns in order to keep them away or break these spells. I don't know how to say this. Today me and a friend went to some lost place was there a lot of time, nothing special. It had a bunker. We wanted to go in there, but the second we went into the forest, the lost place isn't a forest, I felt like someone or something was watching us. I saw some black figure lurking behind a tree. We didn't think anything of it at first, but we just vent inside the house. We just vent inside the house, and that bunker was just wanting to go down there, but I just felt like something was down there waiting for us. So we went outside. When we were outside at our bikes, we heard someone throwing stuff around the bunker. It sounded like wood. My friend just said he heard metal falling down there, and we went to some place near it with a good viewpoint. We had walkie-talkies with us. Don't ask why. So one of us went back to the house. Me first. I don't even know what we really thought doing this, but it felt right. I went there, but at halfway point I heard a breathing like when you're exhausted. It was deep and sounded male. I looked around there and there was nobody. I didn't look in the forest or anything, I just ran back to my friend. He went and I watched. Just so you couldn't see much of the path, you'd have to kind of walk. I heard some strange stuff while he was walking. Then he said he saw something. I heard the same sound as he said. It sounded like it was a classic alien movie sound from those UFOs. Well, that was my point of view. Now my friend will say his. What's up? My name's Demetrius. And I'm going to tell you my perspective of when I went to the bunker alone. So as I walked to the bunker, I started hearing a breathing on my right ear, and as I turned over, I saw a creature that had a wendigo-type body with an upside-down face and a sickle in its shoulder. It was just staring at me with a smile on its face. After I saw that, I just started booking it back to my friend, and the last thing I heard behind me was a male screaming out in anger. It was like it was angry that I left. After that, we immediately left. Thomas again. I know this sounds fake, but it isn't fake. Should we go back there and film it, though? Yes. Midnight Ghost Car 
This happened to me just last night. Although I still can't really wrap my mind around what happened to me, I thought why not put this out there and see if anybody else has had this experience. So I'm a hobbyist photographer. I enjoy astrophotography so much being in winter and the sky usually clears up real nice in late night. So I grabbed my camera gear and headed out of town looking for the night spot exploring different areas. It's like part of the fun. So I'm in my car and I head down this dirt road, losing some satellite reception and I'm getting fuzz. Thinking nothing of it, I switch to FM. Still fuzz. AM, nothing, it was a little strange. So I turn off the radio and I keep heading down the road. I see a couple of red lights ahead of me. They were the tail lights from another vehicle down the road. I was approaching it pretty quickly and I thought this car might just be lost or just going really slow. So as I was approaching, I couldn't have been more than a couple of meters away to the point where these headlights would have given me a better visibility of the type of vehicle, when all of a sudden it was gone. And that's in all sense of the word, it vanished, not fade away, just the blink of an eye. I was left in shock that I didn't immediately see what was really ahead of me. It was an end of a road sign right in front of me. I slammed on my brakes. Luckily, it was a dirt road and there was very little snow or ice on the road. So I didn't slip, but it was still a close call. I got out to see for myself and sure enough, just past the sign, a drop off to a small riverbank. If I was going any faster, if it was slippery, I would have gone down and maybe died. Just the thought of it still gives me chills. If that wasn't enough, when I got back inside my car and started heading back, not two to three kilometers driving, I see headlights coming down the road. So to warn the car in front of me, I start flashing my lights. Still approaching and not phased by my lights, I start to honk my horn and flashing my lights, and he's pretty much beside me, and his lights are on high beam, almost blinding as it gets in closer, and well, he passes me and I hear the roar of his engine clear as day. So I look back to see him, and again... Nothing. No car lights. I went home and didn't take any photos there. No way I was going to stop again. Barely got any sleep last night. Just can't explain it. Anyone have a similar experience and want to share? I'd like to hear your stories. Bone Liquids About three years ago, I lived with my best friend and one of our other friends. Everything was pretty average. Haunting stuff, the Ouija board, my friends never said goodbye, didn't tell me until after I moved in, rude. The man on the stairs, the horrible nightmares. To me, this is all pretty average inside this house. But this friend of ours was a whole new level. I'll call him Friend B. It started when he tried to learn tarot and other tricks of the trade, including, but not related to black magic. So one day our friend leaves and she goes to snoop in Friend B's room. Now originally I didn't think that was okay and thought she was being paranoid until she brought me the notebook. Our names are old friends, and a bunch of pages with weird symbols written furiously in pencil. The kind of symbols you see in your average witchcraft TV show or summoning circles. A pentacle that was made of broken stick frame and hemp string, one for each of us. Our names are in the middle like a dream catcher for your soul. Now, this was all really freaking weird, but we got his stuff and got it out really quickly. Later, upon investigating and cleaning the room, I find a jar filled with nails and pins I lent to friend B. But inside this glass jar wasn't just the nails, but animal bones that looked like they'd been broken up to fit inside, as well as a very strange grayish and thick liquid smelled absolutely foul and when I showed it to grandma she freaks asks me where I found it and then explains that the metal draws out the liquid 
from the bones. What the fuck? Has anyone heard of this practice? I can't find anything about it, and to this day I don't understand. Grandma didn't give many details behind what it was used for. I don't know what somebody would want to do with something so putrid like that. In case you're wondering, we were good friends, but friend B got drunk, admitted he hated me for, and I quote, having too many things in common. How weird. I'd like that. My cat said goodbye before he died. Or did he? I used to sleep in the master bedroom of my house. Key words are used to. This is the experience that made me move rooms and become uncomfortable going up there. I still live with my mom and my dad. We used to have a cat by the name of Comet. When we moved into the house we currently live in, the problem is he had a sickness of the liver and didn't live past one years old. He was an inbred cat, so it was bound to happen. Of course, he was inbred on accident because my last few cats were all sort of related, lived outside, and he was from that litter. But this was when he was kind of getting awful. We were trying anything to help him and keep him around. So I put him on our screened-in porch so we could get some air. I did this around sundown in the early summertime, so it's like 8.30. Then I went to bed and I woke to a strange feeling in the night. It didn't open my eyes, I was more or less half asleep, half awake, but not paralyzed. I could still move. I tossed and turned a little until I felt something climb into bed with me. I reached out to it and felt the oh-so-familiar coat of Comet. The mass was the same size as him, and it purrs sounded like him so I thought it was him. I stopped petting it, and I felt a mass jump off my bed. I cracked open my eyes and searched for the light, and once the room was lit, I hopped out of bed, looked around the room, and there was no cat to be seen, and my door was shut, like it should be. So I thought Common did under my blanket, which was a favorite spot of his. Walked downstairs into my parents' bedroom, they were both up and scrolling through their phones like they commonly do at night when they can't sleep. Okay, which one of you brought Comet in? My mom looks to my dad with a confused look on her face. We didn't. Did you let him in and forget about it? I was certain that I didn't. So I went back upstairs and looked under my bed and sure enough, no cat. A day or two later, Comet died of liver failure. And when we brought him to the vet. To this day, I don't know how to explain what happened. My door was shut when I left to talk to Mom and Dad, so even if Kama was up there, he couldn't have left the room. To this day, I still wonder if that was my dying cat or something pretending to be my dying cat. Or if your cat went out of your room when you went to your parents' room. If it wasn't that, then it's what you said. Ask Reddit. A man tried to sneak into the park by running along the monorail track. A janitor had to hose him off. Well, hose him off the nose of the monorail train. On the ship that cruises in the rivers of America, the water separating Tom Sawyer's island, a cable snapped loose and hit a woman in the face, killing her. In Tomorrowland, what's now known as the Intervention Center, used to be called something else. I forget what, but it was a sort of a stage show in a rotating room with, like, singing animatronics. Some of which ended up in Splash Mountain. A female employee with long hair was leaning against a brick wall of the spinning room watching the show. Her hair got caught as the room spun and slowly pulled her head toward the gears, ripping her scalp off. Two boys, a teenager, excuse me, I should come up with something else that's not excuse me, but I do it on autopilot. Two boys, a teenager and his younger brother, 
had hid on Tom Sawyer's Island, which closes before the rest of the park. After they get bored of running around the island by themselves, they realize they're trapped, decide to try and swim across the River of America and get back to the main park. By then, it's dark, and when someone finally notices that there's someone in the water, the older boy had already drowned, and the younger brother was flailing and crying, trying to swim. After I heard this story, before I worked there, I also tried to hide on the island to see if I could stay behind after it closed. If you're familiar with the island, these are fun little tunnels you can crawl through. Some just dead ends and, well, it's in one of those dead ends and tunnels that my aunt and sister decided to try and hide in. We huddled together in the small tunnel in the very back for maybe three minutes or so before we heard a voice that said, It's closing. Time to leave. We freaked the fuck out and crawled out of that tunnel so fast. But later we're telling the story to my mom on the raft back to the main park. And the employee steering it laughs and tells us there's a camera and a speaker in that tunnel specifically. Mostly because that's where people like to hide during closing. And the voice we heard was probably the technician watching us on camera on the island's PA system. Chatsworth Colt Sighting There's a hiking trail near Chatsworth Park. It's on the northwest side of the valley next to Los Angeles. It's well known for being adjacent to Corganville, which is close to Spahn Ranch. It's essentially called the Manson Hills, which is where Charles Manson and his followers used to hang out. If you end up hiking there, it is not too exciting. You may see a few bobcats and red-tailed hawks, though. This fact is very inconsequential to the story, but still relevant. We used to sit class at Canoga Park, hike to the hills, We'd smoke weed, drink without fear of being busted by local law enforcement, because it was far too out of the way for LAPD's jurisdiction. My buddy Gail used to talk of seeing strange creatures and figures, he would always think it was because he was high or messed up when he hiked the hills. There are also several homeowners that have property up there that was known as a safe place to party. One night when we were walking up the path near the base of the trail, we saw several hooded figures. These figures were holding lanterns and walking very slowly up the path. Being so comfortable with the trails that we've used so many times, we thought nothing of it until we decided to go up over the ridge and follow them. They suddenly disappeared. Anyone who's been up in the hills here knows that there's a considerable amount of wildlife, even though it's next to the city. It became really quiet. We all had the feeling that we had to turn back. And I also want to stress that during daytime, this trail would have been no problem. But at that moment, I had the fight-or-flight feeling. We felt like it was like a general danger for our lives. Never ran so fast a trail in my life. Once we reached the dark trailhead at the bottom, Gail looked up and pointed at the ridge above us and screamed, Dude, what the fuck? We all looked up and saw what I can only describe as a really tall man that was pitch black. No noise, no reaction to her presence. We left. We then decided to go up to another spot to hang out. Late night, up Stunt Road. Been to the park since then, but never after dark. It was closed down now for a couple of years due to lead being found in the hills. And it's since been reopened. Did the lead move? Three Music Bach Notes at Night Most nights for the past two weeks, I've been woken once a night at various times, but most frequently between 3.20 and 3.30 a.m. by a loud, sort of tinny music box notes. Gets my heart racing each time. I don't own a music box. Turned off electronic devices, I pulled out my bed and furniture and looked for anything that could be making the sound. 
can't find any answers. I'd posted on my Facebook wall when it first started happening, and we all concluded it must be some kind of auditory hallucination happening. That's when I was half asleep. But the other night I was having trouble sleeping and was wide awake for over an hour tapping away on my phone and I heard it loud while I was completely awake and alert. And it just happened again tonight while I was awake too. I was trying to think why the three notes were familiar. And I think it's the go-to-sleep notes from Brahms' lullaby. Which is ironic. If it's a ghost, it has a sense of humor. The last two nights I've had a smart recorder app switched on my phone. The kind that only records if it picks up noise. But it didn't happen. I wasn't awoken, and nothing on the recording. Absolutely kicking myself for forgetting to turn the app on tonight. I'll keep trying. Not the first time weird things have happened in this cottage. Soon after moving in a year and a half ago, the lights in my room would randomly switch on and off. At first, I put it down to electronic fault, but it was odd that it only ever happened at night, waking us up once we were asleep. Daughter often sleeps in my bed. Then after a few weeks, it just stopped on its own. Also had a few literal bumps in the night, like loud and sudden bumps, which we initially reasoned were perhaps the cat knocking something over, but we did later realize the cat's outside. My elderly neighbors convinced her place is haunted and has some wild stories that can't be explained. Unless she's either going senile, but she seems sharp as a tack from our conversations. Or someone's been breaking in and playing tricks on her. She said the site where we lived was originally a nunnery, then a convent school for a time, and then a hospital, before being converted to accommodation. Ask Reddit. Okay, so this happened when I was in ninth grade. I'm living in a big city, and I mostly use the subway to go wherever I want. Because my mother can't afford a car, mostly. I remember that I was on my way to visit my boyfriend, and as usual, I used the subway. I only had to drive to the next station, because it's not a very long way. I had to stay in the subway for about 12 minutes. I was already waiting at the subway station when I noticed a guy that was giving me a very creepy look. He was around my age and a little bit taller than me. His hair was blonde and he had deep brown eyes. I exactly remember what he was wearing. Gray cargos, black hoodie, Nike shoes covered in dirt. I looked back at him, he didn't do anything, he just stood there and didn't even break eye contact. That was when I started thinking that something wasn't right. When I finally got into the subway, I noticed he followed me. He sat down only two or three seats next to me. He still kept looking at me, it got so awkward. I texted my boyfriend, Babe, there's a guy and he won't stop watching me, things are getting creepy. Since it was very late, my boyfriend texted back that I'm just paranoid and I should calm down. Maybe he was right. But when he finally looked away, I used the chance to change seats. Because that was a little bit weird for me. Finally, I was safe from his weird looks. When I reached the station, still in fear, my boyfriend picked me up because he asked him, well, because I asked him, because I was scared. We wanted to go upstairs and walk to his house, when I noticed the boy standing in the corner of the station smiling at me, with his eyes wide open. I told my boyfriend there he is. I meant him. I pointed at him. When my boyfriend asked me, Who? What do you mean? I realized the boy wasn't there anymore. How could he get up the stairs so fast? Was he just in my imagination? I never saw him again. I'm now out of school already starting my campus life and I'm still thinking about what happened back then. My boyfriend and I, who are still together by the way, decided to not talk about that again. I'm studying architecture and our teacher, who's somehow very spiritual, once told us about ghosts. Since then, I'm thinking imagination or ghost.
My Ghost Mom I had just come home from school. My father wasn't home because he was at work at that time. My mom answered the door, naturally. I hugged her, kissed her cheeks, and asked what was going, you know, what was for dinner. She didn't answer me, though. I didn't push her, thinking she mustn't. Maybe she just didn't hear it. But then it started to get dark. My mom helped me do my homework, and then the bell rang. My mom said, you answer the door. So I ran to the open door, hugged and kissed my father, then we went into the living room. My mom gave me the hush sign. There was something strange. Looking at my father's movements, it was as if he didn't see her. There was no greeting or any other conversation between them. Even with my child mind, the situation struck me as strange. I was scared, but I kept quiet. I didn't say anything to anyone. When it was around 10 p.m., I went to my room to sleep. My mom was sitting by my bed. Not giving me a chance to ask her why my father couldn't see her, she started telling me a story. Since I was still a small child, I started to listen. I fell asleep while listening to my mother's story. When I woke up in the morning, my father brought my school uniform to my room. My mom helped me put it on, and then I went to school as I always did. And that was how my days went for about a week. Every day it seemed like my mom was helping me in a way that my dad couldn't see. Then two more days passed and things started to change. My mom came at me with a knife. Do you want to come at me? She yelled. And I got scared and started crying. And by the way, my mother had been sick with cancer for years. That evening, my father told me that my mother had passed away in the hospital a week earlier. He had been just waiting for the right time to tell me in a proper way. But when my father found out what I had experienced with my mother for a week, he told me that what I had seen couldn't be real, but everything I experienced was real. She even made me do my homework, spirit thing. Anyway, when I insisted that what I saw was real, my father took me to a psychologist. The psychologist said that it was impossible for a girl of my age to make up such things that she said she had seen. These words of the psychologist proved, well, that what I had seen was real. When we moved out of that house and settled into an apartment, this is 100% true. I personally experienced all of these things. After Hours Work Encounter This is a fairly recent incident that my, well, it's just kind of unnerved my work. I'm a parts assistant manager at a dealership. I work to close every day, and I'm the only one who works the counter for the last hour or so. Strange things happen all the time, mostly noises of the back parts, nothing too crazy. I figure it's just my imagination half the time, but... Sometimes parts will fall off the shelves and it'll spook me a little bit and I'll brush it off. Well, just last week I was alone getting caught up on some paperwork, because we're short-staffed at the moment. So it was just myself. This was after 6 p.m. All the salesmen left, and I know there's nobody left in the building. Lights are off except in, well, some parts, obviously. So it's about 7.30 or 8 when I hear a large bang from the floor on top of me. There are parts stored at the second level and parts of which, which don't sell many, so they're stored at the far back. The lights have never worked at the far back no matter how many times we've had electricians, excuse me, <laughs> electricians fix them. Anyways, I get up from behind the desk to go look, and it's not completely dark up there, but it's still kind of spooky. As I head up the stairs, I hear this large bang again. I did pause for a second, but rushed up the last step and headed to the back. I didn't see anything, but it got cold, and I had a chill running up my back. There was nothing out of place on the floor or nothing, but at least nothing had been moved or shifted from the shelves. It was all normal. So I start heading back to the desk. All the lights go out in parts, and it's pitch black. I know there's no one here and the switches are downstairs near my desk. My heart stops and I just pull out my cell phone, turn the flashlight on, and I find my way to the stairs and start heading down. 
As I'm getting to the last step, I can hear footsteps coming from upstairs and behind me. I was not about to look. Ran back to where the light switch was, and I can hear the steps running. As I did, I just sort of flipped the switch, turn around, and see nothing. I wasn't staying there any longer. Packed up my stuff, turned my computer, set the alarm, and I was out. The whole time I was trying to explain the experience away, but I couldn't think of anything. I don't think I'll be staying late at work if I don't have to for a while. The Disembodied Hand I know how incredibly cliché the title sounds, but I swear that this really happened. When I was around six or seven years old, and right before my family moved to the States, not for scary, haunting-related reasons, my dad needed to relocate for his new job. My siblings and I were playing outside on our trampoline while our parents were busy doing yard work, mowing and weeding, etc. No one was inside the house at the time, at least no one alive. Well, it was early afternoon, and we had been out there for a while, or what felt like hours, at least in my child mind. And I really needed to pee, like it was an emergency, and I really didn't want to pee my pants. So I got off the trampoline, made my way to the front of the house, went into the nearest bathroom. At the front of the house, there was this large window, which jutted forward and out from the rest of the house like a 3D trapezoid. As I was waddling by this window in an attempt to hold it in, I saw a pale white hand rise up from behind the windowsill. The hand was visible only down to the wrist, at which point it looked to be attached to nothing and was suspended mid-air. Initially, this hand was in an open position and looked as though it was about to wave hello, but instead of waving, it clenched into a fist and knocked on the glass, once, twice, thrice. Then it opened into a splayed position and vanished into thin air. Now at the point, the smart thing to do would have been to book it, but I really needed to be, and I was curious as to who or what could be in the house. Yes, I am that blonde chick that is the first to die in a horror film. As an added bonus, the room that I saw the hand in was the same room that was attached to the nearest bathroom, so I would have to enter that room anyway in order to do my business. In my astounding brilliance, I entered the house and that room in particular, I asked, Who's there? Luckily or unluckily, I didn't get a response. It was at this point that I knew I had fucked up. I remembered that everybody was outside and that I was therefore the only person in the house, alone. That was when the fear hit me and I booked it out of there. Needless to say, I decided to pee outside that day. So would I. Amen. Childhood experience that I can't shake 40 years later. I've never spoken about it, but it feels like a trauma memory because it's so vivid. I've never experienced anything else in my life, but I feel this was enough to shape my interpretation of the world from a young age. I was visiting a great aunt with my family, as we did twice a year. Set off at 7 a.m., drive two hours, then leave at 4. We never stayed over, even though she had extra bedrooms and was lovely, so I always thought it was weird. We also were never allowed upstairs. That's in about 15 visits, I only went once more after the first time. My memories of me at six playing with my younger brother in the lounge. Then I was upstairs in the doorway of my auntie's bedroom. She was in the room, stood next to her dresser. She was acting strange, the vibe was off. She asked if I'd like to come over to find her jewelry box and choose a piece. My spider sense was going bananas. I was a very smart kid. I pretended to walk toward her and then turned and ran to my parents in the room below, which is the kitchen with the table and chairs up against the wall. When I got there, I was shocked to see my auntie chopping vegetables. I looked toward the outside door, wondering if there was some stairs or a fireman's pole. Like, how the hell did she get down so fast? I asked her, and she virally blanked me. My 
parents laughed and said, don't be silly, go play with your brother. I was fuming and confused. So I just went and played. My mom went upstairs with my aunt a few years later to get something. She was getting something that she'd been given. I followed them up and started staring in every room looking for this woman. I was told sharply by my mom to go back downstairs as she could see my aunt getting anxious. Then another year later it was still playing on my mind. It would have been maybe ten. I asked my grandmother, my auntie's non-identical twin, whether she had another twin that's identical to auntie. I assumed there was some reason why they hid this other aunt or it was a ghost. I couldn't recall her response, but I have a feeling that she said it was a twin that died. But then again, I can't recall that either. I really want to ask my mom, but don't want to be seen as weird. I have since learned of doppelganger ghosts, and they assume identities. What's your weirdest paranormal or urban legend story? I have several. As my area, specifically my grandmother's house and her surrounding area, have high paranormal energy around it, due to being rather rural and the astonishing amounts of suicides and murders in the area. Most of the suicides took place in my grandmother's property. One man's family went missing, leaving the man who committed committed unalive in the woods. Who committed suicide in the woods behind the house. The second one, just the same as the first, only multiple bodies were found. Due to this, my grandmother's property is rather haunted, some of which I've experienced myself. As far back as I can remember, there's always been one area of the house I would never venture into. It just felt off, like I was being watched by something, and it scared me. One night I was staying with my grandma because she had fallen down a flight of stairs and couldn't walk because she broke her pelvis in three different areas. I slept on my mother's old room. Slept on the room, huh? It was an office at some point, as it had an old Macintosh Apple computer on the desk and with my Dell laptop next to it. I was driving off to sleep one night when I heard it. I heard footsteps just outside my door. They didn't run, it was somebody walking. But the steps stopped at my door. Freaked out, I flipped the lights on. Didn't see anything. I left the lights on the rest of the night. Nothing happened after that. I even left my phone recording all night. But the only thing I got was me talking in my sleep, and I do that a lot, arguing with my mom about donuts. The rest of the time I was there taking care of my grandma, nothing happened as well. My grandma's house was built in the 1800s. It's barely standing now. Grandma claims that she's had experiences with it as well. From people pushing her down the stairs, things moving from one place to another, disappearing for months on end and reappearing sometime later, to hearing disembodied voices, children and my late grandfather, and a cat call whistling. The house is not in the best of shape, as one spark from a loose wire could cause it to go up like a tinderbox. It's a very old house. Run-in with a duende. This happened to me about four years ago. I was coming home from work one night when it was around 6, 6.30. And here in Canada in the winter months, it's nighttime at this point. I was driving home, street lights are on, and nothing unusual except I was leaving work. I saw what looked to be like maybe a little boy in my rearview mirror. I'd say about 50 feet behind me in the middle of a parking lot. Kind of strange, but I didn't pay any attention to it. And as I was driving home, I saw the same kid, or at that point, I thought it was a different kid, about three blocks from where my work is. He was just staring at me as I drove by. I had a slight chill and tried not to think much about it, but it was creepy. I only live about seven minutes from my work, so it doesn't take me long to get back home. 
I didn't see him again until I was about two blocks away this time and he was under a street lamp. So I got a better look at this kid and to my surprise it wasn't a kid at all. In Mexico we call these creatures duendes. They're usually small fairy-like creatures with the appearance of an old man. Their heights do vary, but I myself have never seen one to be the size of a child. He looked exactly like an old man, and as I drove past him about to turn the corner, I was freaking out at this point. I just wanted to get home, this thing was following me. As I was on approach to turn the last corner of the house, there he was again. I slammed on my brakes because there it was right in front of my car just crossing the street. It looked up at me as it was walking past my car, and it gave me the most evil grin I'd ever seen. I was about ready to run him over with my car, but I was frozen in place. As soon as he was on the other side of the street, I gunned it home. But I took one final glance in my rearview mirror to see if he was still behind me. It was gone. It wasn't on the other side of the street or anything. I didn't care, but I was frightened. Got home, got out of my car, and looked around to see if it was nearby. I was fortunate enough not to see it again. I made sure to look down the street both ways before going into my house. Got in, locked the door, closed the curtain, and tried to forget what I saw. Even my wife knew something had spooked me. I didn't tell her the following day, and I didn't want to scare her at the time. I hope I don't see it again. But I do hope I see you guys again in the comments section. See ya. Working Nights in a Care Home when I was 18, I worked in a care home for just over two years. It was a home for adults with learning disabilities. There were around 30 residents living there. The building was L-shaped with four units all connected to one another. You needed a key fob to enter the building and go through the other units. Across from the units was another building with offices, med rooms, an activity room, and two flats upstairs where two residents lived. The laundry room was attached to this building but it was like an extension and he had to go outside to go in there. In the mornings I'd be doing laundry in the laundry room and I heard whistling in the room. Couldn't figure out where it was coming from. Could have been somebody outside, so I'd brush it off. This happened all the time. Another time I was in the laundry room and I head back to the door folding clothes and I heard someone walk in and say hello. I replied hello. Whoever it was said hello again. When I turned around and say hi again, thinking that they wouldn't hear me the first time, no one was there. We used to mess around on nights, filming the corridor in the dark, and orbs would fly everywhere. Got a few pictures of faces and stuff, which was just crazy. I really wish I had them now, but my friend changed her Facebook, and they were all saved in the messages. One of the girls got a video of the door opening slightly by itself, and these were heavy fire doors. She screenshot the video and the door opened and you can see a person through the glass. One night I was working with two other girls. We were sat in the lounge on a break between checks of one of the units watching TV and eating snacks. It was around 3 or 4 a.m. when we heard three loud bands on the glass of the door from outside. We all jumped up and absolutely crapped ourselves. We went to every door in every bedroom. No one was awake, and no one was outside. We didn't leave each other the other night, and it really shook us up. One of the residents would talk to someone in her room. She couldn't walk or talk in sentences. She would say words and laugh at around 2 a.m., and other residents mentioned seeing people in their bedrooms. On nights, there wasn't really one person who hadn't seen something like a shadow or a figure. The place was maybe 10 or 15 years old, and a lot of people died there so it's not surprising. I want to know what band was outside the window, what they were playing. Unless it was a bang. Ask Reddit. I have two, both of which occurred fairly recently not long after my grandfather's passing. The first one was when one of our kitchen lights, which we've never had a problem with before since, went through this weird three-week period of 
it's like light bulbs just spontaneously burning out. And it would be only after just a few days after we had put them in. We went through several bulbs, several boxes of bulbs. The same results every time. We even called an electrician to see if there was some sort of power surge going on. Couldn't find any sort of explanation. It was only that light. None of our other appliances had any sort of problem. Then one night one of the bulbs randomly exploded out of nowhere at like 10 o'clock at night. That's when the light wasn't even on. Now, my mom is a pretty big skeptic, and even she was freaked out by this one. Ever since the explosion, that lights worked normally, no further issues. The second one was my dad's telescope randomly falling over when I was home alone. For context, my dad's telescope is big, very heavy. This fact is important. My parents, coincidentally, were visiting my grandma, my late grandpa's wife. I stayed behind because I had a test due that day, and I'd completely forgotten about it. Thanks, online course, for not notifying me. Anyway, so I'm home alone, kind of mentally kicking myself for my stupid mistake and not being able to go see Grandma because of it. That's when I hear the loudest crash I've ever heard in my life coming from downstairs. It sounded like the front door being slammed open. I thought someone was breaking into the house, and I'm legitimately terrified, like fight or flight response fully activated. Grab my knife go downstairs, mentally preparing to stab a man if I have to. My dad's telescope was on the floor. That thing is way too heavy to fall over on its own. There were no open windows, so I couldn't have been the wind. Something would have had to have pushed it, but when I searched the house, no one was there. What was even creepier was that there were like drag marks on the carpet, meaning that the telescope moved at least a few inches along the floor before it tipped still freaks me the hell out. Am I the only one experiencing supernatural things in my family? So I'm a 17 year old male. I've been having weird encounters with otherworldly beings. I was really interested in communicating with spirits. So I did, and I've had some spirits talking to me. I'm from India. In our locality, we have a lot of Hindus, and their worship centers also scared forests, which are worshipped by these people. He might mean sacred. My family is very Catholic Orthodox, and so am I. I do believe in Jesus as well as the devil. So many months ago, my cousins came for their vacation. We were discussing how boring it was to spend all the time at her house, so we decided to venture into the sacred forest. He wrote scared again, so maybe it is a scared forest. Even though our family have repeatedly told us not to. We went anyway, so it was around 6.30. It wasn't that dark, but still, with that thick canopy of forest, it was really dark inside. FYI. It's actually a forest-like area, and it's like around 100 acres of land that's just forest. No people live near there. So we just started walking through the forest, and it was around 10 minutes into the walk that I noticed the entire atmosphere's changed. It was eerily silent. I was a bit anxious about going to the forest, but still went with them after about a kilometer into the forest. I spotted this white, transparent humanoid figure along the tree line. I suddenly stopped pointed at the direction of the figure to my cousins. They said that they can't see anything and said that maybe it's just fog. But I knew deep down that it wasn't safe to go into the forest. I asked my cousins to get back to the house since that day. I've been seeing the same figure almost everywhere. I can't get loose of it. I feel like I'm being haunted by it. I've been talking to spirits, as I've said, since the past few weeks. I just get so many dreams about a 12-year-old girl named Lizzie. I always wake up in the dream at around 1 a.m. and it's almost like a routine for me. I was chilling on my balcony one day when I saw the same exact girl again along the tree lines of the forest. She just disappeared in the blink of an eye. Blink. See ya.
just happened. Voice over phone from house. Anyone else have something similar happen to them? My wife and I just moved out of our house in Appalachia, but we still own it. Our neighbor is looking over the place for us and goes over there once a week or so to make sure everything's all right. Here's a background with what happened this morning at the bottom. The entire time we lived in that house, we'd never felt alone. There was also an energy that kind of sucked us in, if that makes sense. We heard footsteps and voices, smelled odd smells like perfume and cigarette smoke. Our first Halloween there, in the dead of night, a loud bang woke me up from my sleep. I just hung screen doors in the porch and it sounded like one of those had opened with the wind and slammed shut. I grabbed a flashlight, went downstairs to the latch, tried to close the screen door to learn that they were already latched. There was no wind whatsoever outside. By this time, my wife had woken up and come downstairs as well. She walked into the bathroom and noticed a mirror that was nearly bolted and flew off the wall and landed in the floor and shattered during the early morning hours. We immediately cleaned it up, took the mirror outside to the trash. Another night I was out of town for work. My wife was awoken by footsteps coming up the stairs. She was half asleep, so she thought it was me. Then she woke up and felt someone was standing on my side of the bed staring at her and the dog. The footsteps were so loud the dog even woke up. When she turned the light on, no one had, well, no one was there. This paired with a few other smaller things happening over the past few years just creeped us out of bed. But this morning takes the cake. So this morning, we're 2,000 plus miles away now. Our neighbor who looks over the house called us with a couple of questions. My wife's on the phone with her. She's on speaker and we're both talking to her, answering her questions. Then her phone cuts out mid-sentence and a deep man's voice comes on the phone and slowly sings, You are my sunshine, my only sunshine, in a low, staticky voice. Then her neighbor comes back on, still talking, haven't heard anything. My wife and I hear it as clear as day and it gives me goosebumps and nearly brings tears to my wife's eyes. Evil Laughter Choir So this story goes way back many years ago, and it was brought up while talking to my family over the weekend. It definitely took me back and it brought chills just talking about it. I know this wasn't just myself who experienced it, so I put more validity to the story. It was a shared experience. I was about seven or eight years old and my dad was a choir director at our church. We had about 20 or so people in the group. My mom, my aunt, my uncle, and a couple of my cousins. We would practice usually middle of the week after work hours in the church and it was just like any other choir practice. I would sit on the benches with the radio and a mic plugged into it. My job was to record them singing, so I would move from bench to bench recording them, getting different angles and playing the tape back so they can see how they sound. So after doing this about three times, at least three times already that night, it was the last song and the group was going to practice. I moved to the farthest bench at the very back of the church and hit record. It was all good a couple of times. I had to stop recording then start blunders, laughter. You know, usual stuff when practicing. It was the very last recording session. Everything was perfect. I stopped recording and went to go play what I just sang to the choir. We all huddled around, and like I said, perfect until it got to the end. You could hear faint laughter at the end. It was creepy to say the least. My dad stopped the tape, hit rewind, and played the ending again with the volume raised. Sure enough, there was a deep, low-sounding laughter in the background. Everyone froze. It was dead silent. And just to be sure it wasn't some flaw in the tape, he played it back again. Still there. We stopped the tape, but the laughter continued. That's right after the tape stopped, you can hear the same laughter. It was sinister-like. We could hear it echoing through the church. We all heard it, and we didn't stay much longer. We packed up our stuff and got out of there. 
I asked my dad what ever happened to the tape. He said he got rid of it. It's too bad. Maybe it was for the better, but whatever that laughter was, I sure won't forget about it anytime soon. It kept me up all night last night just thinking about it, and I've still got the chills. Ask Reddit. I am long overdue to this thread, and not a trucker. But that being said, I was heading east on I-70 after a successful recovery job. I had seen enough of west coast of America and felt like heading up to the Rockies. I was on my third day of minimal sleep, two to three hours max, due to aspects of my job. Crossing the mountain pass, I was doing 55 miles an hour with the windows cracked in order for the cold air to keep me awake. At 55 on those roads, I needed to be as awake as I could get myself. I finally managed my way through the twisty parts and hit the flat open stretches of the road. Opened up to about 65 miles an hour. After a while, I noticed something out of the corner of my eye, keeping pace with me. I slowed down kept pace. I ventured a glance over to the right of my vehicle and saw a loping beast. Bright red eyes like highway flare bright red, and a bright blood red tongue hanging out of its mouth as it loped along behind the vehicle. It even turned and looked at me. As I opened up that aged engine and made 8590 and just kept on driving until I hit Elko, Nevada. Not another car did I see for hours until I was two to three miles outside that town. I pulled off the road wearing my Rasputin's rock and roll t-shirt, cut off jeans and my long hair halfway down my back, and carrying a copy of Somerset Maugham's Of Human Bondage. As the waitress and hostess led me to my table, I overheard a couple of locals in the booth discussing. Asshole, number one. I think people that dress like that should be carried out of here. To which asshole number two said, Yeah, in a body bag. Yuck, yuck. I asked the waitress to give me a table at a better location where I could face the door and aforementioned assholes. And sitting down took a huge sigh of relief. Local assholes were like kind of a warm welcome after what I saw chasing me down a highway in the middle of a desert in the dead of night. The cherry pie gave me an upset stomach with three cups of shitty coffee. But the sun was coming up when I left to keep pushing on. Ask Reddit. Not so much creepy as seriously terrifying. But my roommate and I were carjacked right after we pulled into my driveway. We came home at about 11.50 p.m., still a little high from hanging out with some friends. We park and get out, and within two seconds, two guys in black hoodies come up on both sides of the car. They had guns. And my guy had his gun pointed at my gut about a foot away from me. Doesn't sound like your guy. I remember being so terrified I didn't even want to look him in the eyes. I did what he asked me to do throw my purse in the car and start the car, etc. And afterwards, he told me to walk into the middle of the street. I'd snagged my phone and jammed it to my bra, thinking I might need to call the police as soon as possible. As I'm walking to the middle of the street, I just take off running and I can hear them screaming after me. I feel bad because I left my roommate on the ground where they had her, after the guy on the side of the car frisked her for her things. But they just took off. I was on the phone with the police within three seconds of running off and jumping into someone's yard. What freaks me out is that we'd be gone since 8.30 p.m., and they had been hiding behind a nearby hedge just waiting there. Obviously, we had been scoped out. But it's creepy to think how long they could have just been waiting there. We're extremely lucky that we're okay, and I was able to get my car back in a semi-okay condition. My other roommate hadn't been home that night, but left a light on in our apartment, which is visible from the street in the driveway where all this took place. 
If she hadn't have left that on, or they noticed no one was home, they could have taken us upstairs and robbed her place, or assaulted us. Left me with some pretty severe anxiety and some moderate PTSD whenever I'd go outside at night. It was also the night before my 21st birthday, which sucked. But I remember trying to be continuously finding, you know, humor in the situation. Like he kept insisting on me to put the keys in the ignition and me telling him sassy it's a push to start. Remember, not a smart move on my part, but it made me laugh afterwards how I tried to simultaneously stand out outside the car and put my foot on the brake and press the start button. Nightmare or something else? I was wisely using my time last week in browsing TikTok. Nice sarcasm, sir. Or ma'am. I saw some guy saying the next time you're dreaming and you're aware that you're dreaming, ask the people in your dream what the time or date is. The people in the comments were saying stuff like people in their dreams stating that they were in the future or something like that. Thought that was cool and didn't think much of it afterwards. So fast forward to last night. I'm dreaming, doing my sleep thing, and I become aware that I'm dreaming. So I ask the people in my dream what the date and time is. They turn into black shadows and their eyes go red and they say that I'm not supposed to ask that question. So obviously that wakes me up. I am 1000% awake. I have an awful feeling that somebody is looking at me, so I try to go back to sleep, but damn, I had to pee. Close my eyes, go downstairs with my eyes shut the whole time, pee, and come back upstairs. At this time, I feel like I'm fully awake enough, so open my eyes. And I am still laying in bed somehow. So I go downstairs, put some water in my face, I'm awake. Take my temperature just to make sure that I'm okay, and my temperature is 101. At this point, I'm convinced that I'm just having a fever dream. Go back upstairs, it's my husband in the bed. And I lay down and go back to sleep. In the morning, he wakes up and goes downstairs to take a shower. I follow shortly afterwards and go pee and talk to him about my crazy dream last night. He tells me that absolutely crazy takes my temperature. It's still 101. I feel like that can't be right because I feel fine. Suddenly I'm awake in bed again, and the exact same scenario of my husband waking up and going downstairs and me following him continues to happen multiple times. The last time it happened, at the part where I would take my temperature, my fever had broken and it was 97 Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. My husband swore up and down that that was the only time I had taken my temperature that day. Anyways, I've been questioning whether I'm awake or asleep at all. And I've come to the conclusion that the only time I can make sure I'm awake is when I take my temperature and I don't have a fever. Any logic that can make my anxiety go away would be much appreciated. The Old Mansion The Old Mansion had been abandoned for years but it stood still proudly at the top of the hill overlooking the town. People would often talk about the strange occurrences that would happen there. Some claimed to have seen lights flickering in the windows at night, while others swore they heard the sound of someone playing the piano on still evenings. It was the talk of the town for a while, but as time passed, people forgot about the old mansion, went on with their lives. However, one person who couldn't stop thinking about it. His name was Jack, and he always had been fascinated by the old mansion's history. One day, Jack decided to investigate the old mansion for himself. He made his way up the winding path to the mansion's front door and pushed it open. Inside, he found a vast empty space, covered in dust and cobwebs. The mansion was even bigger than he had imagined, and he couldn't wait to explore it. As he walked around, he noticed that some of the old furniture had been moved. It was as if someone had been living there recently. That couldn't be possible, could it? Suddenly, he heard a sound coming from one of the upstairs rooms. It sounded like footsteps. Jack froze in fear, wondering who or what could be upstairs with him. 
slowly made his way up the creaking staircase and down the long hallway. Finally, he reached the room where the sound had been coming. He slowly pushed the door open and gasped in shock. Inside, he saw an old man sitting at the piano, playing a haunting, beautiful melody. The old man turned to look at Jack, and Jack saw the emptiness in his eyes. It was then that Jack realized that he had just stumbled upon a ghost. The old mansion had been home for the old man, who had been a famous pianist in his time. When he died, his spirit remained, haunting the mansion and playing the piano that he loved so much. Jack left the mansion, shaken, but fascinated by what he had seen. From that day onward, he would often visit the old mansion and listen to the ghostly music playing on the old piano. The old mansion may have been abandoned, but it was never truly empty. My Multiple Weird Experiences All began when I was very young. I was playing with my older brother in the garden of our house. That's when suddenly I saw a similar scene, just not from the same era. The two kids were wearing different clothes than anyone our age, and all the scene was in black and white. At the time I decided to ignore what just happened, went back to the plane. Some years later I began to hear, from time to time, some kind of voices. They didn't say anything meaningful. Once it even happened when I was home alone with my brother. Going up the stairs and I asked him if he heard it, and he said, what? I understood that he didn't. Nothing happened until junior high. Once I was on the bus, on the bus home, I saw a very fast moving bright white form which looked like a book. Some weeks later, when I was walking, I saw a bright light white humanoid female form holding the same book from before, and I saw her countless times after. Close to the end of junior high, once I was in bed, not sleeping, not even going to sleep, and I saw a series of flashes. It showed me places and people I didn't know. I even saw a plane. They were sort of at the blooming of aviation. It looked like it was freshly out of a factory. All the flashes were very fast, but one lasted longer. I saw an old man standing in the front of a building, in front of marble columns. It looked like I was like, in the point of view of the photo camera. Suddenly he smiled and I felt like he was smiling to me, like he knew I was there and then the flashes stopped. Then I didn't experience anything like that until university. I was then studying very far from home in a city that we'll call O. Oh. Once I was walking in the city when suddenly I sensed a presence and a few seconds later I saw a bright green humanoid form running. It runned so fast that it soon disappeared. I then saw three times some more bright humanoid forms, two black forms and one red form. Nothing more happened, for now. I'm going to run to so fast to sleep now. See ya. He's been calling to me for months. Back in January, I had a very detailed dream. In this dream, I was sort of burying a body under the patio in a garden. The garden didn't look like mine, but it wasn't one that I recall ever seeing. While I was burying this body, a man who I'd never seen before was standing in front of me, watching me the entire time. He didn't say anything, he just stared at me. I remember how scared I felt, knowing I needed to keep this body a secret. I woke up the next morning remembering every detail, but it was just a weird dream, so I brushed it off. Things started to get a little strange in my house from that day. My dog started to become more reactive, barking and physically scared of something that I couldn't see on my landing. I'd woken up a few times in the night and could have sworn I'd seen a figure standing in the doorway to my bedroom. This wasn't even the worst part. The day after I first started seeing the figure in the doorway, I was changing my bed sheets. I threw back the duvet to find a spot of dried blood on my sheets. I thought that maybe I'd scratched myself in my sleep. 
I couldn't find any evidence of this. Changed my bed sheets and thought nothing of it. The next day while making my bed, the blood was there again. This has continued every day, and I couldn't find the source of the blood, and it was starting to drive me mad. This figure had become more frequent, almost nightly at this point. Started to speak to it, asking it questions, maybe it needed help. Never would I get an answer. I was thinking about seeing a medium or getting the house blessed, because at this point it was driving me insane. That was until last week. For the first time in months, no figure, no blood, no barking dogs. Everything just stopped. The following day, I was scrolling through social media and came across a photo of a man that was attached to an article. I hadn't even looked at the article title. I was fixated on this picture. As soon as I saw his face, I knew it was the man from my dream. I clicked straight on the article to find that the man's body had recently been recovered from underneath the woman's patio. Turns out she had stabbed him in the neck, wrapped him in a bedsheet, and buried him underneath the garden patio in November. No idea if this is just a weird coincidence, or he's been trying to tell me for months what happened to him. That's a good one. Something happened on a ranch. During a school break, me and my mom and one of my older brothers went to go visit our uncle on his ranch in Nevada. I have trouble sleeping, so one night I decided to take a walk around the perimeter of the ranch, just for some air. I had made it all the way to the other side of the ranch, to the far end of the pastures. From the last fence to the woodsy hill area, it's about 50 yards. I decided to stay and look up the grassy area to look at the stars. But nobody had told this city girl was that with no trees and no light save for the barn on the other side of the ranch, you can see so many fucking stars. It was breathtaking to see the universe like that. I started whistling. I heard a branch crack, so I stopped, a little startled. Then something else started to whistle right at me. I froze, and it seemed like every hair in my body stood straight up. I couldn't move, and the whistling got louder and closer. It was almost exact same nonsense melody I was whistling not 15 seconds ago. I know what you're thinking, but birds are a thing. Bull fucking shit. I know the difference between a bird and whatever the hell that was. And this ain't even over yet, so buckle up. I, the stupid white girl in the horror movie, decided to say, Uh, hello? Something said, uh, hello, right back to me in my own voice. Oops. And yes, I know what my voice sounds like. Slightly raspy, faint Brox accent, usually lower pitched unless I'm excited or mad. Then it's usually so high pitched my friends say I sound like Harlequin on Adderall. Another branch snapped, and that was my cue to fucking book it back down around the paddock's back barn main house, which was about two acres maybe. It was like a blur. I have knee issues from a car crash, but I didn't feel even an ache as I sprinted all the way back to my main house. I still don't know what it was. Didn't tell anyone else about it, despite my mom being an extremely superstitious person. I did a little bit of frantic googling the day after, and the closest thing I could come up with was a skinwalker. Nerf War Gone Wrong Most of the paranormal interactions I had that I can remember are from when I was in high school, and this incident was no different. My sister Crisis and I invited a group of friends over for a Nerf War. That's a brutal name. Sorry for inserting that, but Crisis. Brutal. Anyway, my sister Crisis and I invited a group of friends over for a Nerf War since we had owned a sizable amount of Nerf guns of all shapes and sizes. Now our house was known to be a hotspot for the strange and unexplained. So we had code words set up for something if the paranormal nature might happen. 
We always started off with making sure the house was as dark as we could get it. We were actually playing during the day, by closing curtains and covering windows with thick blankets. Crisis's team, they were the first seekers. My group scattered to hide, went upstairs and ducked into the bathroom. Now the layout consists of two rooms. The first room is where the sink was. A huge mirror spanned across the entirety of the wall above the sink. The second room was further in. That's where the toilet and bathtub was. I stayed in the first room looking for a place to hide. That's when I noticed movement behind me in the mirror. I knew for a fact that I was the only one in the bathroom because I was the first one up the stairs. Against my better judgment, I used the reflection to look at the figure. The dark shape was tucked between the open door and the other half of the bathroom into a cabinet, so tall that its head was level with the door frame. It had no features, just a solid black shape that imitated the shape of a person. Even though it didn't have eyes, I knew it was looking back at me. Next thing I know, I'm just tearing out of the bathroom and just taking the stairs two at a time while shouting our code word for an instance like this. Curtains were opened, letting light flood in, and we all gathered in the living room so I could account my experience. We mutually agreed to stop playing and go outside for a while, so we cleaned up and made ourselves scarce. Is this a paranormal experience or a message? A couple of days ago, I, a 22-year-old female, was watching TikTok up in my parents' second floor living room. That's while the rest of my family was downstairs watching a movie. Besides the TV upstairs, we have a small lamp with a bunch of healing crystals around it. Healing in air quotes. As my parents are kind of spiritual and believe in that kind of stuff, the crystals all have somewhat of a flat side to them, and they're sitting around the crystal lamp without being glued down to the surface of the lamp. I'd been sitting there for about an hour, just watching TikTok on my phone, when I suddenly heard the sound of one of the crystals falling to the floor. This startled me, and I got up to see what happened. The crystal, a red jasper, who fell off the lamp, was the stone furthest away from the edge of the TV bench, closest to the wall. So it must have jumped over the lamp and the other crystals before landing on the floor. This freaked me out. I don't understand how this could have even happened. But I put the stone back on the lamp in the same position it previously was, flattest side down, and went downstairs to tell the rest of my family about it. When I had explained what happened, it sounded like they didn't believe me. I stayed down there with them as I too was creeped out, to go back stairs alone at least. Maybe five minutes later we all heard a thud from upstairs. We all went quiet and paused. I instantly knew what it was. My dad and I went upstairs to check it out and lo and behold the same red jasper crystal was laying on the floor. Now we're all freaked out and don't understand how this could happen. My mom is the calmest one in her family and suggested, well, suggested that I just Google what Red Jasper Crystal stands for. Might be a sign from the universe. I don't know what to believe at this point, and I'm wondering if anybody else has experienced something familiar. Or similar. Any people familiar with rocks and gems listening? Drop a comment down below for me. I know not of these things. Family ghosts are in my house. When I was little, my mother used to find me talking to what seemed to be the wall. Yet I would tell her, Old man, mommy. It was always friendly and none of us feared it. Mom used to think it was her grandfather or somebody from my father's side. It went away when I turned seven. As so life went on, when I was eight, my father passed away, and since then I've always seen stuff. I feel he's watching over me. It was only a few months since father passed, and weird stuff was already happening. I 
father had this very distinct aftershave, and I had a bottle of it on my desk as a way for me to remember him. I woke up one night at around 10 or 11 p.m., after I went to sleep at around like 8 or 9. I have a loft bed, it's got a desk underneath, bed on top, and I always kept my desk lamp on. I wake up to hearing stuff move, and I see a figure of a man under my desk. I freeze. I can't move, I can't speak. I see his reflection on the wall in front of my light. I see him moving around, yet I feel safe. I hear the sound of what's the aftershave bottle being used, and then I can smell it. After sitting there for a while, it feels like he looked at me. Looked at the wall, then right into my eyes. I get this sense of happiness and fear at the same time. I didn't feel scared. The light flickered a little and I saw the figure leave my room. The next morning I wake up and tell my mother. She seems happy, almost excited, and cries out of happiness and tells me it's my father. Or that's what she thought. A lot of small stuff's happened since then. Now another big one happened only a few weeks ago. My partner and I were laying down in bed watching a movie, and she tells me, Baby, I think there's something under the stairs moving. We get up to go investigate as we hear stuff moving and open the door to nothing. But we can hear stuff moving still. The smaller part is at the back where the sounds are coming from, and I know just from the sound of it it's the box of family stuff. Pictures, medals, books, toys. It always came to me it's my father trying to communicate now, and he's always seemed to be looking out and after me. But this is all I have to share. But it was good. I suck at telling stories. That's the title. Excited for this one for some reason. I had little experiences before meeting my husband, but since being with him, I've had too many to count. For my first time sharing, I figured I'd tell the most intense ones so far. It's kind of long, so bear with me. We had moved to a new house, and the first night there is what started everything. My husband is a walking magnet for the paranormal and had a crazy dream about the house. In this dream, he said we were in a bed watching TV. When he looked down the hallway, he saw a lady standing at the end of it. At that same moment, she started screaming and running at us at full speed. A face print burned into the wall, and as soon as she reached him, he woke up physically screaming. After that night, things started getting weird. We hear people whispering, see shadows out of the corner of our eyes. We even get the ickiest feeling walking anywhere in the house got to the point that we all camped in the living room and before it got dark I'd grab everything I'd need for the night and everyone refused to go into the room until morning because of whatever reason nothing would happen in that room. We'd sit and watch shadows peek around the corners throughout the night and hear the whispers until we fell asleep. A few weeks into living there my husband was taking the dog out, left the door open and when he turned around to come back in he saw what well, he can only describe as the top hat man standing in the doorway and turning to walk through the house. It scared him so bad that he ran inside and smoked the whole house out with the entire bundle of sage that I had. Things only escalated from there. I had to get this feeling of doom that sat so heavy on my chest that I had to go sit outside to get it to go away. We eventually found out that an older man had passed away in the apartment below ours at some point. A few months into living there, the new tenant downstairs ended up having an electrical fire, which ultimately made everyone have to vacate. It's been a couple of years since we've lived there, and we still talk about it from time to time. St. Vincent's Guest House, New Orleans We were heading down to New Orleans for a long weekend. We had accommodations set Thursday through Sunday, but ended up having Wednesday day off and wanted to head down early. So we needed another hotel night. Ideally close to the lower garden district where we'd be staying the rest of the time. We chose St. Vincent's. 
It was cheap, and it was just for one night. This place had been recently renovated and modernized, from what I can tell. When we stayed, it was in a rough shape. The building was once an orphanage, and the old pictures near the lobby showed some of the previous occupants. Our room had such a creepy energy to it, and I couldn't put my finger on why. The high ceilings in the room were, for whatever reason, just unnerving. The furniture was sparse. A queen-size bed, table for a TV across from it, and a small table in the corner of the room. We both wore glasses. We were heading to sleep. I had been reading on a tablet that I placed on the ground next to the bed. I set my glasses on the table, tablet, or table, maybe. She asked me to put hers with mine. We slept decent. We woke up the next morning and got dressed. I went to get my glasses and tablet, and she asked me to grab her glasses too. I couldn't find hers. Mine were still on the tablet, undisturbed from where I left them. I checked under the bed, figuring maybe I somehow knocked them under with my hand in the middle of the night. Nothing. I asked if she had moved them, but she said the last time she saw them was when she gave them to me. I distinctly remember a rush of cold air in a room that lacked decent AC. As I looked around the room, I found the glasses, laying unfolded on that small corner table a good eight to ten feet from the bed. It's not a wild experience. I never saw anything or heard anything, but it was enough to make me reconsider some preconceived notions, and enough for us to check out, expediously. My dad told a ghost to fuck off. To give you some background here, I live in a two-story Georgian farmhouse with an extensive history. The famine, War of Independence, Civil War, etc. The house belonged to a family of my mam's side. They were, from my interpretation of the stories, were middlemen for a landlord. Collect taxes from tenant farmers in the local area that held land. One relative in particular was like an active member of the IRA. Not the group recognized today, but the early group that emerged from the IRB, the Irish Republican Brotherhood. It was this person my dad saw about two weeks ago in the sitting room. What happened is, for my dad, he was sitting in the sitting room by the TV, couldn't sleep and was up at about midnight, saw flashes in the corner of his vision and ignored them saw said flashes again, and this time, he saw someone walk into the room. They were in a uniform, an IRB uniform. This person walked in, and as he put it, started throwing shapes, was in some way preparing to fight. He said this person appeared grumpy and unimpressed, almost as though, like my dad was sitting in this person's seat. So in the way only my dad could, I couldn't stop laughing at this one, even when I heard it twice over, he looked at the person and told him to fuck off. I'm not in that humor. So the person just turned around, walked out of the room. The weird thing was that he said he had this thought of a name, a family member, that wouldn't have known that the person was him, but never saw photos of him previously. And well, the face was obscured. Only when he described the features, body shape, etc., and saw photos that corresponded to his stature and sort of habitus, did it click. So yeah, my dad told the ghost to, well, heave ho, and the entity responded. This wasn't a regular sleep paralysis experience. This sleep paralysis occurred about five years ago. It was the first time I ever experienced it. I would go on to have sleep paralysis on and off for the next couple of years, and those experiences I can really find reason with and explain, but 
I cannot fully reason and explain this experience. So to get on with it, about a year before I had this experience, I would frequently see the number 323. It could be 323 time, on a receipt, in a phone number, just anywhere you can think of, I kept seeing this number. I didn't take notice immediately, and when I did, I dismissed it. It didn't really mean anything at the time. It was a number I oddly kept seeing. The night I had this experience was like any other night. I remember opening my eyes and just laying there. I did not need to pee or turn or move or flip to get comfortable, if that matters. I'm just laying there half awake when I begin to feel like something's in the room behind me. I wasn't scared, I was just confused as to whatever was there should not be there. So after a few seconds of laying there confused and half awake, I was hit with this feeling of impending doom. Like I was going to die and there was nothing I could do about it. It was a pretty horrible feeling, if you don't know. I was still waking up and processing all of this, so I didn't freak out yet, but a few seconds had passed. That's when I felt some sort of pressure on my side, like something pushing down. Then I felt something odd in my ear. That was when I woke up fully and tried to move and realized I couldn't. After some attempts at moving and nothing happening, I gave up. I think that feeling of doom got to me. I then felt my head dip a bit in the pillow, and within a few seconds it was over. Immediately got out of bed, out of the room, sat in the living room. When I looked at the digital time, it was 3.23 a.m. I was shook, and I still am. I still don't know what to make of this experience, but I believe there was more to it than just sleep paralysis. I believe something was in my room, and I don't know why it was there or what it was. I've forgotten the feeling that came over me that night, but I remember at the time I thought it was evil. The Shadow Man When I was around 13, my mom, older brother, and I moved into a three-story built house. It was a new build, and it was like a housing estate and only about five years old. I had two friends over in the middle of the day watching films, and we decided to play a game. Me and my one friend were stood at the top floor of the house in the bathroom, which was directly at the top of the stairs. My other friend was stood at the bottom of the stairs. We were laughing and joking, and then suddenly what looked like a black sheet covered the bathroom door, then seemed to disappear into my mom's bedroom. Me and my friend in the bathroom both looked at each other in disbelief, and my friend at the bottom of the stairs saw it too. She was stood on the stairs in disbelief. I used to help my mom a lot with housework. She was a single parent and worked a lot. I thought I'd hoover up the stairs before she got home. It must have been around 5 p.m. As I was hoovering the stairs, I saw a black figure at the bottom of the stairs looking at me. I stood straight, turned around, always thought of him as a he, and ran into the wall and seemed to fade into the wall which connects to the garage. Nearly every night I would wake up at random times to use the toilet, and he would be there, just stood in my bedroom. The thing is, though, he never scared me. He didn't feel frightened or uneasy when he was around. I felt like he may have been looking out for me, but you never know. Me and my friends gave him the name Simon, a name that popped up into my head after seeing him a couple of times. Other little things would happen, like things moving around the house when I swore I put them somewhere else, or I would hear someone on the stairs when no one was in, or feel like someone was in the room with me. But yeah, like I never really found him to be scary or make me feel uncomfortable. When I told my mom about it, she told me not to be silly and to stop watching horror films. But I overheard her talking to my stepdad, saying things that she thought something was in the house. I got talking to someone in the village I lived in. He said the housing estate was built on what was believed to be a Roman burial ground. Never heard that one. It was right on the river, and I know back in the day it was the quickest way from the village to the other village. Maybe a lot of bodies got dumped there when they were being carried back to their village, as it used to happen a lot back then. Ask Reddit. Me and my brother had the same vivid nightmare at the exact same time, in the same bed. Scariest dream either of us have ever had. 
It was about 15 seconds long. Mother comes up the stairs with a tray of cinnamon rolls in the morning. Asks us if we want some, and we both are like, we're stick of canned cinnamon rolls. She gets pissed. Reaches behind her ears, peels off her face, revealing a slimy green alien-like monster with really long pointed teeth. We know she's going to kill us. This nightmare is set in the exact surroundings that we were in. Waterbed in a loft area. We freak out. My older brother starts running, jumps from the loft to the living room. She or it runs after him, which gives me time to run downstairs. She or it doesn't jump down from the loft. I get to the living room, run to the front door, and I see my brother make it outside. Two seconds later, I make it through the threshold. Then I immediately wake up, turn to my brother, and we're both sweating and our hearts are racing. We proceed to take turns describing the nightmare that we just had. We couldn't stop talking about it for months. Our mother eventually guilt-tripped us into not mentioning it again. By far the craziest thing that's ever happened to me and my brother. I think it was some kind of a warning sent to us to not trust our mother. If so, it was a good warning to give. Our mother, well, something broke into her long ago. During her divorce or abuse or something. She is beyond strange. I still have no idea what turned her into what she is. Always been really poisonous. I was in my fourth and my brother was in seventh when this happened. Nothing at all similar happened again. No nightmares ever matched that perfect. It was real. It's like it happened yesterday, and I'm 48 now. This event altered the way I think about many things. How about cinnamon rolls? Ask Reddit. My story isn't quite what the title asks. But, in late 2002, I was riding along with an uncle of mine. I'm from Texas, spent a few months with a truck driving uncle of mine out in Missouri. I rode with him carrying a load to Maryland. After a few days or so, we ended up parking near a rest area in Myersville, Maryland. Around 2 or 3 a.m. in the morning, I remember having the shit scared out of me. I was asleep in the passenger seat when I was awoke by a very loud sound. As I awoke, I looked behind me toward my uncle, who was just walking as well. Just as I was about to speak, a bright light shined in through all the windows. I remember getting an adrenaline rush and reaching for my seatbelt when I heard people screaming not to move from outside the truck. I froze and saw people in black gear and guns saying to leave the truck now. All I remember just after was the truck shaking as SWAT pulled us. The truck pulled us across the street in darkness while not saying shit. Most shocked and afraid I've ever been. Once we were near what looked like a bus bench, we heard a loud bang. Also, there was a freaking helicopter nearby, which was sounding well. You could hear it. Couldn't see where because it had no lights on and long story short, we were sleeping near the Myersville, Maryland rest area where the DC snipers were sleeping. We were interviewed by a guy from the FBI when the sun came up. We were told the person that was the man shooting people on the beltway was the suspect they arrested in the area. They didn't go into detail but interviewed everyone there. I remember the blue car they drove being put in a trailer and didn't get to leave until 1 p.m. the next day. I also remember a Greyhound type of bus being there. It was full of Orthodox Jews being interviewed as well. Actually, got talked to by a news crew as well. Weird time. And doesn't seem paranormal at all, but kind of interesting. My best friend since 1983 came to visit me. 
Three years ago, my best friend Gary passed away from diabetes. He'd been very sick, having complications from the disease. He had his toes amputated first, and then his foot, and then the leg below the knee, and two days after, the leg above the knee. He was a trooper, though. A month after the final surgery, he went back to his employer. He was a truck driver. Asked when he could come back to work. His employer said that he couldn't drive the truck, and Gary told him that if he could pull himself into the truck, then he could drive it. His boss said, prove it. Gary rolled his wheelchair over to the driver's side of the truck, pulled himself into the steps and opened the door. Then he grabbed the rail and reached for the steering wheel and pulled himself into the cab of the truck and he started, well, started it up and drove away. His boss was amazed. Sorry about that, I drifted. Not me, that's what they wrote. Gary's in the hospital the last one of his life. He told his girlfriend he didn't want to die in the hospital. Somehow he convinced the doctors that he was fine and they released. Two hours later, he and his girlfriend were talking and his eyes rolled back in his head and he quietly left this world behind. Two weeks later, I had a dream that myself, Gary, and all of our friends were camping at our local lake. Now, Gary had a great sense of humor and this whole dream was like in his sense of humor. It's one of the funniest dreams I've ever had, but the thing I noticed and still stands out in my mind was that he wasn't sick, and he had both legs, he was younger, and the last thing he said before I woke up was, I'm whole again, and I'm getting pretty much all better. It was a great dream. I can't really go into details of the dream, but I can tell you it was hilarious. He's okay now, and he's not suffering anymore. I was at every member of his family's funerals, and they're almost all gone except for his sister. Love that family. I'm glad Gary and his family called him Gopher. That's what I always called him too. I'm glad he came back to make me laugh one more time to tell me he was okay. Rest in peace, Gopher. A Midnight Stroll with My Aunt when I was around four or five years old, we visited my aunt's house one day. My aunt loved me very much and paid close attention to me. They had a detached house with a children's park next to it. My aunt would always take me there to play during the day. The night, we stayed at my aunt's, sleeping with my mother. In the middle of the night, my aunt came to my side quietly, woke me up, took my hand, and led me to the park next to the house. She started to push me on the swing. I was very young at the time, and a long time has passed since the event, so it's hard to remember exactly. But I guess it was around 3 or 4 a.m. when this happened. Of course at the time I wasn't conscious enough to question how strange or even inappropriate it was to go to the park and ride on a swing at midnight. However, even at that age there was something that caught my attention. Something that even I, as a child of 45 years old, 4 to 5, found odd. My aunt was very a normally cheerful and talkative person, but that night she was very different. She wasn't talking at all, with a blank expression. She silently swung me, just without saying a word. Then she took my hand and laid me back down next to my mother, just as she had done at the beginning. Back then, being just a four- or five-year-old child, I naturally didn't question what happened too much. I remembered this event a few years ago, and I'm certain it wasn't a dream. When I asked my family members, they said that the person who took me to the park that night couldn't have possibly have been my aunt. It must have been a jinn that came to love me. I have no idea how they came to that conclusion, and as I said, I'm sure it wasn't my aunt. She definitely didn't have a condition like sleepwalking. Although there are many stories about jinn around here, even legends of jinn abducting children. I've never heard of a jinn that loves children. I don't know, maybe it wasn't a jinn, but some other supernatural entity. If so, I have no idea what it could have been. Ask Reddit. My mom and her two sisters, 
They were all in their early teens and later single digit ages and used to sleep together in the old house that was about a hundred years old. But it was small and semi sturdy, like wood and clay and a thatched roof. My mom and her next sibling sister both claim they used to regularly see the semi transparent gray figure, or figures sometimes, slowly come by their beds at night and just hover next to the bed a few feet away. They always could make out that the figure was watching them, but they didn't feel scared or cold or any bad intention there. Apparently, my mom being the eldest, lost the ability to see them years later, but my aunt could still see the figures for many more years, visiting the bedside at night, just hovering, watching. Years later, that house was demolished. But as was customary, a local shaman, South Indian Hindu custom, was called in to conduct ceremonies to purify the land before construction of another building on that land. The shaman was very adamant about the presence of our ancestors in the area, that they were watching over us and were happy, but that we still needed to pay respects to them and make sure that we continued to be upstanding. Each family in South India traditionally has a familial demigod or temple of worship that protects one and guides folks through life. So my grandparents sure performed extensive ceremonies and offerings to the demigod. Kind of stopped showing up at night. Figures, that is. To this day, my mom speaks of the times. I think she still feels a bit spooked out by it all. But my aunt, who I feel has heightened sensitivity to energies around her, seemingly always felt safe. Me, personally, I'm a scientific atheist with a strong sense of spirituality, and I feel like there is something about youth and their ability to sense things better than adults. I got attacked by a ghost last night. That's a good 20 plus years ago, probably 25 plus. Last night I'm asleep lying in bed on my right hand side, having a weird dream and no, I haven't been watching scary movies. In my dream I'm in some weird American apartment full of bookshelves and antique books. I'm showing some antique books to some prospective buyers. I think this probably comes from watching an episode of Elementary involving a stolen antique map that morning. Suddenly in my dream, I'm aware that a spirit wants to get me, but it's gone into the apartment next door by mistake. No, it sounds mad. I don't know why I'm dreaming about spirits or anything related to them. Next thing I know, and completely unrelated to my dream, I'm waking up because I've just been smashed in the head at full force by what felt like a pillow. Like somebody's taken a pillow, raised it above their head, and hit me at full throttle as hard as they can on the side of my head. I felt the thwack. My ear pressure changed like an ear almost popped from hitting me on the side. I felt the thump on my head. I woke up instantly, kind of, kind of tried to say something like, what? But all that my mouth could really manage was a loaded gibberish. At the same time, the hairs on the back of my neck stood out like crazy. I darn turned around to see if somebody's there. It scared the bejesus out of me. It wasn't part of my dream, it was kind of related to the theme of my dream, but I had a real-world reaction to it, like I was properly slapped in the head in real life and felt it. Instantly woke up from my dream. In it, no way fitted in with my dream. It was odd. I'm torn between thinking it was real or my brain's imagining things. It wasn't a pillow I was hit with, if I was hit by anything. They hadn't moved, but it felt like getting hit over the head with one, and it was kind of a thwack. This was at 4 a.m.-ish British time. Hell, we don't have any more experiences tonight. Can't be going through all that again. Ask Reddit. For background, I live in Southeast Asia. 
I live in the capital of my country. It's a very modern, big city setting. My parents are both doctors, but their parents, both sides and both grandparents, were witch doctors. We call them bomos, or dukuns. My mother is prone to having strange premonition-like dreams, most of which we can usually brush off because of how minor they tend to be. This particular incident, she didn't dream of anything, or so she thought. That should have been the first red flag. She woke up that particular night hearing tapping sounds at the window of her bedroom. She decided to open it up and let whatever was tapping the window into her room. Assuming it was her cat, she walked ahead of it to open the door to my bedroom. I was asleep. According to her at this point, she walked back to bed as it was like 3 a.m. and she had her clinic opening at 8 a.m. She recalled stepping onto something wet. She turned on lights only to find a trail of blood from the cat. She led to my room. Apparently, that was bad enough to jolt her out of her sleep. After she realized she had been asleep, she ran to my room with a fucking machete. Here I was, sitting on my own ass bed, comfy as hell at 3 a.m. I remember seeing something crawl in beside me, thinking it was my cat. I hugged it. Whatever it was, it was wet and cold. Pulled itself out of my grip, and in the dark, it looked like a human head with the spine and entrails dangling out. I remember punching it repeatedly as it bit my left arm and face, and I can still remember the static shock I felt when it first connected. In comes my mother screaming and smacking the head with her thankfully sheathed machete. After a few smacks, she left me to keep punching the grotesque helium balloon as she went to open my bedroom window. I felt the cord rip itself out of my hands. That night was spent cleaning my cuts and blood off the floor and changing my bed sheets. A fallen soul says hello. During the pandemic, circa 220-221, I had to attend my medical internships for two to four weeks. My mind was constantly on low battery since I'm a frontliner. My body was on autopilot whenever I walked home. I had enough spatial awareness not to get hit by a car, but won't understand you if you walked up to me. I feel ya. Walking in my uniform, I was plugged into my headphones and walked past the apartment blocks near my house. A short distance away, I noticed someone on the ground. An older man, sixties, with a beer belly and an undershirt and shorts lying face down on the ground. I was surprised he laid there undisturbed. I was about to go check on him and a hard tap on my shoulder scared the crap out of me. A slightly annoyed policeman was speaking to me and took three tries before I registered what he said. Apparently, the old man had jumped from the apartment across from mine and was pronounced dead on sight. I happened to walk past the perimeter that the police was cordoning off. I was early enough that they hadn't blocked the area with tape yet. The policeman had been trying to get my attention, you know, to not walk that way. I was surprised the man didn't look like he was injured at all, no blood or bruises, still pink in the hands too. Being too tired to respond, but equally shocked... I murmured an apology and just walked around the perimeter after being ushered out. After a long break in processing what happened, I went down my merry way until a little encounter the following morning. My doorstep looks down over the area where the man had fallen. The morning was silent and the sunrise glazed the space in gray shadows. It was too early for anybody to be walking around. My newly rested eyes registered a small pot-bellied man looking my way. He noticed my uniform and waved a morning hello to me, but pretended not to look. Odd coughing slash mechanical noise floating overnight. Over ten years ago I was in my twenties sharing a townhouse with my partner. 
we were in an end unit, connected only by the right side of the home to the rest of the house. I'd lived there for at least a year, maybe two, when this happened. And during that time, never once heard a single sound coming from our neighbors who started the other side of the wall. One night, probably 2 or 3 a.m., I woke up to the sound of their neighbor coughing. I immediately recognized how odd that was because he had never heard them at all through the wall. The coughing continued non-stop and appeared to get louder to the point where it was no longer seeming to be coming from her neighbor, but now inside my bedroom. Like the origin of the sound had drifted through the wall toward me. The sound continued to drift toward me, and I was started to just breathing heavy-like, like I was scared out of my mind. As it came to me and settled what felt like lime two feet directly over me, the sound kind of morphed into a mechanical sound, very similar to a scene from The Matrix where Neo's scream becomes synthesized. This crescendoed above me and then suddenly stopped. My partner then woke up, not from the sound, but from the feeling of me panicking and breathing heavily. I told her what had happened. She said something like, definitely just a weird dream, half awake, half asleep thing. But you do seem really scared. We tried to go back to sleep, but within a few minutes, the whole experience happened again, only this time, my partner could hear it all the way too. We were silently gripping onto each other very tightly as it was happening. Now both of us are panicking. I don't know why we didn't say anything or get out of bed, but we both need to stay quiet and not draw attention to ourselves kind of a feeling. It happened the same as before, and when it was done, we both turned on our bedside lights and spent the rest of the night awake watching TV. I've never heard somebody else have the same kind of experience. The thought of posting this here is to see if it rings true for anyone out there. Help. Question regarding malfunction of electronics when I'm stoned. Let's see what I can do. Before I came here, I scratched the internet. But not a single hit. Maybe some of you experienced it too, since most personally, it's usually most universal. When I get stoned, and then after I interact with technology, such as laptops, phones, streetlights, old electronics, vinyl cassette player, and even software, they start to malfunction. Experiences such as flickering screens, the cassette player playing slowly for a second or two and then speeding up, which it does not do when I'm sober. My phone jumps around from app to app, or if it's in WhatsApp specifically, the screen goes up and down without touching it. Just to clarify, I work in IT, and I have more than one phone and laptop, and it happens on all of them. Laptops are the least affected, it seems. But still, apps doing weird shit. Sometimes it adds or moves text, and web pages are loading only halfway, even after reloading them in different browsers, URLs, and laptops. And the sound stops working sometimes, too, or it makes weird noises. It's like it adds an effect to the original audio. It even happens when I'm at a friend's house. Time and location really don't matter. I have witnesses, so I know I'm not extremely stoned or something. But I know my mind's not playing tricks. Just to put this out there to non-believers. Once I was at a party, again, with a nice blunt. DJ's table flat out stopped working once I was saying hello. He was a friend. Could be a coincidence, but it happens so often. I see a pattern. I politely see somebody who cannot handle their weed and works, you know, touch screens. They can be finicky when you're not paying attention. Perhaps your laptops are the least susceptible to this for the lack of this feature. Just my sixth sense. I was overcome by the feeling that I should flee as fast as I could with my life after pulling into a gas station while on a road trip in the middle of the Nevada desert. So I finally talked to my friend into moving from Seattle to Texas. 
We decided to split it into two parts, the first last week moving her stuff and the rented SUV since we both had some time. We decided to take the trip on all the back roads. We stayed at a mineral springs resort in the middle of nowhere in Oregon. That was amazing. And the second day, we got up to drive to Vegas. We took US 50, which is known as the loneliest highway in America. So I'll admit before this, it was 8 to 10 hours before we had any human contact. I'm a former over-the-road trucker and a U.S. veteran, so I'm used to traveling to different places and being in new surroundings every day, but it also taught me to listen to my instincts. And let me tell you, they didn't come in loud and clear while I was on this trip a few hours away from Vegas. Rather, they did come in loud and clear. We stopped to get gas as we rolled into the place. I just looked, uh, rather, it just looked dazed aged, very outdated. My friend decided to get gas. I walked inside to look at the place and get some snacks. I can honestly say that I can't point at any one thing that was going wrong, but the feeling that overcame me was indescribable. Basically told me that this place was the phrase I would use for, like, out of place. If I wanted to leave or be able to, you know, I just need to go right now. Now, I'll admit, this could be my own experience, and maybe I just had a bad feeling and I was imagining things, but the minute I decided to leave without buying anything or even using the restroom, I swear, everybody in the place started looking at me. And I don't mean just the employees, but the patrons, too. I went quickly to my car, told my friend that she believed in my instincts. We went in, got in the car, left right there. We did, and we didn't breathe easy until we were ten miles away from that place. Spectral Figure As I sit here in a dimly lit living room, the only sound echoing through the empty halls is the soft ticking of the antique grandfather clock. Shadows dance along the walls, casting eerie shapes that seem to shift and morph with every passing moment. I can feel the weight of the silence pressing down on me, suffocating and heavy. I try to shake off the feeling of an ease that's sort of settled deep within my bones but it clings to me like a shroud. I tell myself that I'm being foolish, that there's nothing to fear in an empty house, but the hairs on the back of my neck stand up on end, nonetheless. Suddenly, a chill sweeps through the room, causing goosebumps to erupt across my skin. I wrap my arms around myself, trying to ward off the cold, but it seems to seep into my very soul. Then I hear it, a faint whisper, barely audible above the rustling of the curtains. My heart pounds in my chest as I strain to make out the words. Sounds like a name, whispered with a mixture of longing and sorrow. I feel a shiver run down my spine as I realize I'm not alone in this house. Panic grips me as I scramble to my feet. My mind races with fear. I stumble through the darkness, the shadows seeming to reach out for me with icy fingers call out into the void, but my voice is swallowed by the oppressive silence. And then I see her, a spectral figure standing at the end of the hallway, her features obscured by the darkness. She reaches out to me, beckoning with ethereal hands, and I can feel the pull of her presence drawing me closer. I want to run, to escape this nightmare, but I find myself unable to move, mesmerized by her haunting beauty. I take a hesitant step forward, drawn inexorably, or inexorably toward her. As I reach out to touch her, everything fades to black and I'm consumed by the darkness. Ask Reddit I was dispatched to a house was at 1 a.m. for a prowler. We get there and talk to the residents. Long story short, they saw two people wearing masks. One Jason-style hockey mask, don't remember the other. In the yard across the street, it was like two weeks past Halloween, so it seemed believable. We checked the area, don't see anything. 10 8. 
It's worth noting the residents didn't seem drunk high or crazy at all. A few times you'll get a similar call and get there to find the residents strung out on meth and seeing things. However, back to the story. An hour later we get called back. This time we have our dispatcher on the phone with them. And that's while we're surrounding the area. We were about five of us. We're in a perfect position, dispatch tells us that they can see the prowler in the next yard. We start to move in. Dispatch says the resident saw the two prowlers wave and move into the shed. Guess where I am? That's right, next to the shed. I give verbal commands, bang on the door, nothing. Fuck it. Fine, I'll come in after you. Door is open and empty. I even think to check for a trap door. Nothing. It's raised about four inches, so there isn't even a possibility of a door leading out. Again, check the area and find nothing. Talk to the residents. They said I was moving in on the shed, and the two put their fingers to their lips, giving a shh sign. Then they both waved. They moved into the shed as I was next to it. We went over every possibility, trying to come up with an explanation. If the seller was just fucking with us, or, excuse me, caller, was just fucking with us, they had no prior history of it as in repeated calls for service at the address. I'm not much of a believer in the paranormal stuff, but I can still appreciate a situation where I can't logically explain what just happened. I think it followed me to my new place. A while back I acknowledged that what may have been a lapse in judgment on my part. I moved out of my house where I was experiencing a number of strange occurrences. I moved out because I'd gotten a better job and I'm sort of attending college part-time, so I had nothing to actually do with the house itself. But I'm fearful that whatever it was may have followed me to my new place. I moved into a two-bedroom maybe an hour and a half away from where I was living before. I've been here for a little over a month now. About a week ago, I started noticing sort of a few things that you could say were strange that just didn't seem right to me. The first thing that happened was this aggressive tapping outside my window. It sounded kind of like somebody's fingernail hitting my window from the outside. I live on the second floor, so I don't know how this would be possible. If I had to make an educated guess, I'd say that maybe there could be an explanation for that. But it is a little creepy regardless, because it'll do it, I'll check it out, and then as soon as I'm sitting back down, it'll happen again. The second thing that happened that I can't explain is the door to my bedroom slammed shut as I was leaving. The door wasn't even remotely closed when this happened. Don't exactly know how to really write about this fear, but it scared the hell out of me. So much so that I needed to go to the gym just to work my nerves out. The last thing which happened last night was when I opened my closet door. The closet came with a mirror inside of it which I already don't like. When I opened it to get my bag I could see my reflection but also the dark silhouette of a figure standing next to me. I'm six foot one and whatever it was sort of sat near me and was roughly a little taller than my elbow. I turned around but of course didn't see anything. I'll say that this was not my imagination as I had seen it for a couple of seconds. This scared me completely, like I could feel my knees getting weak and my heart rate rising. My buddy told me this crazy one. Ask Reddit, by the way. In southern Virginia, him and his buddies would ride dirt bikes around the woods and attempt to blaze new trails. One time he went scouting alone and was riding along blazing a new trail when he came across an old dilapidated house. He got off the bike and was wandering around checking things out. First weird thing he noticed was that an old rusted car on cinder blocks out front had brand new plates on it. He went inside and there was nothing of much interest until he got to the top floor and entered a room that appeared to be an old study. The roof was missing on a portion of the room and everything was musty and water damaged. 
there was a desk in the corner of the room and he discovered a locked case and an old safe, the door of which was ajar. Inside of the case was a brand new looking Beret 50 caliber rifle. The rounds and scope was dismantled. He didn't know shit about guns and discovered that this is what it was when you're showing an enthusiast or friend. Shocked. Inside the safe, he found a tightly wrapped bag of off-white powder with a tag on it. He immediately thought it was cocaine and took it in case it and just booked it. A few days later, he invited a buddy over to investigate the powder. After cutting it open and taking a taste, it was determined it was not cocaine. The tag read two four-digit dates, which they determined to be dates. On the back of the tag, there was a name. After some research on the name, they realized that the person was deceased. This was likely his oddly packaged, cremated ashes. Whoops. Scared shitless, he took the package exactly where he found it in the house on his bike. When leaving, he swears he saw a figure in the window of that study. When I came and visited, he showed me the gun, which was unable to find in the house again, and he tried to show me. Ask Reddit I was working at a summer camp in the PNW one year. On the second or third night there, I was jogging alone back from the staff campfire to the cabin, where the campers and my counselor slept. I'm walking in this big grassy thoroughway. It has some taller reeds separating it from a shore of Puget Sound. Probably 2 a.m. Full moon. As I'm jogging, I see this person. They're in the reeds. I'm wearing a white gown. Or rather, it's wearing a white gown and has no face, just hair. I only notice it, <clears throat> because as I approached it, it stood up from a crouched position, backed up joltily a few steps, then crouched down again. I can still see it crouching there, like it was waiting. Its moments, or movements, told me that it wasn't human. My knees gave out and I felt flooded with fear as I collapsed. I tried to run back to my cabin, but my legs would not work. I crawled and scrambled there on all fours. I tried to scream, but no sound came out, just gasping. I finally got to my cabin and fumbled with the doorknob for what felt like a minute before I could open it. I closed the door and stood there waiting for a while inside. I didn't hear anything, but I barely slept. At some point later that night, I remember laughing and thinking. I was just one of the campers peeing. I was hysterically laughing at myself for like 20 minutes and fell asleep. Next morning, though, I realized that no campers returned to the cabin that could have potentially been out there peeing that night. I asked all of them, and all of them said they had gone out to pee the previous night. I'll add that this camp was kind of overtly for non-religious, skeptically-minded staff and campers which I was and still largely am, but I have no explanation for what I saw that night. The late mom of my friend sent her a message in my dream. This happened when I was about 22 or 23. Now I'm a 37-year-old female. My best friend, at the time, had a new girlfriend. Her name was Sophia. We got along very well and had fun, and sometimes deeper conversations when we met at pubs. But we didn't know each other that much. She once told me that her mom had passed away due to cancer when she was around 16. One night I dreamt that I was Sophia, which is already something that never happened. I'm always me in my dreams. I'm wandering, or rather, wandering, through an old dark underground tunnel with grayish brick walls that are falling apart. I felt incredibly sad in this dream. I sat down in a nook and the middle-aged lady appeared. She had the kindest face, told a poem, and hugged me with a force of love that I've never encountered before. I woke up and after a few seconds I started sobbing. The feeling of love and light was so intense. 
I'm not religious, nor do I believe in the classic afterlife or paranormal activities, but this made me question things. So I contemplated for days if I should tell Sophia that this happened. Since I feel like it's unethical and unnecessary hurting to bring up a dead relative and, well, what if it was just a weird dream? Not that I'd wake up crying from normal weird dreams, however, in the end, I decided to still tell her what happened. She told me that she was going through a very hard time at the moment, and that she was very happy that I told her, because she thinks it was a message for her. Not sure why I was kind of a channel for it. Also, I wish I would have written down the poem. I was remembering it when I woke up, and given the intensive feelings in the morning, I thought there was no chance that I'll forget it. Well, I did. Ask Reddit. So, quick context. I'm from the Midwest, and my dad had been a truck driver his whole life. Every summer until I was 14 or 15, I would spend on the road with my dad. It's a great experience, and I miss it every once in a while. I meet some interesting people on the road and realize just how different the U.S. is from place to place. My dad and I just got done driving from West Texas to New Mexico. We're at a truck stop about an hour before sundown. I'm about 11 at the time. My dad decides that we're going into the truck stop for a shower. And maybe dinner and a quick look at CNN before bed. As we walk in, a bunch of the locals are just chasing this scraggly-looking stray off the lot. I've always been a huge animal lover, so I ask Dad why they're chasing and throwing things at that dog, and my dad just says that we aren't from here, and it's best to just leave them be. We take showers, eat a nice meal at the diner attached to the truck stop, head back to the cab with leftovers. As we're heading out, it's already getting dark, and I see that scraggy-looking stray dog ducked underneath the trailer. I peel the meat off my pork chop bone and toss it to him. The dog just kind of slinks over and looks me up and down before wagging his little nub of a tail at me and picking that bone up. The dog turns and books it, because there's this ancient-looking native woman with skin like a Gucci handbag, and she's shrieking at me. My dad turns around and sees this old lady screaming at his kid and walks over and starts chewing this old lady a new asshole. That's until they both figure out what happened. Now I was freaking out to this really, well, just absorbing much, but after she went off my dad just told me that I didn't do anything wrong and the locals are just weird about some things. That's all I really thought of it at the time. But then the story ends and I want to know more. My Grandma's Haunted House This started in around 2008. I was eight at that time. My grandma had moved into an old house that was built around the late 1950s in California. First glance, it was already creepy. felt like a scene from The Grudge. She had a five-member family stay with her, and I'll often visit whenever I can. This particular night, it was about four to five weeks in. We were having a little family gathering and my cousin, who was four, was looking out the backyard sliding door. It was pitch black. She asked my mom's boyfriend, Who's that guy in the backyard? We all turned our attention to her and asked who she's talking about and she described him as a black male behind the bushes in our backyard. My mom's and aunt's boyfriend had went out to check it out and there was no one there. Eventually, it was just shivering their timbers, literally. So this next story involves my cousin, who's four again. My aunt and mom had went out shopping, while we, the kids, were at home watching TV. I remember this particular night very well because it felt like an actual horror movie. Okay, so it was late, like 8 p.m.-ish, and while we were watching TV, we started hearing dishes clattering together and it repeated. We as kids were scared as fuck. We decided we all would check it out together, and we did. All we see was nothing but the dishes slightly moving. We all ran back and hid underneath the blanket till Mom was back home. When they came, we told them what happened. Blah, blah. 
Ten minutes go by and we hear my aunt scream. She said when she went to use the bathroom, she seen her little cousin standing in the bathtub in the dark. She gets out and says, what? She had moved in with her dad afterwards and nothing's happened to her since. Turns out, sadly, a male was shot and killed by police in that backyard. Ask Reddit. It all started as a warm May night. May 28th, to be exact. Nothing was out of the ordinary. My friends and I were playing video games on a school night, procrastinating homework and yelling at each other about some stupid problem in the game. We grew tired of playing video games, so I signed off for the night. I don't live far from a general store, so I thought I might as well hop on my bike, ride there, and grab some cream soda and sunflower seeds. So I did. The bike ride usually takes around 10 minutes to get there. The bike ride consists of going through my neighborhood. It's kind of a scary-ass bike trail. Then another neighborhood. So I put in my earbuds and rode there. I got all the way there just to realize I didn't have my wallet. Very disappointing since it was just getting dark. I got back on my bike, started to ride back. Usually when I go back, I cut through a backyard instead of taking the trail. It's mainly downhill on the way back, so I usually don't take the trail back. But for some reason, I felt compelled to go down the trail, like a pole. When I was riding down the trail, I heard an inhuman screech. I mean, like a mix between a bald eagle and a human scream. I, of course, looked toward where the scream came from. I saw an extremely skinny, super pale, and very tall figure get on all fours and start running at me. When I say extremely skinny, I mean like it was skin and bones. The legs and arms were super long. The face was nearly featureless besides for a mouth and two black eyes. I got the hell out of there as fast as my bike could handle. I know I wasn't just imagining it. Luckily, now I have my license, then refuse to go down that trail when it's remotely close to dark out. The guns felt shut down. My card reading experience. 20 minutes into the experiment, suddenly everything goes dark. When I take my goggles off, I see that the whole house's electricity had suddenly gone out. I was pretty terrified and had to put some candles on, which didn't really make things better to handle. They just made the atmosphere even more eerie. And so all I did was sing Christmas songs by myself to kind of distract myself. The next day, my brother comes to me and gifts me a deck of cards. Sure, could be a coincidence, but I don't believe in coincidences anymore. I got to work guessing the cards. Now, I did limit myself to guessing the colors of the cards, but I thought that would be difficult enough, and it was. Early on, my attempts were unsuccessful. Then I started consistently getting better and always getting more than half of them right. That is, when I tried to do it through quote-unquote psychic abilities. An interesting thing, though, about guessing anything, it's that if you don't know the answer, you should get about maybe 50-50% chance of being right. And so it was when I simply guessed the cards without trying to think about it. Now then I tried to not use my psychic abilities, I figured. Maybe I'm just deducing which card is likely to come next through reasoning. But when I tried that, I still got 50-50. But when employing psychic ability, I always consistently get more than 50-50. I tried recording this, but when I did, I always did much worse than when I didn't record it. I know this is a leap, but could it be that when trying to measure psychic ability, it just doesn't work? Might this be the reason the things I didn't have really been able to replicate in the lab? Or is this just me being nervous in front of a camera? Everybody can get nervous in front of a camera. A 
Ask Reddit. We lived in an old farm that then turned into an old folks home with one half being a nursing station and then a priest from a church loved in it. Lived. There was multiple different family that live in the house. The house was combined with the apartment, in quotes, which was a unit smaller than a bungalow. Which was the nursing station. We lived in the house part, and the apartment was separated with the wall and a room that had two doors. One half-size door and one full-size door. In the apartment, there was always a spooky feeling going over there once you went over. You always felt like something is watching you. An uneasing feeling. And as soon as you went to leave or exit, it would feel like something wants you back there. One day, my father decided to open the apartment up with the rest of the house. Open up the wall, separating the apartment and the house. While he was cutting the wall down, there was a very old white door boarded in between the wall. For some reason, my father replaced that door with one of those shaded glass doors. It had like a turn knob handle and very still and specific way to open a door. We had three dogs growing up. One day we were out visiting my grandparents, so the dogs got left home. When we arrived back at home, one of our three dogs went missing, looking everywhere for her and couldn't find her, until I opened the apartment door, which there she was, sitting on the other side of the door, silent as can be, staring back at it. Over all the years, this dog would always greet you when you got home, and this dog would always scratch or bark at a door if she got locked into it, but she didn't. Something whispered a name into my ear. When I was younger, my family and I would often go up to the cabin. The cabin is owned by my father's friend who allows us to stay free of charge. The cabin is a part of a small line of about ten other cabins with a gravel road dividing them. It's a cute little area and we still visit it to this day. We usually stay a week. But one time I went ice fishing just with my father when I was about eight or nine. We'd go up in the winter and in the summer. We weren't planning on staying there for the night, but by the time we were done ice fishing we were cold and we didn't feel like driving. Our house is about two hours away. There's three bedrooms in total. The one I stayed in that night had a bunk bed. I slept on the top and my dad slept on the bottom. I was on my DS fairly late. I wasn't really tired, and I was probably like maybe 1 or 2 a.m. in the morning. Sorry to be so specific, I just feel like it's important to include everything to avoid confusion. But out of nowhere, all sounds completely cut out for me, and all I heard was the name Jackie. Weirdly, I wasn't freaked out by this. It's like I had gone deaf for a few seconds and just heard this name. Then everything was back to normal. I decided to call it a night, and I went to bed. I told my dad a few years later what had happened. The lake next to our cabin was originally a town that was flooded by the government when they constructed a dam back in the late 20s, I believe. What I didn't know is, there was also a large cemetery that was a part of the town. My parents believed this might be an answer to what I experienced that night. When we go to the cabin now, I don't usually see or hear anything besides feeling really uncomfortable when I'm alone. I feel like something really likes me there, if that makes sense. It's not scary, it's just weird. Haunted School Let me get right into this story. I was about nine when I started going to an elementary school that my mom went to when she was younger. It was a huge school with four floors and a playground out front. I only went to the classroom on the first floor. We had a weird thing where we would have this like one teacher all year, but he would teach different subjects throughout the day. I think that's normal. Anyway, 
I need to use the restroom, so I asked my teacher to go. She of course said yes, so I got up and went to the bathroom. It's important to the story for you to know, well, that the lights were motion censored. That was all throughout the school. As I was walking down the hallway, one of the lights shut off and I got a little freaked out, just because I was nine and scared of the dark. I quickly walked to the hallway and it flashed on. I felt relieved and went to the bathroom. After I was done, I walked out of the bathroom and the light was off again. I was about to rush back down the hallway when suddenly it turned on. No one was there and I could see the whole hallway from where it was standing and it just was me. I got freaked out when suddenly it shut back off and there it was. A huge black figure, except it wasn't standing. It was slithering around the floor like a snake. Freaked out, ran straight to my classroom, not looking back. Left that school when I was 11. And the school was demolished a few years later and turned into apartment buildings. I remember kids talking about it being built on a burial ground. But I don't know if that's true, but I didn't learn one thing. Never build on a burial ground. Isn't it normal for... Before middle school, for you to have one teacher teaching all the subjects, or is that just me? I learned something. Unusual activity. I'm a 15 year old male. Last summer I had a weird excuse with the supernatural. Interesting word choice. It all started when we were doing an all-nighter outside when we eventually got to cold. Decided to go back to our friend's house. We were all having a good time until I got a very weird feeling that something was off and there was something with us. Especially the door in his room was putting me off. Eventually we had enough and three quarters of us decided to go to our other friend's house. As we were packing up, we began to hear crying from our friend's little brothers. Presumably from the room, despite them being fast asleep. As we were leaving, we noticed a door that, according to our friend, doesn't exist. We go into the kitchen to leave out the back, and one of our friends claims to have seen something dark and tall running across the garden. He's usually quite calm, but he was freaked out and grabbed a knife and tried running up the stairs to check on our friend whose house we were in. Eventually, our friend's dad comes to pick us up, and as we're getting in, I feel the intuition to put my seatbelt on, which I never do. The dad begins to speed down the road, almost crashing into curbs down the road as it turned out he was drunk. The following morning, we go to check our friend who was at the house it all happened in. He says that he heard his mom crying from the room that doesn't exist despite the fact that she was in the other room asleep. Me and my friend whose dad drove us home would spend the night at his house to take our mind off things when I randomly have insomnia really badly. I never have had any sleep problems though. Out of desperation and answers, we pray to God hoping for his protection. And despite a few small events afterwards, nothing. The Girl in the Yellow Shirt I was around 10 years old when I had my first interaction with something that I couldn't explain. It happened in broad daylight. The whole incident started out like every other weekend. The neighborhood kids all got together to play what we called Ghost in the Graveyard, which is typically supposed to be played at night. But my sister and I could never stay out past dusk due to our curfew. We played a few rounds before it was the tagger. Everyone scattered within the set boundaries. Now we have a long stretch of woods between our townhomes and the highway. The width gradually thinning when somebody would walk from the line of the townhouses that I lived on to the line of the far end of the property. I was traveling parallel to this forest. The particular section I was following was behind a line of townhouses and bathed in shadow. I kept my eye out for anybody who might be hiding so I wasn't exactly caught off guard when I suddenly heard the crunch of foliage as somebody ran through the forest a few feet away from the sidewalk that I was walking on. 
My head whipped to the side just in time to see a girl around my age with long brown hair and a yellow shirt dart by me in the woods. I gave chase, thinking it was someone from our group. But before I got even halfway across the line of townhouses, she was suddenly gone, having vanished into thin air. I thought it was weird, but brushed it off and continued playing until everybody had made it to the safe zone. I remember looking over all the other kids and suddenly realizing that no one was matching the description of the girl I saw. Couldn't have been anyone new, because no one had moved in lately. The only person who could possibly match the mystery girl's description was my sister and I. Neither of us were in the woods at the time or wearing yellow, or even owned a yellow shirt for that matter. Ask Reddit. Working on ships, some are pretty old, and you hear some weird stories. Four years ago, during a South American season, I used to hang out with the Brazilians. Fun and all cool people, one was a gift shop manager. He'd rant and rant about how his team is lazy and how they keep trying to weasel out of working because they claim to see a little girl running around the gift shop. One night we were having coffee with the head of the photography department. He's a bit extra salty, talking about how he'll have to do an extra couple of hours because of his team. In the middle of the night, I get a call from the photo manager. She tells me her friend is in her cabin crying and shivering. I run over thinking he got some bad news from home or something. Turns out he was working in his office. The door faces a long mirror that covers most of the wall, the clothes section. And after hearing giggling, he saw the shadow of a child run through the reflection, as if she was leaning to look into the door while trying to hide, only in the reflection. He says he jumped up and ran out in the giggling the sounds of tiny feet running around the shop and into the casino it's on the same deck. I'm not big into the paranormal, but the following day I mentioned this to my boss. She told me that about 20 years back, a little girl came out of the theater with her parents, she was running up ahead of them around the gift shop, but eventually she went into the casino, coming out of the atrium. A drop with glass lifts, and that goes from deck 12 to 5, so it's a good drop. She leaned over the railing to look down, lost her balance, and fell, breaking her neck on impact and dying. Apparently it was a common sighting at the shop and casino. Ask Reddit. There's a whole world out there waiting for us to raise our consciousness. Me and many others have personally been in contact with these beings. Through telepathy or real contact. There's a federation of planets that won't interfere with our evolution. They've tried to tell our leaders that they can help make peace and love on our planet. But the leaders, of course, don't want this. They want to manipulate and control us. They don't want us to know this. They want our vibration low. They also said many channelers and others who've been in contact that we can ask for help ourselves simply project a thought out into the universe giving consent for them to materialize on our planet and help us. They are in the service of love, light, and the intelligent infinity. If approximately one people, or excuse me, one million people, ask for this, behind the scenes or in the open, the ones who are deciding that no one can interfere with our evolution will lift the quarantine on our planet, if enough humans ask for it. Sounds crazy if you're new to this, but the information's out there, through various channelers and other sources. They're highly advanced if we're still babies as a excuse me, as a civilization. But that's beginning to shift, and they will wait for us to grow up to realize some things and to orient towards love, peace, and harmony. Unless we ask ourselves for help, it doesn't hurt to send a thought out to the positively oriented civilizations. I recommend Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind. It's free on T-U-B-I TV. Works from the USA with the VPN. I also recommend looking into Law of One by Ra.
Waking Up at 3.33 So a little background. I was deep into the drug trade. Like really deep. Moving extremely large amounts of powder for a less than desirable group of individuals. I've lost three friends in the last month. The last one got shot right in front of me by a gunshot to his head in our way to a candlelight vigil for his nephew. I'm now experiencing an unexplained fear of the dark. I can't sleep in the bedroom with my wife as she needs darkness to sleep. I've been experiencing sleep paralysis symptoms. An overwhelming fear. To the extent that I'm seeing a huge shadow in the darkest area. Smelling what can only be described as struck matches. Hearing whispering from said corners. It's ruining my life. I sleep with a flashlight because my sidearm's too dangerous to sleep with. I illuminate the dark space and it disappears. I'm exhausted. Fearful. I know Reddit isn't all knowing, but I don't know what to do. I'm scared the doctors will give me some strong sleeping pills rendering me helpless at this hour. What do I do? I fear for my children and myself. Please help. Forgive the typo written message. It's currently 4 a.m. I've been using vodka to pass myself out so I can at least get some sleep. I am a believer in the paranormal, so... This is stuff you read or see on TV, but it's not. It's real and is happening. I'm scared out of my mind. And you, sir, write perfectly fine for it being 4 a.m. and drinking vodka. Salute. I saw the same woman my girlfriend saw during her night terror. My girlfriend from now six months have recurring weird sleep episodes. Sleepwalking, talking in her sleep, and night terrors where she tells me that she saw things. When these kind of episodes happen, I reassured her every time, saying there's nothing that I'm here for her. It would calm her down every time. Starting to be used to these episodes. Two weeks ago, she told me that she saw a scary woman near her face when she woke up. She was saying it was a night terror episode and we both believed it. But last night, I slept at her place. I woke up in the middle of the night and saw a woman's silhouette standing near my girlfriend. At first, I was sure it was my girlfriend, but fast enough, I realized she was still in bed next to me. I then looked at the silhouette. It was a woman, her back to me, but her head was turned toward me and she had a creepy smile. She had long black kinky hair and at first I was sure that it was just a hallucination since I was just sleeping a minute ago. Perhaps this vision was going to fade away. But no, she didn't move an inch. I was still seeing her. She was stuck in a loop back to me turning toward me with a creepy smile. I analyzed the situation, still thinking it was a hallucination, and I just close my eyes and fall back asleep. In the morning, I talked to my girlfriend about that. When I described the woman, she told me to stop laughing at her. I told her I lied just to reassure her, but I'm pretty sure we saw the same thing. She's going to move at the end of the month, but in the meantime, what should I do? I don't feel she's in danger, but oh man, that's scary. Teleporting slash very fast man around rural roads. In parentheses. Serious. So I was walking along a fairly rural road late at night, trying to get back to home. As I was walking along, I noticed a man walking just behind me, probably 20 meters. I didn't want to appear weird, so I didn't look back too much, but definitely got a look at the person looked to be a fairly tall, if not very well-built man. As I continued to walk, eventually I realized the man was gone. No less than about five minutes later, I saw a man standing on the side of the road once more, ahead of me. At this point, I was pretty chilled. 
I knew it was the same person for sure. Shape in the way he stood, it was him. I, who am about six foot tall and a Latin man who can bench 110 kilograms and have great cardio who plays rugby every second day for reference, I'm not a pushover, but at this point I just kind of wanted out. I decided to run past him as fast as I could. I began to speed up about 15 meters from me. He ran into the foliage on the side of the road at lightning speed. Look, as I read this back, it seems like I'm bragging. I didn't mean to come off like that. I just meant to show that I don't really ever get afraid of people passing me at night. And furthermore, this is not a street. This is a back road used to get to another small town. There's no reason for anybody to be on the road, let alone at night. I'm the only person to my knowledge to ever be in this area. I'm just looking for an answer so I can go back without soiling my pants. Since what I saw, I've gone back there with a machete, but ended up leaving as twilight hit. Repetitive ticking noise in 300-year-old house. So to get with the problem, it's the recurring ticking noise, like an old desk clock that usually is quite loud, rhythmic, but maintains a similar pattern. The most recent episode was this week past. For two days, the first time in the kitchen over the oven hob. So skeptical as I am, I thought it's the oven with its timer. But nope, the oven's timer is an electronic beep. What happened was it began ticking like lasting 30 seconds and stopped. I asked it to repeat and again it began. Repeated this a few times and sometimes the ticking was barely audible. Then flicking back to a loud as a clock parked in front of you. The following day it bounced back to my room where it originated. As I first heard the noise years back in my room, but again coming from a point over stuff in the room that couldn't quite possibly make a ticking noise if it was there. Interestingly, my brothers heard it over the past few months, so it's not something I alone have heard. I've outruled rain, dodgy gutters, friendly inhabitants in the room, insects, and other benign causes. I've spoken on the forum before about my house. It's a 250 to 300 year old house in Ireland. My dad's told a ghost out of my mam's uncle in his revolutionary uniform to fuck right off. I've had problems with this ticking before and it once went on through a night one summer I was home from college. It's followed me when I moved from home for medical placements to other regions in Ireland. Ask Reddit. I was chilling in my mom's room and we were both lying on her bed. She was watching The Conjuring 2 on the TV and I was laying on my stomach while using my phone right next to her. We were head to head. I couldn't see what was on the TV, mind you. Out of nowhere, she snaps at me to quit lying on the TV remote because the info bar was blocking the show. I looked up, asked her what the heck she was going on about, and the info bar that showed up when we changed channels was going crazy. The TV channels where I live are three digits, and it kept going 6666666666 continuously. Furthermore, the remote was right in the middle of us, nowhere close to either of our body parts. We're both looking at the remote hanging out in the center, and we both look back up to the TV still going crazy. A few seconds after we realized where the remote was, it totally stops. I thought the number pad was sticky or something, but it wasn't. A lot of weird stuff has happened in this house. We had our, do I have to specify, Catholic priest from the parish that we attend from a house blessing twice. On the second blessing, a few years after we moved in, the priest knew nothing about what we were experiencing. When he came, there were some areas of the house where he spent a lot of longer time praying. Afterwards, when we were having some tea, we prodded him to tell us what he knew. 
Every spot that he named and every spirit he described at these specific spots were totally spot on to what me and my other family members have witnessed. Once again, I have to make it clear that he knew absolutely nothing and that our request was just, hey father, get him over for a house for a blessing. Ask Reddit. During COVID, I moved back to my parents' house. One day I walked out of the bathroom. It was the middle of the day, but no one was home. The front door literally was slow motion opening right in front of me. I thought my parents had arrived and opened it, but once the door opened completely, no one was there. My dad tried to explain it that maybe the door just had an issue tried to sort of imitate the situation by closing it very slowly or locking it lightly. Nothing he tried could replicate what happened that day. In the following weeks, the door of our neighbor who lives right across the hall was fully open. No one had come. They live abroad and only visit once a year. No one could explain it. After that, not much had happened. In the following months, though, I was up till past 2 or 3 a.m. one night, and oddly enough again, as I walked out of the bathroom, I saw a bright light in the living room. Immediately, my heart started pumping. The light disappeared in a few seconds. I had no idea what that was. The next day, I asked my sister, and she said that she saw it too once, that the TV just turns on for a few seconds, then turns off again. So I waited the next night, and surely enough, at exactly 3 a.m., the TV turns on. It was a picture of my grandpa and some family members at a picnic. My grandpa died years ago. The photo kept appearing at 3 a.m. every day. Till one day it didn't. Still gives me the shivers. The Most Haunted Place in the West So in Nevada, there's this little park, and below this is Rob Canyon. It's a pretty big canyon. Now this place is just creepy overall. The only dead tree in the area stops the river flow. Residents that live near it act strange, like they're out of a Black Mirror episode. Like we're outsiders. It's been claimed to be the most haunted place in the West. There's some background on this location. All right, so the story begins this last year in July when me and my friends go to Rob Canyon to give our final say on if it's haunted. But this time we were checking out the park. Upon our arrival, we see a glimmer of something in the light to stumble across one swing, just swinging by itself. Now, this is creepy and all, but we put it aside. My homie goes to the bathroom, and I see him pull a large stick out between the door and the frame. For some reason, he knocked on it, and I thought it was stupid, but as he was walking back, he dead froze, then ran over to me. He says the door knocked back. So following this, about five minutes later, we heard a very loud GO! And being noticeably freaked out, we still stayed. Suddenly we're being quiet to try and hear the voice. We heard a female moan or bellow through the canyon, followed by that same GO. Cowboy. This happened about a year ago. I was 16. I've always been referred to as a psychic or a medium. This runs in my family as my mom and sister have special abilities as well. I was with my mom and my sister and this took place at my cousin's place. For this story you need a little context into the layout of my cousin's house. As you walk into the house the stairs to the second floor are right there. They have a huge kind of Victorian railing and the living room is off from the front door. 
went there with my mom and sister to visit my baby cousins, as I'm very close to them. I went upstairs to check one of them and found her playing video games. I talked to her for a second before waking, excuse me, walking out of the room, shutting the door behind me. As I was about to walk down the stairs, I got a glimpse into my cousin's room. There's a guy in a cowboy hat with long dark hair and gray muscle shirt. He had a pair of bleach-washed kind of jeans with chaps on over them, along with cowboy boots. He was about six feet tall and skinny, and he walked toward me and I ran down the stairs to the living room whispering what I'd seen to my mom and I wanted to scare my other cousin. As I look over my shoulder, I see the man crouched down on the top of the stairs looking through the railing. I whisper that to my mom and I kid you not, she said. You mean that shadow? My mom could see the man, but only in a shadow I could see his detail. I told my mom I didn't like his vibe and we needed to leave. She agreed and we left. A while after that, there was a dark shadow that would follow me around. I had issues around food and sleeping. I haven't seen this since and I hope I never do. Ask Reddit. I was 11 years old and I was with my 7 year old cousin eating Oreos in his bunk bed. I went to the hallway to throw out the trash because that's where the trash can was. He had a long hallway with a staircase at the end of it. As I threw the trash away and looked down the hallway, I saw a man coming toward me. My first reaction was that it was his dad who had woke up and was about to yell at us for, you know, being up eating Oreos. So I ran back into my cousin's room and got in bed and told him to act like he was sleeping. I remember being freezing cold the whole time and shaking. After a couple of seconds went by, I realized what I saw looked nothing like my uncle. What I had seen was an apparition of a man. He had no legs and he was floating toward me at rapid speed. His eyes were hollow and his whole body seemed gray. His hair was flowing and wasn't very long. The most distinctive feature was that he had a top hat on. I ended up telling my cousin what had happened and it freaked him out too. Barely slept at all at night. But the absolute crazy part was the next morning. I went downstairs and had breakfast with my uncle and my cousin. My cousin then said to his dad that I'd seen a ghost last night. I was embarrassed because I knew it sounded silly and I didn't want my uncle to think I was crazy. My uncle's eyes suddenly widened and he stared at me. After a couple of seconds went by, he slowly asked, Was he wearing a top hat? Turns out, my uncle had seen this ghost before, too. Totally validated my experience. There's no way he would have known this detail beforehand, considering I never mentioned it. Ghost Air Raid Sirens That being said, my brother and I had an experience in our childhood that I still can't explain to this day. We were on a trip visiting family in Eastern Europe. We did it every couple of years as kids. And that day, we had gone to one of the largest cemeteries in the region to visit some family grave sites. Maintenance and to pay respects and all. We were out with mom, my grandpa, and my great aunt. And as the afternoon set in, the adults had taken a break and started to chat. So my brother and I decided to run off and explore a bit. We weren't even ten yards from where the rest of my family were around the corner, playing with sticks or whatever it was. It seemingly out of nowhere, clear as day, we heard ominous air raid sirens start going off as if there was an incoming threat through the clear afternoon sky. They were quite loud, but sounded as if they were like maybe a large hillside away or maybe even further. My brother and I looked at each other with concern and had chatted on how it would have been best to go back to our family as we weren't sure really what to do. It would have taken just about an hour to get out of the cemetery with how far in we'd gone at that point. But to our surprise, none of the adults knew what we were talking about and hadn't heard anything at all. It never stood out as a particularly spooky experience, but I've never been able to come up with a logical explanation for how loud the sirens were. 
I would have expected everyone in the entire cemetery, and maybe even further, to hear it. Seeking advice about vision. I've been experiencing something quite peculiar over the past week, and I'm hoping to get some insights and opinions. I keep catching fleeting glimpses of a big brown shaggy dog out of the corner of my eye. However, there's no actually dog present when I turn to look directly at it. It's been happening consistently, and I can't help but wonder if there's a deeper meaning behind it. Curiosity led me to do a very brief Google search, which suggested that such sightings could be considered omens of misfortune. As someone who's Christian, but also believes in the paranormal and the supernatural, I find myself torn between various interpretations. I've always had a fascination with mythologies and their symbolism, so I'm curious to explore different perspectives on this matter. While I've shared my experiences with my parents, they dismiss it as me simply making things up. Unfortunately, their skepticism only adds to my unease. The timing is particularly unsettling. I'll be moving away from my degree in the next month or so. And the idea of a bad omen hovering over this exciting new chapter makes me nervous. So I turn to you for your thoughts, advice, and personal experiences. Have any of you encountered similar paranormal phenomena? What do you make of these fleeting visions of a shaggy dog? Could there be any significance to it? Or is it merely a coincidence? I'm open to hearing different viewpoints, whether they come from a religious, logical, or purely personal standpoint. Carlton, friend, colleague, a man who is my friend. Many years ago I belonged to a volunteer fire company in Oxford, Connecticut. One of the elder statesmen in the firehouse, Carlton, grew up in the same town I did about 30 miles away. We became quite close because of this. A few years into my membership, Carl had gotten sick and passed away. I was one of the ones the FD chose to be a pallbearer. Carl always wore tan trousers and a different colored polo shirt every day. He was buried in tan trousers and a navy blue polo with our FD logo on it. Late one night, I was the last one in the firehouse just finishing up some paperwork and manpower reports for the chief's office. The rule was last one to leave has to make sure the house was secure. It was around 10.30 or 11 o'clock when I started my rounds to make sure all was locked up. When I came out of the meeting room on the apparatus floor, Carl came out of the men's room in his tan trousers and polo shirt about 15 feet away from me. I saw him with my very own eyes. So real I even called his name. He didn't look at me or even acknowledge me, just walked behind the engine toward the back of the house. At the time I got back behind the engine, I saw him turn the corner toward the back bays. I called out Carl again, but by the time I got back, he was gone. I know I saw him. He loved the Oxford Fire Department so much. My guess is, is that he couldn't leave. Ask Reddit So this will get buried, but whatever. I found it. So when I was in fourth grade, I would often stay at my friend Greg's house. His family was cool and didn't mind me hanging out all the time, and Greg always mentioned that his house was haunted, like footsteps in the hallway, shadowy figures, etc. But I never took him seriously. Shut up, Greg, you're not scaring me. One night, we decided to sneak out and wrap toilet paper on our friend's house down the street. We thought we were badasses. We waited till about 3 a.m., stole a roll of TP from the bathroom, and silently left out the front door. We were gone for maybe 15 minutes. But we were worn out. So we went to the TV room and took our spots. He was on the pull-out couch, and I was on the floor. I was a weird kid. I preferred it. After watching TV for a bit, we decided to pass out. 
As soon as we turned off the TV light, the light in his kitchen became very bright and loud, almost as if it was going to explode. Then footsteps ran from the kitchen to where we were, and I promise I'm not making this up. The couch cushion next to me depressed as if someone was sitting on it. I whispered to Greg, what was that? He probably told me to shut up just as the entire sequence repeated itself. Bright light, footsteps, couch. I threw the covers over my head and somehow went to sleep. The next morning I woke underneath the covers to the sound of Greg getting in trouble. His mom noticed that the last roll of teepee was gone. Rookie mistake on our part. Haunted Apartment To start off, we've lived here for about five years. There's not too many nights where it's quiet. We have friends over and we're often up playing video games to the early morning hours. It started a few years after we moved in. Most of the activity happens around 2 to 4 a.m., especially when it's just us, you know, in the apartment. I have a perfect view of the kitchen near the front door. If anybody passes between that space, I can see from my bed. Around the golden hour, sometimes I'll see a person pass that space in the dark. It's even happened when one of us are asleep on the couch in the living room. You know, with the glow of the TV projecting on the kitchen. It's never a definite shape, only a shadow or something moving across that space. There was this one 4th of July weekend about two years ago that really hit me. The light was on, I was in my bed, and I definitely saw somebody come through the front door and pass into the living room. Thinking it was my friend coming home early from Las Vegas, I went to the living room and said, Hey man, I thought... only to find no one. I immediately got freaked out and got the chills. Even though I'm a grown man, I decided to close and lock my door and get underneath the covers. After a good half hour of silence and watching Star Trek, the door popped and swung open. I have to admit, a little pee came out of me. Other than that, it's quiet, but every once in a while we hear steps in the kitchen on the cheap linoleum. No one will be there. Dagarville, New Zealand. Paranormal experience. My partner and I traveled to New Zealand a few years back. We were living out of a van and tried our best to utilize freedom camping spots in our trip. We arrived in a town called Dargarville. It was a quaint little town that reminded us both of Wild West movies. There was one camping spot which was located on the grounds of an agricultural machinery museum. If you bought tickets to the museum, then camping was free. The staff were really friendly. We were unsure what to do the following day as it was going to be Sunday. Many things to do were shut in New Zealand on Sunday. We were the only people staying on the grounds of the museum. It was dark and the place had a slightly eerie feeling. But I couldn't place my finger on it. We went to sleep and woke up the next day and proceeded to head into town. And to our surprise, everything was open. We looked around the charity shops and we noticed that a lot of the local people stared at us as if we were aliens. Felt very bizarre and though everybody was polite, we didn't feel wanted or welcome. Upon checking our calendars, we realized that it wasn't Sunday and in fact it was Monday. We lost a whole day somehow. Did time skip forward? We often discuss this and what could have happened and can't find any information about paranormal activity in Dargerville. The Chipotle I work at definitely has a ghost. As the title says, I work at a Chipotle. Over the past few years working there, I've had several encounters. My co-workers have experienced things too. I'm a manager, so there's been many times where I'm sort of stuck there late at night by myself finishing things. I almost always feel like I'm being watched. 
I'll be in the office doing my computer work and randomly get an eerie feeling that something is behind me. I've heard and seen dishes come falling off shelves. I hear footsteps coming from the restaurant to the back. The store is quite small. But when I look at the cameras or turn my head, there's always no one. Multiples of co-workers hear their names being called and have been touched. They also get the feeling of being watched. The biggest encounter I've had there was one night my coworker and I had our backs to each other. We were just cleaning up when we heard footsteps and someone say hello. We both turned at the same time because we thought it was a customer. There was no one there. It gave us chills. The night I was finishing counting the registers, I heard someone go psst. It sounded like it came from around the corner next to me, where our dry storage is. I was the only one in the store. Look up at the cameras anyway, and of course no one's there. Got up, looked in the storage area because the camera doesn't hit it, you know, all the way. And again, no one. See ya. My 11 year old sister can see ghosts. Can anyone explain this? The first one was seven or eight feet. It was a white figure with hands that curve and fade at the end. She saw it in broad daylight in town. She blinked several times as most of the spirits she saw went away in like a blink, but not this one. It also walked in a smooth, flowing fashion. The second one was roughly the same height but black. She saw it looking down at her upon leaving her bedroom. Another looked like a young girl with black hair and a white dress with dirt patches and burn holes. It looked like she was covered in gasoline. The last was seen looking similar to the girl, but it was her bed. My sister sleeps on a raised bed, so the girl she saw was said to be floating. She also heard knocking throughout the room. A consistent knock, knock, knock started on our bedroom window every 30 seconds to a minute would knock again always three times in a row. Kept getting closer, too, from the window to each of the cupboards to the door and then under the bed. She said she could feel the knocking from underneath, not just sound-wise. The last wasn't a knock. She felt something grab her knee and it felt like bones, apparently. Does anybody know what these figures could be and what happens if we were to try to communicate with one? She's worried she'll anger them by trying to communicate, so she basically ignores them. Weird memory loss as a kid. I think I was pretty small when this happened, around four or six. I remember waking up in a guest bedroom at my grandparents' house. When I woke up, it was early in the afternoon. I realized I couldn't remember how I got there, or how I got to my grandparents' house, or what had happened that morning. The weird thing is, as I tried to recall my last memory, I couldn't remember anything. Like I knew my family, my house, and I could recognize my grandparents' house, places we went to often, but I couldn't remember any specific event that I had ever experienced. Just general facts about my life. I tried to recall any memory at all for a few minutes, and I couldn't. After that, I remember walking to the living room. My family was there. I remember the adults were smiling and laughing at me, which was confusing at the time, but it must have been because they had noticed I'd fallen asleep and thought it was cute. I also think I'd probably fallen asleep in the living room and they had, you know, carried me to bed. It sounds pretty mundane and I was really young, but it was pretty disorienting at the time and I can't think of any explanation besides a false memory or a dream. To clarify two things. We live a few minutes away from my grandparents, and so we visited very often. So it wasn't out of the usual that we were there. Also, I don't have any other memories in connection to this one, so if it really happened, I don't know if I regained my memories right after or what. Me and my friends heard knocking, yet... Nothing was there. 
Me, a male 18, and my three friends, male 17, we were hanging out. We had been in my friend's bedroom for a few hours whilst his mom was asleep. We were being quite noisy and heard two knocks on what seemed like his wooden bedroom door. My friend, the host, first called out and heard nothing. He then left to go to investigate. Thinking it was his mom asking him to be quiet, he found nothing. His bedroom was downstairs, so this is quite strange. He turned on all the lights in every room and saw nothing or nobody. The only thing he had he found his back door was unlocked. There was no sign of an entrance, though. We were all very confused, knocking all around his bedroom, yet found no true replication of the original knock. The one abnormality is my other friend heard three knocks, while we only heard two, which he insinuates were quite deep and not a very wooden sound. We're all extremely concerned by this, as me and my friends the host have seen and felt things throughout his house, which is somewhat old, around the 1940s. So much so as to where the host has experienced sleep paralysis and an evil aura. If anyone knows the meaning behind the two random knocks or what it was, please tell me. Please inform me as to why my friend heard three deep knocks. The Girl in the Blue Dress This is my favorite paranormal experience to retell. It happened to me when I was very young, around 9, maybe 10 years old. I used to live in these old townhomes. I wanted to do some research on them because all the family paranormal stories happened there. The layout of our house was pretty small. We had the living room as soon as you entered the door, and then a nice little kind of bar area which overlooked the kitchen. It was facing the kitchen and on the left with stairs. Anyways, I was sitting in the living room while my grandmother and mom were talking in the kitchen. And to be honest, I don't remember what I was doing, but I was sitting on the couch that faced the kitchen. Our bar area had bar stools that I could obviously be sat on, and as children, we'd like to spin as fast as we could on them. We'd loosen them up to a certain point where they could no longer face straight. They would be facing the stairs. I turned to face the stools, and there was a little girl sitting on one of them looking down with her long hair in front of her face. I remember her vividly. She was wearing a long blue dress that was a tad bit dirty. There's no negative energy coming off of her from what I remember. But seeing that as a child, I still am scared by it. After a couple of seconds of me looking at her, she turned her head up almost to look at me, and at the same time my grandmother asked me if I can get something from her room. So I ran up the stairs, and upon return, she was gone. Ask Reddit. I had a favorite pair of silver hoop earrings that I liked to wear pretty much all the time. One day I looked for them and I couldn't find them. No big deal, I'm kind of disorganized and figured I just left them lying there somewhere. I kept my eyes open for the next day or two, figuring I'd stumble across them, but no luck. After they'd been missing a couple of days, I had a date planned for later that evening. Really wanted to wear them. So I really thoroughly looked everywhere I could think, behind furniture, under the couch cushions, etc. I especially looked in and around my bed. I had a tendency to climb in my bed with them on, and I could feel them poking and pulling my head and it hit the pillow. My usual habit was to sleepily pluck them out and toss them on the nightstand, but sometimes I'd miss. So I looked everywhere behind the nightstand, under the bed, in the sheets, under the pillows. Nada. Bummed, I gave up. A couple of hours later, I went and got ready for my date. Just as I was about to leave, I glanced at the bed. There, resting in plain sight on top of my pillow, were my earrings. I was home alone at the time and hadn't left the house in between looking for the earrings and getting ready for my date. There's no way I could have missed them can't for the life of me figure out how they could have gotten there.
Ask Reddit. My dad has a house in the mountains of upstate New York. He bought it in the early 2000s. We still live in the suburbs of Westchester, so we would go up and stay at this house on weekends while my dad did his best to fix it up. When I was little, I was into paintball. And I was from the city, so I was always shooting up things in the woods. Makes sense. Next to my dad's house in the woods was this house that was falling apart. I could see it in the distance from my bedroom window, and it always gave me the creeps. Half the ceiling was caved in, and it was fully furnished. The old Ford Fairlane still in the driveway. Everything was completely rotting away. One time my cousin came up for the weekend. We took the paintball guns and went out to shoot up the woods as usual. We walked over to the end of the decrepit house and thought it would be fun to shoot out all the windows. So we did. Lame. It was fun. We continued to find other things to shoot up and went back inside to play Grand Theft Auto 3. The next weekend I went up but didn't visit the abandoned house. The weekend after that, my cousin came up with us again and we went out to the paintball guns. We walked toward the old house and all the windows weren't broken anymore. They were still full of cobwebs and pollen. Me and my cousin were confused as hell so we shot him out again. Stopped going up for a couple of months after that, by the time the house had been demolished. The Cost of Mocking the Jinns. True Story. I was a really naughty boy when I was young. I used to mock everything, and I didn't care about anything either. One day while I was having a conversation with my friends, we started to talk about the Jinns. I started to mock them with my usual reckless and naughty attitude, as always. While my friend told me, don't do it, don't do it, I take it to the next level and started to swear Jins. I mocked Jins despite the warnings of my friends, but something in me was telling me that something bad was going to happen to me. Suddenly I saw a cat in front of me after I let my friends and was going back to my home. Something amazing happened, and the cat started to talk to me. Her eyes were pure white and she was saying things that I couldn't pay attention to because I was really scared. I ran to my house shocked with fear and I wanted to wash my hands and face. When I washed my hands and face and lifted my head up, my mind was blown. A strange creature was looking at me in the mirror. And it wasn't me. I just froze in my position. I was trying to run away, but it was like something fixed me in my position. At one moment, I don't know what happened, but I managed to get control of my body and run away. Now I'm trying not to mock anything in my file and I cannot look at the mirrors. La Llorona La Llorona, often referred to as the Weeping Woman, is a legendary figure in Latin American folklore. The tale of La Llorona varies across different cultures and regions. But the core story revolves around a woman who's said to have drowned her own children and is now condemned to roam, wailing, and weeping for an eternity as a tormented spirit. The details of the story can differ, but the common thread is that La Llorona is often depicted as a grieving woman dressed in white, seen near bodies of water, particularly rivers or lakes. Her cries and mournful wails are said to be both eerie and sorrowful striking fear into those who hear her. This legend has been passed down through generations, serving as a cautionary tale to children. It's often used as a way to discourage them from wandering alone near water bodies or staying out late at night. The tale has been adapted in various forms, including literature, film, music, and other forms of art, making it a significant part of the cultural fabric in many Latin American countries. The story of La Llorona continues to captivate and intrigue people, reflecting the power of folklore to communicate deep emotions and moral lessons across generations. What was this thing? My mom lives in southeast Ohio at the top of a hill on a country road. 
One day my son, age eight at the time, was riding his scooter up and down the road, something he wasn't allowed to do for safety reasons. So this country road is woods on both sides, but they aren't particularly dense on either side. The fields, like a utility crossing, splits the roadside woods from a bigger section of forest. He suddenly comes running up the hill, white as a ghost, teary-eyed, says that he saw something scary in the woods. He's almost inconsolable. He finally gets calmed down and we ask him what he saw. He says it was kind of like a stick figure, but thicker. It was all black, had no facial features, and looked like a man on the bathroom signs. Of course, we went to check, and he took us to a specific area, pointed out exactly where it was, even showed us how much taller it was than a dead tree in the area, roughly seven feet tall. He was physically shaking the whole time, and he was showing us and talking about it. We told him it was probably a warning to stay off the road, but what could it have been? Anyone ever seen anything like this before? Ask Reddit. I used to babysit my niece and nephew when they were about four and five while my sister went to work. She lived down the street from me, so I would walk down in the morning before she left and before the kids woke up. I got there one morning and after she left, I laid down on the couch. I heard one of the kids run down the hall and I immediately pretended to be asleep, so they would go back to bed and not get the day started yet. I felt my niece run by me on the couch. Her running stomps shook the floor, and I could hear the trinkets on the shelves shake. I felt the wind of her blow by me. Then it was quiet, but I knew she was still there. She leaned over my ear and moved my hair out of the way and laughed into my ear. I just thought the audacity of this girl. Seriously. And then she hid under the end table of the couch. Realizing she wasn't going to go back to bed until I woke up, I just got up and looked under the end table. There was no one there. Completely baffled at how she got up and out of the living room in literally two seconds without me hearing shook me. So I went down the hall to her room and was starting to freak out. My nephew was sound asleep in his bedroom, and I got to my niece's room and she was sound asleep tucked under her covers. My heart almost fell out of my body. Ask Reddit. My whole family is convinced that our cottage is haunted. About three years ago, my uncle's wife and her friends were up there on their own. Three or four of them. They were sitting out on the deck right by the back door at about 1 a.m. shooting the shit. One of them says that they can see something on the rocks by the lake. So they all turned. They all saw the same thing. It looked like a little boy climbing around on the rocks, playing and suddenly vanishing. Well, a couple of days after that, they're all talking to my grandma and grandpa about all this, the owners of the cottage. My grandma brought up that she had a very scary paranormal experience in one of the rooms. She was sleeping and was woken up by something pressing down on her chest really hard. She saw a little boy sitting on her chest and she tried to yell for help, but she couldn't. So she just closed her eyes and prayed for it to go away. When she woke up, she thought she had just had the worst nightmare of her life until she saw that she had two bruises on her chest right where the pressure was. She didn't bring this up until a couple of years ago. She didn't want to scare anyone from coming up. She did some investigating on her own and found out that the people who owned the cottage before us had a son who drowned in the lake. Do people come to take you away when you're on your deathbed? A few months, if not weeks, before she passed away, my granny, my mom's mom, kept staring at the upper corner of her bedroom and also next to the wardrobe and kept saying that she sees people. She wouldn't specify their number, but she spoke in a plural type of a way. Given that she was old and sick, we didn't take her seriously. 
thought it had something to do with their brain experiencing old age. Here's what's strange, though. The mother, excuse me, the mother of my uncle's wife, I also called her my granny, also experienced that same thing. She would sometimes scream that she sees people wanting to take her away in her bedroom. We still didn't think there were people around because she would point at the wall and we couldn't see anyone. She could clearly recognize us, but kept insisting that there are more people there with us. So my question is, are there actually people who come to take you away when you're on your deathbed, or is it just old age sickness which results in hallucinations? Ouija board tea. So I went and got a tattoo yesterday, and the shop had a lot of, like, skulls and Halloween-type decorations. You know, typical tattoo shop stuff. I stopped and I really honed in on a skeleton that was wearing a Ouija board tee that I thought was pretty cool. But I even remember thinking that it might be a bit daring to wear something like that, but whatever. But I really paid attention to that shirt because I really liked it. Specifically, I remember these elbows on it. Literally, the following day, my sister-in-law texts me, asking if I bought a Ouija board t-shirt for my nephew as a gag gift. It's a kid's size. It's the same fucking shirt. The exact same one, elbows and all. She had no idea how it got to her house, let alone into my nephew's things. I looked it up online and it doesn't exist. Like, for purchase. They have similar ones, but not the exact same one. I'm in need of a logical explanation for what happened here. I'm gonna go back to this tattoo shop in a couple of days and see if the original shirt's still there. 